In appearance it was a huge curving ditch with a stagnant stream at the bottom. The sloping sides of the ditch were fringed with boars, who had ridden thither before dawn and were now waiting for the unsuspecting column. There were not more than three hundred of them, and four times their number were approaching, but no odds can represent the difference between the concealed man with the magazine rifle and the man upon the plain. There were two dangers, however, which the boars ran, and, skillful as their dispositions were, their luck was equally great, for the risks were enormous. One was that a force coming the other way, Colviles was only a few miles off, would arrive, and that they would be ground between the upper and the lower millstone. The other was that for once the British scouts might give the alarm and that Broadwood's mounted men would wheel swiftly to right and left and secure the ends of the long donga. Should that happen, not a man of them could possibly escape. But they took their chances like brave men, and fortune was their friend. The wagons came on without any scouts. Behind them was U Battery, then Q with Roberts's horse abreast of them and the rest of the cavalry behind dot as the wagons, occupied for the most part only by unarmed sick soldiers and black transport drivers, came down into the drift, the boars quickly but quietly took possession of them, and drove them on up the further slope. Thus the troops behind saw their wagons dip down, reappear, and continue on their course. The idea of an ambush could not suggest itself. Only one thing could avert an absolute catastrophe, and that was the appearance of a hero who would accept certain death in order to warn his comrades. Such a man rode by the wagons though, unhappily, in the stress and rush of the moment there is no certainty as to his name or rank. We only know that one was found brave enough to fire his revolver in the face of certain death. The outburst of firing which answered his shot was the sequel which saved the column. Not often is it given to a man to die so choice a death as that of this nameless soldier. But the detachment was already so placed that nothing could save it from heavy loss. The wagons had all passed but nine, and the leading battery of artillery was at the very edge of the Donga. Nothing is so helpless as a limbered up battery. In an instant, the teams were shot down and the gunners were made prisoners. A terrific fire burst at the same instant upon Roberts's horse who were abreast of the guns. Files about. Gallop. Yelled Colonel Dawson, and by his exertions and those of Major Pack Beresford the corps was extricated and reformed some hundreds of yards further off. But the loss of horses and men was heavy. Major Pack Beresford and other officers were shot down, and every unhorsed man remained necessarily as a prisoner under the very muzzles of the riflemen in the Donga. As Roberts his horse turned and galloped for dear life across the flat, four out of the six guns, footnote, of the other two one overturned and could not be righted, the other had the wheelers shot and could not be extricated from the tumult. It was officially stated that the guns of Q Battery were halted a thousand yards off the Donga, but my impression was, from examining the ground, that it was not more than six hundred, of Q Battery and one gun, the rearmost, of U Battery swung round and dashed frantically for a place of safety. At the same instant every boar along the line of the Donga sprang up and emptied his magazine into the mass of rushing, shouting soldiers, plunging horses, and screaming kaffirs. It was for a few moments a sore key pot. Sergeant Major Martin of you, with a single driver on a wheeler, got away the last gun of his battery. The four guns which were extricated of Q, under Major Phipps Hornby, whirled across the plain, pulled up, unlimbered, and opened a brisk fire of shrapnel from about a thousand yards upon the Donga. Had the battery gone on for double the distance, its action would have been more effective, for it would have been under a less deadly rifle fire, but in any case its sudden change from flight to discipline and order steadied the whole force. Roberts's men sprang from their horses, and with the Burmese and New Zealanders flung themselves down in a skirmish line. The cavalry moved to the left to find some drift by which the Donga could be passed, and out of chaos there came in a few minutes calm and a settled purpose. It was for Q Battery to cover the retreat of the force, and most nobly it did it. A fortnight later, a pile of horses, visible many hundreds of yards off across the plain, showed where the guns had stood. 
it was the colon so of the horse gunners. In a devilish sleet of lead they stood to their work, loading and firing while a man was left. Some of the guns were left with two men to work them, one was loaded and fired by a single officer. When at last the order for retirement came, only ten men, several of them wounded, were left upon their feet. With scratch teams from the limbers, driven by single gunners, the twelve pounders staggered out of action, and the skirmish line of mounted infantry sprang to their feet amid the hail of bullets to cheer them as they passed. It was no slight task to extricate that sorely stricken force from the close contact of an exultant enemy, and to lead it across that terrible donga. Yet, thanks to the coolness of Broadwood and the steadiness of his rearguard, the thing was done. A practicable passage had been found two miles to the south by Captain Chester Master of Rymington's. This corps, with Roberts's, the New Zealanders, and the Third Mounted Infantry, covered the withdrawal in turn. It was one of those actions in which the horseman who is trained to fight upon foot did very much better than the regular cavalry. In two hours' time the drift had been passed and the survivors of the force found themselves in safety. The losses in this disastrous but not dishonorable engagement were severe. About thirty officers and five hundred men were killed, wounded, or missing. The prisoners came to more than three hundred. They lost a hundred wagons, a considerable quantity of stores, and seven twelve-pounder guns five from U battery and two from Q. Of U battery only Major Taylor and Sergeant Major Martin seem to have escaped, the rest being captured en bloc. Of Q battery nearly every man was killed or wounded. Roberts's horse, the New Zealanders, and the mounted infantry were the other corps which suffered most heavily. Among many brave men who died, none was a greater loss to the service than Major Booth of the Northumberland Fusiliers, serving in the mounted infantry. With four comrades he held a position to cover the retreat, and refused to leave it. Such men are inspired by the traditions of the past, and pass on the story of their own deaths to inspire fresh heroes in the future. Broadwood, the instant that he had disentangled himself, faced about, and brought his guns into action. He was not strong enough, however, nor were his men in a condition, to seriously attack the enemy. Martyr's mounted infantry had come up, led by the Queenslanders, and at the cost of some loss to themselves helped to extricate the disordered force. Colville's division was behind Bushman's Cop, only a few miles off, and there were hopes that it might push on and prevent the guns and wagons from being removed. Colville did make an advance, but slowly and in a flanking direction instead of dashing swiftly forward to retrieve the situation. It must be acknowledged, however, that the problem which faced this general was one of great difficulty. It was almost certain that before he could throw his men into the action the captured guns would be beyond his reach, and it was possible that he might swell the disaster. With all charity, however, one cannot but feel that his return next morning, after a reinforcement during the night, without any attempt to force the Boer position, was lacking in enterprise. Footnote, it may be urged in General Colville's defence that his division had already done a long march from Blow Enfantine. A division, however, which contains two such brigades as Macdonald's and Smith Doyen's may safely be called upon for any exertions. The gunner officers in Colville's division heard their comrades' guns in section fire and knew it to be the sign of a desperate situation. The victory left the Boers in possession of the waterworks and Blow Emfantine had to fall back upon her wells a change which reacted most disastrously upon the enteric which was already decimating the troops. The effect of the Sanners post defeat was increased by the fact that only four days later, on April 4, a second even more deplorable disaster befell our troops. This was the surrender of five companies of infantry, two of them mounted, at Redisburg, so many surrenders of small bodies of troops had occurred during the course of the war that the public, remembering how seldom the word surrender had ever been heard in our endless succession of European wars, had become very restive upon the subject, and were sometimes inclined to question whether this new and humiliating fact did not imply some deterioration of our spirit. The fear was natural, 
and yet nothing could be more unjust to this the most splendid army which has ever marched under the red crossed flag. The fact was new because the conditions were new, and it was inherent in those conditions. In that country of huge distances small bodies must be detached, for the amount of space covered by the large bodies was not sufficient for all military purposes. In reconnoitering, in distributing proclamations, in collecting arms, in overawing outlying districts, weak columns must be used. Very often these columns must contain infantry soldiers, as the demands upon the cavalry were excessive. Such bodies, moving through a hilly country with which they were unfamiliar, were always liable to be surrounded by a mobile enemy. Once surrounded the length of their resistance was limited by three things, their cartridges, their water, and their food. When they had all three, as at weapon or mafeking, they could hold out indefinitely. When one or other was wanting, as at Redisburg or Nicholson's neck, their position was impossible. They could not break away, for how can men on foot break away from horsemen? Hence those repeated humiliations, which did little or nothing to impede the course of the war, and which were really to be accepted as one of the inevitable prices which we had to pay for the conditions under which the war was fought. Numbers, discipline, and resources were with us. Mobility, distances, nature of the country, insecurity of supplies, were with them. We need not take it to heart therefore if it happened, with all these forces acting against them, that our soldiers found themselves sometimes in a position whence neither wisdom nor valour could rescue them. To travel through that country, fashioned above all others for defensive warfare, with trench and fort of superhuman size and strength, barring every path. One marvels how it was that such incidents were not more frequent and more serious. It is deplorable that the white flag should ever have waved over a company of British troops, but the man who is censorious upon the subject has never travelled in South Africa. In the disaster at Redisburg, three of the companies were of the Irish Rifles, and two of the 2nd Northumberland Fusiliers, the same unfortunate regiments which had already been cut up at Stormberg. They had been detached from Gattaca's 3rd Division, the headquarters of which was at Springfontein. On the abandonment of Abenchu and the disaster of Sanna's post, it was obvious that we should draw in our detached parties to the east, so the five companies were ordered to leave Duetsdorp, which they were garrisoning, and to get back to the railway line. Either the order was issued too late, or they were too slow in obeying it, for they were only halfway upon their journey near the town of Redisburg, when the enemy came down upon them with five guns. Without artillery they were powerless, but, having seized a cop, they took such shelter as they could find, and waited in the hope of succour. Their assailants seemed to have been detached from De Wet's force in the north, and contained among them many of the victors of Sanna's post. The attack began at 11 a.m. of April 3rd, and all day the men lay among the stones, subjected to the pelt of shell and bullet. The cover was good, however, and the casualties were not heavy. The total losses were under fifty killed and wounded. More serious than the enemy's fire was the absence of water, save a very limited supply in a cart. A message was passed through of the dire straits in which they found themselves, and by the late afternoon the news had reached headquarters. Lord Roberts instantly dispatched the Camerons, just arrived from Egypt, to Bethany, which is the nearest point upon the line, and telegraphed to Gattaca at Springfontein to take measures to save his compromised detachment. The telegram should have reached Gattaca early on the evening of the 3rd, and he had collected a force of 1500 men, entrained it, journeyed 40 miles up the line, detrained it, and reached Redisburg, which is 10 or 12 miles from the line by 10.30 next morning. Already, however, it was too late, and the besieged force, unable to face a second day without water under that burning sun, had laid down their arms. No doubt the stress of thirst was dreadful, and yet one cannot say that the defence rose to the highest point of resolution. Knowing that help could not be far off, the garrison should have held on while they could lift a rifle. If the ammunition was running low, it was bad management which caused it to be shot away too fast. Captain McQueen, 
who was in command, behaved with the utmost personal gallantry. Not only the troops but General Gattaker also was involved in the disaster. Blame may have attached to him for leaving a detachment at Duetsdorp, and not having a supporting body at Redisburg upon which it might fall back, but it must be remembered that his total force was small and that he had to cover a long stretch of the lines of communication. As to General Gattaker's energy and gallantry it is a byword in the army, but coming after the Stormburg disaster this fresh mishap to his force made the continuance of his command impossible. Much sympathy was felt with him in the army, where he was universally liked and respected by officers and men. He returned to England, and his division was taken over by General Chermside. In a single week, at a time when the back of the war had seemed to be broken, we had lost nearly 1200 men with seven guns. The men of the Free State for the fighting was mainly done by commandos from the Lady Brand, Winburg, Bethlehem and Harrismith districts deserve great credit for this fine effort, and their leader De Wet confirmed the reputation which he had already gained as a dashing and indefatigable leader. His force was so weak that when Lord Roberts was able to really direct his own against it, he brushed it away before him, but the manner in which De Wet took advantage of Roberts's enforced immobility, and dared to get behind so mighty an enemy, was a fine exhibition of courage and enterprise. The public at home chafed at this sudden and unexpected turn of affairs, but the general, constant to his own fixed purpose, did not permit his strength to be wasted, and his cavalry to be again disorganized, by flying excursions, but waited grimly until he should be strong enough to strike straight at Pretoria. In this short period of depression there came one gleam of light from the west. This was the capture of a commando of sixty Boers, or rather of sixty foreigners fighting for the Boers, and the death of the gallant Frenchman, Derville Boys Mail, who appears to have had the ambition of playing Lafayette in South Africa to Kruger's Washington. From the time that Kimberley had been reoccupied the British had been accumulating their force there so as to make a strong movement which should coincide with that of Roberts from Blow Enfantine. Hunter's division from Natal was being moved round to Kimberley, and Methuen already commanded a considerable body of troops, which included a number of the newly arrived Imperial Yeomanry. With these Methuen pacified the surrounding country, and extended his outposts to Barclay West on the one side, to Boshoff on the other, and to Warrington upon the Val River in the centre. On April 4 news reached Boshoff that a Boer commando had been seen some ten miles to the east of the town, and a force, consisting of yeomanry, Kimberley Light Horse, and half of Butcher's veteran 4th Battery, was sent to attack them. They were found to have taken up their position upon a cop which, contrary to all Boer custom, had no other copies to support it. French generalship was certainly not so astute as Boer cunning. The cop was instantly surrounded, and the small force upon the summit being without artillery in the face of our guns found itself in exactly the same position which our men had been in twenty-four hours before at Redisburg. Again was shown the advantage which the mounted rifleman has over the cavalry, for the yeomanry and light horsemen left their horses and ascended the hill with the bayonet. In three hours all was over and the Boers had laid down their arms. Villeboys was shot with seven of his companions, and there were nearly sixty prisoners. It speaks well for the skirmishing of the yeomanry and the way in which they were handled by Lord Chesham that though they worked their way up the hill under fire they only lost four killed and a few wounded. The affair was a small one, but it was complete, and it came at a time when a success was very welcome. One bustling week had seen the expensive victory of Curie the disasters of Sanna's post and Redisburg, and the successful skirmish of Boshoff. Another chapter must be devoted to the movement towards the south of the Boer forces and the dispositions which Lord Roberts made to meet it. Chapter 23. The clearing of the southeast. Lord Roberts never showed his self-command and fixed purpose more clearly than during his six weeks halt at Blo Enfantine. De Wet, the most enterprising and aggressive of the Boer commanders was attacking his eastern posts and menacing his line of communications. A fussy or nervous general would have harassed his men and worn out his horses by endeavouring to pursue a number of will-of-the-wisp commandos. 
Roberts contented himself by building up his strength at the capital, and by spreading nearly 20,000 men along his line of rail from Blow Emfantine to Betholly. When the time came he would strike, but until then he rested. His army was not only being rehorsed and reshod, but in some respects was being reorganized. One powerful weapon which was forged during those weeks was the collection of the mounted infantry of the Central Army into one division, which was placed under the command of Ian e. Hamilton, with Hutton and Ridley as brigadiers. Hutton's brigade contained the Canadians, New South Wales men, West Australians, Queenslanders, New Zealanders, Victorians, South Australians, and Tasmanians, with four battalions of Imperial Mounted Infantry, and several light batteries. Ridley's brigade contained the South African irregular regiments of cavalry, with some Imperial troops. The strength of the whole division came to over 10,000 rifles, and in its ranks the road the hardiest and best from every corner of the earth over which the old flag is flying. A word as to the general distribution of the troops at this instant while Roberts was gathering himself for his spring. Eleven divisions of infantry were in the field. Of these the first, Methians, and half the tenth, Hunters, were at Kimberley, forming really the hundred mile distant left wing of Lord Roberts's army. On that side also was a considerable force of yeomanry, as General Vilboys discovered. In the centre with Roberts was the sixth division, Kelly Kenny's, at Blow Emfantine, the seventh, Tuckers, at Caree. 20 miles north, the 9th, Colviles, and the 11th, Pole Carouse, near Blo Emfantine. French's cavalry division was also in the centre. As one descended the line towards the Cape one came on the 3rd division, Chermsides, late Gattacas, which had now moved up to Redisburg, and then, further south, the 8th, Rundles, near Ouville. To the south and east was the other half of Hunter's division. Hart's Brigade, and Brabant's Colonial Division, half of which was shut up in Weapona and the rest at Alliwell. These were the troops operating in the Free State, with the addition of the Division of Mounted Infantry in process of formation. There remained the three divisions in Natal, the second, Glories, the fourth, Lyttelton's, and the fifth, Hildyards, Late Warrens, with the cavalry brigades of Burn Murdoch, Dundonald, and Brocklehurst. These, with numerous militia and unbrigaded regiments along the lines of communication, formed the British Army in South Africa. At Mafeking some 900 irregulars stood at bay, with another force about as large under Plumer a little to the north, endeavouring to relieve them. At Bra, a Portuguese port through which we have treaty rights by which we may pass troops, a curious mixed force of Australians. New Zealanders and others was being disembarked and pushed through to Rhodesia, so as to cut off any trek which the Boers might make in that direction. Carrington, a fierce old soldier with a large experience of South African warfare, was in command of this picturesque force, which moved amid tropical forests over crocodile haunted streams, while their comrades were shivering in the cold southerly winds of a Cape winter. Neither our government, our people, nor the world understood at the beginning of this campaign how grave was the task which we had undertaken, but, having once realized it, it must be acknowledged that it was carried through in no half-hearted way. So vast was the scene of operations that the Canadian might almost find his native climate at one end of it and the Queenslander at the other dot to follow in close detail the movements of the Boers and the counter-movements of the British in the southeast portion of the Free State during this period would tax the industry of the historian and the patience of the reader. Let it be told with as much general truth and as little geographical detail as possible. The narrative which is interrupted by an eternal reference to the map is a narrative spoiled. The main force of the Free Staters had assembled in the northeastern corner of their state, and from this they made their sally southwards, attacking or avoiding at their pleasure the eastern line of British outposts. Their first engagement, that of Senna's post, was a great and deserved success. Three days later they secured the five companies at Redisburg. Warned in time, the other small British bodies closed in upon their supports, and the railway line, that nourishing artery which was necessary for the very existence of the army, 
was held too strongly for attack. The Bethali Bridge was a particularly important point, but though the Boers approached it, and even went the length of announcing officially that they had destroyed it, it was not actually attacked. At Wepina, however, on the Barsato land border, they found an isolated force, and proceeded at once, according to their custom, to hem it in and to bombard it, until one of their three great allies, want of food, want of water, or want of cartridges, should compel a surrender. On this occasion, however, the Boers had undertaken a task which was beyond their strength. The troops at Weapon Air were 1,700 in number, and formidable in quality. The place had been occupied by part of Brabant's colonial division, consisting of hardy irregulars, men of the stuff of the defenders of Maffa King. Such men are too shrewd to be herded into an untenable position and too valiant to surrender a tenable one. The force was commanded by a dashing soldier, Colonel Dalgety, of the Cape Mounted Rifles, as tough a fighter as his famous namesake. There were with him nearly a thousand men of Brabant's horse, 400 of the Cape Mounted Rifles, 400 Caffrarian horse, with some scouts, and 100 regulars, including 20 invaluable sappers. They were strong in guns two 7-pounders, two naval 12-pounders, two 15-pounders and several machine guns. The position which they had taken up, Jamersburg, three miles north of Weppener, was a very strong one, and it would have taken a larger force than De Wet had at his disposal to turn them out of it. The defence had been arranged by Major Cedric Maxwell, of the Sappers, and though the huge perimeter, nearly eight miles, made its defence by so small a force a most difficult matter, the result proved how good his dispositions were dot at the same time, the Boers came on with every confidence of victory, for they had a superiority in guns and an immense superiority in men. But after a day or two of fierce struggle their attack dwindled down into a mere blockade. On April 9 they attacked furiously, both by day and by night, and on the 10th the pressure was equally severe. In these two days occurred the vast majority of the casualties. But the defenders took cover in a way to which British regulars have not yet attained, and they outshot their opponents both with their rifles and their cannon. Captain Lukin's management of the artillery was particularly skillful. The weather was violent the hastily dug trenches turned into ditches half full of water, but neither discomfort nor danger shook the courage of the gallant colonials. Assault after assault was repulsed and the scourging of the cannon was met with stolid endurance. The Boers excelled all their previous feats in the handling of artillery by dragging two guns up to the summit of the lofty Jamersburg, whence they fired down upon the camp. Nearly all the horses were killed and three hundred of the troopers were hit, a number which is doubled that of the official return, for the simple reason that the spirit of the force was so high that only those who were very severely wounded reported themselves as wounded at all. None but the serious cases ever reached the hands of Dr. Faskley, who did admirable work with very slender resources. How many the enemy lost can never be certainly known but as they pushed home several attacks it is impossible to imagine that their losses were less than those of the victorious defenders. At the end of seventeen days of mud and blood the brave irregulars saw an empty ledger and abandoned trenches. Their own resistance and the advance of Brabant to their rescue had caused a hasty retreat of the enemy. Weaponer, Maffa King, Kimberley, the taking of the first guns at Ladysmith, the deeds of the Imperial Light Horse it cannot be denied that our irregular South African forces have a brilliant record for the war. They are associated with many successes and with few disasters. Their fine record cannot, I think, be fairly ascribed to any greater hardihood which one portion of our race has when compared with another, for a South African must admit that in the best colonial corps at least half the men were Britons of Britain. In the Imperial Light Horse the proportion was very much higher. But what may fairly be argued is that their exploits have proved, what the American War proved long ago, that the German conception of discipline is an obsolete fetish, and that the spirit of free men, whose individualism has been encouraged rather than crushed, is equal to any feat of arms. The clerks and miners and engineers who went up Elan's lag till without bayonets, shoulder to shoulder with the Gordons, 
and who, according to Sir George White, saved Lady Smith on January 6, have shown forever that with men of our race it is the spirit within, and not the drill or the discipline, that makes a formidable soldier. An intelligent appreciation of the fact might in the course of the next few years save us as much money as would go far to pay for the war. It may well be asked how for so long a period as 17 days the British could tolerate a force to the rear of them when with their great superiority of numbers they could have readily sent an army to drive it away. The answer must be that Lord Roberts had dispatched his trusty lieutenant. Kitchener, to Alliwell, whence he had been in heliographic communication with Weaponer, that he was sure that the place could hold out, and that he was using it, as he did Kimberley, to hold the enemy while he was making his plans for their destruction. This was the bait to tempt them to their ruin. Had the trap not been a little slow in closing, the war in the Free State might have ended then and there. From the 9th to the 25th the Boers were held in front of Weaponer. Let us trace the movements of the other British detachments during that time. Brabant's force, with Hart's brigade, which had been diverted on its way to Kimberley, where it was to form part of Hunter's division, was moving on the south towards Weaponer, advancing through Rueville, but going slowly for fear of scaring the Boers away before they were sufficiently compromised. Chermside's 3rd Division approached from the northwest, moving out from the railway at Bethany and passing through Riddersburg towards Duetsdorp, from which it would directly threaten the Boer line of retreat. The movement was made with reassuring slowness and a gentleness, as when the curved hand approaches the unconscious fly. And then suddenly, on April 21, Lord Roberts let everything go. Had the action of the agents been as swift and as energetic as the mind of the planner, De Wet could not have escaped as. What held Lord Roberts's hand for some few days after he was ready to strike was the abominable weather. Rain was falling in sheet, and those who know South African roads, South African mud, and South African drifts will understand how impossible swift military movements are under those circumstances. But with the first clearing of the clouds, the hills to the south and east of Blow Emfantine were dotted with our scouts. Rundle with his 8th Division was brought swiftly up from the south, united with Chermside to the east of Redisburg, and the whole force, numbering 13,000 rifles with 30 guns, advanced upon Duetsdorp, Rundle, a senior officer, being in command. As they marched the blue hills of weapon aligned the sky some twenty miles to the south, eloquent to every man of the aim and object of their march. On April 20, Rundle as he advanced found a force with artillery across his path to Duetsdorp. It is always difficult to calculate the number of hidden men and lurking guns which go to make up a Boer army but with some knowledge of their total at weapon it was certain that the force opposed to him must be very inferior to his own. At Constantia Farm, where he found them in position, it is difficult to imagine that there were more than 3,000 men. Their left flank was their weak point, as a movement on that side would cut them off from Weaponer and drive them up towards our main force in the north. One would have thought that a containing force of 3,000 men, and a flanking movement from 8,000, would have turned them out, as it has turned them out so often before and since. Yet a long-range action began on Friday, April 20th, and lasted the whole of the 21st, the 22nd, and the 23rd, in which we sustained few losses, but made no impression upon the enemy. Thirty of the first Worcesters wandered at night into the wrong line, and were made prisoners, but with this exception the four days of noisy fighting does not appear to have cost either side fifty casualties. It is probable that the deliberation with which the operations were conducted was due to Rundle's instructions to wait until the other forces were in position. His subsequent movements showed that he was not a general who feared to strike. On Sunday night, April 22, Paul Carew sallied out from Blow Emfantine on a line which would take him round the right flank of the Boers who were facing Rundle. The Boers had, however, occupied a strong position at Liu Kop, which barred his path so that the duet store boars were covering the weapon of boars, and being in turn covered by the boars of Liukop. 
before anything could be done. They must be swept out of the way. Pole Karoo is one of those finds which help to compensate us for the war. Handsome, dashing, debonair, he approaches a field of battle as a light-hearted schoolboy approaches a football field. On this occasion he acted with energy and discretion. His cavalry threatened the flanks of the enemy, and Stevenson's brigade carried the position in front at a small cost. On the same evening General French arrived and took over the force, which consisted now of Stevenson's and the Guards brigades, making up the 11th Division, with two brigades of cavalry and one corps of mounted infantry. The next day, the 23rd, the advance was resumed, the cavalry bearing the brunt of the fighting. That gallant corps, Roberts's horse, whose behavior at Sanna's post had been admirable, again distinguished itself, losing among others its colonel, Brazier Career. On the 24th again it was to the horsemen that the honor and the casualties fell. The 9th Lancers, the regular cavalry regiment which bears away the honors of the war, lost several men and officers, and the 8th Hussars also suffered, but the Boers were driven from their position and lost more heavily in this skirmish than in some of the larger battles of the campaign. The pom-poms, which had been supplied to us by the belated energy of the Ordnance Department, were used with some effect in this engagement, and the Boers learned for the first time how unnerving are those noisy but not particularly deadly fireworks which they had so often crackled round the ears of our gunners. On the Wednesday morning rundle, with the addition of Pole Carew's division, was strong enough for any attack, while French was in a position upon the flank. Every requisite for a great victory was there except the presence of an enemy. The weapon a siege had been raised and the force in front of Rundle had disappeared as only Boer armies can disappear. The combined movement was an admirable piece of work on the part of the enemy. Finding no force in front of them, the combined troops of French, Rundle, and Chermside occupied Duetsdorp where the latter remained, while the others pushed on to the Bantu, the storm center from which all our troubles had begun nearly a month before. All the way they knew that de Wet's retreating army was just in front of them, and they knew also that a force had been sent out from Bloemfontein to the Bantu to head off the Boers. Lord Roberts might naturally suppose, when he had formed two cordons through which de Wet must pass, that one or other must hold him. But with extraordinary skill and mobility De Wet, aided by the fact that every inhabitant was a member of his intelligence department, slipped through the double net which had been laid for him. The first net was not in its place in time, and the second was too small to hold him. While Rundle and French had advanced on Duet Storp as described, the other force which was intended to head off De Wet had gone direct to the Bantu. The advance began by a movement of Ian Hamilton on April 22 with 800 mounted infantry upon the waterworks. The enemy, who held the hills beyond, allowed Hamilton's force to come right down to the modder before they opened fire from three guns. The mounted infantry fell back, and encamped for the night out of range. Footnote, this was a remarkable exhibition of the harmlessness of shell fire against troops in open formation. I myself saw at least forty shells, all of which burst, fall among the ranks of the mounted infantry, who retired at a contemptuous walk. There were no casualties, before morning they were reinforced by Smith Doyen's brigade, Gordon's, Canadians, and Shropshire's the Cornwalls had been left behind, and some more mounted infantry. With daylight a fine advance was begun the brigade moving up in very extended order and the mounted men turning the right flank of the defence. By evening we had regained the waterworks, a most important point for Blow Enfantine, and we held all the line of hills which command it. This strong position would not have been gained so easily if it had not been for Pole Carew's and French's actions two days before, on their way to join Rundle, which enabled them to turn it from the south. Ian Hamilton, who had already done good service in the war, having commanded the infantry at Elanslagd, and been one of the most prominent leaders in the defence of Ladysmith, takes from this time onwards a more important and a more independent position. A thin, aquiline man, of soft voice and gentle manners, 
he had already proved more than once during his adventurous career that he not only possessed in a high degree the courage of the soldier, but also the equanimity and decision of the born leader. A languid elegance in his bearing covered a shrewd brain and a soul of fire. A distorted and half-paralyzed hand reminded the observer that Hamilton, as a young lieutenant, had known at Majuba what it was to face the Boer rifles. Now, in his forty-seventh year, he had returned, matured and formidable, to reverse the results of that first deplorable campaign. This was the man to whom Lord Roberts had entrusted the command of that powerful flanking column which was eventually to form the right wing of his main advance. Being reinforced upon the morning after the capture of the waterworks by the Highland Brigade, the Cornwalls, and two heavy naval guns, his whole force amounted to not less than 7,000 men. From these he detached a garrison for the waterworks, and with the rest he continued his march over the hilly country which lies between them and Abantu. One position, Israel's port, a neck between two hills, was held against them on April 25th but was gained without much trouble, the Canadians losing one killed and two wounded. Colonel Otter, their gallant leader, was one of the latter, while Marshall's horse, a colonial corps raised in Gramstown, had no fewer than seven of their officers and several men killed or wounded. Next morning the town of Abinchu was seized, and Hamilton found himself upon the direct line of the Boer retreat. He seized the pass which commands the road and all next day he waited eagerly, and the hearts of his men beat high when at last they saw a long trail of dust winding up to them from the south. At last the wily de wet had been headed off. Deep and earnest were the curses when out of the dust there emerged a khaki column of horsemen, and it was realized that this was French's pursuing force, closely followed by Rundle's infantry from Duet's Dorp. The Boers had slipped round and were already to the north of us. It is impossible to withhold our admiration for the way in which the Boer force was maneuvered throughout this portion of the campaign. The mixture of circumspection and audacity, the way in which French and Rundle were hindered until the weapon of force had disengaged itself, the manner in which these covering forces were then withdrawn, and finally the clever way in which they all slipped past Hamilton make a brilliant bit of strategy. Louis Boter, the generalissimo, held all the strings in his hand, and the way in which he pulled them showed that his countrymen had chosen the right man for that high office, and that his was a master spirit even among those fine natural warriors who led the separate commandos. Having got to the north of the British forces Boter made no effort to get away, and refused to be hustled by a reconnaissance developing into an attack which French made upon April 27. In a skirmish the night before Kitchener's horse had lost fourteen men, and the action of the 27th cost us about as many casualties. It served to show that the Boer force was a compact body some six or seven thousand strong, which withdrew in a leisurely fashion, and took up a defensive position at Houtnick, some miles further on. French remained at Abantu, from which he afterwards joined Lord Robert's advance while Hamilton now assumed complete command of the flanking column, with which he proceeded to march north upon Winburg. The Houtnick position is dominated upon the left of the advancing British force by Thobber Mountain, and it was this point which was the centre of Hamilton's attack. It was most gallantly seized by Kitchener's horse, who were quickly supported by Smith Doyen's men. The mountain became the scene of a brisk action, and night fell before the crest was cleared. At dawn upon May 1st the fighting was resumed, and the position was carried by a determined advance of the Shropshires, the Canadians, and the Gordons, the Boers escaping down the reverse slope of the hill came under a heavy fire of our infantry, and fifty of them were wounded or taken. It was in this action, during the fighting on the hill, that Captain Toes, of the Gordons, though shot through the eyes and totally blind encouraged his men to charge through a group of the enemy who had gathered round them. After this victory Hamilton's men, who had fought for seven days out of ten, halted for a rest at Jacob's Rust, where they were joined by Broadwood's cavalry and Bruce Hamilton's infantry brigade. Ian Hamilton's column now contained two infantry brigades, Smith Doyen's and Bruce Hamilton's, Ridley's mounted infantry, Broadwood's cavalry brigade, 
five batteries of artillery, two heavy guns, altogether 13,000 men. With this force in constant touch with boat as rear guard, Ian Hamilton pushed on once more on May 4. On May 5 he fought a brisk cavalry skirmish, in which Kitchener's horse and the 12th Lancers distinguished themselves, and on the same day he took possession of Winburg, thus covering the right of Lord Roberts's great advance. The distribution of the troops on the eastern side of the Free State was, at the time of this the final advance of the main army, as follows Ian Hamilton with his mounted infantry, Smith Doyen's brigade, Macdonald's brigade, Bruce Hamilton's brigade, and Broadwood's cavalry were at Winburg. Rundle was at Abenchu, and Brabant's colonial division was moving up to the same point. Chermside was at Duet's Dorp, and had detached a force under Lord Castletown to garrison Weaponer. Hart occupied Smithfield, whence he and his brigade were shortly to be transferred to the Kimberley force. Altogether there could not have been fewer than 30,000 men engaged in clearing and holding down this part of the country. French's cavalry and Paul Carew's division had returned to take part in the central advance. Before entering upon a description of that great and decisive movement, one small action calls for comment. This was the cutting off of 20 men of Lumsden's horse in a reconnaissance at Carew. The small post under Lieutenant Crane found themselves by some misunderstanding isolated in the midst of the enemy. Refusing to hoist the flag of shame, they fought their way out, losing half their number, while of the other half it is said that there was not one who could not show bullet marks upon his clothes or person. The men of this corps, volunteer Anglo-Indians, had abandoned the ease and even luxury of Eastern life for the hard fare and rough fighting of this most trying campaign. Incoming they had set the whole empire an object lesson in spirit, and now on their first field they set the army an example of military virtue. The proud traditions of our Dram's volunteers have been upheld by the men of Lumsden's horse. Another minor action which cannot be ignored is the defence of a convoy on April 29th by the Derbyshire Yeomanry, Major Dugdale, and a company of the Scots Guards. The wagons were on their way to Rundell when they were attacked at a point about ten miles west of Thabanchu. The small guard beat off their assailants in the most gallant fashion, and held their own until relieved by Brabazon upon the following morning. This phase of the war was marked by a certain change in the temper of the British. Nothing could have been milder than the original intentions and proclamations of Lord Roberts and he was most ably seconded in his attempts at conciliation by General Britiman, who had been made civil administrator of the state. There was evidence, however, that this kindness had been construed as weakness by some of the burghers, and during the Boer incursion to weapon many who had surrendered a worthless firearm reappeared with the Morsa which had been concealed in some crafty hiding place. Troops were fired at from farmhouses which flew the white flag and the good housewife remained behind to charge the runic extortionate prices for milk and fodder while her husband shot at him from the hills. It was felt that the burghers might have peace or might have war, but could not have both simultaneously. Some examples were made therefore of offending farmhouses, and stock was confiscated where there was evidence of double dealing upon the part of the owner. In a country where property is a more serious thing than life, these measures, together with more stringent rules about the possession of horses and arms, did much to stamp out the chances of an insurrection in our ear. The worst sort of peace is an enforced peace, but if that can be established time and justice may do the rest. The operations which have been here described may be finally summed up in one short paragraph. A Boer army came south of the British line and besieged a British garrison. Three British forces, those of French, Rundle, and Ian Hamilton, were dispatched to cut it off. It successfully threaded its way among them and escaped. It was followed to the northward as far as the town of Winburg, which remained in the British possession. Lord Roberts had failed in his plan of cutting off De Wet's army, but, at the expense of many marches and skirmishes, the southeast of the state was cleared of the enemy. Chapter 24. The Siege of Mafeking. This small place, which sprang in the course of a few weeks from obscurity to fame, is situated upon the long line of railway which connects Kimberley in the south with Rhodesia in the north. 
in character it resembles one of those western american townlets which possess small present assets but immense aspirations in its litter of corrugated iron roofs and in the church and the race course which are the first fruits everywhere of anglo-celtic civilization one sees the seeds of the great city of the future it is the obvious depot for the western transvaal upon one side and the starting point for all attempts upon the kalahari desert upon the other the transvaal border runs within a few miles dot it is not clear why the imperial authorities should desire to hold this place since it has no natural advantages to help the defense but lies exposed in a wide spread plain a glance at the map must show that the railway line would surely be cut both to the north and south of the town and the garrison isolated at a point some 250 miles from any reinforcements considering that the boers could throw any strength of men or guns against the place it seemed certain that if they seriously desired to take possession of it they could do so under ordinary circumstances any force shut up there was doomed to capture but what may have seemed short-sighted policy became the highest wisdom owing to the extraordinary tenacity and resource of baden powell the officer in command through his exertions the town acted as a bait to the boers and occupied a considerable force in a useless siege at a time when their presence at other seats of war might have proved disastrous to the british cause dot colonel baden powell is a soldier of a type which is exceedingly popular with the british public a skilled hunter and an expert at many games there was always something of the sportsman in his keen appreciation of war in the matable campaign he had outscouted the savage scouts and found his pleasure in tracking them among their native mountains often alone in the night trusting to his skill in springing from rock to rock in his rubber soled shoes to save him from their pursuit there was a brain quality in his bravery which is rare among our officers full of veldcraft and resource it was as difficult to outwit as it was to outfight him but there was another curious side to his complex nature the french have said of one of their heroes il avait cet grain de folie dans sa bravoure la france aimant and the words might have been written of powell an impish humor broke out in him and the mischievous schoolboy alternated with the warrior and the administrator he met the boer commandos with chaff and jokes which were as disconcerting as his wire entanglements and his rifle pits the amazing variety of his personal accomplishments was one of his most striking characteristics from drawing caricatures with both hands simultaneously or skirt dancing to leading a forlorn hope nothing came amiss to him and he had that magnetic quality by which the leader imparts something of his virtues to his men such was the man who held mafeking for the queen dot in a very early stage before the formal declaration of war the enemy had massed several commandos upon the western border the men being drawn from zerust rosenberg and lichtenberg baden powell with the aid of an excellent group of special officers who included colonel gould adams lord edward cecil the soldier son of england's premier and colonel hoare had done all that was possible to put the place into a state of defense in this he had immense assistance from benjamin vile a well-known south african contractor who had shown great energy in provisioning the town on the other hand the south african government displayed the same stupidity or treason which had been exhibited in the case of kimberley and had met all demands for guns and reinforcements with foolish doubts as to the need of such precautions in the endeavor to supply these pressing wants the first small disaster of the campaign was encountered on october 12th the day after the declaration of war an armored train conveying two seven pounders for the mafeking defenses was derailed and captured by a boer raiding party at kraipan a place 40 miles south of their destination the enemy shelled the shattered train until after 5 hours captain nesbit who was in command and his men some 20 in number surrendered it was a small affair but it derived importance from being the first bloodshed and the first tactical success of the war dot the garrison of the town whose fame will certainly live in the history of south africa contained no regular soldiers at all with the exception of the small group of excellent officers they consisted of irregular troops 340 of the protectorate regiment 170 police 
and 200 volunteers, made up of that singular mixture of adventurers, younger sons, broken gentlemen, and irresponsible sportsmen who have always been the vortrekkers of the British Empire. These men were of the same stamp as those other admirable bodies of natural fighters who did so well in Rhodesia, in Natal, and in the Cape. With them there was associated in the defence the town guard, who included the able-bodied shopkeepers, businessmen, and residents, the whole amounting to about 900 men. Their artillery was feeble in the extreme, two seven-pounder toy guns and six machine guns but the spirit of the men and the resource of their leaders made up for every disadvantage. Colonel Vivian and Major Panzer planned the defences, and the little trading town soon began to take on the appearance of a fortress. On October 13 the Boers appeared before Mafeking. On the same day Colonel Baden Powell sent two truckloads of dynamite out of the place. They were fired into by the invaders, with the result that they exploded. On October 14 the pickets around the town were driven in by the Boers. On this the armoured train and a squadron of the Protectorate Regiment went out to support the pickets and drove the Boers before them. A body of the Latu doubled back and interposed between the British and Maffa King, but two fresh troops with a seven-pounder throwing shrapnel drove them off. In this spirited little action the garrison lost two killed and fourteen wounded but they inflicted considerable damage on the enemy. To Captain Williams, Captain Fitzclarence, and Lord Charles Bentinck great credit is due for the way in which they handled their men, but the whole affair was ill-advised, for if a disaster had occurred Mafeking must have fallen, being left without a garrison. No possible results which could come from such a sortie could justify the risk which was run. On October 16 the siege began in earnest. On that date the Boers brought up two 12-pounder guns, and the first of that interminable flight of shells fell into the town. The enemy got possession of the water supply, but the garrison had already dug wells. Before October 20 5,000 Boers, under the formidable Cronge, had gathered round the town. Surrender to avoid bloodshed was his message. When is the bloodshed going to begin? asked Powell. When the Boers had been shelling the town for some weeks the light-hearted colonel sent out to say that if they went on any longer he should be compelled to regard it as equivalent to a declaration of war. It is to be hoped that Cronge also possessed some sense of humour, or else he must have been as sorely puzzled by his eccentric opponent as the Spanish generals were by the vagaries of Lord Peterborough. Among the many difficulties which had to be met by the defenders of the town the most serious was the fact that the position had a circumference of five or six miles to be held by about one thousand men against a force who at their own time and their own place could at any moment attempt to gain a footing. An ingenious system of small forts was devised to meet the situation. Each of these held from ten to forty riflemen, and was furnished with bomb-proofs and covered ways. The central bomb-proof was connected by telephone with all the outlying ones, so as to save the use of orderlies. A system of bells was arranged by which each quarter of the town was warned when a shell was coming in time to enable the inhabitants to scuttle off to shelter. Every detail showed the ingenuity of the controlling mind. The armoured train painted green and tied round with scrub, stood unperceived among the clumps of bushes which surrounded the town. On October 24 a savage bombardment commenced, which lasted with intermissions for seven months. The Boers had brought an enormous gun across from Pretoria, throwing a 96-pound shell, and this, with many smaller pieces, played upon the town. The result was as futile as our own artillery fire has so often been when directed against the Boers. As the Mafeking guns were too weak to answer the enemy's fire, the only possible reply lay in a sortie, and upon this Colonel Powell decided. It was carried out with great gallantry on the evening of October 27, when about a hundred men under Captain Fitzclarence moved out against the Boer trenches with instructions to use the bayonet only. The position was carried with a rush and many of the Boers bayoneted before they could disengage themselves from the tarpaulins which covered them. The trenches behind fired wildly in the darkness, and it is probable that as many of their own men as of ours were hit by their rifle fire. 
The total loss in this gallant affair was six killed, eleven wounded, and two prisoners. The loss of the enemy, though shrouded as usual in darkness, was certainly very much higher. Dot on October 31st, the Boers ventured upon an attack on Cannon Cop, which is a small fort and eminence to the south of the town. It was defended by Colonel Walford, of the British South African Police, with 57 of his men and three small guns. The attack was repelled with heavy loss to the Boers. The British casualties were six killed and five wounded. Their experience in this attack seems to have determined the Boers to make no further expensive attempts to rush the town, and for some weeks the siege degenerated into a blockade. Cronch had been recalled for more important work, and Commandant Snyman had taken over the uncompleted task. From time to time the great gun tossed its huge shells into the town, but boardwood walls and corrugated iron roofs minimized the dangers of a bombardment. On November 3rd the garrison rushed the brickfields, which had been held by the enemy's sharpshooters, and on the 7th another small sally kept the game going. On the 18th Powell sent a message to Snyman that he could not take the town by sitting and looking at it. At the same time he dispatched a message to the Boer forces generally, advising them to return to their homes and their families. Some of the commandos had gone south to assist Cronje in his stand against Methuen, and the siege languished more and more, until it was woken up by a desperate sortie on December 26, which caused the greatest loss which the garrison had sustained. Once more the lesson was to be enforced that with modern weapons and equality of forces it is always long odds on the defense. On this date a vigorous attack was made upon one of the Boer forts on the north. There seems to be little doubt that the enemy had some inkling of our intention, as the fort was found to have been so strengthened as to be impregnable without scaling ladders. The attacking force consisted of two squadrons of the Protectorate Regiment and one of the Bequinelland Rifles backed up by three guns. So desperate was the onslaught that of the actual attacking party a forlorn hope, if ever there was one 53 out of 80 were killed and wounded, 25 of the former and 28 of the latter. Several of that gallant band of officers who had been the soul of the defense were among the injured. Captain Fitz Clarence was wounded, Vernon, Sandford, and Patton were killed, all at the very muzzles of the enemy's guns. It must have been one of the bitterest moments of Baden Powell's life when he shut his field glass and said, let the ambulance go out. Even this heavy blow did not damp the spirits nor diminish the energies of the defense, though it must have warned Baden Powell that he could not afford to drain his small force by any more expensive attempts at the offensive, and that from then onwards he must content himself by holding grimly on until Plumer from the north or Methuen from the south should at last be able to stretch out to him a helping hand. Vigilant and indomitable, throwing away no possible point in the game which he was playing, the new year found him and his hardy garrison sternly determined to keep the flag flying. January and February offer in their records that monotony of excitement which is the fate of every besieged town. On one day the shelling was a little more, on another a little less. Sometimes they escaped scatheless, sometimes the garrison found itself the poorer by the loss of Captain Girdwood or Trooper Webb or some other gallant soldier. Occasionally they had their little triumph when a too curious Dutchman, peering for an instant from his cover to see the effect of his shot, was carried back in the ambulance to the ledger. On Sunday a truce was usually observed and the snipers who had exchanged rifle shots all the week met occasionally on that day with good-humoured chaff. Snyman, the Boer general, showed none of that chivalry at Mafeking which distinguished the gallant old Jew but at Lady Smith. Not only was there no neutral camp for women or sick, but it is beyond all doubt or question that the Boer guns were deliberately turned upon the women's quarters inside Mafeking in order to bring pressure upon the inhabitants. Many women and children were sacrificed to this brutal policy, which must in fairness be set to the account of the savage leader, and not of the rough but kindly folk with whom we were fighting. In every race there are individual ruffians, and it would be a political mistake to allow our action to be influenced or our feelings permanently embittered by their crimes. It is from the man himself, and not from his country 
that an account should be exacted. The garrison, in the face of increasing losses and decreasing food, lost none of the high spirits which it reflected from its commander. The program of a single day of Jubilee Heaven only knows what they had to hold Jubilee over shows a cricket match in the morning, sports in the afternoon, a concert in the evening, and a dance, given by the bachelor officers, to wind up. Baden Powell himself seems to have descended from the eerie from which, like a captain on the bridge, he rang bells and telephoned orders, to bring the house down with a comic song and a humorous recitation. The ball went admirably, save that there was an interval to repel an attack which disarranged the program. Sports were zealously cultivated, and the grimy inhabitants of casemates and trenches were pitted against each other at cricket or football. Footnote, Sunday cricket so shocked Snyman that he threatened to fire upon it if it were continued, the monotony was broken by the occasional visits of a postman, who appeared or vanished from the vast barren lands to the west of the town, which could not all be guarded by the besiegers. Sometimes a few words from home came to cheer the hearts of the exiles, and could be returned by the same uncertain and expensive means. The documents which found their way up were not always of an essential or even of a welcome character. At least one man received an unpaid bill from an angry tailor. In one particular, Mafeking had, with much smaller resources, rivaled Kimberley. An ordnance factory had been started, formed in the railway workshops, and conducted by Kinley and Clullan, of the locomotive department. Daniels, of the police supplemented their efforts by making both powder and fuses. The factory turned out shells, and eventually constructed a 5.5-inch smoothbore gun, which threw a round shell with great accuracy to a considerable range. April found the garrison, in spite of all losses, as efficient and as resolute as it had been in October. So close were the advanced trenches upon either side that both parties had recourse to the old-fashioned hand grenades thrown by the Boers, and cast on a fishing line by ingenious Sergeant Page, of the Protectorate Regiment. Sometimes the besiegers and the number of guns diminished, forces being detached to prevent the advance of Plumer's relieving column from the north, but as those who remained held their forts, which it was beyond the power of the British to storm, the garrison was now much the better for the alleviation. Putting Mafeking for Ladysmith and Pluma for Buller, the situation was not unlike that which had existed in Natal. At this point, some account might be given of the doings of that northern force whose situation was so remote that even the ubiquitous correspondent hardly appears to have reached it. No doubt the book will eventually make up for the neglect of the journal, but some short facts may be given here of the Rhodesian column. Their action did not affect the course of the war but they clung like bulldogs to a most difficult task, and eventually, when strengthened by the relieving column, made their way to Mafeking. The force was originally raised for the purpose of defending Rhodesia, and it consisted of fine material pioneers, farmers, and miners from the great new land which had been added through the energy of Mr. Rhodes to the British Empire. Many of the men were veterans of the native wars, and all were imbued with a hardy and adventurous spirit. On the other hand, the men of the northern and western Transvaal, whom they were called upon to face the burghers of Watersburg and Zoutpansburg, were tough frontiersmen living in a land where a dinner was shot, not bought. Shaggy, hairy, half-savage men, handling a rifle as a medieval Englishman handled a bow, and skilled in every while of veldt craft. They were as formidable opponents as the world could show. On the war breaking out, the first thought of the leaders in Rhodesia was to save as much of the line which was their connection through Mafeking with the south as was possible. For this purpose, an armoured train was dispatched only three days after the expiration of the ultimatum to the point 400 miles south of Bulawayo, where the frontiers of the Transvaal and of Bequinelland join. Colonel Holdsworth commanded the small British force. The Boers, a thousand or so in number, had descended upon the railway, and an action followed in which the train appears to have had better luck than has usually attended these ill-fated contrivances. The Boer commando was driven back and a number were killed. It was probably news of this affair, and not anything which had occurred at Mafeking, 
which caused those rumors of gloom at Pretoria very shortly after the outbreak of hostilities. An agency telegraphed that women were weeping in the streets of the Boer capital. We had not then realized how soon and how often we should see the same sight in Paul Mall. The adventurous armored train pressed on as far as Lobatsi, where it found the bridges destroyed, so it returned to its original position, having another brush with the Boer commandos, and again, in some marvelous way, escaping its obvious fate. From then until the new year the line was kept open by an admirable system of patrolling to within a hundred miles or so of Mafeking. An aggressive spirit and a power of dashing initiative were shown in the British operations at this side of the scene of war such as have too often been absent elsewhere. At Sekwani, on November 24, a considerable success was gained by a surprise planned and carried out by Colonel Holdsworth. The Bolliger was approached and attacked in the early morning by a force of 120 frontiersmen, and so effective was their fire that the Boers estimated their numbers at several thousand. Thirty Boers were killed or wounded, and the rest scattered. While the railway line was held in this way, there had been some skirmishing also on the northern frontier of the Transvaal. Shortly after the outbreak of the war, the gallant Blackburn, scouting with six comrades in thick bush, found himself in the presence of a considerable commando. The British concealed themselves by the path, but Blackburn's foot was seen by a keen-eyed Kaffir, who pointed it out to his masters. A sudden volley riddled Blackburn with bullets, but his men stayed by him and drove off the enemy. Blackburn dictated an official report of the action, and then died. In the same region a small force under Captain Hare was cut off by a body of boars. Of the twenty men most got away, but the chaplain J. W. Leary, Lieutenant Hazeric, who behaved with admirable gallantry, and six men were taken. Footnote, Mr. Leary was wounded in the foot by a shell. The German artillerist entered the hut in which he lay. Here's a bit of your work. Said Leary good-humouredly. I wish it had been worse, said the amiable German gunner, the commando which attacked this party and on the same day Colonel Spreckley's force, was a powerful one, with several guns. No doubt it was organized because there were fears among the Boers that they would be invaded from the north. When it was understood that the British intended no large aggressive movement in that quarter, these burghers joined other commandos. Sir Lilof, who was one of the leaders of this northern force, was afterwards taken at Mafeking. Colonel Plumer had taken command of the small army which was now operating from the north along the railway line with Mafeking for its objective. Plumer is an officer of considerable experience in African warfare, a small, quiet, resolute man, with a knack of gently enforcing discipline upon the very rough material with which he had to deal. With his weak force which never exceeded a thousand men and was usually from six to seven hundred he had to keep the long line behind him open, build up the ruined railway in front of him, and gradually creep onwards in face of a formidable and enterprising enemy. For a long time Gabarans, which is eighty miles north of Mafeking, remained his headquarters, and thence he kept up precarious communications with the besieged garrison. In the middle of March he advanced as far south as Lobatsi which is less than fifty miles from Mafeking, but the enemy proved to be too strong, and Plumer had to drop back again with some loss to his original position at Gabarans. Sticking doggedly to his task, Plumer again came south, and this time made his way as far as Rimathlabama, within a day's march of Mafeking. He had with him, however, only three hundred and fifty men, and had he pushed through the effect might have been an addition of hungry men to the garrison. The relieving force was fiercely attacked, however, by the Boers and driven back onto their camp with a loss of twelve killed, twenty-six wounded, and fourteen missing. Some of the British were dismounted men, and it says much for Plumer's conduct of the fight that he was able to extricate these safely from the midst of an aggressive mounted enemy. Personally he set an admirable example, sending away his own horse, and walking with his rearmost soldiers. Captain Crew Robertson and Lieutenant Milligan, the famous Yorkshire cricketer, were killed, and Rolt, Jarvis, McLaren, and Plumer himself were wounded. The Rhodesian force withdrew again to Nilobatsi, 
and collected itself for yet another effort. In the meantime, Mafeking abandoned, as it seemed, to its fate was still as formidable as a wounded lion. Far from weakening in its defense, it became more aggressive, and so persistent and skillful were its riflemen that the big boar gun had again and again to be moved further from the town. Six months of trenches and rifle pits had turned every inhabitant into a veteran. Now and then words of praise and encouragement came to them from without. Once it was a special message from the Queen, once a promise of relief from Lord Roberts. But the rails which led to England were overgrown with grass, and their brave hearts yearned for the sight of their countrymen and for the sound of their voices. How long, O oh Lord, how long? was the cry which was wrung from them in their solitude. But the flag was still held high. April was a trying month for the defence. They knew that Methuen, who had advanced as far as fourteen streams upon the Val River, had retired again upon Kimberley. They knew also that Plumer's force had been weakened by the repulse at Ramathlebama, and that many of his men were down with fever. Six weary months had this village withstood the pitiless pelt of rifle, bullet, and shell. Help seemed as far away from them as ever. But if troubles may be allayed by sympathy, then theirs should have lain lightly. The attention of the whole empire had centered upon them, and even the advance of Roberts's army became secondary to the fate of this gallant struggling handful of men who had upheld the flag so long. On the continent also their resistance attracted the utmost interest, and the numerous journals there who find the imaginative writer cheaper than the war correspondent announced their capture periodically as they had once done that of Ladysmith. From a mere tin roofed village, Mafeking had become a prize of victory a stake which should be the visible sign of the predominating manhood of one or other of the great white races of South Africa. Unconscious of the keenness of the emotions which they had aroused, the garrison manufactured brawn from horsehide, and captured locusts as a relish for their luncheons, while in the shot-torn billiard room of the club an open tournament was started to fill in their hours off duty. But their vigilance, and that of the hawk-eyed man up in the conning tower, never relaxed. The besiegers had increased in number, and their guns were more numerous than before. Our less acute man than Barden Powell might have reasoned that at least one desperate effort would be made by them to carry the town before relief could come. On Saturday, May 12, the attack was made at the favorite hour of the bother first grey of the morning. It was gallantly delivered by about 300 volunteers under the command of Eloff who had crept round to the west of the town the side furthest from the lines of the besiegers. At the first rush they penetrated into the native quarter, which was at once set on fire by them. The first building of any size upon that side is the barracks of the Protectorate Regiment, which was held by Colonel Hoare and about twenty of his officers and men. This was carried by the enemy who sent an exultant message along the telephone to Barden Powell to tell him that they had got it two other positions within the lines, one a stone kraal and the other a hill, were held by the Boers, but their supports were slow in coming on, and the movements of the defenders were so prompt and energetic that all three found themselves isolated and cut off from their own lines. They had penetrated the town, but they were as far as ever from having taken it. All day the British forces drew their cordon closer and closer round the Boer positions, making no attempt to rush them, but ringing them round in such a way that there could be no escape for them. A few burghers slipped away in twos and threes, but the main body found that they had rushed into a prison from which the only egress was swept with rifle fire. At seven o'clock in the evening they recognized that their position was hopeless, and Eloff with 117 men laid down their arms. Their losses had been ten killed and nineteen wounded. For some reason, either of lethargy, cowardice, or treachery, Snyman had not brought up the supports which might conceivably have altered the result. It was a gallant attack gallantly met, and for once the greater wiliness in fight was shown by the British. The end was characteristic. Good evening, Commandant, said Powell to Eloff, won't you come in and have some dinner? The prisoners burghers, Hollanders, Germans, and Frenchmen were treated to as good a supper as the destitute larders of the town could furnish. So, in a small blaze of glory, ended the historic siege of Mafeking.
for Elof's attack was the last, though by no means the worst of the trials which the garrison had to face. Six killed and ten wounded were the British losses in this admirably managed affair. On May 17, five days after the fight, the relieving force arrived, the besiegers were scattered, and the long imprisoned garrison were free men once more. Many who had looked at their maps and saw this post isolated in the very heart of Africa had despaired of ever reaching their heroic fellow countrymen, and now one universal outbreak of joy bells and bonfires from Toronto to Melbourne proclaimed that there is no spot so inaccessible that the long arm of the empire cannot reach it when her children are in peril. Colonel Mann, a young Irish officer who had made his reputation as a cavalry leader in Egypt, had started early in May from Kimberley with a small but mobile force consisting of the Imperial Light Horse, brought round from Natal for the purpose, the Kimberley Mounted Corps, the Diamond Fields Horse, some Imperial Yeomanry, a detachment of the Cape Police, and 100 volunteers from the Fusilier Brigade, with M Battery RHA and Pom Poms, 1200 men in all. Whilst Hunter was fighting his action at Rudam on May 4th, Man with his men struck round the western flank of the Boers and moved rapidly to the northwards. On May 11 they had left Vryberg, the halfway house, behind them, having done 120 miles in five days. They pushed on, encountering no opposition save that of nature, though they knew that they were being closely watched by the enemy. At Kuda's Rand it was found that a Boer force was in position in front but Mann avoided them by turning somewhat to the westward. His detour took him, however, into a bushy country, and here the enemy headed him off, opening fire at short range upon the ubiquitous imperial light horse, who led the column. A short engagement ensued, in which the casualties amounted to thirty killed and wounded, but which ended in the defeat and dispersal of the Boers, whose force was certainly very much weaker than the British. On May 15 the relieving column arrived without further opposition at Masibistat, 20 miles to the west of Mafeking. In the meantime Pluma's force upon the north had been strengthened by the addition of sea battery of four 12-pounder guns of the Canadian artillery under Major Rudin and a body of Queenslanders. These forces had been part of the small army which had come with General Carrington through Bra, and after a detour of thousands of miles through their own wonderful energy they had arrived in time to form portion of the relieving column. Foreign military critics, whose experience of warfare is to move troops across a frontier, should think of what the Empire has to do before her men go into battle. These contingents had been assembled by long railway journeys, conveyed across thousands of miles of ocean to Cape Town, brought round another 2,000 or so to Bra, transferred by a narrow gauge railway to Bamboo Creek changed to a broader gauge to Mirandlers, sent on in coaches for hundreds of miles to Bulawayo, transferred to trains for another four or five hundred miles to Oatsi, and had finally a forced march of a hundred miles, which brought them up a few hours before their presence was urgently needed upon the field. Their advance, which averaged twenty-five miles a day on foot for four consecutive days over deplorable roads was one of the finest performances of the war. With these high-spirited reinforcements and with his own hardy Rhodesians Pluma pushed on, and the two columns reached the hamlet of Masibi Stat within an hour of each other. Their united strength was far superior to anything which Snyman's force could place against them. But the gallant and tenacious spores would not abandon their prey without a last effort. As the little army advanced upon Mafeking they found the enemy waiting in a strong position. For some hours the Boers gallantly held their ground, and their artillery fire was, as usual, most accurate. But our own guns were more numerous and equally well served, and the position was soon made untenable. The Boers retired past Mafeking and took refuge in the trenches upon the eastern side, but Baden Powell with his war-hardened garrison sallied out and, supported by the artillery fire of the relieving column, drove them from their shelter. With their usual admirable tactics their larger guns had been removed, but one small cannon was secured as a souvenir by the townsfolk, together with a number of wagons and a considerable quantity of supplies. 
a long rolling trail of dust upon the eastern horizon told that the famous siege of Mafeking had at last come to an end. So ended a singular incident. The defense of an open town which contained no regular soldiers and a most inadequate artillery against a numerous and enterprising enemy with very heavy guns. All honor to the townsfolk who bore their trials so long and so bravely and to the indomitable men who lined the trenches for seven weary months. Their constancy was of enormous value to the empire. In the all-important early month at least four or five thousand Boers were detained by them when their presence elsewhere would have been fatal. During all the rest of the war, two thousand men and eight guns, including one of the four big, grey usots, had been held there. It prevented the invasion of Rhodesia, and it gave a rallying point for loyal whites and natives in the huge stretch of country from Kimberley to Bulawayo. All this had, at a cost of two hundred lives, been done by this one devoted band of men, who killed, wounded, or took no fewer than one thousand of their opponents. Critics may say that the enthusiasm in the empire was excessive, but at least it was expended over worthy men and a fine deed of arms. Chapter 25. The march on Pretoria. In the early days of May, when the season of the rains was past and the veldt was green, Lord Roberts's six weeks of enforced inaction came to an end. He had gathered himself once more for one of those tiger springs which should be as sure and as irresistible as that which had brought him from Belmont to Blow Enfantine, or that other in olden days which had carried him from Kabul to Kandahar. His army had been decimated by sickness, and eight thousand men had passed into the hospitals, but those who were with the colours were of high heart, longing eagerly for action. Any change which would carry them away from the pester-ridden, evil-smelling capital which had revenged itself so terribly upon the invader must be a change for the better. Therefore it was with glad faces and brisk feet that the centre column left Blow Enfantine on May 1st, and streamed, with bands playing, along the northern road. On May 3rd the main force was assembled at Karee, twenty miles upon their way. Two hundred and twenty separated them from Pretoria, but in little more than a month from the day of starting, in spite of broken railway, a succession of rivers, and the opposition of the enemy, this army was marching into the main street of the Transvaal capital. Had there been no enemy there at all, it would still have been a fine performance. The more so when one remembers that the army was moving upon a front of twenty miles or more, each part of which had to be coordinated to the rest. It is with the story of this great march that the present chapter deals. Roberts had prepared the way by clearing out the southeastern corner of the state, and at the moment of his advance, his forces covered a semicircular front of about 40 miles, the right under Ian Hamilton near the Abantu, and the left at Karee. This was the broad net which was to be swept from south to north across the free state, gradually narrowing as it went. The conception was admirable and appears to have been an adoption of the Boers' own strategy, which had in turn been borrowed from the Zulus. The solid centre could hold any force which faced it, while the mobile flanks, Hutton upon the left and Hamilton upon the right, could lap round and pin it, as Kronge was pinned at Paderberg. It seems admirably simple when done upon a small scale. But when the scale is one of forty miles, since your front must be broad enough to envelop the front which is opposed to it, and when the scattered wings have to be fed with no railway line to help, it takes such a master of administrative detail as Lord Kitchener to bring the operations to complete success. On May 3rd, the day of the advance from our most northern post, Curie, the disposition of Lord Roberts's army was briefly as follows. On his left was Hutton with his mixed force of mounted infantry drawn from every quarter of the empire. This formidable and mobile body, with some batteries of horse artillery and of pom-poms, kept a line a few miles to the west of the railroad, moving northwards parallel with it. Roberts's main column kept on the railroad, which was mended with extraordinary speed by the railway pioneer regiment and the engineers, under Girard and the ill-fated Seymour. It was amazing to note the shattered culverts as one passed, and yet to be overtaken by trains within a day. This main column consisted of Pole Carew's 11th Division, which contained the Guards, and Stevenson's Brigade, Woix, Essex, Welsh, and Yorkshires. 
with them were the 83rd, 84th, and 85th RFA, with the heavy guns, and a small force of mounted infantry. Passing along the widespread British line one would then, after an interval of seven or eight miles, come upon Tucker's division, the 7th, which consisted of Maxwell's brigade, formerly Chermside's the Norfolk's, Lincoln's, Hampshire's, and Scottish borderers, and Wavell's brigade, North Stafford's, Cheshire's, East Lancashire's, South Wales borderers. To the right of these was Ridley's mounted infantry. Beyond them, extending over very many miles of country and with considerable spaces between, the came Broadwood's cavalry, Bruce Hamilton's brigade, Derbyshire's, Sussex, Cameron's, and C.I.V., and finally on the extreme right of Orlean Hamilton's force of Highlanders, Canadians, Shropshires, and Cornwalls, with cavalry and mounted infantry, starting forty miles from Lord Roberts, but edging westwards all the way, to merge with the troops next to it, and to occupy Winburg in the way already described. This was the army, between forty and fifty thousand strong, with which Lord Roberts advanced upon the Transvaal. In the meantime, he had anticipated that his mobile and enterprising opponents would work around and strike at our ear. Ample means had been provided for dealing with any attempt of the kind. Rundle with the 8th Division and Brabant's Colonial Division remained in rear of the right flank to confront any force which might turn it. At Blow Enfantine were Kelly Kenny's division, the 6th, and Chermsides, the 3rd, with a force of cavalry and guns. Methuen, working from Kimberley towards Boshoff, formed the extreme left wing of the main advance, though distant a hundred miles from it. With excellent judgment Lord Roberts saw that it was on our right flank that danger was to be feared, and here it was that every precaution had been taken to meet it. The objective of the first day's march was the little town of Brandfoot, ten miles north of Curie. The head of the main column faced it, while the left arm swept round and drove the Boer force from their position. Tucker's division upon the right encountered some opposition, but overbore it with artillery. May 4th was a day of rest for the infantry, but on the 5th they advanced, in the same order as before, for 20 miles, and found themselves to the south of the Vet River, where the enemy had prepared for an energetic resistance. A vigorous artillery duel ensued the British guns in the open as usual against an invisible enemy. After three hours of a very hot fire the mounted infantry got across the river upon the left and turned the ball flank, on which they hastily withdrew. The first lodgment was effected by two bodies of Canadians and New Zealanders, who were energetically supported by Captain Anley's third mounted infantry. The rushing of a cop by 23 West Australians was another gallant incident which marked this engagement, in which our losses were insignificant. A maxim and 20 or 30 prisoners were taken by Hutton's men. The next day, May 6, the army moved across the difficult drift of the Vet River, and halted that night at Smildeal, some five miles to the north of it. At the same time Ian Hamilton had been able to advance to Winburg so that the army had contracted its front by about half, but had preserved its relative positions. Hamilton, after his junction with his reinforcements at Jacob's Rust, had under him so powerful a force that he overbore all resistance. His actions between the Abenchu and Winburg had cost the Boers heavy loss, and in one action the German legion had been overthrown. The informal warfare which was made upon us by citizens of many nations without rebuke from their own governments is a matter of which pride, and possibly policy, have forbidden us to complain, but it will be surprising if it does not prove that their laxity has established a very dangerous precedent, and they will find it difficult to object when, in the next little war in which either France or Germany is engaged they find a few hundred British adventurers carrying a rifle against them. The record of the army's advance is now rather geographical than military, for it rolled northwards with never a check save that which was caused by the construction of the railway diversions which atoned for the destruction of the larger bridges. The infantry now, as always in the campaign, 
marched excellently, for though twenty miles in the day may seem a moderate allowance to a healthy man upon an English road, it is a considerable performance under an African sun with a weight of between thirty and forty pounds to be carried. The good humor of the men was admirable, and they eagerly longed to close with the elusive enemy who flitted ever in front of them. Huge clouds of smoke veiled the northern sky, for the Boers had set fire to the dry grass, partly to cover their own retreat, and partly to show up our khaki upon the blackened surface. Far on the flanks the twinkling heliographs revealed the position of their widespread wings. On May 10 Lord Roberts's force, which had halted for three days at Smaldeel, moved onwards to Welgeljan. French's cavalry had come up by road, and quickly strengthened the center and left wing of the army. On the morning of the 10th the invaders found themselves confronted by a formidable position which the Boers had taken up on the northern bank of the Sand River. Their army extended over 20 miles of country, the two Bothers were in command, and everything pointed to a pitched battle. Had the position been rushed from the front, there was every material for a second colon so, but the British had learned that it was by brains rather than by blood that such battles may be won. French's cavalry turned the Boers on one side, and Bruce Hamilton's infantry on the other. Theoretically we never passed the Boer flanks, but practically their line was so overextended that we were able to pierce it at any point. There was never any severe fighting, but rather a steady advance upon the British side and a steady retirement upon that of the Boers. On the left the Sussex regiment distinguished itself by the dash with which it stormed an important cop. The losses were slight, save among a detached body of cavalry which found itself suddenly cut off by a strong force of the enemy and lost Captain Elworthy killed, and Haig of the Inniskings, Wilkinson of the Australian Horse, and twenty men prisoners. We also secured forty or fifty prisoners, and the enemy's casualties amounted to about as many more. The whole straggling action fought over a front as broad as from London to Woking cost the British at the most a couple of hundred casualties, and carried their army over the most formidable defensive position which they were to encounter. The war in its later phases certainly has the pleasing characteristic of being the most bloodless, considering the number of men engaged and the amount of powder burned, that has been known in history. It was at the expense of their boots and not of their lives that the infantry won their way. On May 11, Lord Roberts's army advanced 20 miles to Geneva siding, and every preparation was made for a battle next day, as it was thought certain that the Boers would defend their new capital, Kroonstad. It proved, however, that even here they would not make a stand, and on May 12, at one o'clock, Lord Roberts rode into the town. Stain boat uh, and Dowett escaped, and it was announced that the village of Lindley had become the new seat of government. The British had now accomplished half their journey to Pretoria, and it was obvious that on the south side of the Val no serious resistance awaited them. Burghers were freely surrendering themselves with their arms, and returning to their farms. In the southeast Rundle and Brabant were slowly advancing, while the Boers who faced them fell back towards Lindley. On the west, Hunter had crossed the valley at Windsorton, and Barton's Fusilier Brigade had fought a sharp action at Rudham, while Marne's Mafeking relief column had slipped past their flank, escaping the observation of the British public, but certainly not that of the Boers. The casualties in the Rudham action were nine killed and thirty wounded, but the advance of the Fusiliers was irresistible, and for once the Boer loss, as they were hustled from cop to cop appears to have been greater than that of the British. The yeomanry had an opportunity of showing once more that there are few more high-metalled troops in South Africa than these good sportsmen of the shires, who only showed a trace of their origin in their irresistible inclination to burst into a tally-ho. When ordered to attack, the Boer forces fell back after the action along the line of the Val, making for Christiana and Blow Emhoff. Hunter entered into the Transvaal in pursuit of them, being the first to cross the border, with the exception of raiding Rhodesians early in the war. Methuen, in the meanwhile, was following a course parallel to Hunter but south of him, Hoopstad being his immediate objective. The little Union Jacks which were stuck in the war maps in so many British households were now moving swiftly upwards. Buller's force was also sweeping northwards, 
and the time had come when the Lady Smith garrison, restored at last to health and strength, should have a chance of striking back at those who had tormented them so long. Many of the best troops had been drafted away to other portions of the seat of war. Hart's brigade and Barton's fusilier brigade had gone with Hunter to form the 10th division upon the Kimberley side, and the Imperial Light Horse had been brought over for the relief of Mafeking. There remained, however, a formidable force, the regiments in which had been strengthened by the addition of drafts and volunteers from home. Not less than 20,000 sabres and bayonets were ready and eager for the passage of the Biggersburg Mountains. This line of rugged hills is pierced by only three passes, each of which was held in strength by the enemy. Considerable losses must have ensued from any direct attempt to force them. Buller, however, with excellent judgment, demonstrated in front of them with Hildyard's men, while the rest of the army, marching round, outflanked the line of resistance and on May 15 pounced upon Dundee. Much had happened since that October day when Penn Simmons led his three gallant regiments up Talana Hill, but now at last, after seven weary months, the ground was reoccupied which he had gained. His old soldiers visited his grave, and the national flag was raised over the remains of as gallant a man as ever died for the sake of it. The Boers, whose force did not exceed a few thousands were now rolled swiftly back through northern natal into their own country. The long strain at Ladysmith had told upon them, and the men whom we had to meet were very different from the warriors of Spion Cop and Nicholson's Nick. They had done magnificently, but there is a limit to human endurance, and no longer would these peasants face the bursting lydite and the bayonets of angry soldiers. There is little enough for us to boast of in this. Some pride might be taken in the campaign when at a disadvantage we were facing superior numbers, but now we could but deplore the situation in which these poor valiant burghers found themselves, the victims of a rotten government and of their own illusions. Hofer's Tyrolese, Charette's Vendians, or Bruce's Scotchmen never fought a finer fight than these children of the Velt, but in each case they combated a real and not an imaginary tyrant. It is heart sickening to think of the butchery, the misery, the irreparable losses, the blood of men, and the bitter tears of women, all of which might have been spared had one obstinate and ignorant man been persuaded to allow the state which he ruled to conform to the customs of every other civilized state upon the earth. Buller was now moving with a rapidity and decision which contrast pleasantly with some of his earlier operations. Although Dundee was only occupied on May 15th, on May 18 his vanguard was in Newcastle, 50 miles to the north. In nine days he had covered 138 miles. On the 19th the army lay under the loom of that Majuba which had cast its sinister shadow for so long over South African politics. In front was the historical Leinsnick, the pass which leads from Natal into the Transvaal, while through it runs the famous railway tunnel. Here the Boers had taken up that position which had proved nineteen years before to be too strong for British troops. The Runks had come back after many days to try again. A halt was called, for the ten days' supplies which had been taken with the troops were exhausted, and it was necessary to wait until the railway should be repaired. This gave time for Hildyard's 5th Division and Lyttelton's 4th Division to close up on Clary's 2nd Division which with Dundonald's cavalry had formed our vanguard throughout. The only losses of any consequence during this fine march fell upon a single squadron of Bethune's mounted infantry, which being thrown out in the direction of Ryde, in order to make sure that our flank was clear, fell into an ambuscade and was almost annihilated by a close-range fire. Sixty-six casualties, of which nearly half were killed, were the result of this action which seems to have depended, like most of our reverses, upon defective scouting. Buller, having called up his two remaining divisions and having mended the railway behind him, proceeded now to manoeuvre the Boers out of Leyen's neck exactly as he had manoeuvred them out of the Biggersburg. At the end of May Hildyard and Lyttelton were dispatched in an eastern direction, as if there were an intention of turning the pass from Utrecht. It was on May 12 that Lord Roberts occupied Kroonstad and he halted the for eight days before he resumed his advance. At the end of that time his railway had been repaired, 
and enough supplies brought up to enable him to advance again without anxiety. The country through which he passed swarmed with herds and flocks, but, with as scrupulous a regard for the rights of property as Wellington showed in the south of France, no hungry soldier was allowed to take so much as a chicken as he passed. The punishment for looting was prompt and stern. It is true that farms were burned occasionally and the stock confiscated, but this was as a punishment for some particular offence and not part of a system. The limping Tommy looked askance at the fat geese which covered the dam by the roadside, but it was as much as his life was worth to allow his fingers to close round those tempting white necks. On foul water and bully beef he tramped through a land of plenty. Lord Roberts's eight days halt was spent in consolidating the general military situation. We have already shown how Buller had crept upwards to the natal border. On the west Methian reached Hoopstad and Hunter Christiana, settling the country and collecting arms as they went. Rundell in the southeast took possession of the rich grain lands, and on May 21st entered Lady Brand. In front of him lay that difficult hilly country about Senecal, Fixburg, and Bethlehem which was to delay him so long. Ian Hamilton was feeling his way northwards to the right of the railway line, and for the moment cleared the district between Lindley and Heilbronn, passing through both towns and causing Stain to again change his capital, which became Vreed, in the extreme northeast of the state. During these operations Hamilton had the two formidable De Wet brothers in front of him, and suffered nearly a hundred casualties in the continual skirmishing which accompanied his advance. His right flank and rear were continually attacked, and these signs of forces outside our direct line of advance were full of menace for the future. On May 22 the main army resumed its advance, moving forward fifteen miles to Honing's Sprout. On the 23rd another march of 20 miles over a fine rolling prairie brought them to Renosta River. The enemy had made some preparations for a stand, but Hamilton was near Heilbronn upon their left and French was upon their right flank. The river was crossed without opposition. On the 24th the army was at Vredefort Road, and on the 26th the vanguard crossed the Val River at Viljones Drift, the whole army following on the 27th. Hamilton's force had been cleverly swung across from the right to the left flank of the British, so that the Boers were massed on the wrong side. Preparations for resistance had been made on the line of the railway, but the wide turning movements on the flanks by the indefatigable French and Hamilton rendered all opposition of no avail. The British columns flowed over and onwards without a pause, tramping steadily northwards to their destination. The bulk of the free state forces refused to leave their own country, and moved away to the eastern and northern portion of the state, where the British generals thought incorrectly, as the future was to prove that no further harm would come from them. The state which they were in arms to defend had really ceased to exist, for already it had been publicly proclaimed at Blow Enfantine in the Queen's name that the country had been annexed to the Empire and that its style henceforth was that of the Orange River Colony. Those who think this measure unduly harsh must remember that every mile of land which the Free Staters had conquered in the early part of the war had been solemnly annexed by them. At the same time, those Englishmen who knew the history of this state, which had once been the model of all that a state should be, were saddened by the thought that it should have deliberately committed suicide for the sake of one of the most corrupt governments which have ever been known. Had the Transvaal been governed as the Orange Free State was, such an event as the Second Boer War could never have occurred. Lord Roberts's tremendous march was now drawing to a close. On May 28 the troops advanced twenty miles, and passed Clip River without fighting. It was observed with surprise that the Transvaalers were very much more careful of their own property than they had been of that of their allies, and that the railway was not damaged at all by the retreating forces. The country had become more populous, and far away upon the low curves of the hills were seen high chimneys and gaunt iron pumps which struck the north of England soldier with a pang of homesickness. This long distant hill was the famous Rand and under its faded grasses lay such riches as Solomon never took from offer. It was the prize of victory, and yet the prize is not to the victor, for the dust-grimed officers and men looked with little personal interest at this treasure house of the world. 
not one penny the richer would they be for the fact that their blood and their energy had brought justice and freedom to the gold fields. They had opened up an industry for the world, men of all nations would be the better for their labors. The miner and the financier or the trader would equally profit by them, but the men in khaki would tramp on, unrewarded and uncomplaining, to India, to China, to any spot where the needs of their worldwide empire called them. The infantry, streaming up from the Val River to the famous Ridge of Gold, had met with no resistance upon the way, but great mist banks of cloud by day and huge twinkling areas of flame by night showed the handiwork of the enemy. Hamilton and French, moving upon the left flank, found boars thick upon the hills, but cleared them off in the well-managed skirmish which cost us a dozen casualties. On May 29, pushing swiftly along, French found the enemy posted very strongly with several guns at Dorkop, a point west of Clip Riverberg. The cavalry leader had with him at this stage three horse batteries, four pom-poms, and three thousand mounted men. The position being too strong for him to force, Hamilton's infantry, 19th and 21st brigades, were called up, and the Boers were driven out. That splendid corps, the Gordons, lost nearly a hundred men in their advance over the open, and the CIVS on the other flank fought like a regiment of veterans. There had been an inclination to smile at these citizen soldiers when they first came out but no one smiled now save the general who felt that he had them at his back. Hamilton's attack was assisted by the menace rather than the pressure of French's turning movement on the Boer right, but the actual advance was as purely frontal as any of those which had been carried through at the beginning of the war. The open formation of the troops, the powerful artillery behind them, and perhaps also the lowered morale of the enemy combined to make such a movement less dangerous than of old. In any case it was inevitable, as the state of Hamilton's commissariat rendered it necessary that at all hazards he should force his way through. Whilst this action of Dorncop was fought by the British left flank, Henry's mounted infantry in the centre moved straight upon the important junction of Germiston, which lies amid the huge white heaps of tailings from the mines. At this point, or near it, the lines from Johannesburg and from Natal join the line to Pretoria. Colonel Henry's advance was an extremely daring one, for the infantry were some distance behind, but after an irregular scrambling skirmish, in which the Boer snipers had to be driven off the mine heaps and from among the houses, the 8th Mounted Infantry got their grip of the railway and held it. The exploit was a very fine one and stands out the more brilliantly as the conduct of the campaign cannot be said to afford many examples of that well-considered audacity which deliberately runs the risk of the minor loss for the sake of the greater gain. Henry was much assisted by J Battery RHA, which was handled with energy and judgment. French was now on the west of the town, Henry had cut the railway on the east, and Roberts was coming up from the south. His infantry had covered 130 miles in seven days, but the thought that every step brought them nearer to Pretoria was as exhilarating as their fifes and drums. On May 30 the victorious troops camped outside the city while Bota retired with his army, abandoning without a battle the treasure house of his country. Inside the town were chaos and confusion. The richest mines in the world lay for a day or more at the mercy of a lawless rabble drawn from all nations. The Boer officials were themselves divided in opinion, Kraus standing for law and order while Judge Koch advocated violence. A spark would have set the town blazing, and the worst was feared when a crowd of mercenaries assembled in front of the Robinson mine with threats of violence. By the firmness and tact of Mr. Tucker, the manager, and by the strong attitude of Commissioner Krause, the situation was saved and the danger passed. Upon May 31st, without violence to life or destruction to property, that great town which British hands have done so much to build found itself at last under the British flag. May it wave the so long as it covers just laws, honest officials, and clean-handed administrators so long and no longer. And now the last stage of the great journey had been reached. Two days were spent at Johannesburg while supplies were brought up, and then a move was made upon Pretoria 30 miles to the north. Here was the Boer capital, 
the seat of government, the home of Kruger, the centre of all that was anti-British, crouching amid its hills, with costly forts guarding every face of it. Surely at last the place had been found where that great battle should be fought which should decide for all time whether it was with the Briton or with the Dutchman that the future of South Africa lay. On the last day of May 200 lances under the command of Major Hunter Weston, with Charles of the Sappers and Burnham the Scout, a man who has played the part of a hero throughout the campaign, struck off from the main army and endeavoured to descend upon the Pretoria to De La Goa railway line with the intention of blowing up a bridge and cutting the Boer line of retreat. It was a most dashing attempt, but the small party had the misfortune to come into contact with a strong Boer commando, who headed them off. After a skirmish they were compelled to make their way back with a loss of five killed and fourteen wounded. The cavalry under French had waited for the issue of this enterprise at a point nine miles north of Johannesburg. On June 2 it began its advance with orders to make a wide sweep round to the westward, and so skirt the capital, cutting the Pietersburg railway to the north of it. The country in the direct line between Johannesburg and Pretoria consists of a series of rolling downs which are admirably adapted for cavalry work, but the detour which French had to make carried him into the wild and broken district which lies to the north of the Little Crocodile River. Here he was fiercely attacked on ground where his troops could not deploy, but with extreme coolness and judgment beat off the enemy. To cover 32 miles in a day and fight a way out of an ambuscade in the evening is an ordeal for any leader and for any troops. Two killed and seven wounded were our trivial losses in a situation which might have been a serious one. The Boers appear to have been the escort of a strong convoy which had passed along the road some miles in front. Next morning both convoy and opposition had disappeared. The cavalry rode on amid a country of orange groves, the troopers standing up in their stirrups to pluck the golden fruit. There was no further fighting, and on June 4 French had established himself upon the north of the town, where he learned that all resistance had ceased. Whilst the cavalry had performed this enveloping movement the main army had moved swiftly upon its objective, leaving one brigade behind to secure Johannesburg. Ian Hamilton advanced upon the left, while Lord Roberts's column kept the line of the railway, Colonel Henry's mounted infantry scouting in front. As the army topped the low curves of the veldt they saw in front of them two well-marked hills, each crowned by a low squat building. They were the famous southern forts of Pretoria. Between the hills was a narrow neck and beyond the Boer capital. For a time it appeared that the entry was to be an absolutely bloodless one but the booming of cannon and the crash of moors of fire soon showed that the enemy was in force upon the ridge. Botu had left a strong rearguard to hold off the British while his own stores and valuables were being withdrawn from the town. The silence of the forts showed that the guns had been removed and that no prolonged resistance was intended, but in the meanwhile fringes of determined riflemen, supported by cannon, held the approaches, and must be driven off before an entry could be effected. Each fresh corps as it came up reinforced the firing line. Henry's mounted infantrymen supported by the horse guns of J Battery and the guns of Tucker's division began the action. So hot was the answer, both from cannon and from rifle, that it seemed for a time as if a real battle were at last about to take place. The Guards Brigade, Stevenson's Brigade, and Maxwell's Brigade streamed up and waited until Hamilton, who was on the enemy's right flank, should be able to make his presence felt. The heavy guns had also arrived, and a huge cloud of debris rising from the Praetorian forts told the accuracy of their fire. But either the burghers were half hearted or there was no real intention to make a stand. About half past two, their fire slackened and Paul Carew was directed to push on. That Yibnair soldier with his two veteran brigades obeyed the order with alacrity, and the infantry swept over the ridge with some thirty or forty casualties, the majority of which fell to the Woiks. The position was taken, and Hamilton, who came up late, was only able to send on Delisle's mounted infantry, chiefly Australians, who ran down one of the Boer Maxims in the open. The action had cost us altogether about seventy men. Among the injured was the Duke of Norfolk, 
who had shown a high sense of civic virtue in laying aside the duties and dignity of a cabinet minister in order to serve as a simple captain of volunteers. At the end of this one fight the capital lay at the mercy of Lord Roberts. Consider the fight which they made for their chief city, compare it with that which the British made for the village of Mafeking, and say on which side is that stern spirit of self-sacrifice and resolution which are the signs of the better cause. In the early morning of June 5th, the Coldstream guards were mounting the hills which commanded the town. Beneath them in the clear African air lay the famous city, embowered in green, the fine central buildings rising grandly out of the wide circle of villas. Through the neck part of the Guards Brigade and Maxwell's Brigade had passed, and had taken over the station, from which at least one train laden with horses had steamed that morning. Two others, both ready to start. were only just stopped in time. The first thought was for the British prisoners, and a small party headed by the Duke of Marlborough rode to their rescue. Let it be said once for all that their treatment by the Boers was excellent and that their appearance would alone have proved it. 129 officers and 39 soldiers were found in the model schools, which had been converted into a prison. A day later our cavalry arrived at Waterville, which is 14 miles to the north of Pretoria. Here were confined 3,000 soldiers, whose fare had certainly been of the scantiest, though in other respects they appear to have been well treated. Footnote, further information unfortunately shows that in the case of the sick and of the colonial prisoners the treatment was by no means good, 900 of their comrades had been removed by the Boers, but Porter's cavalry was in time to release the others under a brisk shell fire from a boar gun upon the ridge. Many pieces of good luck we had in the campaign, but this recovery of our prisoners, which left the enemy without a dangerous lever for exacting conditions of peace, was the most fortunate of all. In the centre of the town there is a wide square decorated or disfigured by a bare pedestal upon which a statue of the president was to have been placed. Hard by is the bleak barn-like church in which he preached and on either side are the government offices and the law courts, buildings which would grace any European capital. Here, at two o'clock on the afternoon of June 5, Lord Roberts sat his horse and saw pass in front of him the men who had followed him so far and so faithfully the guards, the Essex, the Welsh, the Yorks, the Woiks, the guns, the mounted infantry, the dashing irregulars, the Gordons, the Canadians, the Shropshires, the Cornwalls, the Camerons, the Derbys, the Sussex, and the London Volunteers. For over two hours the khaki waves with their crests of steel went sweeping by. High above their heads from the summit of the Rad Sal the broad Union Jack streamed for the first time. Through months of darkness we had struggled onwards to the light. Now at last the strange drama seemed to be drawing to its close. The god of battles had given the long withheld verdict. But of all the hearts which throbbed high at that supreme moment there were few who felt one touch of bitterness towards the brave men who had been overborne. They had fought and died for their ideal. We had fought and died for ours. The hope for the future of South Africa is that they or their descendants may learn that that banner which has come to wave above Pretoria means no racial intolerance, no greed for gold, no paltering with injustice or corruption but that it means one law for all and one freedom for all, as it does in every other continent in the whole broad earth. When that is learned it may happen that even they will come to date a happy life under wider liberty from that 5th of June which saw the symbol of their nation pass forever from among the ensigns of the world. Chapter 26. Diamond Hill Rundle's operations. The military situation at the time of the occupation of Pretoria was roughly as follows. Lord Roberts with some 30,000 men was in possession of the capital, but had left his long line of communications very imperfectly guarded behind him. On the flank of this line of communications, in the eastern and northeastern corner of the Free State, was an energetic force of unconquered Free Staters who had rallied round President Steyn. They were some eight or 10,000 in number, well horsed, with a fair number of guns, under the able leadership of De Wet. Prince Lou, and Olivier. 
above all, they had a splendid position, mountainous and broken, from which, as from a fortress, they could make excursions to the south or west. This army included the commandos of Fixburg, Senekl, and Harrismith, with all the broken and desperate men from other districts who had left their farms and fled to the mountains. It was held in check as a united force by Rundle's division and the colonial division on the south, while Colville, and afterwards Methuen, endeavoured to pen them in on the west. The task was a hard one, however, and though Rundle succeeded in holding his line intact, it appeared to be impossible in that wide country to coop up altogether an enemy so mobile. A strange game of hide and seek ensued, in which De Wet, who led the Borades, was able again and again to strike our line of rails and to get back without serious loss. The story of these instructive and humiliating episodes will be told in their order. The energy and skill of the guerrilla chief challenge our admiration, and the score of his successes would be amusing were it not that the points of the game are marked by the lives of British soldiers. General Buller had spent the latter half of May in making his way from Lady Smith to Layne's Neck, and the beginning of June found him with 20,000 men in front of that difficult position. Some talk of a surrender had arisen, and Christian Boter, who commanded the Boers, succeeded in gaining several days' armistice, which ended in nothing. The Transvaal forces at this point were not more than a few thousand in number, but their position was so formidable that it was a serious task to turn them out. Van Wyck's Hill, however, had been left unguarded, and as its possession would give the British the command of Boaters Pass, its unopposed capture by the South African Light Horse was an event of great importance. With guns upon this eminence the infantry were able, on June 8, to attack and to carry with little loss the rest of the high ground, and so to get the pass into their complete possession. Boater fired the grass behind him, and withdrew sullenly to the north. On the 9th and 10th the convoys were passed over the pass, and on the 11th the main body of the army followed them. The operations were now being conducted in that extremely acute angle of natal which runs up between the Transvaal and the Orange Free State. In crossing Boaters Pass the army had really entered what was now the Orange River colony. But it was only for a very short time, as the object of the movement was to turn the Layens Neck position, and then come back into the Transvaal through Almond's Pass. The gallant South African light horse led the way, and fought hard at one point to clear a path for the army, losing six killed and eight wounded in a sharp skirmish. On the morning of the 12th the flanking movement was far advanced, and it only remained for the army to force Almond's Neck, which would place it to the rear of Layen's Neck, and close to the Transvaal town of Volksrust. Had the Boers been the men of Colenso and of Spionkop, this storming of Almond's Neck would have been a bloody business. The position was strong, the cover was slight, and there was no way round. But the infantry came on with the old dash without the old stubborn resolution being opposed to them. The guns prepared the way, and then the Dorsets, the Dublins, the Middlesex, the Queens, and the East Surrey did the rest. The door was open and the Transvaal lay before us. The next day Volksrust was in our hands. The whole series of operations were excellently conceived and carried out. Putting Colenso on one side, it cannot be denied that General Buller showed considerable power of manoeuvring large bodies of troops. The withdrawal of the compromised army after Spionkop, the change of the line of attack at Peters Hill, and the flanking marches in this campaign of northern Natal, were all very workmanlike achievements. In this case a position which the Boers had been preparing for months, scored with trenches and topped by heavy artillery had been rendered untenable by a clever flank movement, the total casualties in the whole affair being less than 200 killed and wounded. Natal was cleared of the invader, Buller's foot was on the high plateau of the Transvaal, and Roberts could count on 20,000 good men coming up to him from the southeast. More important than all, the Natal railway was being brought up, and soon the central British army would depend upon Durban instead of Cape Town for its supplies a saving of nearly two-thirds of the distance. The fugitive Boers made northwards in the Middelburg direction, while Buller advanced to Standerton, 
which town he continued to occupy until Lord Roberts could send a force down through Heidelberg to join hands with him. Such was the position of the natal field force at the end of June. From the west and the southwest British forces were also converging upon the capital. The indomitable Baden-Powell sought for rest and change of scene after his prolonged trial by harrying the Boers out of Zierust and Russenberg. The forces of Hunter and of Mann converged upon Pochstrom, from which, after settling that district, they could be conveyed by rail to Kruzierstorp and Johannesburg. Before briefly recounting the series of events which took place upon the line of communications, the narrative must return to Lord Roberts at Pretoria, and describe the operations which followed his occupation of that city. In leaving the undefeated forces of the Free State behind him, the British general had unquestionably run a grave risk, and was well aware that his railway communication was in danger of being cut. By the rapidity of his movements he succeeded in gaining the enemy's capital before that which he had foreseen came to pass, but if Bota had held him at Pretoria while De Wet struck at him behind, the situation would have been a serious one. Having once attained his main object, Roberts could receive with equanimity the expected news that De Wet with a mobile force of less than 2,000 men had, on June 7, cut the line at Rudeville to the north of Kroonstad. Both rail and telegraph were destroyed, and for a few days the army was isolated. Fortunately there were enough supplies to go on with, and immediate steps were taken to drive away the intruder, though, like a mosquito. He was brushed from one place only to settle up on another dot leaving others to restore his broken communications, Lord Roberts turned his attention once more to Bota, who still retained ten or fifteen thousand men under his command. The president had fled from Pretoria with a large sum of money, estimated at over two millions sterling, and was known to be living in a saloon railway carriage which had been transformed into a seat of government even more mobile than that of President Stein. From Waterville Boven, a point beyond Middelburg, he was in a position either to continue his journey to Delago Bay, and so escape out of the country, or to travel north into that wild Lidenberg country which had always been proclaimed as the last ditch of the defence. Here he remained with his gold bags waiting the turn of events. Botu and his stalwarts had not gone far from the capital. Fifteen miles out to the east, the railway line runs through a gap in the hills called Pinaras Port, and here was such a position as the Boer loves to hold. It was very strong in front, and it had widely spread formidable flanking hills to hamper those turning movements which had so often been fatal to the Boer generals. Behind was the uncut railway line along which the guns could in case of need be removed. The whole position was over fifteen miles from wing to wing, and it was well known to the Boer general that Lord Roberts had no longer that preponderance of force which would enable him to execute wide turning movements, as he had done in his advance from the south. His army had decreased seriously in numbers. The mounted men, the most essential branch of all, were so ill-horsed that brigades were not larger than regiments. One brigade of infantry, the 14th, had been left to garrison Johannesburg, and another, the 18th, had been chosen for special duty in Pretoria. Smith Doyen's brigade had been detached for duty upon the line of communications. With all these deductions and the wastage caused by wounds and disease, the force was in no state to assume a vigorous offensive. So hard pressed were they for men that the 3,000 released prisoners from Waterville were hurriedly armed with Boer weapons and sent down the line to help to guard the more vital points. Had Bota withdrawn to a safe distance, Lord Roberts would certainly have halted, as he had done at Blow Enfantein, and waited for remounts and reinforcements. But the war could not be allowed to languish when an active enemy lay only 15 miles off within striking distance of two cities and of the line of rail. Taking all the troops that he could muster, the British general moved out once more on Monday, June 11, to drive Bota from his position. He had with him Pole Carew's 11th Division, which numbered about 6,000 men with 20 guns, Ian Hamilton's force, which included one infantry brigade, Bruce Hamilton's, one cavalry brigade, and a corps of mounted infantry, say, 6,000 in all, 
with 30 guns. There remained French's cavalry division, with Hutton's mounted infantry, which could not have exceeded 2,000 sabres and rifles. The total force was, therefore, not more than 16 or 17,000 men, with about 70 guns. Their task was to carry a carefully prepared position held by at least 10,000 burghers with a strong artillery. Had the Boar of June been the Boar of December, the odds would have been against the British. There had been some negotiations for peace between Lord Roberts and Bota, but the news of De Wet's success from the south had hardened the Boer general's heart, and on June 9 the cavalry had their orders to advance. Hamilton was to work round the left wing of the Boers and French round their right, while the infantry came up in the centre. So wide was the scene of action that the attack and the resistance in each flank and in the centre constituted, on June 11, three separate actions. Of these the latter was of least importance, as it merely entailed the advance of the infantry to a spot whence they could take advantage of the success of the flanking forces when they had made their presence felt. The centre did not on this as on several other occasions in the campaign make the mistake of advancing before the way had been prepared for it. French with his attenuated force found so vigorous a resistance on Monday and Tuesday that he was hard put to it to hold his own. Fortunately he had with him three excellent horse artillery batteries, G, O, and T, who worked until, at the end of the engagement, they had only twenty rounds in their limbers. The country was an impossible one for cavalry, and the troopers fought dismounted, with intervals of twenty or thirty paces between the men. Exposed all day to rifle and shell fire, unable to advance and unwilling to retreat, it was only owing to their open formation that they escaped with about thirty casualties. With boars on his front, his flank, and even on his rear, French held grimly on, realizing that a retreat upon his part would mean a greater pressure at all other points of the British advance. At night his weary men slept upon the ground which they had held. All Monday and all Tuesday French kept his grip at Camille's drift, stolidly indifferent to the attempt of the enemy to cut his line of communications. On Wednesday, Hamilton, upon the other flank, had gained the upper hand, and the pressure was relaxed. French then pushed forward but the horses were so utterly beaten that no effective pursuit was possible. During the two days that French had been held up by the Boer right wing Hamilton had also been seriously engaged upon the left so seriously that at one time the action appeared to have gone against him. The fight presented some distinctive features, which made it welcome to soldiers who were weary of the invisible man with his smokeless gun upon the eternal cop. It is true that man, gun, and Cop were all present upon this occasion, but in the endeavours to drive him off some new developments took place, which formed for one brisk hour a reversion to picturesque warfare. Perceiving a gap in the enemy's line, Hamilton pushed up the famous Q battery the guns which had plucked glory out of disaster at Sanna's post. For the second time in one campaign they were exposed and in imminent danger of capture. A body of mounted boars with great dash and hardihood galloped down within close range and opened fire. Instantly the twelfth lancers were let loose upon them. How they must have longed for their big boned long striding English troop horses as they strove to raise a gallop out of their spiritless overworked Argentines. For once, however, the lance meant more than five pounds dead weight and an encumbrance to the rider. The guns were saved, the boars fled and a dozen were left upon the ground. But a cavalry charge has to end in a reformation, and that is the instant of danger if any unbroken enemy remains within range. Now a sleet of bullets hissed through their ranks as they retired, and the gallant Lord Ailey, as modest and brave a soldier as ever drew sword, was struck through the heart. Pray moderate your language. Was his last characteristic remark, made to a battle-drunken sergeant. Two officers, seventeen men, and thirty horses went down with their colonel, the great majority only slightly injured. In the meantime the increasing pressure upon his right caused Broadwood to order a second charge, of the lifeguards this time, to drive off the assailants. The appearance rather than the swords of the guards prevailed, 
and cavalry as cavalry had vindicated their existence more than they had ever done during the campaign. The guns were saved, the flank attack was rolled back, but one other danger had still to be met, for the Heidelberg Commando A Corps elite of the Boers had made its way outside Hamilton's flank and threatened to get past him. With cool judgment the British general detached a battalion and a section of a battery, which pushed the Boers back into a less menacing position. The rest of Bruce Hamilton's brigade were ordered to advance upon the hills in front, and, aided by a heavy artillery fire, they had succeeded, before the closing in of the winter night, in getting possession of this first line of the enemy's defences. Night fell upon an undecided fight, which, after swaying this way and that, had finally inclined to the side of the British. The Sussex and the city imperial volunteers were clinging to the enemy's left flank, while the 11th Division were holding them in front. All promised well for the morrow. By order of Lord Roberts, the guards were sent round early on Tuesday, the 12th, to support the flank attack of Bruce Hamilton's infantry. It was afternoon before all was ready for the advance, and then the Sussex, the London Volunteers, and the Derbyshires won a position upon the ridge, followed later by the three regiments of guards. But the ridge was the edge of a considerable plateau, swept by ball fire, and no advance could be made over its bare expanse save at a considerable loss. The infantry clung in a long fringe to the edge of the position, but for two hours no guns could be brought up to their support, as the steepness of the slope was insurmountable. It was all that the stormers could do to hold their ground, as they were enfiladed by a vicar's maxim, and exposed to showers of shrapnel as well as to an incessant trifle fire. Never were guns so welcome as those of the 82nd Battery, brought by Major Connolly into the firing line. The enemy's riflemen were only a thousand yards away, and the action of the artillery might have seemed as foolhardy as that of Long at Cole and so. Ten horses went down on the instant, and a quarter of the gunners were hit, but the guns roared one by one into action, and their shrapnel soon decided the day. Undoubtedly it is with Connolly and his men that the honours lie dot at four o'clock, as the sun sank towards the west, the tide of fight had set in favour of the attack. Two more batteries had come up, every rifle was thrown into the firing line, and the Boer reply was decreasing in volume. The temptation to an assault was great, but even now it might mean heavy loss of life, and Hamilton shrank from the sacrifice. In the morning his judgment was justified for Bota had abandoned the position, and his army was in full retreat. The mounted men followed as far as Eland's River Station, which is twenty-five miles from Pretoria, but the enemy was not overtaken, save by a small party of Delisle's Australians and regular mounted infantry. This force, less than a hundred in number, gained a cop which overlooked a portion of the Boer army. Had they been more numerous, the effect would have been incalculable. As it was, the Australians fired every cartridge which they possessed into the throng, and killed many horses and men. It would bear examination why it was that only this small corps was present at so vital a point, and why, if they could push the pursuit to such purpose, others should not be able to do the same. Time was bringing some curious revenges. Already Paderberg had come upon Majuba Day. Buller's victorious soldiers had taken Leyen's neck. Now, the sprout at which the retreating Boers were so mishandled by the Australians was that same Broncos sprout at which, nineteen years before, a regiment had been shot down. Many might have prophesied that the deed would be avenged, but who could ever have guessed the men who would avenge it? Such was the Battle of Diamond Hill, as it was called from the name of the ridge which was opposite to Hamilton's attack. The prolonged two days struggle showed that there was still plenty of fight in the burghers. Lord Roberts had not routed them, nor had he captured their guns, but he had cleared the vicinity of the capital, he had inflicted a loss upon them which was certainly as great as his own, and he had again proved to them that it was vain for them to attempt to stand. A long pause followed at Pretoria, broken by occasional small alarms and excursions, which served no end save to keep the army from ennui. In spite of occasional breaks in his line of communications, horses and supplies were coming up rapidly, and, by the middle of July, 
Roberts was ready for the field again. At the same time Hunter had come up from Potchfstroom, and Hamilton had taken Heidelberg, and his force was about to join hands with Buller at Standerton. Sporadic warfare broke out here and there in the west, and in the course of it Snyman of Mafeking had reappeared, with two guns, which were promptly taken from him by the Canadian mounted rifles. On all sides it was felt that if the redoubtable De Wet could be captured there was every hope that the burghers might discontinue a struggle which was disagreeable to the British and fatal to themselves. As a point of honour it was impossible for Bota to give in while his ally held out. We will turn, therefore, to this famous guerrilla chief, and give some account of his exploits. To understand them some description must be given of the general military situation in the free state. When Lord Roberts had swept past to the north he had brushed aside the flower of the Orange Free State Army, who occupied the considerable quadrilateral which is formed by the northeast of that state. The function of Rundle's 8th Division and of Brabant's Colonial Division was to separate the sheep from the goats by preventing the fighting burghers from coming south and disturbing those districts which had been settled. For this purpose Rundle formed a long line which should serve as a cordon. Moving up through Trommel and Clockillen, Fixburg was occupied on May 25th by the Colonial Division, while Rundle seized Senecl, 40 miles to the northwest. A small force of forty yeomanry, who entered the town some time in advance of the main body, was suddenly attacked by the Boers, and the gallant Dalbiac, famous rider and sportsman, was killed, with four of his men. He was a victim, as so many have been in this campaign, to his own proud disregard of danger. The Boers were in full retreat, but now, as always, they were dangerous. One cannot take them for granted for the very moment of defeat is that at which they are capable of some surprising effort. Rundle, following them up from Senecl, found them in strong possession of the Kopjes at Bidolfsburg, and received a check in his endeavour to drive them off. It was an action fought amid great grass fires, where the possible fate of the wounded was horrible to contemplate. The second Grenadiers, the Scots Guards, the East Yorkshires, and the West Kents were all engaged, with the 2nd and 79th field batteries and a force of yeomanry. Our losses incurred in the open from unseen rifles were 30 killed and 130 wounded, including Colonel Lloyd of the Grenadiers. Two days later Rundell, from Senecl, joined hands with Brabant from Fixburg, and a defensive line was formed between those two places, which was held unbroken for two months when the operations ended in the capture of the greater part of the force opposed to him. Clements's brigade, consisting of the 1st Royal Irish, the 2nd Bedfords, the 2nd Worcesters, and the 2nd Wiltshires, had come to strengthen Rundell, and altogether he may have had as many as 12,000 men under his orders. It was not a large force with which to hold a mobile adversary at least 8,000 strong, who might attack him at any point of his extended line. So well, however, did he select his positions that every attempt of the enemy, and there were many, ended in failure. Badly supplied with food, he and his half-starved men held bravely to their task, and no soldiers in all that great host deserved better of their country. At the end of May, then, the colonial division, Rundle's division, and Clements's brigade held the Boers from Fixburg on the Barsutta border to Senecl. This prevented them from coming south. But what was that to prevent them from coming west, and falling upon the railway line? There was the weak point of the British position. Lord Methuen had been brought across from Boshoff, and was available with 6,000 men. Colville was on that side also, with the Highland Brigade. A few details were scattered up and down the line waiting to be gathered up by an enterprising enemy. Kroonstad was held by a single militia battalion, each separate force had to be nourished by convoys with weak escorts. Never was there such a field for a mobile and competent guerrilla leader. And, as luck would have it, such a man was at hand, ready to take full advantage of his opportunities. Chapter 27. The Lines of Communication. Christian de Wet, the elder of two brothers of that name, was at this time in the prime of life, a little over forty years of age. He was a burly middle-sized bearded man, 
poorly educated, but endowed with much energy and common sense. His military experience dated back to Majuba Hill, and he had a large share of that curious race hatred which is intelligible in the case of the Transvaal, but inexplicable in a free stater who has received no injury from the British Empire. Some weakness of his sight compels the use of tinted spectacles, and he had now turned these, with a pair of particularly observant eyes behind them, upon the scattered British forces and the long exposed line of railway. De Wet's force was an offshoot from the army of free staters under de Villiers, Olivier, and Prince Lou, which lay in the mountainous northeast of the state. To him were committed five guns, fifteen hundred men, and the best of the horses. Well armed, well mounted, and operating in a country which consisted of rolling plains with occasional fortress copges, his little force had everything in its favor. There were so many tempting objects of attack lying before him that he must have had some difficulty in knowing where to begin. The tinted spectacles were turned first upon the isolated town of Lindley. Colville with the Highland Brigade had come up from Ventersburg with instructions to move onward to Heilbronn pacifying the country as he passed. The country, however, refused to be pacified, and his march from Ventersburg to Lindley was harassed by snipers every mile of the way. Finding that De Wet and his men were close upon him, he did not linger at Lindley, but passed on to his destination, his entire march of 126 miles costing him 63 casualties, of which nine were fatal. It was a difficult and dangerous march, especially for the handful of Eastern Province horse, upon whom fell all the mounted work. By evil fortune a force of five hundred yeomanry, the 18th Battalion, including the Duke of Cambridge's own and the Irish companies, had been sent from Grunstad to join Colville at Lindley. Colonel Sprague was in command. On May 27 this body of horsemen reached their destination only to find that Colville had already abandoned it. They appear to have determined to halt for a day in Lindley, and then follow Colville to Heilbronn. Within a few hours of their entering the town they were fiercely attacked by De Wet. Colonel Sprague seems to have acted for the best. Under a heavy fire he caused his troopers to fall back upon his transport which had been left at a point a few miles out upon the Kroonstad road, where three defensible copges sheltered a valley in which the cattle and horses could be herded. A stream ran through it. There were all the materials the for a stand which would have brought glory to the British arms. The men were of peculiarly fine quality, many of them from the public schools and from the universities and if any would fight to the death these with their sporting spirit and their high sense of honor might have been expected to do so. They had the stronger motive for holding out, as they had taken steps to convey word of their difficulty to Colville and to Methuen. The former continued his march to Heilbronn, and it is hard to blame him for doing so, but Methuen on hearing the message, which was conveyed to him at great personal peril by Corporal Hanke of the Yeomanry, pushed on instantly with the utmost energy though he arrived too late to prevent, or even to repair, a disaster. It must be remembered that Colville was under orders to reach Heilbronn on a certain date, that he was himself fighting his way, and that the force which he was asked to relieve was much more mobile than his own. His cavalry at that date consisted of 100 men of the Eastern Province Horse. Colonel Sprague's men had held their own for the first three days of their investment during which they had been simply exposed to a long-range rifle fire which inflicted no very serious loss upon them. Their principal defense consisted of a stone kraal about twenty yards square, which sheltered them from rifle bullets, but must obviously be a perfect death trap in the not improbable event of the boars sending for artillery. The spirit of the troopers was admirable. Several dashing sorties were carried out under the leadership of Captain Humby and Lord Longford. The latter was a particularly dashing business, ending in a bayonet charge which cleared a neighboring ridge. Early in the siege the gallant Keith met his end. On the fourth day the Boers brought up five guns. 
one would have thought that during so long a time as three days it would have been possible for the officer in command to make such preparations against this obvious possibility as were so successfully taken at a later stage of the war by the handful who garrisoned Lady Brand. Surely in this period, even without engineers, it would not have been hard to construct such trenches as the Boers have again and again opposed to our own artillery. But the preparations which were made proved to be quite inadequate. One of the two smaller copies was carried, and the garrison fled to the other. This also was compelled to surrender, and finally the main cop also hoisted the white flag. No blame can rest upon the men, for their presence there at all is a sufficient proof of their public spirit and their gallantry. But the lessons of the war seem to have been imperfectly learned especially that very certain lesson that shell fire in a close formation is insupportable, while in an open formation with a little cover it can never compel surrender. The casualty lists, 80 killed and wounded out of a force of 470, show that the yeomanry took considerable punishment before surrendering, but do not permit us to call the defence desperate or heroic. It is only fair to add that Colonel Sprague was acquitted of all blame by a court of inquiry, which agreed, however, that the surrender was premature, and attributed it to the unauthorized hoisting of a white flag upon one of the detached copies. With regard to the subsequent controversy as to whether General Colville might have returned to the relief of the yeomanry, it is impossible to see how that general could have acted in any other way than he did. Some explanation is needed of Lord Methuen's appearance upon the central scene of warfare, his division having, when last described, been at Boshoff, not far from Kimberley, where early in April he fought the successful action which led to the death of Vilboys. Thence he proceeded along the valley and then south to Kronstadt, arriving there on May 28. He had with him the 9th Brigade, Douglas's, which contained the troops which had started with him for the relief of Kimberley six months before. These were the Northumberland Fusiliers, loyal North Lancashires, Northamptons, and Yorkshire Light Infantry. With him also were the Munsters, Lord Chesham's Yeomanry, five companies, with the 4th and 37th batteries, two howitzers and two pom-poms. His total force was about 6,000 men. On arriving at Kroonstad he was given the task of relieving Heilbronn, where Colville, with the Highland Brigade, some colonial horse, Levat scouts, two naval guns, and the 5th battery, were short of food and ammunition. The more urgent message from the yeoman at Lindley, however, took him on a fruitless journey to the town on June 1. So vigorous was the pursuit of the yeomanry that the leading squadrons, consisting of South Knots Hussars and Sherwood Rangers, actually cut into the Boer convoy and might have rescued the prisoners had they been supported. As it was they were recalled, and had to fight their way back to Lindley with some loss including Colonel Rolston, the commander, who was badly wounded. A garrison was left under Pegget, and the rest of the force pursued its original mission to Heilbronn, arriving there on June 7, when the Highlanders had been reduced to quarter rations. The Salvation Army was the nickname by which they expressed their gratitude to the relieving force. A previous convoy sent to the same destination had less good fortune. On June 1 55 wagons started from the railway line to reach Heilbronn. The escort consisted of 160 details belonging to Highland regiments without any guns, Captain Corporalis in command. But the gentleman with the tinted glasses was waiting on the way. I have 1200 men and 5 guns. Surrender at once. Such was the message which reached the escort and in their defenseless condition there was nothing for it but to comply. Thus one disaster leads to another, for, had the yeomanry held out at Lindley, De Wet would not on June 4 have laid hands upon our wagons, and had he not recruited his supplies from our wagons it is doubtful if he could have made his attack upon Rudeville. This was the next point upon which he turned his attention. Two miles beyond Rudeville station there is a well-marked cop by the railway line with other hills some distance to the right and the left. A militia regiment, the 4th Derbyshire, had been sent up to occupy this post. There were rumours of Boers on the line, and Major Haag, who with 1,000 details of various regiments commanded a trailhead, 
had been attacked on June 6 but had beaten off his assailants. De Wet, acting sometimes in company with, and sometimes independently of, his lieutenant Nl, passed down the line looking for some easier prey, and on the night of June 7 came upon the militia regiment, which was encamped in a position which could be completely commanded by artillery. It is not true that they had neglected to occupy the cop under which they lay, for two companies had been posted upon it. But there seems to have been no thought of imminent danger, and the regiment had pitched its tents and gone very comfortably to sleep without a thought of the gentleman in the tinted glasses. In the middle of the night he was upon them with a hissing sleet of bullets. At the first dawn the guns opened and the shells began to burst among them. It was a horrible ordeal for raw troops. The men were miners and agricultural laborers, who had never seen more bloodshed than a cut finger in their lives. They had been four months in the country, but their life had been a picnic, as the luxury of their baggage shows. Now in an instant the picnic was ended, and in the grey cold dawn war was upon them grim war with the whine of bullets, the screams of pain, the crash of shell the horrible rending and riving of body and limb. In desperate straits, which would have tried the oldest soldiers, the brave miners did well. They never from the beginning had a chance save to show how gamely they could take punishment, but that at least they did. Bullets were coming from all sides at once and yet no enemy was visible. They lined one side of the embankment, and they were shot in the back. They lined the other, and were again shot in the back. Baird Douglas, the colonel, vowed to shoot the man who should raise the white flag, and he fell dead himself before he saw the hated emblem. But it had to come. A hundred and forty of the men were down, many of them suffering from the horrible wounds which shell inflicts. The place was a shambles. Then the flag went up and the Boers at last became visible. Outnumbered, outgeneraled, and without guns. There is no shadow of stain upon the good name of the one militia regiment which was ever seriously engaged during the war. Their position was hopeless from the first, and they came out of it with death, mutilation, and on a dot two miles south of the Renostakop stands Rudeville Station, in which, on that June morning, there stood a train containing the mails for the army, a supply of greatcoats, and a truck full of enormous shells. A number of details of various sorts, a hundred or more, had alighted from the train, twenty of them post office volunteers, some of the Pioneer Railway Corps, a few Shropshires, and other waifs and strays. To them in the early morning came the gentleman with the tinted glasses, his hands still red with the blood of the derbies. I have fourteen hundred men and four guns. Surrender, said the messenger. But it is not in nature for a postman to give up his post bag without a struggle. Never! cried the valiant postman. But shell after shell battered the corrugated iron buildings about their ears, and it was not possible for them to answer the guns which were smashing the life out of them. There was no help for it but to surrender. De Wet added samples of the British volunteer and of the British regular to his bag of militia. The station and train were burned down the greatcoats looted, the big shells exploded, and the mails burned. The latter was the one unsportsmanlike action which can up to that date be laid to De Wet's charge. Forty thousand men to the north of him could forego their coats and their food, but they yearned greatly for those home letters, charred fragments of which are still blowing about the veldt. Footnote, fragments continually met the eye which must have afforded curious reading for the victors. I hope you have killed all those boars by now, was the beginning of one letter which I could not help observing. For three days the wet held the line, and during all that time he worked his wicked will upon it. For miles and miles it was wrecked with most scientific completeness. The Renoster Bridge was destroyed. So, for the second time, was the Rudeville Bridge. The rails were blown upwards with dynamite until they looked like an unfinished line to heaven. De Wet's heavy hand was everywhere. Not a telegraph post remained standing within ten miles. His headquarters continued to be the Copper Trudeville. On June 10, two British forces were converging upon the point of danger. One was Methuen's, from Heilbronn. The other was a small force consisting of the Shropshires, 
the South Wales borderers, and a battery which had come south with Lord Kitchener. The energetic chief of the staff was always sent by Lord Roberts to the point where a strong man was needed, and it was seldom that he failed to justify his mission. Lord Methuen, however, was the first to arrive, and at once attacked De Wet, who moved swiftly away to the eastward. With a tendency to exaggeration, which has been too common during the war, the affair was described as a victory. It was really a strategic and almost bloodless move upon the part of the Boers. It is not the business of guerrillas to fight pitched battles. Methuen pushed for the south, having been informed that Kroonstad had been captured. Finding this to be untrue, he turned again to the eastward in search of De Wet. That wily and indefatigable man was not long out of Arken. On June 14 he appeared once more at Renosta, where the construction trains, under the famous Girard, were working furiously at the repair of the damage which he had already done. This time the guard was sufficient to beat him off, and he vanished again to the eastward. He succeeded, however, in doing some harm, and very nearly captured Lord Kitchener himself. A permanent post had been established at Renostra under the charge of Colonel Spoons of the Shropshires, with his own regiment and several guns. Smith Doyen, one of the youngest and most energetic of the divisional commanders, had at the same time undertaken the supervision and patrolling of the line. An attack had at this period been made by a commando of some hundred Boers at the Sand River to the south of Kronstadt, where there is a most important bridge. The attempt was frustrated by the Royal Lancaster Regiment and the Railway Pioneer Regiment, helped by some mounted infantry and yeomanry. The fight was for a time a brisk one and the pioneers, upon whom the brunt of it fell, behaved with great steadiness. The skirmish is principally remarkable for the death of Major Seymour of the Pioneers, a noble American, who gave his services and at last his life for what, in the face of all slander and misrepresentation, he knew to be the cause of justice and of liberty. It was hoped now, after all these precautions, that the last had been seen of the gentleman with the tinted glasses, but on June 21 he was back in his old haunts once more. Honing Sprout Station, about midway between Kroonstad and Rudeville, was the scene of his new raid. On that date his men appeared suddenly as a train waited in the station, and ripped up the rails on either side of it. There were no guns at this point, and the only available troops were 300 of the prisoners from Pretoria, armed with Martini Henry rifles and obsolete ammunition. A good man was in command, however the same Colonel Bullock of the Devons who had distinguished himself at Colonso and every tattered, half-starved wastrel was nerved by a recollection of the humiliations which he had already endured. For seven hours they lay helpless under the shell fire, but their constancy was rewarded by the arrival of Colonel Brookfield with three hundred yeomanry and four guns of the 17th RFA, followed in the evening by a larger force from the south. The Boers fled, but left some of their number behind them, while of the British, Major Hobbs and four men were killed and nineteen wounded. This defence of three hundred half-armed men against seven hundred Boer riflemen, with three guns firing shell and shrapnel, was a very good performance. The same body of burghers immediately afterwards attacked a post held by Colonel Evans with two companies of the Shropshires and fifty Canadians. They were again beaten back with loss, the Canadians under Ringles especially distinguishing themselves by their desperate resistance in an exposed position. All these attacks, irritating and destructive as they were, were not able to hinder the general progress of the war. After the Battle of Diamond Hill, the captured position was occupied by the mounted infantry, while the rest of the forces returned to their camps round Pretoria, the to await the much needed remounts. At other parts of the seat of war the British cordon was being drawn more tightly round the Boer forces. Buller had come as far as Standerton, and Ian Hamilton, in the last week of June, had occupied Heidelberg. A week afterwards the two forces were able to join hands, and so to completely cut off the free state from the Transvaal armies. Hamilton in these operations had the misfortune to break his collarbone and for a time the command of his division passed to Hunter the one man, perhaps, 
whom the army would regard as an adequate successor. It was evident now to the British commanders that there would be no peace and no safety for their communications while an undefeated army of seven or eight thousand men, under such leaders as De Wet and Olivier, was lurking amid the hills which flanked their railroad. A determined effort was made, therefore, to clear up that corner of the country. Having closed the only line of escape by the junction of Ian Hamilton and of Buller, the attention of six separate bodies of troops was concentrated upon the stalwart Free Staters. These were the divisions of Rundle and of Brabant from the south, the brigade of Clements on their extreme left, the garrison of Lindley under Paget, the garrison of Heilbronn under Macdonald, and, most formidable of all, a detachment under Hunter which was moving from the north. A crisis was evidently approaching. The nearest free state town of importance still untaken was Bethlehem, a singular name to connect with the operations of war. The country on the south of it forbade an advance by Rundle or Brabant, but it was more accessible from the west. The first operation of the British consisted, therefore, in massing sufficient troops to be able to advance from this side. This was done by effecting a junction between Clements from Senecal and Pegget who commanded at Lindley, which was carried out upon July 1st near the latter place. Clements encountered some opposition, but besides his excellent infantry regiments, the Royal Irish, Worcesters, Wiltshires, and Bedfords, he had with him the second Brabant's horse, with yeomanry, mounted infantry, two five-inch guns, and the 38th RFA aided by a demonstration on the part of Grenfell and of Brabant, he pushed his way through after three days of continual skirmish. On getting into touch with Clements, Pegget sallied out from Lindley, leaving the buffs behind to garrison the town. He had with him Brookfield's mounted brigade 1,000 strong, eight guns, and two fine battalions of infantry, the Munster Fusiliers and the Yorkshire Light Infantry. On July 3rd, he found nearly Ucop a considerable force of Boers with three guns opposed to him. Clements being at that time too far off upon the flank to assist him. Four guns of the 38th RFA Major Oldfield, and two belonging to the city volunteers came into action. The Royal Artillery guns appear to have been exposed to a very severe fire, and the losses were so heavy that for a time they could not be served. The escort was inadequate, insufficiently advanced, and badly handled, for the Boer riflemen were able, by creeping up a donga, to get right into the 38th battery, and the gallant major, with Lieutenant Belcher, was killed in the defence of the guns. Captain Fitzgerald, the only other officer present, was wounded in two places, and twenty men were struck down, with nearly all the horses of one section. Captain Marks, who was brigade major of Colonel Brookfield's yeomanry, with the help of Lieutenant Keevil Davis and the 15th IY came to the rescue of the disorganized and almost annihilated section. At the same time the CIV guns were in imminent danger, but were energetically covered by Captain Budworth, adjutant of the battery. Soon, however, the infantry, Munster Fusiliers, and Yorkshire Light Infantry, which had been carrying out a turning movement, came into action, and the position was taken. The force moved onwards, and on July 6 they were in front of Bethlehem. The place is surrounded by hills, and the enemy was found strongly posted. Clements's force was now on the left and Pegget's on the right. From both sides an attempt was made to turn the Boer flanks, but they were found to be very wide and strong. All day a long-range action was kept up while Clements felt his way in the hope of coming upon some weak spot in the position but in the evening a direct attack was made by Pegget's two infantry regiments upon the right, which gave the British a footing on the Boer position. The Munster Fusiliers and the Yorkshire Light Infantry lost forty killed and wounded, including four officers, in this gallant affair, the heavy loss and the greater honour going to the men of Munster. The centre of the position was still held, and on the morning of July 7 Clements gave instructions to the Colonel of the Royal Irish to storm it if the occasion should seem favourable. Such an order to such a regiment means that the occasion will seem favourable. Up they went in three extended lines, dropping forty or fifty on the way, but arriving breathless and enthusiastic upon the crest of the ridge.
Below them, upon the further side, lay the village of Bethlehem. On the slopes beyond hundreds of horsemen were retreating, and a gun was being hurriedly dragged into the town. For a moment it seemed as if nothing had been left as a trophy, but suddenly a keen-eyed sergeant raised a cheer, which was taken up again and again until it resounded over the veldt. Under the crest, lying on its side with a broken wheel, was a gun one of the fifteen-pounders of Stormberg which it was a point of honor to regain once more. Many a time had the gunners been friends in need to the infantry. Now it was the turn of the infantry to do something in exchange. That evening Clements had occupied Bethlehem, and one more of their towns had passed out of the hands of the free staters. A word now as to that force under General Hunter which was closing in from the north. The gallant and energetic Hamilton, Lean, Aquiline, and Tireless, had, as already stated, broken his collarbone at Heidelberg, and it was as his lieutenant that Hunter was leading these troops out of the Transvaal into the Orange River colony. Most of his infantry was left behind at Heidelberg, but he took with him Broadwood's cavalry, two brigades, and Bruce Hamilton's 21st Infantry Brigade, with Ridley's mounted infantry, some 7,000 men in all. On the 2nd of July this force reached Frankfurt in the north of the Free State without resistance, and on July 3rd they were joined there by Macdonald's force from Heilbronn, so that Hunter found himself with over 11,000 men under his command. Here was an instrument with which surely the coup de grace could be given to the dying state. Passing south, still without meeting serious resistance, Hunter occupied Reitz, and finally sent on Broadwood's cavalry to Bethlehem, where on July 8 they joined Pegget and Clements. The net was now in position, and about to be drawn tight, but at this last moment the biggest fish of all dashed furiously out from it. Leaving the main free state force in a hopeless position behind him, De Wet, with 1500 well mounted men and five guns, broke through Slabert's neck between Bethlehem and Fixburg, and made swiftly for the northwest, closely followed by Pegates and Broadwood's cavalry. It was on July 16 that he made his dash for freedom. On the 19th, Little, with the 3rd Cavalry Brigade, had come into touch with him near Lindley. De Wet shook himself clear, and with splendid audacity cut the railway once more to the north of Honing Sprout, gathering up a train as he passed, and taking 200 details prisoners. On July 22 De Wet was at Vreed effort, still closely followed by Broadwood, Ridley, and Little, who gleaned his wagons and his stragglers. Thence he threw himself into the hilly country some miles to the south of the Val River, where he lurked for a week or more while Lord Kitchener came south to direct the operations which would, as it was hoped, lead to a surrender. Leaving the indomitable guerrilla in his hiding place, the narrative must return to that drawing of the net which still continued in spite of the escape of this one important fish. On all sides the British forces had drawn closer and they were both more numerous and more formidable in quality. It was evident now that by a rapid advance from Bethlehem in the direction of the Barsutta border all bores to the north of Fixburg would be hemmed in. On July 22 the columns were moving. On that date Pegget moved out of Bethlehem, and Rundell took a step forward from Fixburg. Bruce Hamilton had already, at the cost of twenty Cameron Highlanders, got a grip upon a bastion of that rocky country in which the enemy lurked. On the 23rd Hunter's force was held by the Boers at the strong pass of Retief's Neck, but on the 24th they were compelled to abandon it, as the capture of Slabert's Neck by Clements threatened their ear. This latter pass was fortified most elaborately. It was attacked upon the 23rd by Brabant's horse and the Royal Irish without success. Later in the day two companies of the Wiltshire Regiment were also brought to a standstill, but retained a position until nightfall within stone throw of the bore lines, though a single company had lost seventeen killed and wounded. Part of the Royal Irish remained also close to the enemy's trenches. Under cover of darkness, Clement sent four companies of the Royal Irish and two of the Wiltshires under Colonel Guinness to make a flanking movement along the crest of the heights. These six companies completely surprised the enemy, and caused them to hurriedly evacuate the position. Their night march was performed under great difficulties, 
The men crawling on hands and knees along a rocky path with a drop of 400 feet upon one side. But their exertions were greatly rewarded. Upon the success of their turning movement depended the fall of Slabotsnik. Retief's neck was untenable if we held Slabotsnik, and if both were in our hands the retreat of Prince Lou was cut off. At every opening of the hills the British guns were thundering, and the heads of British columns were appearing on every height. The Highland Brigade had fairly established themselves over the Boer position, though not without hard fighting, in which a hundred men of the Highland Light Infantry had been killed and wounded. The Seaforths and the Sussex had also gripped the positions in front of them, and taken some punishment in doing so. The outworks of the Great Mountain Fortress were all taken, and on July 26 the British columns were converging on Verisburg, while no port on the line of retreat was held by Macdonald. It was only a matter of time now with the Boers. On the 28th Clements was still advancing and contracting still further the space which was occupied by our stubborn foe. He found himself faced by the stiff position of Slapkrantz, and a hot little action was needed before the Boers could be dislodged. The fighting fell upon Brabant's horse, the Royal Irish, and the Wiltshires. Three companies of the latter seized a farm upon the enemy's left, but lost ten men in doing so, while their gallant Colonel, Carter, was severely wounded in two places. The Wiltshires, who were excellently handled by Captain Bolton, held on to the farm and were reinforced there by a handful of the Scots guards. In the night the position was abandoned by the Boers, and the advance swept onwards. On all sides the pressure was becoming unendurable. The burghers in the valley below could see all day the twinkle of British heliographs from every hill while at night the constant flash of signals told of the sleepless vigilance which hemmed them in. Upon July 29, Prince Lou sent in a request for an armistice, which was refused. Later in the day he dispatched a messenger with a white flag to Hunter, with an announcement of his unconditional surrender. On July 30 the motley army which had held the British off so long emerged from among the mountains. but it soon became evident that in speaking for all Prince Lou had gone beyond his powers. Discipline was low and individualism high in the Boer army. Every man might repudiate the decision of his commandant, as every man might repudiate the white flag of his comrade. On the first day no more than 1100 men of the Fixburg and Lady Brand commandos, with 1500 horses and two guns, were surrendered. Next day 750 more men came in with 800 horses, and by August 6 the total of the prisoners had mounted to 4150 with three guns, two of which were our own. But Olivier, with 1500 men and several guns, broke away from the captured force and escaped through the hills. Of this incident General Hunter, an honorable soldier, remarks in his official report, I regard it as a dishonorable breach of faith upon the part of General Olivier, for which I hold him personally responsible. He admitted that he knew that General Prinsloo had included him in the unconditional surrender. It is strange that, on Olivier's capture shortly afterwards, he was not court-martialed for this breach of the rules of war, but that good-natured giant, the Empire, is quick too quick, perhaps to let Piegons be Piegons. On August 4 Harrismith surrendered to Macdonald, and thus was secure the opening of the Van Rien's Pass and the end of the natal system of railways. This was of the very first importance, as the utmost difficulty had been found in supplying so large a body of troops so far from the Cape base. In a day the base was shifted to Durban, and the distance shortened by two-thirds, while the army came to be on the railway instead of a hundred miles from it. This great success assured Lord Roberts's communications from serious attack, and was of the utmost importance in enabling him to consolidate his position at Pretoria. Chapter 28. The halt at Pretoria. Lord Roberts had now been six weeks in the capital, and British troops had overrun the greater part of the south and west of the Transvaal, but in spite of this, there was continued Boer resistance which flared suddenly up in places which had been nominally pacified and disarmed. It was found, as has often been shown in history, 
that it is easier to defeat a Republican army than to conquer it. From Klerksdorp, from Ventersdorp, from Rosenberg, came news of risings against the newly imposed British authority. The concealed Morser and the Bandelier were dug up once more from the trampled corner of the cattle kraal, and the farmer was a warrior once again. Vague news of the exploits of De Wet stimulated the fighting burghers and shamed those who had submitted. A letter was intercepted from the guerrilla chief to Kronje's son, who had surrendered near Usenberg. De Wet stated that he had gained two great victories and had 1500 captured rifles with which to replace those which the burghers had given up. Not only were the outlying districts in a state of revolt, but even round Pretoria the Boers were inclined to take the offensive while both that town and Johannesburg were filled with malcontents who were ready to fly to their arms once more. Already at the end of June there were signs that the Boers realized how helpless Lord Roberts was until his remounts should arrive. The mosquitoes buzzed round the crippled lion. On June 29 there was an attack upon Springs near Johannesburg, which was easily beaten off by the Canadians. Early in July some of the cavalry and mounted infantry patrols were snapped up in the neighborhood of the capital. Lord Roberts gave orders accordingly that Hutton and Marne should sweep the Boers back upon his right, and push them as far as Bronckhorst Sprout. This was done on July 6 and 7, the British advance meeting with considerable resistance from artillery as well as rifles. By this movement the pressure upon the right was relieved which might have created a dangerous unrest in Johannesburg, and it was done at the moderate cost of 34 killed and wounded, half of whom belonged to the Imperial Light Horse. This famous corps, which had come across with Marn from the relief of Mafeking, had, a few days before, ridden with mixed feelings through the streets of Johannesburg and passed, in many instances, the deserted houses which had once been their homes. Many weary months were to pass before the survivors might occupy them. On July 9 the Boers again attacked, but were again pushed back to the eastward. It is probable that all these demonstrations of the enemy upon the right of Lord Roberts's extended position were really feints in order to cover the far-reaching plans which Bota had in his mind. The disposition of the Boer forces at this time appears to have been as follows. Bota with his army occupied a position along the Lagoa railway line, further east than Diamond Hill, whence he detached the bodies which attacked Hutton upon the extreme right of the British position to the southeast of Pretoria. To the north of Pretoria a second force was acting under Grobler, while a third under Delare had been dispatched secretly across to the left wing of the British, northwest of Pretoria. While Boto engaged the attention of Lord Roberts by energetic demonstrations on his right, Grobler and Delare were to make a sudden attack upon his centre and his left, each point being twelve or fifteen miles from the other. It was well devised and very well carried out, but the inherent defect of it was that, when subdivided in this way, the Boer force was no longer strong enough to gain more than a mere success of outposts. Delare's attack was delivered at break of day on July 11 at Uit Vlosnik, a post some 18 miles west of the capital. This position could not be said to be part of Lord Roberts's line, but rather to be a link to connect his army with Rosenberg. It was weakly held by three companies of the Lincolns with two others in support, one squadron of the Scots Greys and two guns of O battery RHA the attack came with the first grey light of dawn, and for many hours the small garrison bore up against a deadly fire, waiting for the help which never came. All day they held their assailants at bay, and it was not until evening that their ammunition ran short and they were forced to surrender. Nothing could have been better than the behaviour of the men, both infantry, cavalry, and gunners, but their position was a hopeless one. The casualties amounted to 80 killed and wounded. Nearly 200 were made prisoners and the two guns were taken. On the same day that Delare made his coup at Uit Vlznik, Grobler had shown his presence on the north side of the town by treating very roughly a couple of squadrons of the 7th Dragoon Guards which had attacked him. By the help of a section of the ubiquitous O battery and of the 14th Hussars, Colonel Lowe was able to disengage his cavalry from the trap into which they had fallen but it was at the cost of between 30 and 40 officers and men killed, wounded, or taken. 
the old black horse sustained their historical reputation, and fought their way bravely out of an almost desperate situation, where they were exposed to the fire of a thousand riflemen and four guns. On this same day of skirmishes, July 11th, the Gordons had seen some hot work 20 miles or so to the south of Uitville's neck. Orders had been given to the 19th Brigade, Smith Doyens, to proceed to Krugerstorp, and thence to make their way north. The Scottish Yeomanry and a section of the 78th RFA accompanied them. The idea seems to have been that they would be able to drive north any Boers in that district, who would then find the garrison of Uitville's neck at their rear. The advance was checked, however, at a place called Dolverkrantz, which was strongly held by Boer riflemen. The two guns were insufficiently protected, and the enemy got within short range of them, killing or wounding many of the gunners. The lieutenant in charge, Mr. A. J. Turner, the famous Essex cricketer, worked the gun with his own hands until he also fell wounded in three places. The situation was now very serious, and became more so when news was flashed of the disaster at Hewitt Vlosnik, and they were ordered to retire. They could not retire and abandon the guns, yet the fire was so hot that it was impossible to remove them. Gallant attempts were made by volunteers from the Gordons Captain Younger and other brave men throwing away their lives in the vain effort to reach and to limber up the guns. At last, under the cover of night, the teams were harnessed and the two field pieces successfully removed, while the Boers who rushed in to seize them were scattered by a volley. The losses in the action were 36 and the gain nothing. Decidedly July 11th was not a lucky day for the British arms. It was well known to Bota that every train from the south was bringing horses for Lord Roberts's army, and that it had become increasingly difficult for De Wet and his men to hinder their arrival. The last horse must win, and the Empire had the world on which to draw. Any movement which the Boers would make must be made at once, for already both the cavalry and the mounted infantry were rapidly coming back to their full strength once more. This consideration must have urged Bota to deliver an attack on July 16, which had some success at first, but was afterwards beaten off with heavy loss to the enemy. The fighting fell principally upon Bolkaru and Hutton, the corps chiefly engaged being the Royal Irish Fusiliers, the New Zealanders, the Shropshires, and the Canadian Mounted Infantry. The enemy tried repeatedly to assault the position but were beaten back each time with a loss of nearly a hundred killed and wounded. The British loss was about sixty, and included two gallant young Canadian officers, Borden and Birch, the former being the only son of the Minister of Militia. So ended the last attempt made by Boto upon the British positions round Pretoria. The end of the war was not yet, but already its futility was abundantly evident. This had become more apparent since the junction of Hamilton and of Buller had cut off the Transvaal army from that of the Free State. Unable to send their prisoners away, and also unable to feed them, the Free Staters were compelled to deliver up in Natal the prisoners whom they had taken at Lindley and Rudeville. These men, a ragged and starving battalion, emerged at Ladysmith, having made their way through Van Rien's Pass. It is a singular fact that no parole appears on these and similar occasions to have been exacted by the Boers. Lord Roberts, having remounted a large part of his cavalry, was ready now to advance eastward and give Bo to battle. The first town of any consequence along the Delagoa Railway is Middelburg, some seventy miles from the capital. This became the British objective, and the forces of Marne and Hamilton on the north, of Polkaru in the centre and of French and Hutton to the south, all converged upon it. There was no serious resistance, though the weather was abominable, and on July 27 the town was in the hands of the invaders. From that date until the final advance to the eastward French held this advanced post, while Paul Carew guarded the railway line. Rumours of trouble in the west had convinced Roberts that it was not yet time to push his advantage to the east and he recalled Ian Hamilton's force to act for a time upon the other side of the seat of the war. This excellent little army, consisting of Marnes and Pilchers mounted infantry, M Battery RHA, the Elswick Battery, two 5-inch and two 4.7 guns, with the Berkshires, the Border Regiment, the Argyll and Sutherlands, and the Scottish Borderers, 
put in as much hard work in marching and in fighting as any body of troops in the whole campaign. The renewal of the war in the West had begun some weeks before, but was much accelerated by the transference of Tlare and his burghers to that side. There is no district in the Transvaal which is better worth fighting for, for it is a fair countryside, studded with farmhouses and green with orange groves, with many clear streams running through it. The first sign of activity appears to have been on July 7, when a commando with guns appeared upon the hills above Russenberg. Hanbury Tracy, commandant of Russenberg, was suddenly confronted with a summons to surrender. He had only 120 men and one gun, but he showed a bold front. Colonel Holdsworth, at the first whisper of danger, had started from Zerust with a small force of Australian bushmen, and arrived at Russenberg in time to drive the enemy away in a very spirited action. On the evening of July 8 Baden Powell took over the command, the garrison being reinforced by Plumer's command. The Boer commando was still in existence, however, and it was reinforced and reinvigorated by Delaray's success at Hewitt Vlznik. On July 18 they began to close in upon Russenberg again, and a small skirmish took place between them and the Australians. Methuen's division, which had been doing very arduous service in the north of the Free State during the last six weeks, now received orders to proceed into the Transvaal and to pass northwards through the disturbed districts en route for Russenberg which appeared to be the storm center. The division was transported by train from Kroonstad to Kruzsdorp, and advanced on the evening of July 18 upon its mission, through a bear and fire blackened country. On the 19th Lord Methuen maneuvered the Boers out of a strong position, with little loss to either side. On the 21st he forced his way through Oliphantsnik, in the Magalisberg range, and so established communication with Baden Powell, whose valiant bushmen, under Colonel Airy, had held their own in a severe conflict near Magato Pass, in which they lost six killed, nineteen wounded, and nearly two hundred horses. The fortunate arrival of Captain Fitz Clarence with the Protectorate Regiment helped on this occasion to avert a disaster. The force, only three hundred strong, without guns, had walked into an ugly ambuscade and only the tenacity and resource of the men enabled them ever to extricate themselves. Although Methuen came within reach of Russenberg, he did not actually join hands with Baden Powell. No doubt he saw and heard enough to convince him that that astute soldier was very well able to take care of himself. Learning of the existence of a Boer force in his rear, Methuen turned, and on July 29 he was back at Frederickstad on the Potchfstrom to Kruzsdorp Railway. The sudden change in his plans was caused, doubtless by the desire to head off to wet in case he should cross the Val River. Lord Roberts was still anxious to clear the neighborhood of Russenberg entirely of the enemy, and he therefore, since Methuen was needed to complete the cordon round the wet, recalled Hamilton's force from the east and dispatched it, as already described, to the west of Pretoria. Before going into the details of the great de wet hunt, in which Methuen's force was to be engaged, I shall follow Hamilton's division across, and give some account of their services. On August 1st he set out from Pretoria for Russenberg. On that day and on the next he had brisk skirmishes which brought him successfully through the Maglisberg range with a loss of 40 wounded, mostly of the Berkshires. On the 5th of August he had made his way to Russenberg and drove off the investing force. A smaller siege had been going on to westward, where at Elands River another Mafeking man, Colonel Hoare, had been held up by the Bergers. For some days it was feared, and even officially announced, that the garrison had surrendered. It was known that an attempt by Carrington to relieve the place on August 5 had been beaten back, and that the state of the country appeared so threatening that he had been compelled, or had imagined himself to be compelled, to retreat as far as Mafeking evacuating Zerust and Otto's Hoop, abandoning the considerable stores which were collected at those places. In spite of all these sinister indications the garrison was still holding its own, and on August 16 it was relieved by Lord Kitchener. This standard Brackfontein on the Elands River appears to have been one of the very finest deeds of arms of the war. 
the Australians have been so split up during the campaign, that though their valour and efficiency were universally recognised, they had no single exploit which they could call their own. But now they can point to Elands River as proudly as the Canadians can to Paderberg. There were 500 in number, Victorians, New South Welshmen, and Queenslanders, the latter the larger unit, with a corps of Rhodesians. Under Hoare were Major Hopper of the Rhodesians, and Major Tubridge of the Queenslanders. 2,500 Boers surrounded them, and most favourable terms of surrender were offered and scouted. Six guns were trained upon them, and during eleven days 1,800 shells fell within their lines. The river was half a mile off, and every drop of water for man or beast had to come from there. Nearly all their horses and 75 of the men were killed or wounded. With extraordinary energy and ingenuity the little band dug shelters which are said to have exceeded in depth and efficiency any which the Boers have devised. Neither the repulse of Carrington, nor the jamming of their only gun, nor the death of the gallant Annett, was sufficient to dishearten them. They were sworn to die before the white flag should wave above them. And so fortune yielded, as a fortune will when brave men set their teeth, and Broadwood's troopers, filled with wonder and admiration, rode into the lines of the reduced and emaciated but indomitable garrison. When the ballad makers of Australia seek for a subject, let them turn to Eland's River, for there was no finer resistance in the war. They will not grudge a place in their record to the 130 gallant Rhodesians who shared with them the honours and the dangers of the exploit. On August 7 Ian Hamilton abandoned Rosenberg, taking Baden Powell and his men with him. It was obviously unwise to scatter the British forces too widely by attempting to garrison every single town. For the instant the whole interest of the war centred upon De Wet and his dash into the Transvaal. One or two minor events, however, which cannot be fitted into any continuous narrative may be here introduced. One of these was the action at Faber's Put, by which Sir Charles Warren crushed the rebellion in Griqualand. In that sparsely inhabited country of vast distances it was a most difficult task to bring the revolt to a decisive ending. This Sir Charles Warren, with his special local knowledge and interest, was able to do, and the success is doubly welcome as bringing additional honour to a man who, whatever view one may take of his action at Spyankop, has grown grey in the service of the Empire. With a column consisting mainly of colonials and of yeomanry he had followed the rebels up to a point within twelve miles of Douglas. Here at the end of May they turned upon him and delivered a fierce night attack, so sudden and so strongly pressed that much credit is due both to general and to troops for having repelled it. The camp was attacked on all sides in the early dawn. The greater part of the horses were stampeded by the firing and the enemy's riflemen were found to be at very close quarters. For an hour the action was warm, but at the end of that time the Boers fled, leaving a number of dead behind them. The troops engaged in this very creditable action, which might have tried the steadiness of veterans, were four hundred of the Duke of Edinburgh's volunteers, some of Pegget's horse and of the 8th Regiment Imperial Yeomanry, four Canadian guns, and twenty-five of Warren's scouts. Their losses were 18 killed and 30 wounded. Colonel Spence, of the volunteers, died at the head of his regiment. A few days before, on May 27, Colonel Eddy had won a small engagement at Kays, some distance to the westward, and the effect of the two actions was to put an end to open resistance. On June 20 de Villiers, the Boer leader, finally surrendered to Sir Charles Warren, handing over 220 men with stores rifles, and ammunition. The last sparks had for the time been stamped out in the colony. There remain to be mentioned those attacks upon trains and upon the railway which had spread from the Free State to the Transvaal. On July 19 the train was wrecked on the way from Pochstrom to Kruger Storp without serious injury to the passengers. On July 31, however, the same thing occurred with more murderous effect the train running at full speed off the metals. Thirteen of the Shropshires were killed and thirty-seven injured in this deplorable affair, which cost us more than many an important engagement.
On August 2 a train coming up from Bloemfontein was derailed by Cyril Theron and his gang some miles south of Kroonstad. Thirty-five trucks of stores were burned, and six of the passengers, unarmed convalescent soldiers, were killed or wounded. A body of mounted infantry followed up the Boers, who numbered eighty, and succeeded in killing and wounding several of them. On July 21, the Boers made a determined attack upon the railhead at a point 13 miles east of Heidelberg, where over a hundred Royal Engineers were engaged upon a bridge. They were protected by 300 Dublin Fusiliers under Major English. For some hours, the little party was hard pressed by the Burgers who had two field pieces and a pom-pom. They could make no impression, however, upon the steady Irish infantry, and after some hours the arrival of General Hart with reinforcements scattered the assailants, who succeeded in getting their guns away in safety. At the beginning of August it must be confessed that the general situation in the Transvaal was not reassuring. Springs near Johannesburg had in some inexplicable way, without fighting, fallen into the hands of the enemy. Klerksdorp, an important place in the southwest, had also been reoccupied, and a handful of men who garrisoned it had been made prisoners without resistance. Russenburg was about to be abandoned, and the British were known to be falling back from Zerust and Otto's Hoop, concentrating upon Mafeking. The sequel proved however, that there was no cause for uneasiness in all this. Lord Roberts was concentrating his strength upon those objects which were vital, and letting the others drift for a time. At present the two obviously important things were to hunt down the wet and to scatter the main Boer army on the boater. The latter enterprise must wait upon the former, so for a fortnight all operations were in abeyance while the flying columns of the British endeavoured to run down their extremely active and energetic antagonist. At the end of July the wet had taken refuge in some exceedingly difficult country near Eatsburg, seven miles south of the Val River. The operations were proceeding vigorously at that time against the main army at Vereesburg, and sufficient troops could not be spared to attack him but he was closely observed by Kitchener and Broadwood with a force of cavalry and mounted infantry. With the surrender of Prince Lou a large army was disengaged, and it was obvious that if De Wet remained where he was he must soon be surrounded. On the other hand, there was no place of refuge to the south of him. With great audacity he determined to make a dash for the Transvaal, in the hope of joining hands with De La Rey's force or else of making his way across the north of Pretoria, and so reaching Bota's army. President Steyn went with him, and a most singular experience it must have been for him to be harried like a mad dog through the country in which he had once been an honoured guest. De Wet's force was exceedingly mobile, each man having a led horse, and the ammunition being carried in light cape carts. In the first week of August the British began to thicken round his lurking place, and De Wet knew that it was time for him to go. He made a great show of fortifying a position, but it was only a ruse to deceive those who watched him. Travelling as lightly as possible, he made a dash on August 7 at the drift which bears his own name, and so won his way across the Val River, Kitchener thundering at his heels with his cavalry and mounted infantry. Methuen's force was at that time at Pochfstrom and instant orders had been sent to him to block the drifts upon the northern side. It was found as he approached the river that the vanguard of the enemy was already across and that it was holding the spurs of the hills which would cover the crossing of their comrades. By the dash of the Royal Welsh Fusiliers and the exertions of the artillery ridge after ridge was carried, but before evening De Wet with supreme skill had got his convoy across, and had broken away, first to the eastward and then to the north. On the ninth Methuen was in touch with him again, and the two savage little armies, Methuen worrying at the haunch, and De Wet snapping back over his shoulder, swept northward over the huge plains. Wherever there was ridge or cop the Boer riflemen staved off the eager pursuers. Where the ground lay flat and clear the British guns thundered onwards and fired into the lines of wagons. Mile after mile the running fight was sustained, but the other British columns, Broadwood's men and Kitchener's men, had for some reason not come up. Methuen alone was numerically inferior to the men he was chasing, but he held on with admirable energy and spirit. 
the boars were hustled off the coppice from which they tried to cover their ear. Twenty men of the Yorkshire Yeomanry carried one hill with the bayonet, though only twelve of them were left to reach the top. The wet trekked onwards during the night of the ninth, shedding wagons and stores as he went. He was able to replace some of his exhausted beasts from the farmhouses which he passed. Matthew on the morning of the tenth struck away to the west, sending messages back to Broadwood and Kitchener in the rear that they should bear to the east, and so nurse the boar column between them. At the same time he sent on a messenger, who unfortunately never arrived, to warn Smith Doyen at Bank Station to throw himself across De Wet's path. On the eleventh it was realized that De Wet had succeeded, in spite of great exertions upon the part of Smith Doyen's infantry, in crossing the railway line, and that he had left all his pursuers to the south of him. But across his front lay the Maglisberg Range. There are only three passes, the Magato Pass, Oliphant's Nick, and Commando Nick. It was understood that all three were held by British troops. It was obvious, therefore, that if Methuen could advance in such a way as to cut De Wet off from slipping through to the west he would be unable to get away. Broadwood and Kitchener would be behind him, and Pretoria, with the main British army, to the east. Methuen continued to act with great energy and judgment. At 3 a.m. on the 12th he started from Frederickstadt, and by 5 p.m. on Tuesday he had done 80 miles in 60 hours. The force which accompanied him was all mounted, 1,200 of the Colonial Division, 1st Brabant's, Cape Mounted Rifles, Caffrarian Rifles, and Border Horse, and the Yeomanry with 10 guns. Douglas with the infantry was to follow behind, and these brave fellows covered 66 miles in 76 hours in their eagerness to be in time. No men could have made greater efforts than did those of Methuen, for there was not one who did not appreciate the importance of the issue and longed to come to close quarters with the wily leader who had baffled us so long. On the twelfth, Methuen's van again overtook De Wet's rear, and the old game of rearguard riflemen on one side, and a pushing artillery on the other, was once more resumed. All day the boars streamed over the veldt with the guns and the horsemen at their heels. A shot from the 78th battery struck one of De Wet's guns, which was abandoned and captured. Many stores were taken and much more, with the wagons which contained them, burned by the boars. Fighting incessantly, both armies traversed 35 miles of ground that day. It was fully understood that Oliphant's neck was held by the British. So Methuen felt that if he could block the Magato Pass all would be well. He therefore left De Wet's direct track, knowing that other British forces were behind him, and he continued his swift advance until he had reached the desired position. It really appeared that at last the elusive raider was in a corner. But, alas for fallen hopes, and alas for the wasted efforts of gallant men. Oliphant's neck had been abandoned and De Wet had passed safely through it into the plains beyond, where De Larre's force was still in possession. In vain Methuen's weary column forced the Magato pass and descended into Russenburg. The enemy was in a safe country once more. Who's the fault, or whether there was a fault at all, it is for the future to determine. At least an alloyed praise can be given to the ball leader for the admirable way in which he had extricated himself from so many dangers. On the 17th, moving along the northern side of the mountains, he appeared at Commando Nick on the Little Crocodile River, where he summoned Baden Powell to surrender, and received some chaff in reply from that light-hearted commander. Then, swinging to the eastward, he endeavored to cross to the north of Pretoria. On the 19th he was heard of at Hebron. Baden Powell and Pegget had, however, already barred this path, and De Wet, having sent Stain on with a small escort, turned back to the Free State. On the 22nd it was reported that, with only a handful of his followers, he had crossed the Maglisberg Range by a bridle path and was riding southwards. Lord Roberts was at last free to turn his undivided attention upon boat. Two boar plots had been discovered during the first half of August, the one in Pretoria and the other in Johannesburg, 
each having for its object a rising against the British in the town. Of these the former, which was the more serious, involving as it did the kidnapping of Lord Roberts, was broken up by the arrest of the divisor, Hans Cordua, a German lieutenant in the Transvaal artillery. On its merits it is unlikely that the crime would have been met by the extreme penalty, especially as it was a question whether the agent provocateur had not played a part. But the repeated breaches of parole, by which our prisoners of one day were in the field against us on the next, called imperatively for an example, and it was probably rather for his broken faith than for his harebrained scheme that Cordua died. At the same time it is impossible not to feel sorrow for this idealist of twenty-three who died for a cause which was not his own. He was shot in the garden of Pretoria jail upon August 24. A fresh and more stringent proclamation from Lord Roberts showed that the British commander was losing his patience in the face of the wholesale return of paroled men to the field, and announced that such perfidy would in future be severely punished. It was notorious that the same men had been taken and released more than once. One man killed in action was found to have nine signed passes in his pocket. It was against such abuses that the extra severity of the British was aimed. Chapter 29. The advance to Kamati Port. The time had now come for the great combined movement which was to sweep the main Boer army off the line of the De Lagoa railway, cut its source of supplies and follow it into that remote and mountainous Lidenburg district which had always been proclaimed as the last refuge of the burghers. Before entering upon this most difficult of all his advances Lord Roberts waited until the cavalry and mounted infantry were well mounted again. Then, when all was ready, the first step in this last stage of the regular campaign was taken by General Buller who moved his army of natal veterans off the railway line and advanced to a position from which he could threaten the flank and rear of Boto if he held his ground against Lord Roberts. Buller's cavalry had been reinforced by the arrival of Stratconnor's horse, a fine body of Canadian troopers, whose services had been presented to the nation by the public-spirited nobleman whose name they bore. They were distinguished by their fine physique, and by the lassoes, cowboy stirrups, and large spurs of the northwestern plains. It was in the first week of July that Clary joined hands with the Heidelberg garrison, while Coke with the 10th Brigade cleared the right flank of the railway by an expedition as far as Amis Fort. On July 6, the natal communications were restored, and on the 7th, Buller was able to come through to Pretoria and confer with the commander in chief. A Boer force with heavy guns still hung about the line and several small skirmishes were fought between Vlakfontein and Greylingstad in order to drive it away. By the middle of July the immediate vicinity of the railway was clear save for some small marauding parties who endeavoured to tamper with the rails and the bridges. Up to the end of the month the whole of the natal army remained strung along the line of communications from Heidelberg to Standerton waiting for the collection of forage and transport to enable them to march north against Boater's position. On August 8 Buller's troops advanced to the northeast from Padkop, pushing a weak Boer force with five guns in front of them. At the cost of 25 wounded, principally of the 60th rifles, the enemy was cleared off, and the town of Amos Fort was occupied. On the 13th, moving on the same line, and meeting with very slight opposition, Buller took possession of Ermelo. His advance was having a good effect upon the district, for on the 12th the Standerton Commando, which numbered 182 men, surrendered to Clary. On the 15th, still skirmishing, Buller's men were at Twyfela, and had taken possession of Carolina. Here and there a distant horseman riding over the olive-coloured hills showed how closely and incessantly he was watched, but, save for a little sniping upon his flanks. There was no fighting. He was coming now within touch of French's cavalry, operating from Middelburg, and on the 14th heliographic communication was established with Gordon's brigade. Buller's column had come nearer to its friends, but it was also nearer to the main body of Boers who were waiting in that very rugged piece of country which lies between Belfast in the west and Makado Dorp in the east. From this rocky stronghold they had thrown out mobile bodies to harass the British advance from the south, and every day brought Buller into closer touch with these advance guards of the enemy. 
On August 21 he had moved eight miles nearer to Belfast, French operating upon his left flank. Here he found the Boers in considerable numbers, but he pushed them northward with his cavalry, mounted infantry, and artillery, losing between 30 and 40 killed and wounded, the greater part from the ranks of the 18th Hussars and the Gordon Highlanders. This march brought him within 15 miles of Belfast, which lay due north of him. At the same time Pole Carew with the central column of Lord Roberts's force had advanced along the railway line, and on August 24 he occupied Belfast with little resistance. He found, however, that the enemy were holding the formidable ridges which lie between that place and Dalmanuta, and that they showed every sign of giving battle, presenting a firm front to Buller on the south as well as to Roberts's army on the west. On the 23rd some successes attended their efforts to check the advance from the south. During the day Buller had advanced steadily, though under incessant fire. The evening found him only six miles to the south of Dalmanuta, the center of the Boer position. By some misfortune, however, after dark two companies of the Liverpool Regiment found themselves isolated from their comrades and exposed to a very heavy fire. They had pushed forward too far, and were very near to being surrounded and destroyed. There were 56 casualties in their ranks, and 32, including their wounded captain, were taken. The total losses in the day were 121. On August 25 it was evident that important events were at hand for on that date Lord Roberts arrived at Belfast and held a conference with Buller, French, and Paul Carew. The general communicated his plans to his three lieutenants, and on the 26th and following days the fruits of the interview were seen in a succession of rapid maneuvers which drove the Boers out of this, the strongest position which they had held since they left the banks of the Tugla. The advance of Lord Roberts was made, as his wont is, with two widespread wings and a central body to connect them. Such a movement leaves the enemy in doubt as to which flank will really be attacked, while if he denudes his center in order to strengthen both flanks there is the chance of a frontal advance which might cut him in two. French with two cavalry brigades formed the left advance, Pole Carew the center, and Buller the right, the whole operations extending over thirty miles of infamous country. It is probable that Lord Roberts had reckoned that the Borite was likely to be their strongest position, since if it were turned it would cut off their retreat upon Lidenburg, so his own main attack was directed upon their left. This was carried out by General Buller on August 26 and 27 th. On the first day the movement upon Buller's part consisted in a very deliberate reconnaissance of and closing in upon the enemy's position his troops bivouacking upon the ground which they had won. On the second, finding that all further progress was barred by the strong ridge of Burgundal, he prepared his attack carefully with artillery and then let loose his infantry upon it. It was a gallant feat of arms upon either side. The Boer position was held by a detachment of the Johannesburg police, who may have been bullies in peace, but were certainly heroes in war. The fire of sixty guns was concentrated for a couple of hours upon a position only a few hundred yards in diameter. In this infernal fire, which left the rocks yellow with lyddite, the survivors still waited grimly for the advance of the infantry. No finer defense was made in the war. The attack was carried out across an open glassy by the second rifle brigade and by the Innis King Fusiliers, the men of Peter's Hill. Through a deadly fire the gallant infantry swept over the position, though Metcalf, the brave colonel of the rifles, with eight other officers, and seventy men were killed or wounded. Leslie, Stewart, and Campbell were all killed in leading their companies, but they could not have met their deaths upon an occasion more honorable to their battalion. Great credit must also be given to and be companies of the Innis King Fusiliers, who were actually the first over the Boer position. The cessation of the artillery fire was admirably timed. It was sustained up to the last possible instant. As it was, said the captain of the leading company, a 94-pound shell burst about 30 yards in front of the right of our lot. The smell of the lyddite was awful. A pom-pom and twenty prisoners, including the commander of the police, were the trophies of the day. An outwork of the Boer position had been carried, 
and the rumor of defeat and disaster had already spread through their ranks. Braver men than the burghers have never lived, but they had reached the limits of human endurance, and a long experience of defeat in the field had weakened their nerve and lessened their morale. They were no longer men of the same fiber as those who had crept up to the trenches of Spy and Cop, or faced the lean warriors of Ladysmith on that grim January morning at Caesar's camp. Dutch tenacity would not allow them to surrender, and yet they realized how hopeless was the fight in which they were engaged. Nearly 15,000 of their best men were prisoners, 10,000 at the least had returned to their farms and taken the oath. Another 10 had been killed, wounded, or incapacitated. Most of the European mercenaries had left, they held only the ultimate corner of their own country, they had lost their grip upon the railway line and their supply of stores and of ammunition was dwindling. To such a pass had eleven months of war reduced that formidable army who had so confidently advanced to the conquest of South Africa. While Buller had established himself firmly upon the left of the Boer position, Pole Carew had moved forward to the north of the railway line, and French had advanced as far as Swart Kopje upon the Boer right. These operations on August 26 and 27 were met with some resistance, and entailed a loss of 40 or 50 killed and wounded, but it soon became evident that the punishment which they had received at Burgundal had taken the fight out of the Boers, and that this formidable position was to be abandoned as the others had been. On the 28th the Burgers were retreating, and Mikado Dorp, where Kruger had sat so long in his railway carriage protesting that he would eventually move west and not east, was occupied by Buller. French, moving on a more northerly route, entered Waterfallander with his cavalry upon the same date, driving a small boar force before him. Amid rain and mist the British columns were pushing rapidly forwards, but still the burghers held together, and still their artillery was uncaptured. The retirement was swift. But it was not yet a route. On the 30th, the British cavalry were within touch of Nuitjedukt, and saw a glad sight in a long trail of ragged men who were hurrying in their direction along the railway line. They were the British prisoners, 1800 in number, half of whom had been brought from Waterval when Pretoria was captured, while the other half represented the men who had been sent from the south by De Wet, or from the west by De Laray. Much allowance must be made for the treatment of prisoners by a belligerent who is himself short of food, but nothing can excuse the harshness which the Boers showed to the colonials who fell into their power, or the callous neglect of the sick prisoners at Waterville. It is a humiliating but an interesting fact that from first to last no fewer than 7,000 of our men passed into their power, all of whom were now recovered save some 60 officers who had been carried off by them in their flight. On September 1st Lord Roberts showed his sense of the decisive nature of these recent operations by publishing the proclamation which had been issued as early as July 4th, by which the Transvaal became a portion of the British Empire. On the same day General Buller, who had ceased to advance to the east and retraced his steps as far as Helvetia, began his northerly movement in the direction of Lidenburg which is nearly 50 miles to the north of the railway line. On that date his force made a march of 14 miles, which brought them over the Crocodile River to Bad Fontein. Here, on September 2, Buller found that the indomitable boater was still turning back upon him, for he was faced by so heavy a shell fire, coming from so formidable a position, that he had to be content to wait in front of it until some other column should outflank it. The days of unnecessary frontal attacks were forever over, and his force, though ready for anything which might be asked of it, had gone through a good deal in the recent operations. Since August 21st they had been under fire almost every day, and their losses, though never great on any one occasion, amounted in the aggregate during that time to 365. They had crossed the Tugler, they had relieved Lady Smith, they had forced Lane's neck and now it was to them that the honor had fallen of following the enemy into this last fastness. Whatever criticism may be directed against some episodes in the natal campaign, it must never be forgotten that to Buller and to his men have fallen some of the hardest tasks of the war, and that these tasks have always in the end been successfully carried out. The controversy about the unfortunate message to White 
and the memory of the abandoned guns at Colon so, must not lead us to the injustice of ignoring all that is to be set to the credit account. On September 3rd, Lord Roberts, finding how strong a position faced Buller, dispatched Ian Hamilton with a force to turn it upon the right. Brocklehurst's brigade of cavalry joined Hamilton in his advance. On the 4th he was within signalling distance of Buller, and on the right rear of the Boer position. The occupation of a mountain called Zwaginho Ek would establish Hamilton firmly, and the difficult task of seizing it at night was committed to Colonel Douglas and his fine regiment of Royal Scots. It was spy and cop over again, but with a happy or ending. At break of day the Boers discovered that their position had been rendered untenable and withdrew leaving the road to Lidenberg clear to Buller. Hamilton and he occupied the town upon the 6th. The Boers had split into two parties, the larger one with the guns falling back upon Kruger's post, and the others retiring to Pilgrim's Rest. Amid cloud-girt peaks and hardly passable ravines the two long-enduring armies still wrestled for the final mastery. To the northeast of Lidenberg, between that town and Spitzkop, there is a formidable ridge called the Markburg, and here again the enemy were found to be standing at bay. They were even better than their word, for they had always said that they would make their last stand at Lidenberg, and now they were making one beyond it. But the resistance was weakening. Even this fine position could not be held against the rush of the three regiments, the Devons, the Royal Irish, and the Royal Scots, who were let loose upon it. The artillery supported the attack admirably. They did nobly, said one who led the advance. It is impossible to overrate the value of their support. They ceased also exactly at the right moment. One more shell would have hit us. Mountain mists saved the defeated burghers from a close pursuit, but the hills were carried. The British losses on this day, September 8, were 13 killed and 25 wounded but of these 38 no less than half were accounted for by one of those strange malignant freaks which can neither be foreseen nor prevented. A shrapnel shell, fired at an incredible distance, burst right over the volunteer company of the Gordons who were marching in column. Nineteen men fell, but it is worth recording that, smitten so suddenly and so terribly, the gallant volunteers continued to advance as steadily as before this misfortune befell them. On the 9th Buller was still pushing forward to Spitzkop, his guns and the first rifles overpowering a weak rearguard resistance of the Boers. On the 10th he had reached Klipgat, which is halfway between the Markberg and Spitzkop. So close was the pursuit that the Boers, as they streamed through the passes, flung 13 of their ammunition wagons over the cliffs to prevent them from falling into the hands of the British horsemen. At one period it looked as if the gallant Boer guns had waited too long in covering the retreat of the Burgers. Stratconner's horse pressed closely upon them. The situation was saved by the extreme coolness and audacity of the Boer gunners. When the cavalry were barely half a mile behind the rear gun says an eyewitness and we regarded its capture as certain, the leading Long Tom deliberately turned to bay and opened with case shot at the pursuers streaming down the hill in single file over the head of his brother gun. It was a magnificent coup, and perfectly successful. The cavalry had to retire, leaving a few men wounded, and by the time our heavy guns had arrived both Long Toms had got clean away. But the Boer riflemen would no longer stand. Demoralized after their magnificent struggle of eleven months the burghers were now a beaten and disorderly rabble flying wildly to the eastward, and only held together by the knowledge that in their desperate situation there was more comfort and safety in numbers. The war seemed to be swiftly approaching its close. On the 15th Buller occupied Spitzkop in the north, capturing a quantity of stores, while on the 14th French took Barberton in the south releasing all the remaining British prisoners and taking possession of forty locomotives, which do not appear to have been injured by the enemy. Meanwhile Pol Carew had worked along the railway line, and had occupied Carp Muden, which was the junction where the Barberton line joins that to Lure and Go Marks. Ian Hamilton's force, after the taking of Lidenburg and the action which followed, turned back, leaving Buller to go his own way and reached Kamatiport on September 24, 
having marched since September 9th without a halt through a most difficult country. On September 11th, an incident had occurred which must have shown the most credulous believer in Boer prowess that their cause was indeed lost. On that date, Paul Kruger, a refugee from the country which he had ruined, arrived at Lure and Co. Marx, abandoning his beaten commandos and his deluded burghers. How much had happened since those distant days when as a little herds boy he had walked behind the bullocks on the great northward trek. How piteous this ending to all his strivings and his plottings. A life which might have closed amid the reverence of a nation and the admiration of the world was destined to finish in exile, impotent and undignified. Strange thoughts must have come to him during those hours of flight, memories of his virile and turbulent youth of the first settlement of those great lands, of wild wars where his hand was heavy upon the natives, of the triumphant days of the War of Independence, when England seemed to recoil from the rifles of the burghers. And then the years of prosperity, the years when the simple farmer found himself among the great ones of the earth. His name a household word in Europe, his state rich and powerful his coffers filled with the spoil of the poor drudges who worked so hard and paid taxes so readily. Those were his great days, the days when he hardened his heart against their appeals for justice and looked beyond his own borders to his kinsmen in the hope of a South Africa which should be all his own. And now what had come of it all? A handful of faithful attendants, and a fugitive old man, clutching in his flight at his papers and his money bags. The last of the old world Puritans, he departed poring over his well-thumbed Bible, and proclaiming that the troubles of his country arose, not from his own narrow and corrupt administration, but from some departure on the part of his fellow burghers from the stricter tenets of the Dopper sect. So Paul Kruger passed away from the country which he had loved and ruined. Whilst the main army of Bota had been hustled out of their position at Mikado Dorp and scattered at Lidenburg and at Barberton. A number of other isolated events had occurred at different points of the seat of war, each of which deserves some mention. The chief of these was a sudden revival of the war in the Orange River colony, where the band of Olivier was still wandering in the northeastern districts. Hunter, moving northwards after the capitulation of Prince Louis at Friesburg, came into contact on August 15 with this force near Heilbronn, and had 40 casualties mainly of the Highland Light Infantry, in a brisk engagement. For a time the British seemed to have completely lost touch with Olivier, who suddenly on August 24 struck at a small detachment consisting almost entirely of Queenstown rifle volunteers under Colonel Ridley, who were reconnoitering near Winburg. The colonial troopers made a gallant defence. Throwing themselves into the farmhouse of Help Macca, and occupying every post of vantage around it, they held off more than a thousand assailants, in spite of the three guns which the latter brought to bear upon them. A hundred and thirty-two rounds were fired at the house, but the garrison still refused to surrender. Troopers who had been present at Weapener declared that the smaller action was the warmer of the two. Finally on the morning of the third day a relief force arrived upon the scene, and the enemy dispersed. The British losses were thirty-two killed and wounded. Nothing daunted by his failure, Olivier turned upon the town of Winburg and attempted to regain it, but was defeated again and scattered, he and his three sons being taken. The result was due to the gallantry and craft of a handful of the Queenstown volunteers, who laid an ambuscade in a donga, and disarmed the Boers as they passed, after the pattern of Sanna's post. By this action one of the most daring and resourceful of the Dutch leaders fell into the hands of the British. It is a pity that his record is stained by his dishonourable conduct in breaking the compact made on the occasion of the capture of Prince Lou. But for British magnanimity a drumhead court-martial should have taken the place of the hospitality of the Ceylon planters. On September 2 another commando of free state Boers under Ferry emerged from the mountain country on the Barsutta border and fell upon Lady Brand, which was held by a feeble garrison consisting of one company of the Worcester Regiment and forty-three men of the Wiltshire Yeomanry. The Boers, who had several guns with them, appear to have been the same force which had been repulsed at Winburg. Major White, a gallant marine, 
whose fighting qualities do not seem to have deteriorated with his distance from salt water, had arranged his defenses upon a hill, after the weapon a model, and held his own most stoutly. So great was the disparity of the forces that for days acute anxiety was felt lest another of those humiliating surrenders should interrupt the record of victories, and encourage the Boers to further resistance. The point was distant, and it was some time before relief could reach them. But the dusky chiefs, who from their native mountains looked down on the military drama which was played so close to their frontier, were again, as on the Jamasburg, to see the Boer attack beaten back by the constancy of the British defence. The thin line of soldiers, 150 of them covering a mile and a half of ground, endured a heavy shell and rifle fire with unshaken resolution, repulsed every attempt of the burghers, and held the flag flying until relieved by the forces under White and Bruce Hamilton. In this march to the relief Hamilton's infantry covered 80 miles in four and a half days. Lean and hard, inured to warfare, and far from every temptation of wine or women, the British troops at this stage of the campaign were in such training, and marched so splendidly, that the infantry was often very little slower than the cavalry. Methuen's fine performance in pursuit of De Wet, where Douglas's infantry did 66 miles in 75 hours, the city imperial volunteers covering 224 miles in 14 days, with a single forced march of 30 miles in 17 hours, the Shropshires 43 miles in 32 hours, the 45 miles in 25 hours of the Essex Regiment, Bruce Hamilton's march recorded above and many other fine efforts serve to show the spirit and endurance of the troops. In spite of the defeat at Winburg and the repulsed Lady Brand, there still remained a fair number of broken and desperate men in the free state who held out among the difficult country of the East. A party of these came across in the middle of September and endeavoured to cut the railway near Brandford. They were pursued and broken up by MacDonald, who, much aided in his operations by the band of scouts which Lord Lovat had brought with him from Scotland, took several prisoners and a large number of wagons and of oxen. A party of these Boers attacked a small post of sixteen yeomanry under Lieutenant Slater at Baltfontine, but were held at bay until relief came from Branford. At two other points the Boer and British forces were in contact during these operations. One was to the immediate north of Pretoria, where Grobler's commando was faced by Pegget's brigade. On August 18 the Boers were forced with some loss out of Horny's Neck, which is ten miles to the north of the capital. On the 22nd a more important skirmish took place at Pinners River, in the same direction, between Baden Powell's men, who had come thither in pursuit of De Wet. and Grobler's band. The advance guards of the two forces galloped into each other, and for once Boer and Britain looked down the muzzles of each other's rifles. The gallant Rhodesian regiment, which had done such splendid service during the war, suffered most heavily. Colonel Spreckley and four others were killed, and six or seven wounded. The Boers were broken, however, and fled, leaving twenty-five prisoners to the victors. Baden Powell and Pegget pushed forwards as far as Nilestrom, but finding themselves in wild and profitless country they returned towards Pretoria, and established the British northern posts at a place called Warm Baths. Here Pegget commanded, while Baden Powell shortly afterwards went down to Cape Town to make arrangements for taking over the police force of the conquered countries, and to receive the enthusiastic welcome of his colonial fellow countrymen. Plumer, with a small force operating from Warm Baths, scattered a Boer commando on September 1, capturing a few prisoners and a considerable quantity of munitions of war. On the 5th there was another skirmish in the same neighbourhood, during which the enemy attacked a cop held by a company of Munster Fusiliers, and was driven off with loss. Many thousands of cattle were captured by the British in this part of the field of operations, and were sent into Pretoria whence they helped to supply the army in the east. There was still considerable effervescence in the western districts of the Transvaal, and a mounted detachment met with fierce opposition at the end of August on their journey from Zerust to Krugersdorp. 
Methuen, after his unsuccessful chase of De Wet, had gone as far as Zerust, and had then taken his force on to Mafeking to refit. Before leaving Zerust, however, he had dispatched Colonel Little to Pretoria with a column which consisted of his own 3rd Cavalry Brigade, 1st Brabants, the Caffrarian Rifles, our battery of horse artillery, and four colonial guns. They were acting as guard to a very large convoy of returned empties. The district which they had to traverse is one of the most fertile in the Transvaal, a land of clear streams and of orange groves. But the farmers are numerous and aggressive, and the column, which was 900 strong, could clear all resistance from its front, but found it impossible to brush off the snipers upon its flanks and rear. Shortly after their start the column was deprived of the services of its gallant leader, Colonel Little, who was shot while riding with his advance scouts. Colonel Dalgety took over the command. Numerous desultory attacks culminated in a fierce skirmish at Quagafontein on August 31, in which the column had 60 casualties. The event might have been serious, as Delaray's main force appears to have been concentrated upon the British detachment the brunt of the action falling upon the Caffrarian rifles. By a rapid movement the column was able to extricate itself and win its way safely to Krugersdorp, but it narrowly escaped out of the wolf's jaws, and as it emerged into the open country de Larey's guns were seen galloping for the pass which they had just come through. This force was sent south to Grunstad to refit. Lord Methuen's army, after its long marches and arduous work, arrived at Mafeking on August 28 for the purpose of refitting. Since his departure from Boshoff on May 14 his men had been marching with hardly a rest, and he had during that time fought fourteen engagements. He was off upon the warpath once more, with fresh horses and renewed energy, on September 8, and on the 9th, with the cooperation of General Douglas, he scattered a Boer force at Malopo capturing thirty prisoners and a great quantity of stores. On the 14th he ran down a convoy and regained one of the coal and so guns and much ammunition. On the 20th he again made large captures. If in the early phases of the war the Boers had given Paul Methuen some evil hours, he was certainly getting his own back again. At the same time Clements was dispatched from Pretoria with a small mobile force for the purpose of clearing the Russenberg and Kruger Storp districts, which had always been storm centers. These two forces, of Methuen and of Clements, moved through the country, sweeping the scattered boar bands before them, and hunting them down until they dispersed. At Kekeport and at Hexport Clements fought successful skirmishes, losing at the latter action Lieutenant Stanley of the Yeomanry, the Somersetshire cricketer, who showed, as so many have done, how close is the connection between the good sportsman and the good soldier. On the 12th Douglas took 39 prisoners near Lichtenberg. On the 18th Rundle captured a gun at Bronkhorstfontein. Hart at Pochstrom, Hildyard in the Utrecht district, Macdonald in the Orange River colony, Everywhere the British generals were busily stamping out the remaining embers of what had been so terrible a conflagration. Much trouble but no great damage was inflicted upon the British during this last stage of the war by the incessant attacks upon the lines of railway by roving bands of Boers. The actual interruption of traffic was of little consequence, for the assiduous sappers with their gangs of Barsato labourers were always at hand to repair the break. But the loss of stores, and occasionally of lives, was more serious. Hardly a day passed that the stokers and drivers were not made targets of by snipers among the copies, and occasionally a train was entirely destroyed. Footnote, it is to be earnestly hoped that those in authority will see that these men obtain the medal and any other reward which can mark our sense of their faithful service. One of them in the Orange River Colony, after narrating to me his many hairbreadth escapes, prophesied bitterly that the memory of his services would pass with the need for them, chief among these raiders was the wild Theron, who led a band which contained men of all nations the same gang who had already, as narrated, held up a train in the Orange River colony. On August 31st he derailed another at Flip River to the south of Johannesburg, blowing up the engine and burning thirteen trucks. 
Almost at the same time a train was captured near Kroonstad, which appeared to indicate that the great De Wet was back in his old hunting grounds. On the same day the line was cut at Standerton. A few days later, however, the impunity with which these feats had been performed was broken, for in a similar venture near Kruja Storp the dashing Theron and several of his associates lost their lives. Two other small actions performed at this period of the war demand a passing notice. One was a smart engagement near Cry Railway Station, in which Major Broke of the Sappers with a hundred men attacked a superior boar force upon a cop and drove them off with loss a feat which it is safe to say he could not have accomplished six months earlier. The other was the fine defence made by 125 of the Canadian mounted rifles, who, while guarding the railway, were attacked by a considerable boar force with two guns. They proved once more, as Lady Brandon Eland's River had shown, that with provisions, cartridges, and brains, the smallest force can successfully hold its own if it confines itself to the defensive dot and now the Boer Corps appeared to be visibly tottering to its fall. The flight of the President had accelerated that process of disintegration which had already set in. Chalkberger had assumed the office of Vice President, and the notorious Benville Joan had become First Lieutenant of Louis Botha in maintaining the struggle. Lord Roberts had issued an extremely judicious proclamation, in which he pointed out the uselessness of further resistance, declared that guerrilla warfare would be ruthlessly suppressed, and informed the burghers that no fewer than 15,000 of their fellow countrymen were in his hands as prisoners, and that none of these could be released until the last trifle had been laid down. From all sides in the third week of September the British forces were converging on committee port the frontier town. Already wild figures, stained and tattered after nearly a year of warfare, were walking the streets of Lure and Comarx, gazed at with wonder and some distrust by the Portuguese inhabitants. The exiled burghers moodily pacing the streets saw their exiled president seated in his corner of the governor's veranda, the well-known curved pipe still dangling from his mouth, the Bible by his chair. Day by day the number of these refugees increased. On September 17 special trains were arriving crammed with the homeless burghers, and with the mercenaries of many nations French, German, Irish American, and Russian all anxious to make their way home. By the 19th no fewer than 700 had passed over. At dawn on September 22 a half-hearted attempt was made by the commando of Erasmus to attack Eland's River Station but it was beaten back by the garrison. While it was going on Pegget fell upon the camp which Erasmus had left behind him, and captured his stores. From all over the country, from Plumer's Bushmen, from Barton and Cruiser Storp, from the Colonials at Heilbronn, from Clements on the west, came the same reports of dwindling resistance and of the abandoning of cattle, arms and ammunition. On September 24 came the last chapter in this phase of the campaign in the eastern Transvaal, when at eight in the morning Polkaru and his guardsmen occupied committee port. They had made desperate marches, one of them through thick bush, where they went for nineteen miles without water, but nothing could shake the cheery gallantry of the men. To them fell the honour, an honour well deserved by their splendid work throughout the whole campaign of entering and occupying the ultimate eastern point which the Boers could hold. Resistance had been threatened and prepared for, but the grim silent advance of that veteran infantry took the heart out of the defence. With hardly a shot fired the town was occupied. The bridge which would enable the troops to receive their supplies from Lure and Comarx was still intact. General Pinner and the greater part of his force, amounting to over two thousand men had crossed the frontier and had been taken down to Delagoa Bay, where they met the respect and attention which brave men in misfortune deserve. Small bands had slipped away to the north and the south, but they were insignificant in numbers and depressed in spirit. For the time it seemed that the campaign was over, but the result showed that there was greater vitality in the resistance of the burghers and less validity in their oaths than anyone had imagined. One find of the utmost importance was made at Committee Port, and at Hector Sprout on the Crocodile River. That excellent artillery which had fought so gallant a fight against our own more numerous guns, 
was found destroyed and abandoned. Pearl Karu at Kamati Port got one long tom, 96 pound, Crayusod, and one smaller gun. Ian Hamilton and Hector Sprout found the remains of many guns, which included two of our horse artillery 12 pounders, two large Crayusod guns, two crops, one Vickers Maxim quick firer, two pom poms, and four mountain guns. Chapter 30. The campaign of De Wet. It had been hoped that the dispersal of the main Boer army, the capture of its guns, and the expulsion of many both of the burghers and of the foreign mercenaries, would have marked the end of the war. These expectations were, however, disappointed, and South Africa was destined to be afflicted and the British Empire disturbed by a useless guerrilla campaign. After the great and dramatic events which characterized the earlier phases of the struggle between the Britain and the Boer for the mastery of South Africa it is somewhat of the nature of an anticlimax to turn one's attention to those scattered operations which prolonged the resistance for a turbulent year at the expense of the lives of many brave men on either side. These raids and skirmishes, which had their origin rather in the hope of vengeance than of victory inflicted much loss and misery upon the country, but, although we may deplore the desperate resolution which bids brave men prefer death to subjugation, it is not for us, the countrymen of Hayard or Wallace, to condemn it. In one important respect these numerous, though to reveal, conflicts differed from the battles in the earlier stages of the war. The British had learned their lesson so thoroughly that they often turned the tables upon their instructors. Again and again the surprise was effected, not by the nation of hunters, but by those runics whose want of cunning and of veldcraft had for so long been a subject of derision and merriment. A year of the cop and the donga had altered all that. And in the proportion of casualties another very marked change had occurred. Time was when in battle after battle a tenth would have been a liberal estimate for the losses of the Boers compared with those of the Britain. So it was at Stormberg so it was at Colon so, so it may have been at Magus Fontein. But in this last stage of the war the balance was rather in favour of the British. It may have been because they were now frequently acting on the defensive, or it may have been from an improvement in their fire, or it may have come from the more desperate mood of the burghers, but in any case the fact remains that every encounter diminished the small reserves of the Boers rather than the ample forces of their opponents. One other change had come over the war, which caused more distress and searchings of conscience among some of the people of Great Britain than the darkest hours of their misfortunes. This lay in the increased bitterness of the struggle, and in those more strenuous measures which the British commanders felt themselves entitled and compelled to adopt. Nothing could exceed the lenity of Lord Roberts's early proclamations in the Free State. But, as the months went on and the struggle still continued, the war assumed a harsher aspect. Every farmhouse represented a possible fort, and a probable depot for the enemy. The extreme measure of burning them down was only carried out after a definite offence, such as affording cover for snipers, or as a deterrent to railway wreckers but in either case it is evident that the women or children who were usually the sole occupants of the farm could not by their own unaided exertions prevent the line from being cut or the riflemen from firing. It is even probable that the Boers may have committed these deeds in the vicinity of houses the destruction of which they would least regret. Thus, on humanitarian grounds there were strong arguments against this policy of destruction being pushed too far, and the political reasons were even stronger since a homeless man is necessarily the last man to settle down, and a burnt out family the last to become contented British citizens. On the other hand, the impatience of the army towards what they regarded as the abuses of lenity was very great, and they argued that the war would be endless if the women in the farm were allowed always to supply the sniper on the cop. The irregular and brigand-like fashion in which the struggle was carried out had exasperated the soldiers and though there were few cases of individual outrage or unauthorized destruction, the general orders were applied with some harshness, and repressive measures were taken which warfare may justify but which civilization must deplore. After the dispersal of the main army at Committee Port there remained a considerable number of men in arms, some of them irreconcilable burghers, some of them foreign adventurers, and some of them gay prebels to whom British arms were less terrible than British law. 
these men, who were still well armed and well mounted, spread themselves over the country, and acted with such energy that they gave the impression of a large force. They made their way into the settled districts, and brought fresh help and fresh disaster to many who had imagined that the war had passed forever away from them. Under compulsion from their irreconcilable countrymen, a large number of the farmers broke their parole, mounted the horses which British leniency had left with them, and threw themselves once more into the struggle, adding their honour to the other sacrifices which they had made for their country. In any account of the continual brushes between these scattered bands and the British forces, there must be such a similarity in procedure and result that it would be hard for the writer and intolerable for the reader if they were set forth in detail. As a general statement it may be said that during the months to come there was no British garrison in any one of the numerous posts in the Transvaal, and in that portion of the Orange River colony which lies east of the railway, which was not surrounded by prowling riflemen, there was no convoy sent to supply those garrisons which was not liable to be attacked upon the road and there was no train upon any one of the three lines which might not find a rail up and a hundred raiders covering it with their mausers. With some two thousand miles of railroad to guard, so many garrisons to provide, and an escort to be furnished to every convoy, there remained out of the large body of British troops in the country only a moderate force who were available for actual operations. This force was distributed in different districts scattered over a wide extent of country, and it was evident that while each was strong enough to suppress local resistance, still at any moment a concentration of the Boer scattered forces upon a single British column might place the latter in a serious position. The distribution of the British in October and November was roughly as follows. Methuen was in the Russenberg district, Barton at Kruzersdorp and operating down the line to Klerksdorp. Settle was in the west, Pegate at Pinners River, Clements in the Magalisberg, Hart at Pochfstrom, Lyttelton at Middelburg, Smith Doyen at Belfast, W. Kitchener at Lidenburg, French in the eastern Transvaal, Hunter, Rundle, Brabant, and Bruce Hamilton in the Orange River Colony. Each of these forces was occupied in the same sort of work, breaking up small bodies of the enemy, hunting for arms, bringing in refugees, collecting supplies, and rounding up cattle. Some, however, were confronted with organized resistance and some were not. A short account may be given in turn of each separate column. I would treat first the operations of General Barton, because they formed the best introduction to that narrative of the doings of Christian de Wet to which this chapter will be devoted. The most severe operations during the month of October fell to the lot of this British general, who, with some of the faithful fusiliers whom he had led from the first days in Natal, was covering the line from Kruzersdorp to Klerksdorp. It is a long stretch, and one which, as the result shows, is as much within striking distance of the Orange Free State as, as of the men of the Transvaal. Upon October 5th Barton left Kruzersdorp with a force which consisted of the Scots and Welsh fusiliers, 500 mounted men, the 78th RFA three pom-poms, and a 4.7 naval gun. For a fortnight, as the small army moved slowly down the line of the railroad, their progress was one continual skirmish. On October 6 they brushed the enemy aside in an action in which the volunteer company of the Scots Fusiliers gained the applause of their veteran comrades. On the 8th and 9th there was sharp skirmishing, the brunt of which on the latter date fell upon the Welsh Fusiliers who had three officers and eleven men injured. The commandos of Douthwaite, Liebenberg, and Van der Mo seem to have been occupied in harassing the column during their progress through the Gatsrand range. On the 15th the desultory sniping freshened again into a skirmish in which the honours and the victory belonged mainly to the Welshmen and to the very keen and efficient body, the Scottish Yeomanry. Six boars were left dead upon the ground. On October 17 the column reached Frederickstad, where it halted. On that date six of Marshall's horse were cut off while collecting supplies. The same evening 300 of the Imperial Light Horse came in from Kruzersdorp. Up to this date the Boer forces which dogged the column had been annoying but not seriously aggressive. On the 19th, however, affairs took an unexpected turn. 
the British scouts rode in to report a huge dust cloud whirling swiftly northwards from the direction of the Val River soon plainly visible to all, and showing as it drew nearer the hazy outline of a long column of mounted men. The dark coats of the riders, and possibly the speed of their advance, showed that they were boars, and soon it was rumoured that it was no other than Christian de Wet with his merry men, who, with characteristic audacity, had ridden back into the Transvaal in the hope of overwhelming Barton's column. It is some time since we have seen anything of this energetic gentleman with the tinted glasses, but as the narrative will be much occupied with him in the future a few words are needed to connect him with the past. It has been already told how he escaped through the net which caught so many of his countrymen at the time of the surrender of Prince Lu, and how he was chased at furious speed from the Val River to the mountains of Maglisberg. Here he eluded his pursuers, separated from Stein, who desired to go east to confer with Kruger, and by the end of August was back again in his favorite recruiting ground in the north of the Orange River colony. Here for nearly two months he had lain very quiet, refitting and reassembling his scattered force, until now, ready for action once more, and fired by the hope of cutting off an isolated British force. He rode swiftly northwards with two thousand men under the trolling cloud which had been spied by the watchers of Frederickstad. The problem before him was a more serious one, however, than any which he had ever undertaken, for this was no isolated regiment or ill-manned post, but a complete little field force very ready to do battle with him. De Wetsbergers, as they arrived, sprang from their ponies and went into action in their usual invisible but effective fashion covered by the fire of several guns. The soldiers had thrown up lines of sangers, however, and were able, though exposed to a very heavy fire coming from several directions, to hold their own until nightfall, when the defences were made more secure. On the 20th, 21st, 22nd, 23rd, and 24th the cordon of the attack was drawn gradually closer, the boars entirely surrounding the British force and it was evident that they were feeling round for a point at which an assault might be delivered. The position of the defenders upon the morning of October 25th was as follows. The Scots Fusiliers were holding a ridge to the south. General Barton with the rest of his forces occupied a hill some distance off. Between the two was a valley down which ran the line, and also the sprut upon which the British depended for their water supply. On each side of the line were ditches, and at dawn on this seventh day of the investment it was found that these had been occupied by snipers during the night, and that it was impossible to water the animals. One of two things must follow. Either the force must shift its position or it must drive these men out of their cover. No fire could do it, as they lay in perfect safety. They must be turned out at the point of the bayonet. About noon, several companies of Scots and Welsh fusiliers advanced from different directions in very extended order upon the ditches. Captain Bailey's company of the former regiment first attracted the fire of the burghers. Wounded twice, the brave officer staggered on until a third bullet struck him dead. Six of his men were found lying beside him. The other companies were exposed in their turn to a severe fire but rushing onwards they closed rapidly in upon the ditches. There have been few finer infantry advances during the war, for the veldt was perfectly flat and the fire terrific. A mile of ground was crossed by the fusiliers. Three gallant officers Dick, Elliot, and Best went down, but the rush of the men was irresistible. At the edge of the ditches the supports overtook the firing line, and they all surged into the trenches together. Then it was seen how perilous was the situation of the Boer snipers. They had placed themselves between the upper and the nether millstone. There was no escape for them save across the open. It says much for their courage that they took that perilous choice rather than wave the white flag, which would have ensured their safety. The scene which followed has not often been paralleled. About a hundred and fifty burghers rushed out of the ditches streaming across the veldt upon foot to the spot where their horses had been secreted. Rifles, pom-poms, and shrapnel played upon them during this terrible race. A black running mob carrying coats, blankets, boots, rifles, and sea, was seen to rise as if from nowhere and rush as fast as they could, dropping the various things they carried as they ran. 
One of their survivors has described how awful was that wild blind flight, through a dust cloud thrown up by the shells. For a mile the veld was dotted with those who had fallen. Thirty-six were found dead, thirty were wounded, and thirty more gave themselves up as prisoners. Some were so demoralized that they rushed into the hospital and surrendered to the British doctor. The Imperial Light Horse were for some reason slow to charge. Had they done so at once, many eyewitnesses agree that not a fugitive should have escaped. On the other hand, the officer in command may have feared that in doing so he might mask the fire of the British guns. One incident in the action caused some comment at the time. A small party of Imperial Light Horse, gallantly led by Captain Yockney of B Squadron, came to close quarters with a group of Boers. Five of the enemy having held up their hands Yockney passed them and pushed on against their comrades. On this the prisoners seized their rifles once more and fired upon their captors. A fierce fight ensued with only a few feet between the muzzles of the rifles. Three Boers were shot dead, five wounded, and eight taken. Of these eight three were shot next day by order of court-martial for having resumed their weapons after surrender, while two others were acquitted. The death of these men in cold blood is to be deplored, but it is difficult to see how any rules of civilized warfare can be maintained if a flagrant breach of them is not promptly and sternly punished. On receiving this severe blow De Wet promptly raised the investment and hastened to regain his favorite haunts. Considerable reinforcements had reached Barton upon the same day, including the Dublins, the Essex, Stratconnor's horse, and the Elswick battery, with some very welcome supplies of ammunition. As Barton had now more than a thousand mounted men of most excellent quality it is difficult to imagine why he did not pursue his defeated enemy. He seems to have underrated the effect which he had produced for instead of instantly assuming the offensive he busied himself in strengthening his defences. Yet the British losses in the whole operations had not exceeded 100, so that there does not appear to have been any reason why the force should be crippled. As Barton was in direct and constant telegraphic communication with Pretoria, it is possible that he was acting under superior orders in the course which he adopted. It was not destined, however that De Wet should be allowed to escape with his usual impunity. On the 27th, two days after his retreat from Frederickstad he was overtaken stumbled upon by pure chance apparently by the mounted infantry and cavalry of Charles Knox and Delisle. The Boers, a great disorganized cloud of horsemen, swept swiftly along the northern bank of the Val, seeking for a place to cross, while the British rode furiously after them, spraying them with shrapnel at every opportunity. Darkness and a violent storm gave De Wet his opportunity to cross, but the closeness of the pursuit compelled him to abandon two of his guns, one of them a Krupp and the other one of the British 12-pounders of Senna's post. Which, to the delight of the gunners, was regained by that very new battery to which it belonged. Dot once across the river and back in his own country, De Wet, having placed seventy miles between himself and his pursuers, took it for granted that he was out of their reach, and halted near the village of Bothaville to refit. But the British were hard upon his track, and for once they were able to catch this indefatigable man unawares. Yet their knowledge of his position seems to have been most hazy and on the very day before that on which they found him, General Charles Knox, with the main body of the force, turned north, and was out of the subsequent action. Derlisle's mounted troops also turned north, but fortunately not entirely out of call. To the third and smallest body of mounted men, that under Le Gallais, fell the honor of the action which I am about to describe. It is possible that the move northwards of Charles Knox and of Delisle had the effect of a most elaborate stratagem, since it persuaded the Boer scouts that the British were retiring. So indeed they were, save only the small force of Le Gallais, which seems to have taken one last cast round to the south before giving up the pursuit. In the grey of the morning of November 6, Major Lean with forty men of the 5th Mounted Infantry came upon three weary boars sleeping upon the veldt. Having secured the men, and realizing that they were an outpost, Lean pushed on, 
and topping a rise some hundreds of yards further, he and his men saw a remarkable scene. There before them stretched the camp of the boars, the men sleeping, the horses grazing, the guns parked, and the wagons outspanned. There was little time for consideration. The Kaffir drivers were already afoot and strolling out for their horses, or lighting the fires for their master's coffee. With splendid decision, although he had but forty men to oppose to over a thousand, Lean sent back for reinforcements and opened fire upon the camp. In an instant it was buzzing like an overturned hive. Up sprang the sleepers, rushed for their horses, and galloped away across the veldt, leaving their guns and wagons behind. A few stalwarts remained, however, and their numbers were increased by those whose horses had stampeded, and who were, therefore, unable to get away. They occupied an enclosed kraal and a farmhouse in front of the British, whence they opened a sharp fire. At the same time a number of the boars who had ridden away came back again, having realized how weak their assailants were, and worked round the British flanks upon either side. Legolais, with his men, had come up, but the British force was still far inferior to that which it was attacking. A section of U battery was able to unlimber, and open fire at 400 yards from the boar position. The British made no attempt to attack but contented themselves with holding on to the position from which they could prevent the boar guns from being removed. The burghers tried desperately to drive off the stubborn fringe of riflemen. A small stone shed in the possession of the British was the centre of the boar fire, and it was within its walls that Ross of the Durhams was horribly wounded by an explosive ball, and that the brave Jerseyman, Legolais, was killed. Before his fall he had dispatched his staff officer, Major Hickey, to hurry up men from the rear. Dot on the fall of Ross and Legolais, the command fell upon Major Taylor of U Battery. The position at that time was sufficiently alarming. The Boers were working round each flank in considerable numbers, and they maintained a heavy fire from a stone enclosure in the centre. The British forces actually engaged were insignificant, consisting of forty men of the 5th Mounted Infantry, and two guns in the centre. 46 men of the 17th and 18th Imperial Yeomanry upon the right, and 105 of the 8th Mounted Infantry on the left or 191 rifles in all. The flanks of this tiny force had to extend to half a mile to hold off the boar flank attack, but they were heartened in their resistance by the knowledge that their comrades were hastening to their assistance. Taylor, realizing that a great effort must be made to tide over the crisis, sent a messenger back with orders that the convoy should be parked, and every available man sent up to strengthen the right flank, which was the weakest. The enemy got close onto one of the guns, and swept down the whole detachment, but a handful of the Suffolk mounted infantry under Lieutenant Peebles most gallantly held them off from it. For an hour the pressure was extreme. Then two companies of the 7th mounted infantry came up, and were thrown onto each flank. Shortly afterwards Major Welch, with two more companies of the same corps, arrived, and the tide began slowly to turn. The Boers were themselves outflanked by the extension of the British line and were forced to fall back. At half past eight Delisle, whose force had trotted and galloped for twelve miles, arrived with several companies of Australians, and the success of the day was assured. The smoke of the Prussian guns at Waterloo was not a more welcome sight than the dust of Delisle's horsemen. But the question now was whether the Boers, who were in the walled enclosure and farm which formed their centre, would manage to escape. The place was shelled, but here, as often before, it was found how useless a weapon is shrapnel against buildings. There was nothing for it but to storm it, and a grim little storming party of fifty men, half British half Australian, was actually waiting with fixed bayonets for the whistle which was to be their signal, when the white flag flew out from the farm, and all was over. Warned by many a tragic experience the British still lay low in spite of the flag. Come out! Come out! They shouted. Eighty-two unwounded boars filed out of the enclosure, and the total number of prisoners came to one hundred and fourteen while between twenty and thirty boars were killed. Six guns, a pom-pom, 
and 1,000 head of cattle were the prizes of the victors. This excellent little action showed that the British mounted infantry had reached a point of efficiency at which they were quite able to match the Boers at their own game. For hours they held them with an inferior force, and finally, when the numbers became equal, were able to drive them off and capture their guns. The credit is largely due to Major Lean for his prompt initiative on discovering their ledger, and to Major Taylor for his handling of the force during a very critical time. Above all, it was due to the dead leader, Le Gallais, who had infected every man under him with his own spirit of reckless daring. If I die, tell my mother that I die happy, as we got the guns, said he, with his failing breath. The British total losses were 12 killed, 4 officers, and 33 wounded, 7 officers. Major Welch, a soldier of great promise, much beloved by his men, was one of the slain. Following closely after the repulsed Frederickstad this action was a heavy blow to De Wet. At last, the British were beginning to take something off the score which they owed the bold raider but there was to be many an item on either side before the long reckoning should be closed. The Boers, with De Wet, fled south, where it was not long before they showed that there was still a military force with which we had to reckon. In defiance of chronology it may perhaps make a clearer narrative if I continue at once with the movements of De Wet from the time that he lost his guns at Bothaville, and then come back to the consideration of the campaign in the Transvaal and to a short account of those scattered and disconnected actions which break the continuity of the story. Before following De Wet, however, it is necessary to say something of the general state of the Orange River colony and of some military developments which had occurred there. Under the wise and conciliatory rule of General Pretime and the farmers in the south and west were settling down, and for the time it looked as if a large district was finally pacified. The mild taxation was cheerfully paid, schools were reopened, and a peace party made itself apparent, with Fraser and Byatt de Wet, the brother of Christian, among its strongest advocates. Apart from the operations of de Wet, there appeared to be no large force in the field in the Orange River colony, but early in October of 1900, a small but very mobile and efficient Boer force skirted the eastern outposts of the British struck the southern line of communications, and then came up the western flank, attacking, where an attack was possible, each of the isolated and weakly garrisoned townlets to which it came, and recruiting its strength from a district which had been hardly touched by the ravages of war, and which by its prosperity alone might have proved the amenity of British military rule. This force seems to have skirted Weaponer without attacking a place of such evil omen to their cause. Their subsequent movements are readily traced by a sequence of military events. On October 1st, Rouville was threatened. On the 9th, an outpost of the Cheshire militia was taken and the railway cut for a few hours in the neighborhood of Bethali. A week later, the Boer riders were dotting the country round Philippe Lys, Springfontein, and Jages Fontein, the latter town being occupied upon October 16th, while the garrison held out upon the nearest cop. The town was retaken from the enemy by King Hall and his men, who were Seaforth Highlanders and police. There was fierce fighting in the streets, and from twenty to thirty of each side were killed or wounded. For Asmith was attacked on October 19, but was also in the very safe hands of the Seaforths, who held it against a severe assault. Philippe Lys was continually attacked between the 18th and the 24th, but made a most notable defence which was conducted by Gosling, the resident magistrate, with forty civilians. For a week this band of stalwarts held their own against six hundred Boers, and were finally relieved by a force from the railway. All the operations were not, however, as successful as these three defences. On October 24 a party of cavalry details belonging to many regiments were snapped up in an ambuscade. On the next day Jack Hobsdell was attacked, with considerable loss to the British. The place was entered in the night, and the enemy occupied the houses which surrounded the square. The garrison, consisting of about sixty men of the Cape Town Highlanders, had encamped in the square, and were helpless when fire was opened upon them in the morning. There was practically no resistance, 
and yet for hours a murderous fire was kept up upon the tents in which they cowered, so that the affair seems not to have been far removed from murder. Two-thirds of the little force were killed or wounded. The number of the assailants does not appear to have been great, and they vanished upon the appearance of a relieving force from Modder River. After the disaster at Jacobsdale, the enemy appeared on November 1 near Kimberley and captured a small convoy. The country round was disturbed, and Settle was sent south with a column to pacify it. In this way, we can trace this small cyclone from its origin in the old storm center in the northeast of the Orange River colony sweeping round the whole country, striking one post after another, and finally blowing out at the corresponding point upon the other side of the seat of war. We have last seen De Wet upon November 6, when he fled south from Bothaville, leaving his guns but not his courage behind him. Trekking across the line, and for a wonder gathering up no train as he passed, he made for that part of the eastern Orange River colony which had been reoccupied by his countrymen. Here, in the neighborhood of Abantu, he was able to join other forces, probably the commandos of Haysbro Ekantari, which still retained some guns. At the head of a considerable force he attacked the British garrison of Duetsdorp, a town some forty miles to the southeast of Bloemfontein. It was on November 18 that De Wet assailed the place, and it fell upon the 24th, after a defense which appears to have been a very creditable one. Several small British columns were moving in the southeast of the colony, but none of them arrived in time to avert the disaster, which is the more inexplicable as the town is within one day's ride of Bloemfontein. The place is a village hemmed in upon its western side by a semicircle of steep rocky hills broken in the center by a gully. The position was a very extended one, and had the fatal weakness that the loss of any portion of it meant the loss of it all. The garrison consisted of one company of Highland Light Infantry on the southern horn of the semicircle, three companies of the 2nd Gloucester Regiment on the northern and central part, with two guns of the 68th Battery. Some of the Royal Irish Mounted Infantry and a handful of police made up the total of the defenders to something over 400, Major Massey in command. The attack developed at the end of the ridge which was held by the company of Highlanders. Every night the Boer riflemen drew in closer, and every morning found the position more desperate. On the 20th the water supply of the garrison was cut, though a little was still brought up by volunteers during the night. The thirst in the sultry trenches was terrible, but the garrison still, with black lips and parched tongues, held on to their lines. On the 22nd the attack had made such progress that the posted by the Highlanders became untenable and had to be withdrawn. It was occupied next morning by the Boers, and the whole ridge was at their mercy. Out of eighteen men who served one of the British guns sixteen were killed or wounded, and the last rounds were fired by the sergeant Farrier, who carried, loaded, and fired all by himself. All day the soldiers held out, but the thirst was in itself enough to justify if not to compel a surrender. At half past five the garrison laid down their arms, having lost about sixty killed or wounded. There does not, as far as one can learn, seem to have been any attempt to injure the two guns which fell into the hands of the enemy. De Wet himself was one of the first to ride into the British trenches, and the prisoners gazed with interest at the short strong figure, with the dark tail coat and the square topped bowler hat of the most famous of the Boer leaders. British columns were converging, however, from several quarters, and De Wet had to be at once on the move. On the 26th Duet Stop was reoccupied by General Charles Knox with 1500 men. De Wet had two days start, but so swift was Knox that on the 27th he had run him down at Valbank, where he shelled his camp. De Wet broke away, however, and trekking south for eighteen hours without a halt, shook off the pursuit. He had with him at this time nearly eight thousand men with several guns under Haysbroek, Thury, Philip Bota, and Stain. It was his declared intention to invade Cape Colony with his train of weary foots or prisoners, and the laurels of Duet Storp still green upon him. He was much aided in all his plans by that mistaken leniency which had refused to recognize that a horse is in that country as much a weapon as a rifle, 
and had left great numbers upon the farms with which he could replace his useless animals. So numerous were they that many of the boars had two or three for their own use. It is not too much to say that our weak treatment of the question of horses will come to be recognized as the one great blot upon the conduct of the war, and that our undue and fantastic scruples have prolonged hostilities for months and cost the country many lives and many millions of pounds. De Wet's plan for the invasion of the colony was not yet destined to be realized, for a tenacious man had set himself to frustrate it. Several small but mobile British columns, those of Pilcher, of Barker, and of Herbert, under the supreme direction of Charles Knox, were working desperately to head him off. In torrents of rain which turned every sprout into a river and every road into a quagmire, the British horsemen stuck manfully to their work. De Wet had hurried south, crossed the Caledon River, and made for a Dindle's drift. But Knox, after the skirmish at Valbank, had trekked swiftly south to Bethali, and was now ready with three mobile columns and a network of scouts and patrols to strike in any direction. For a few days he had lost touch, but his arrangements were such that he must recover it if the Boers either crossed the railroad or approached the river. On December 2 he had authentic information that De Wet was crossing the Caledon, and in an instant the British columns were all off at full cry once more, sweeping over the country with a front of fifteen miles. On the third and fourth, in spite of frightful weather, the two little armies of horsemen struggled on, fetlock deep in mud, with the rain lashing their faces. At night without cover, drenched and bitterly cold, the troopers threw themselves down on the sodden veld to snatch a few hours sleep before renewing the interminable pursuit. The drift over the Caledon flowed deep and strong, but the boar had passed and the Briton must pass also. Thirty guns took to the water, diving completely under the coffee-colored surface, to reappear glistening upon the southern bank. Everywhere there were signs of the passage of the enemy. A litter of crippled or dying horses marked their track and a crop gun was found abandoned by the drift. The duet store, prisoners, too, had been set loose, and began to stumble and stagger back to their countrymen, their boots worn off, and their putties wrapped round their bleeding feet. It is painful to add that they had been treated with a personal violence and a brutality in marked contrast to the elaborate hospitality shown by the British government to its involuntary guests. On December 6, De Wet had at last reached the Orange River a clear day in front of his pursuers. But it was only to find that his labours had been in vain. At Adendal, where he had hoped to cross, the river was in spate. The British flag waved from a post upon the further side and a strong force of expectant guardsmen eagerly awaited him there. Instantly recognizing that the game was up, the boar leader doubled back for the north and safety. At Rouville he hesitated as to whether he should snap up the small garrison, but the commandant, Rundle, showed a bold face, and the wet passed on to the Kumasi bridge over the Caledon. The small post there refused to be bluffed into a surrender, and the boars, still dropping their horses fast, passed on, and got over the drift at Amsterdam, their rearguard being hardly across before Knox had also reached the river. On the 10th the British were in touch again near Helvetia, where there was a rearguard skirmish. On the 11th both parties rode through Redisburg, a few hours separating them. The Boers in their cross-country trekking go, as one of their prisoners observed, slap bang at everything and as they are past masters in the art of ox and mule driving, and have such a knowledge of the country that they can trek as well by night as by day, it says much for the energy of Knox and his men that he was able for a fortnight to keep in close touch with them. It became evident now that there was not much chance of overtaking the main body of the burghers, and an attempt was therefore made to interpose a fresh force who might head them off. A line of posts existed between Thabanchu and Lady Brand, and Colonel Thornycroft was stationed there with a movable column. It was Knox's plan therefore to prevent the Boers from breaking to the west and to head them towards the Bar Sutter border. A small column under Parsons had been sent by Hunter from Blow Enfantine, and pushed in upon the flank of De Wet, who had on the 12th got back to Duet's Dorp. Again the pursuit became warm, but De Wet's time was not yet come. He headed for Springenneck 
about 15 miles east of Dabunchu. This pass is about 4 miles broad, with a British fort upon either side of it. There was only one way to safety, for Knox's mounted infantrymen and lancers were already dotting the southern skyline. Without hesitation the whole Boer force, now some 2,500 strong, galloped at full speed in open order through the neck, braving the long-range fire of riflemen and guns. The tactics were those of French in his ride to Kimberley, and the success was as complete. De Wet's force passed through the last barrier which had been held against him, and vanished into the mountainous country round Fixburg, where it could safely rest and refit. The result then of these bustling operations had been that De Wet and his force survived, but that he had failed in his purpose of invading the colony, and had dropped some 500 horses, two guns, and about a hundred of his men. Hayes commando had been detached by De Wet to make a feint at another pass while he made his way through the Springen. Parsons's force followed Hayes up and engaged him, but under cover of night he was able to get away and to join his leader to the north of Dabunchu. On December 13, this, the second great chase after De Wet, may be said to have closed. Dot chapter 31. Dot the guerrilla warfare in the Transvaal, Nuitchidak. Dot leaving De Wet in the Fixburg Mountains, where he lurked until after the opening of the new year. The story of the scattered operations in the Transvaal may now be carried down to the same point a story comprising many skirmishes and one considerable engagement, but so devoid of any central thread that it is difficult to know how to approach it. From Lichtenberg to Kamati, a distance of 400 miles, there was sporadic warfare everywhere, attacks upon scattered posts, usually beaten off but occasionally successful, attacks upon convoys attacks upon railway trains, attacks upon anything and everything which could harass the invaders. Each general in his own district had his own work of repression to perform, and so we had best trace the doings of each up to the end of the year 1900. Lord Methuen after his pursuit of De Wet in August had gone to Mafeking to refit. From that point, with a force which contained a large proportion of yeomanry and of Australian bushmen, he conducted a long series of operations in the difficult and important district which lies between Rosenberg, Lichtenberg, and Zerust. Several strong and mobile Boer commandos with guns moved about in it, and an energetic though not very deadly warfare aged between Lemmer, Snyman, and Alare on the one side, and the troops of Methuen, Douglas, Broadwood and Lord Errol upon the other. Methuen moved about incessantly through the broken country, winning small skirmishes and suffering the indignity of continual sniping. From time to time he captured stores, wagons, and small bodies of prisoners. Early in October he and Douglas had successes. On the 15th Broadwood was engaged. On the 20th there was a convoy action. On the 25th Methuen had a success and 28 prisoners. On November 9 he surprised Snyman and took 30 prisoners. On the 10th he got a pom-pom. Early in this month Douglas separated from Methuen, and marched south from Zerust through Venterstorp to Klerksdorp, passing over a country which had been hardly touched before, and arriving at his goal with much cattle and some prisoners. Towards the end of the month a considerable stock of provisions were conveyed to Zerust and a garrison left to hold the town so as to release Methuen's column for service elsewhere. Hart's sphere of action was originally round Potchfstroom. On September 9 he made a fine forced march to surprise this town, which had been left some time before with an entirely inadequate garrison to fall into the hands of the enemy. His infantry covered 36 and his cavalry 54 miles in 15 hours. The operation was a complete success the town with 80 boars falling into his hands with little opposition. On September 30 Hart returned to Krugersdorp, where, save for one skirmish upon the Gats Rand on November 22, he appears to have had no actual fighting to do during the remainder of the year. After the clearing of the eastern border of the Transvaal by the movement of Polkaru along the railway line, and of Buller raided by Ian Hamilton in the mountainous country to the north of it, there were no operations of importance in this district. A guard was kept upon the frontier to prevent the return of refugees and the smuggling of ammunition, while General Kitchener, 
the brother of the Serda, broke up a few small bulges in the neighborhood of Lidenburg. Smith Doyen guarded the line at Belfast, and on two occasions, November 1st and November 6th, he made aggressive movements against the enemy. The first, which was a surprise executed in concert with Colonel Spoons of the Shropshires, was frustrated by a severe blizzard, which prevented the troops from pushing home their success. The second was a two days expedition, which met with a spirited opposition, and demands a fuller notice. This was made from Belfast, and the force, which consisted of about 1400 men, advanced south to the Committee River. The infantry were Suffolk's and Shropshire's, the cavalry Canadians and 5th Lancers, with two Canadian guns and four of the 84th Battery. All day the Boer snipers clung to the column, as they had done to French's cavalry in the same district. Mirut marches without a very definite and adequate objective appear to be rather exasperating than overawing, for so long as the column is moving onwards the most timid farmer may be tempted into long-range fire from the flanks or rear. The river was reached and the Boers driven from a position which they had taken up, but their signal fires brought mounted riflemen from every farm and the retreat of the troops was pressed as they returned to Belfast. There was all the material for a South African Lexington. The most difficult of military operations, the covering of a detachment from a numerous and aggressive enemy, was admirably carried out by the Canadian gunners and dragoons under the command of Colonel Lessard. So severe was the pressure that sixteen of the latter were for a time in the hands of the enemy who attempted something in the nature of a charge upon the steadfast rearguard. The movement was repulsed, and the total ball loss would appear to have been considerable, since two of their leaders, Commandant Henry Prince Lou and General Joachim Vary, were killed, while General Johann Grobler was wounded. If the rank and file suffered in proportion the losses must have been severe. The British casualties in the two days amounted to eight killed and thirty wounded, a small total when the arduous nature of the service is considered. The Canadians and the Shropshires seem to have borne off the honours of these trying operations. In the second week of October, General French, with three brigades of cavalry, Dixons, Gordons, and Marnes, started for a cross country ride from Macado Dorp. Three brigades may seem an imposing force, but the actual numbers did not exceed two strong regiments or about 1,500 sabres in all. A wing of the Suffolk Regiment went with them. On October 13 Marne's brigade met with a sharp resistance, and lost 10 killed and 29 wounded. On the 14th the force entered Carolina. On the 16th they lost 6 killed and 20 wounded, and from the day that they started until they reached Heidelberg on the 27th there was never a day that they could shake themselves clear of their attendant snipers. The total losses of the force were about 90 killed and wounded, but they brought in 60 prisoners and a large quantity of cattle and stores. The march had at least the effect of making it clear that the passage of a column of troops encumbered with baggage through a hostile country is an inefficient means for quelling a popular resistance. Light and mobile parties acting from a central depot were in future to be employed, with greater hopes of success. Some appreciable proportion of the British losses during this phase of the war arose from railway accidents caused by the persistent tampering with the lines. In the first ten days of October, there were four such mishaps. In which two sappers, 23 of the guards, cold streams, and 18 of the 66th battery were killed or wounded. On the last occasion, which occurred on October 10 near Vlakfontein, the reinforcements who came to aid the sufferers were themselves waylaid, and lost 20, mostly of the rifle brigade, killed, wounded, or prisoners. Hardly a day elapsed that the line was not cut at some point. The bringing of supplies was complicated by the fact that the Boer women and children were coming more and more into refugee camps, where they had to be fed by the British, and the strange spectacle was frequently seen of Boer snipers killing or wounding the drivers and stokers of the very trains which were bringing up food upon which Boer families were dependent for their lives. Considering that these tactics were continued for over a year, 
and that they resulted in the death or mutilation of many hundreds of British officers and men, it is really inexplicable that the British authorities did not employ the means used by all armies under such circumstances which is to place hostages upon the trains. A truckload of bores behind every engine would have stopped the practice forever. Again and again in this war the British have fought with the gloves when their opponents used their knuckles. We will pass now to a consideration of the doings of General Paget, who was operating to the north and northeast of Pretoria with a force which consisted of two regiments of infantry, about a thousand horsemen, and twelve guns. His mounted men were under the command of Plumer. In the early part of November this force had been withdrawn from warm baths and had fallen back upon Pinner's River where it had continual skirmishes with the enemy. Towards the end of November, news having reached Pretoria that the enemy under Erasmus and Viljoen were present in force at a place called Renostakop, which is about 20 miles north of the Delagoa railway line and 50 miles northeast of the capital, it was arranged that Pegit should attack them from the south, while Lytleton from Middelburg should endeavour to get behind them. The force with which Pegget started upon this enterprise was not a very formidable one. He had for mounted troops some Queensland, South Australian, New Zealand, and Tasmanian Bushmen, together with the York, Montgomery, and Warwick Yeomanry. His infantry were the 1st West Riding Regiment and four companies of the Monsters. His guns were the 7th and 38th Batteries with two naval quick-firing 12-pounders and some smaller pieces. The total could not have exceeded some 2,000 men. Here, as at other times, it is noticeable that in spite of the 200,000 soldiers whom the British kept in the field, the lines of communication absorbed so many that at the actual point of contact they were seldom superior and often inferior in numbers to the enemy. The opening of the Natal and De Lagoa lines though valuable in many ways, had been an additional drain. Where every culvert needs its picket and every bridge its company, the guardianship of many hundreds of miles of rail is no light matter. In the early morning of November 29th Pegget's men came in contact with the enemy, who were in some force upon an admirable position. A ridge for their center, a flanking cop for their crossfire, and a grass glassy for the approach it was an ideal boar battlefield. The colonials and the yeomanry under Plumer on the left, and Hickman on the right, pushed in upon them, until it was evident that they meant to hold their ground. Their advance being checked by a very severe fire, the horsemen dismounted and took such cover as they could. Pegget's original idea had been a turning movement, but the boars were the more numerous body and it was impossible for the smaller British force to find their flanks, for they extended over at least seven miles. The infantry were moved up into the centre, therefore, between the wings of dismounted horsemen, and the guns were brought up to cover the advance. The country was ill-suited, however, to the use of artillery, and it was only possible to use an indirect fire from under a curve of the grassland. The guns made good practice, however, one section of the 38th battery being in action all day within 800 yards of the ball line, and putting themselves out of action after 300 rounds by the destruction of their own rifling. Once over the curve every yard of the veldt was commanded by the hidden riflemen. The infantry advanced, but could make no headway against the deadly fire which met them. By short rushes the attack managed to get within 300 yards of the enemy, and there it stuck. On the right the monsters carried a detached cop which was in front of them, but could do little to aid the main attack. Nothing could have exceeded the tenacity of the Yorkshiremen and the New Zealanders, who were immediately to their left. Though unable to advance they refused to retire, and indeed they were in a position from which a retirement would have been a serious operation. Colonel Lloyd of the West Tridings was hit in three places and killed. Five out of six officers of the New Zealand Corps were struck down. There were no reserves to give a fresh impetus to the attack, and the thin scattered line, behind bullet spotted stones or ant hills, could but hold its own while the sun sank slowly upon a day which will not be forgotten by those who endured it. The Boers were reinforced in the afternoon, and the pressure became so severe that the field guns were retired with much difficulty. 
Many of the infantry had shot away all their cartridges and were helpless. Just one year before British soldiers had lain under similar circumstances on the plain which leads to Modder River, and now on a smaller scale the very same drama was being enacted. Gradually the violet haze of evening deepened into darkness, and the incessant rattle of the rifle fire died away on either side. Again, as at Modder River, the British infantry still lay in their position, determined to take no backward step, and again the Boers stole away in the night, leaving the ridge which they had defended so well. A hundred killed and wounded was the price paid by the British for that line of rock-studded hills a heavier proportion of losses than had befallen Lord Methuen in the corresponding action. Of the Boer losses there was as usual no means of judging, but several grave mounds, newly dug, showed that they also had something to deplore. Their retreat, however, was not due to exhaustion, but to the demonstration which Lyttelton had been able to make in their ear. The gunners and the infantry had all done well in a most trying action, but by common consent it was with the men from New Zealand that the honours lay. It was no empty compliment when Sir Alfred Milner telegraphed to the Premier of New Zealand his congratulations upon the distinguished behaviour of his fellow countrymen. From this time onwards there was nothing of importance in this part of the seat of war. It is necessary now to turn from the northeast to the northwest of Pretoria, where the presence of Telare and the cover afforded by the Maglisberg Mountains had kept alive the Boer resistance. Very rugged lines of hill alternating with fertile valleys, afforded a succession of forts and of granaries to the army which held them. To General Clement's column had been committed the task of clearing this difficult piece of country. His force fluctuated in numbers, but does not appear at any time to have consisted of more than 3,000 men, which comprised the Border Regiment, the Yorkshire Light Infantry, the 2nd Northumberland Fusiliers, Mounted Infantry, Yeomanry, the 8th RFA, P Battery RHA, and one heavy gun. With this small army he moved about the district, breaking up boar bands, capturing supplies, and bringing in refugees. On November 13 he was at Grugestorp, the southern extremity of his beat. On the 24th he was moving north again, and found himself as he approached the hills in the presence of a force of boars with cannon. This was the redoubtable de la Rey, who sometimes operated in Methuen's country to the north of the Maglisberg, and sometimes to the south. He had now apparently fixed upon Clements as his definite opponent. Delare was numerically inferior, and Clements had no difficulty in this first encounter in forcing him back with some loss. On November 26 Clements was back at Cruiser Storp again with cattle and prisoners. In the early days of December he was moving northwards once more where a serious disaster awaited him. Before narrating the circumstances connected with the Battle of New Itchidak there is one incident which occurred in this same region which should be recounted. This consists of the determined attack made by a party of de la Rey's men, upon December 3rd, on a convoy which was proceeding from Pretoria to Rosenberg, and had got as far as Buffalo's Hoek. The convoy was a very large one, consisting of 150 wagons, which covered about three miles upon the march. It was guarded by two companies of the West Yorkshires, two guns of the 75th Battery, and a handful of the Victoria Mounted Rifles. The escort appears entirely inadequate when it is remembered that these stores, which were of great value, were being taken through a country which was known to be infested by the enemy. What might have been foreseen occurred. Five hundred boars suddenly rode down upon the helpless line of wagons and took possession of them. The escort rallied, however, upon a cop, and, though attacked all day, succeeded in holding their own until help arrived. They prevented the boars from destroying or carrying off as much of the convoy as was under their guns, but the rest was looted and burned. The incident was a most unfortunate one as it supplied the enemy with a large quantity of stores, of which they were badly in need. It was the more irritating as it was freely rumoured that a Boer attack was pending, and there is evidence that a remonstrance was addressed from the convoy before it left Triatfontein to the general of the district, pointing out the danger to which it was exposed. 
the result was the loss of 120 wagons and of more than half the escort. The severity of the little action and the hardihood of the defense are indicated by the fact that the small body who held the cop lost 15 killed and 22 wounded, the gunners losing 9 out of 15. A relieving force appeared at the close of the action, but no vigorous pursuit was attempted, although the weather was wet and the Boers had actually carried away 60 loaded wagons, which could only go very slowly. It must be confessed that from its feckless start to its spiritless finish the story of the Buffalo's Hoek convoy is not a pleasant one to tell. Clements, having made his way once more to the Magalisberg Range, had pitched his camp at a place called Newitjadik not to be confused with the post upon the Delagoa railway at which the British prisoners had been confined. Here, in the very shadow of the mountain, he halted for five days, during which, with the usual insouciance of British commanders, he does not seem to have troubled himself with any interenching. He knew, no doubt, that he was too strong for his opponent de la Rey, but what he did not know, but might have feared, was that a second Boer force might appear suddenly upon the scene and join with de la Rey in order to crush him. This second Boer force was that of Commandant Buz from Warm Baths. By a sudden and skillful movement the two united, and fell like a thunderbolt upon the British column, which was weakened by the absence of the border regiment. The result was such a reverse as the British had not sustained since Sanna's post a reverse which showed that, though no regular Boer army might exist, still a sudden coalition of scattered bands could at any time produce a force which would be dangerous to any British column which might be taken at a disadvantage. We had thought that the days of battles in this war were over but an action which showed a missing and casualty roll of 550 proved that in this, as in so many other things, we were mistaken. As already stated, the camp of Clements lay under a precipitous cliff, upon the summit of which he had placed four companies of the 2nd Northumberland Fusiliers. This strong post was a thousand feet higher than the camp. Below lay the main body of the force, two more companies of Fusiliers four of Yorkshire Light Infantry, the 2nd Mounted Infantry, Kitchener's Horse, Yeomanry, and the Artillery. The latter consisted of one heavy naval gun, four guns of the 8th RFA, and P Battery RHA the whole force amounted to about 1500 men. It was just at the first break of dawn the hour of fate in South African warfare that the battle began. The mounted infantry post between the camp and the mountains were aware of moving figures in front of them. In the dim light they could discern that they were clothed in grey, and that they wore the broad-brimmed hats and feathers of some of our own irregular corps. They challenged, and the answer was a shattering volley, instantly returned by the survivors of the picket. So hot was the Boer attack that before help could come every man save one of the picket was on the ground. The sole survivor, Daly of the Dublins, took no backward step, but continued to steadily load and fire until help came from the awakened camp. There followed a savage conflict at point-blank range. The mounted infantrymen, rushing half-clad to the support of their comrades, were confronted by an ever-thickening swarm of Boer riflemen, who had already, by working round on the flank, established their favourite cross-fire. Leg, the leader of the mounted infantry, a hard little Egyptian veteran, was shot through the head, and his men lay thick around him. For some minutes it was as hot a corner as any in the war. But Clements himself had appeared upon the scene, and his cool gallantry turned the tide of fight. An extension of the line checked the crossfire, and gave the British in turn a flanking position. Gradually the Boer riflemen were pushed back, until at last they broke and fled for their horses in the rear. A small body were cut off, many of whom were killed and wounded, while a few were taken prisoners. This stiff fight of an hour had ended in a complete repulse of the attack, though at a considerable cost. Both Boers and British had lost heavily. Nearly all the staff were killed or wounded, though General Clements had come through untouched. Fifty or sixty of both sides had fallen. But it was noted as an ominous fact that in spite of shell fire the Boers still lingered upon the western flank. Were they coming on again? They showed no signs of it. And yet they waited in groups, and looked up towards the beetling crags above them. 
What were they waiting for? The sudden crash of a murderous moors a fire upon the summit, with the rolling volleys of the British infantry, supplied the answer. Only now must it have been clear to Clements that he was not dealing merely with some spasmodic attack from his old enemy de la Rey, but that this was a largely conceived movement, in which a force at least doubled the strength of his own had suddenly been concentrated upon him. His camp was still menaced by the men whom he had repulsed, and he could not weaken it by sending reinforcements up the hill. But the roar of the musketry was rising louder and louder. It was becoming clearer that there was the main attack. It was a Majuba Hill action up yonder, a thick swarm of skirmishers closing in from many sides upon a central band of soldiers. But the fusiliers were hopelessly outnumbered, and this rock fighting is that above all others in which the Boer has an advantage over the regular. A helio on the hill cried for help. The losses were heavy, it said, and the assailants numerous. The Boers closed swiftly in upon the flanks, and the fusiliers were no match for their assailants. Till the very climax the helio still cried that they were being overpowered, and it is said that even while working it the soldier in charge was hurled over the cliff by the onrush of the victorious Boers. The fight of the mounted infantrymen had been at half past four. At six the attack upon the hill had developed, and Clements in response to those frantic flashes of light had sent up a hundred men of the yeomanry, from the Fife and Devon squadrons, as a reinforcement, to climb a precipitous thousand feet with rifle, bandolier, and spurs, is no easy feat, yet that roar of battle above them heartened them upon their way, but in spite of all their efforts they were only in time to share the general disaster. The head of the line of hard-breathing yeomen reached the plateau just as the Boers, sweeping over the remnants of the Northumberland fusiliers, reached the brink of the cliff. One by one the yeomen darted over the edge, and endeavoured to find some cover in the face of an infernal point-blank fire. Captain Mudie of the staff, who went first, was shot down. So was Pivis of the fifes, who followed him. The others, springing over their bodies rushed for a small trench, and tried to restore the fight. Lieutenant Campbell, a gallant young fellow, was shot dead as he rallied his men. Of twenty-seven of the five shires upon the hill six were killed and eleven wounded. The statistics of the Devons are equally heroic. Those yeomen who had not yet reached the crest were in a perfectly impossible position, as the Boers were firing from complete cover right down upon them. There was no alternative for them but surrender. By seven o'clock every British soldier upon the hill, yeoman or fusilier, had been killed, wounded, or taken. It is not true that the supply of cartridges ran out, and the fusiliers, with the ill luck which has pursued the second battalion, were outnumbered and outfought by better skirmishers than themselves. Seldom has a general found himself in a more trying position than Clements or extricated himself more honourably. Not only had he lost nearly half his force, but his camp was no longer tenable, and his whole army was commanded by the fringe of deadly rifles upon the cliff. From the berg to the camp was from 800 to 1000 yards, and a sleet of bullets whistled down upon it. How severe was the fire may be gauged from the fact that the little pet monkey belonging to the yeomanry a small enough object was hit three times though he lived to survive as a battle-scarred veteran. Those wounded in the early action found themselves in a terrible position, laid out in the open under a withering fire, like helpless Aunt Sally's, as one of them described it. We must get a red flag up, or we shall be blown off the face of the earth, says the same correspondent, a corporal of the Ceylon Mounted Infantry. We had a pillowcase, but no red paint. Then we saw what would do instead so they made the upright with my blood, and the horizontal with Paul's. It is pleasant to add that this grim flag was respected by the Boers. Bullocks and mules fell in heaps, and it was evident that the question was not whether the battle could be restored, but whether the guns could be saved. Leaving a fringe of yeomen, mounted infantry, and kitchen as horse to stave off the Boers, who were already descending by the same steep kloof up which the yeomen had climbed, the general bent all his efforts to getting the big naval gun out of danger. Only six oxen were left out of a team of forty, 
and so desperate did the situation appear that twice dynamite was placed beneath the gun to destroy it. Each time, however, the general intervened, and at last, under a stimulating rain of pom-pom shells, the great cannon lurched slowly forward, quickening its pace as the men pulled on the drag ropes, and the six oxen broke into a wheezy canter. Its retreat was covered by the smaller guns which rained shrapnel upon the crest of the hill, and upon the boars who were descending to the camp. Once the big gun was out of danger, the others limbered up and followed, their ear still covered by the staunch mounted infantry, with whom rest all the honours of the battle. Cookson and Brooks with 250 men stood for hours between Clements and absolute disaster. The camp was abandoned as it stood, and all the stores, 400 picketed horses, and, most serious of all, two wagons of ammunition, fell into the hands of the victors. To have saved all his guns, however, after the destruction of half his force by an active enemy far superior to him in numbers and in mobility, was a feat which goes far to condone the disaster, and to increase rather than to impair the confidence which his troops feel in General Clements. Having retreated for a couple of miles he turned his big gun round upon the hill, which is called Yeomanry Hill, and opened fire upon the camp, which was being looted by swarms of boars. So bold a face did he present that he was able to remain with his crippled force upon Yeomanry Hill from about nine until four in the afternoon, and no attack was pressed home, though he lay under both shell and rifle fire all day. At four in the afternoon he began his retreat, which did not cease till he had reached Triatfontaine, twenty miles off, at six o'clock upon the following morning. His weary men had been working for twenty-six hours, and actually fighting for fourteen, but the bitterness of defeat was alleviated by the feeling that every man, from the general downwards, had done all that was possible, and that there was every prospect of their having a chance before long of getting their own back. The British losses at the Battle of Nuitchedak amounted to sixty killed, one hundred and eighty wounded, and three hundred and fifteen prisoners, all of whom were delivered up a few days later at Trussenburg. Of the Bol losses it is, as usual, impossible to speak with confidence, but all the evidence points to their actual casualties being as heavy as those of the British. There was the long struggle at the camp in which they were heavily punished, the fight on the mountain, where they exposed themselves with unusual recklessness, and the final shelling from shrapnel and from lyodite. All accounts agree that their attack was more open than usual. They were mowed down in twenties that day, but it had no effect. They stood like fanatics, says one who fought against them. From first to last their conduct was most gallant, and great credit is due to their leaders for the skillful sudden concentration by which they threw their whole strength upon the exposed force. Some eighty miles separate warm baths from New Itchidakt, and it seems strange that our intelligence department should have remained in ignorance of so large a movement. General Broadwood's 2nd Cavalry Brigade had been stationed to the north of Maglisburg, some twelve miles westward of Clements, and formed the next link in the long chain of British forces. Broadwood does not appear, however, to have appreciated the importance of the engagement, and made no energetic movement to take part in it. If Colville is open to the charge of having been slow to march upon the cannon at Sanna's post, it might be urged that Broadwood in turn showed some want of energy and judgment upon this occasion. On the morning of the 13th his force could hear the heavy firing to the eastward, and could even see the shells bursting on the top of the Maglisberg. It was but 10 or 12 miles distant, and, as his Elswick guns have a range of nearly five, a very small advance would have enabled him to make a demonstration against the flank of the Boers, and so to relieve the pressure upon Clements. It is true that his force was not large, but it was exceptionally mobile. Whatever the reasons, no effective advance was made by Broadwood. On hearing the result he fell back upon Rosenberg, the nearest British post, his small force being dangerously isolated. Those who expected that General Clements would get his own back had not long to wait. In a few days he was in the field again. The remains of his former force had, however, been sent into Pretoria to refit, 
and nothing remained of it save the 8th RFA and the indomitable cow gun still pocked with the bullets of Nuitjaduct. He had also F battery RHA, the Inniskings, the Border Regiment, and a force of mounted infantry under Alderson. More important than all, however, was the cooperation of General French, who came out from Pretoria to assist in the operations. On the 19th, only six days after his defeat, Clements found himself on the very same spot fighting some at least of the very same men. This time, however, there was no element of surprise, and the British were able to approach the task with deliberation and method. The result was that both upon the 19th and 20th the Boers were shelled out of successive positions with considerable loss, and driven altogether away from that part of the Magalisberg. Shortly afterwards General Clements was recalled to Pretoria, to take over the command of the 7th Division, General Tucker having been appointed to the military command of Bloemfontein in the place of the gallant hunter, who, to the regret of the whole army, was invalided home. General Cunningham henceforward commanded the column which Clements had led back to the Maglisberg. Upon November 13 the first of a series of attacks was made upon the posts along the Delagoa railway line. These were the work of Ville Jones' commando, who, moving swiftly from the north, threw themselves upon the small garrisons of Balmoral and of Wilge River, stations which are about six miles apart. At the former was a detachment of the Buffs, and at the latter of the Royal Fusiliers. The attack was well delivered, but in each instance was beaten back with heavy loss to the assailants. A picket of the Buffs was captured at the first rush and the detachment lost six killed and nine wounded. No impression was made upon the position, however, and the double attack seems to have cost the Boers a large number of casualties. Another incident calling for some mention was the determined attack made by the Boers upon the town of Ryde, in the extreme southeast of the Transvaal near the natal border. Throughout November this district had been much disturbed and the small British garrison had evacuated the town and taken up a position on the adjacent hills. Upon December 11 the Boers attempted to carry the trenches. The garrison of the town appears to have consisted of the 2nd Royal Lancaster Regiment, some 500 strong, a party of the Lancashire Fusiliers, 150 strong, and 50 men of the Royal Garrison Artillery, with a small body of mounted infantry. They held a hill about half a mile north of the town, and commanding it. The attack, which was a surprise in the middle of the night, broke upon the pickets of the British, who held their own in a way which may have been injudicious but was certainly heroic. Instead of falling back when seriously attacked, the young officers in charge of these outposts refused to move, and were speedily under such a fire that it was impossible to reinforce them. There were four outposts, under Woodgate. Theobald, Lippert, and Mangles. The attack at 2.15 on a cold dark morning began at the post held by Woodgate, the Boers coming hand to hand before they were detected. Woodgate, who was unarmed at the instant, seized a hammer, and rushed at the nearest Boer, but was struck by two bullets and killed. His post was dispersed or taken. Theobald and Lippert, warned by the firing, held on behind their sangers and were ready for the storm which burst over them. Lippert was unhappily killed, and his ten men all hit or taken, but young Theobald held his own under a heavy fire for twelve hours. Mangles also, the gallant son of a gallant father, held his post all day with the utmost tenacity. The troops in the trenches behind were never seriously pressed, thanks to the desperate resistance of the outposts, but Colonel Gorney of the Lancasters was unfortunately killed. Towards evening the Boers abandoned the attack, leaving fourteen of their number dead upon the ground, from which it may be guessed that their total casualties were not less than a hundred. The British losses were three officers and five men killed, twenty-two men wounded, and thirty men with one officer missing the latter being the survivors of those outposts which were overwhelmed by the Boer advance. A few incidents stand out among the daily bulletins of snipings, skirmishes, and endless marchings which make the dull chronicle of these, the last months of the year 1900. These must be enumerated without any attempt at connecting them. 
The first is the long drawn out siege or investment of Schweizerneck. This small village stands upon the Harz River, on the western border of the Transvaal. It is not easy to understand why the one party should desire to hold, or the other to attack, a position so insignificant. From August 19th onwards it was defended by a garrison of 250 men, under the very capable command of Colonel Chamia, who handled a small business in a way which marks him as a leader. The Boer force, which varied in numbers from 500 to 1000, never ventured to push home an attack, for Chamia, fresh from the experience of Kimberley, had taken such precautions that his defences were formidable, if not impregnable. Late in September a relieving force under Colonel settled through fresh supplies into the town, but when he passed on upon his endless march the enemy closed in once more, and the siege was renewed. It lasted for several months, until a column withdrew the garrison and abandoned the position. Of all the British detachments, the two which worked hardest and marched furthest during this period of the war was the 21st Brigade, Derby Spires, Sussex, and Camerons under General Bruce Hamilton, and the column under Settle, which operated down the western border of the Orange River Colony, and worked round and round with such pertinacity that it was familiarly known as Settle's Imperial Circus. Much hard and disagreeable work, far more repugnant to the soldier than the actual dangers of war, fell to the lot of Bruce Hamilton and his men. With Kroonstad as their centre they were continually working through the dangerous Lindley and Heilbronn districts, returning to the railway line only to start again immediately upon a fresh quest. It was work for mounted police, not for infantry soldiers, but what they were given to do they did to the best of their ability. Settle's men had a similar thankless task. From the neighbourhood of Kimberley he marched in November with his small column down the border of the Orange River colony, capturing supplies and bringing in refugees. He fought one brisk action with Herzog's commando at Kluve, and then, making his way across the colony, struck the railway line again at Edinburgh on December 7, with a train of prisoners and cattle. Trundle also had put in much hard work in his efforts to control the difficult district in the northeast of the colony which had been committed to his care. He traversed in November from north to south the same country which he had already so painfully traversed from south to north. With occasional small actions he moved about from Vreed to Reitz, and so to Bethlehem and Harrismith. On him, as on all other commanders, the vicious system of placing small garrisons in the various towns imposed a constant responsibility lest they should be starved or overwhelmed. The year and the century ended by a small reverse to the British arms in the Transvaal. This consisted in the capture of a post at Helvetia defended by a detachment of the Liverpool Regiment and by a 4.7 gun. Lidenberg, being 70 miles off the railway line, had a chain of posts connecting it with the junction at Mikado Dorp. These posts were seven in number, ten miles apart, each defended by 250 men. Of these Helvetia was the second. The key of the position was a strongly fortified hill about three quarters of a mile from the headquarter camp, and commanding it. This post was held by Captain Kirk with 40 garrison artillery to work the big gun, and 70 Liverpool infantry. In spite of the barbed wire entanglements, the Boers most gallantly rushed this position, and their advance was so rapid, or the garrison so slow, that the place was carried with hardly a shot fired. Major Cotton, who commanded the main lines, found himself deprived in an instant of nearly half his force and fiercely attacked by a victorious and exultant enemy. His position was much too extended for the small force at his disposal, and the line of trenches was pierced and enfiladed at many points. It must be acknowledged that the defences were badly devised little barbed wire, frail walls, large loopholes, and the outposts so near the trenches that the assailants could reach them as quickly as the supports. With the dawn Cotton's position was serious, if not desperate. He was not only surrounded, but was commanded from Gun Hill. Perhaps it would have been wiser if, after being wounded, he had handed over the command to Jones, his junior officer. A stricken man's judgment can never be so sound as that of the Hale. However that may be, he came to the conclusion that the position was untenable, 
and that it was best to prevent further loss of life. Fifty of the Liverpools were killed and wounded, two hundred taken. No ammunition of the gun was captured, but the Boers were able to get safely away with this humiliating evidence of their victory. One post, under Captain Wilkinson with forty men, held out with success, and harassed the enemy in their retreat. As at Duet Storp and at Nuitjeduct. The Boers were unable to retain their prisoners, so that the substantial fruits of their enterprise were small, but it forms none the less one more of those incidents which may cause us to respect our enemy and to be critical towards ourselves. Footnote, considering that Major Stapleton Cotton was himself wounded in three places during the action, one of these wounds being in the head, he has had hard measure in being deprived of his commission by a court-martial which sat eight months after the event. It is to be earnestly hoped that there may be some revision of this severe sentence. In the last few months of the year some of those corps which had served their time or which were needed elsewhere were allowed to leave the seat of war. By the middle of November the three different corps of the City Imperial Volunteers, the two Canadian contingents, Lumsden's Horse, the composite regiment of guards, 600 Australians, a battery RHA, and the volunteer companies of the regular regiments, were all homeward bound. This loss of several thousand veteran troops before the war was over was to be deplored, and though unavoidable in the case of volunteer contingents, it is difficult to explain where regular troops are concerned. Early in the new year the government was compelled to send out strong reinforcements to take their place. Early in December Lord Roberts also left the country, to take over the duties of Commander-in-Chief. High as his reputation stood when, in January, he landed at Cape Town, it is safe to say that it had been immensely enhanced when, ten months later, he saw from the quarter-deck of the Canada the Table Mountain growing dimmer in the distance. He found a series of disconnected operations, in which we were uniformly worsted. He speedily converted them into a series of connected operations in which we were almost uniformly successful. Proceeding to the front at the beginning of February, within a fortnight he had relieved Kimberley, within a month he had destroyed Cronje's force, and within six weeks he was in Blow Enfantine. Then, after a six weeks halt which could not possibly have been shortened, he made another of his tiger leaps, and within a month had occupied Johannesburg and Pretoria. From that moment the issue of the campaign was finally settled, and though a third leap was needed, which carried him to Kumati Port, and though brave and obstinate men might still struggle against their destiny, he had done what was essential, and the rest, however difficult, was only the detail of the campaign. A kindly gentleman, as well as a great soldier, his nature revolted from all harshness, and a worse man might have been a better leader in the last hopeless phases of the war. He remembered, no doubt, how Grant had given Lee's army their horses, but Lee at the time had been thoroughly beaten, and his men had laid down their arms. A similar boon to the partially conquered Boers led to very different results, and the prolongation of the war is largely due to this act of clemency. At the same time political and military considerations were opposed to each other upon the point, and his moral position in the use of harsher measures is the stronger since a policy of conciliation had been tried and failed. Lord Roberts returned to London with the respect and love of his soldiers and of his fellow countrymen. A passage from his farewell address to his troops may show the qualities which endeared him to them. The service which the South African force has performed is, I venture to think, unique in the annals of war, inasmuch as it has been absolutely almost incessant for a whole year, in some cases for more than a year. There has been no rest, no days off to recruit, no going into winter quarters, as in other campaigns which have extended over a long period. For months together, in fierce heat, in biting cold, in pouring rain, you, my comrades, have marched and fought without halt, and bivouacked without shelter from the elements. You frequently have had to continue marching with your clothes in rags and your boots without soles, time being of such consequence that it was impossible for you to remain long enough in one place to refit. 
when not engaged in actual battle you have been continually shot at from behind copies by invisible enemies to whom every inch of the country was familiar, and who, from the peculiar nature of the country, were able to inflict severe punishment while perfectly safe themselves. You have forced your way through dense jungles, over precipitous mountains, through and over which with infinite manual labor you have had to drag heavy guns and ox wagons. You have covered with almost incredible speed enormous distances, and that often on very short supplies of food. You have endured the sufferings inevitable in water sick and wounded men far from the base, without a murmur and even with cheerfulness. The words reflect honor both upon the troops addressed and upon the man who addressed them. From the middle of December 1900 Lord Kitchener took over the control of the campaign. Chapter 32. The Second Invasion of Cape Colony. December 1900 to April 1901. During the whole war the task of the British had been made very much more difficult by the openly expressed sympathy with the Boers from the political association known as the Africanda Bond, which either inspired or represented the views which prevailed among the great majority of the Dutch inhabitants of Cape Colony. How strong was this rebel impulse may be gauged by the fact that in some of the border districts no less than 90% of the voters joined the Boer invaders upon the occasion of their first entrance into the colony. It is not pretended that these men suffered from any political grievances whatever, and their action is to be ascribed partly to a natural sympathy with their northern kinsmen, and partly to racial ambition and to personal dislike to their British neighbours. The liberal British policy towards the natives had especially alienated the Dutch, and had made as well marked a line of cleavage in South Africa as the slave question had done in the States of the Union. With the turn of the war the discontent in Cape Colony became less obtrusive, if not less acute, but in the later months of the year 1900 it increased to a degree which became dangerous. The fact of the farm burning in the conquered countries and the fiction of outrages by the British troops, raised a storm of indignation. The annexation of the republics, meaning the final disappearance of any Dutch flag from South Africa, was a racial humiliation which was bitterly resented. The Dutch papers became very violent, and the farmers much excited. The agitation culminated in a conference at Worcester upon December 6, at which some thousands of delegates were present. It is suggestive of the imperial nature of the struggle that the assembly of Dutch Afrikanders was carried out under the muzzles of Canadian artillery, and closely watched by Australian cavalry. Had violent words transformed themselves into deeds, all was ready for the crisis. Fortunately the good sense of the assembly prevailed, and the agitation, though bitter, remained within those wide limits which a British constitution permits. Three resolutions were passed one asking that the war be ended, a second that the independence of the republics be restored, and a third protesting against the actions of Sir Alfred Milner. A deputation which carried these to the governor received a courteous but an uncompromising reply. Sir Alfred Milner pointed out that the home government, all the great colonies, and half the Cape were unanimous in their policy, and that it was folly to imagine that it could be reversed on account of a local agitation. All were agreed in the desire to end the war, but the last way of bringing this about was by encouraging desperate men to go on fighting in a hopeless cause. Such was the general nature of the governor's reply, which was, as might be expected, entirely endorsed by the British government and people. A duet, in the operations which have already been described, evaded Charles Knox and crossed the Orange River. His entrance into the colony would have been synchronous with the Congress at Worcester, and the situation would have become more acute. This peril was fortunately averted. The agitation in the colony suggested to the Boer leaders, however, that here was an untouched recruiting ground, and that small mobile invading parties might gather strength and become formidable. It was obvious, also that by enlarging the field of operations the difficulties of the British commander-in-chief would be very much increased, and the pressure upon the Boer guerrillas in the republics relaxed. Therefore, in spite of De Wet's failure to penetrate the colony, several smaller bands under less known leaders were dispatched over the Orange River. With the help of the information and the supplies furnished by the local farmers, 
these bands wandered for many months over the great expanse of the colony, taking refuge, when hard pressed, among the mountain ranges. They moved swiftly about, obtaining remounts from their friends, and avoiding everything in the nature of an action, save when the odds were overwhelmingly in their favor. Numerous small posts or patrols cut off, many skirmishes, and one or two railway smashes were the fruits of this invasion, which lasted till the end of the war, and kept the colony in an extreme state of unrest during that period. A short account must be given here of the movement and exploits of these hostile bands, avoiding, as far as possible, that catalogue of obscure fontines and cops which mark their progress. The invasion was conducted by two main bodies, which shed off numerous small raiding parties. Of these two, one operated on the western side of the colony, reaching the sea coast in the Clan William district, and attaining a point which is less than a hundred miles from Cape Town. The other penetrated even more deeply down the centre of the colony, reaching almost to the sea in the Mossel Bay direction. Yet the incursion, although so far reaching, had small effect, since the invaders held nothing save the ground on which they stood, and won their way not by victory, but by the avoidance of danger. Some recruits were won to their cause, but they do not seem at the time to have been more than a few hundreds in number, and to have been drawn for the most part from the classes of the community which had least to lose and least to offer. The western Boers were commanded by Judge Herzog of the Free State, having with him Brand, the son of the former president, and about 1200 well-mounted men. Crossing the Orange River at Sand Drift, North of Colesburg, upon December 16, they paused at Camille Fontein to gather up a small post of thirty yeomen and guardsmen under Lieutenant Fletcher, the well known or. Meeting with a stout resistance, and learning that British forces were already converging upon them, they abandoned the attack, and turning away from Colesburg, they headed west, cutting the railway line twenty miles to the north of Douar. On the 22nd, they occupied Britstown which is 80 miles inside the border, and on the same day they captured a small body of yeomanry who had been following them. These prisoners were released again some days later. Taking a sweep round towards Prieska and Stradenburg, they pushed south again. At the end of the year Herzog's column was 150 miles deep in the colony, sweeping through the barren and thinly inhabited western lands, Heading apparently for Fraserburg and Beaufort West. The second column was commanded by Kritzinger, a burgher of Zastron, in the Orange River colony. His force was about 800 strong. Crossing the border at Renostehoek upon December 16, they pushed for Bergerstorp, but were headed off by a British column. Passing through Ventestad, they made for Steinsburg, fighting two indecisive skirmishes with small British forces. The end of the year saw them crossing the railroad at Sherburne, north of Rosmed Junction, where they captured a train as they passed, containing some colonial troops. At this time they were a hundred miles inside the colony, and nearly three hundred from Herzog's western column. In the meantime Lord Kitchener, who had descended for a few days to Douar, had shown great energy in organizing small mobile columns which should follow and, if possible, destroy the invaders. Martial law was proclaimed in the parts of the colony affected, and as the invaders came further south the utmost enthusiasm was shown by the loyalists, who formed themselves everywhere into town guards. The existing colonial regiments, such as Brabant's, the Imperial and South African Light Horse Thornycroft's, Rymington's, and the others had already been brought up to strength again, and now two new regiments were added, Kitchener's bodyguard and Kitchener's fighting scouts, the latter being raised by Johann Kohlenbrander, who had made a name for himself in the Rhodesian Wars. At this period of the war between twenty and thirty thousand Cape colonists were under arms. Many of these were untrained levies, but they possessed the martial spirit of the race, and they set free more seasoned troops for other duties. It will be most convenient and least obscure to follow the movements of the Western force, Herzogs, and afterwards to consider those of the Eastern, Kritzingers. The opening of the year saw the mobile column of Free State as 150 miles over the border, 
pushing swiftly south over the barren surface of the Karoo. It is a country of scattered farms and scanty population, desolate plains curving upwards until they rise into still more desolate mountain ranges. Moving in a very loose formation over a wide front, the Boers swept southwards. On or about January 4 they took possession of the small town of Calvinia, which remained their headquarters for more than a month. From this point their roving bands made their way as far as the seacoast in the Clan William direction, for they expected at Lambert's Bay to meet with a vessel with mercenaries and guns from Europe. They pushed their outposts also as far as Sutherland and Beaufort west in the south. On January 15 strange horsemen were seen hovering about the line at Tooze River, and the citizens of Cape Town learned with amazement that the war had been carried to within a hundred miles of their own doors. Whilst the Boers were making this staring raid a force consisting of several mobile columns was being organized by General Settle to arrest and finally to repel the Western invasion. The larger body was under the command of Colonel de Lisle, an officer who brought to the operations of war the same energy and thoroughness with which he had made the polo team of an infantry regiment the champions of the whole British army. His troops consisted of the 6th Mounted Infantry, the New South Wales Mounted Infantry, the Irish Yeomanry, a section of our battery RHA, and a pom-pom. With this small but mobile and hardy force he threw himself in front of Herzog's line of advance. On January 13 he occupied Piketburg, 80 miles south of the Boer headquarters. On the 23rd he was at Clan William, 50 miles southwest of them. To his right were three other small British columns under Beth Hune, Thornycroft, and Henniker, the latter resting upon the railway at Matchsfontein, and the whole line extending over 120 miles barring the southern path to the invaders. Though Herzog at Calvinia and Delisle at Clan William were only 50 miles apart, the intervening country is among the most broken and mountainous in South Africa. Between the two points, and nearer to Delisle than to Herzog, flows the Dawn River. The Boers advancing from Calvinia came into touch with the British scouts at this point and drove them in upon January 21. On the 28th Delisle, having been reinforced by Bethune's column, was able at last to take the initiative. Bethune's force consisted mainly of colonials, and included Kitchener's fighting scouts, the Cape Mounted Police, Cape Mounted Rifles, Brabant's Horse, and the Diamond Field Horse. At the end of January the united forces of Bethune and of Delisle advanced upon Calvinia. The difficulties lay rather in the impassable country than in the resistance of an enemy who was determined to refuse battle. On February 6, after a fine march, Delisle and his men took possession of Calvinia, which had been abandoned by the Boers. It is painful to add that during the month that they had held the town they appear to have behaved with great harshness, especially to the Kaffirs. The flogging and shooting of a colored man named Disson forms one more incident in the dark story of the Boer and his relations to the native. The British were now sweeping north on a very extended front. Colnbrunder had occupied Van Rijnsdorp, to the east of Calvinia, while Beth Hune's force was operating to the west of it. Delisle hardly halted at Calvinia, but pushed onwards to Williston, covering 72 miles of broken country in 48 hours one of the most amazing performances of the war. Quick as he was, the Boers were quicker still, and during his northward march he does not appear to have actually come into contact with them. Their line of retreat lay through Carnarvon, and upon February 22 they crossed the railway line to the north of Dua, and joined upon February 26 the new invading force under De Wet, who had now crossed the Orange River. De Lisle, who had passed over 500 miles of barren country since he advanced from Piketburg, made for the railway at Victoria West, and was dispatched from that place on February 22 to the scene of action in the north. From all parts Boer and Britain were concentrating in their effort to aid or to repel the inroad of the famous guerrilla. Before describing this attempt it would be well to trace the progress of the eastern invasion, Kritzinger's, a movement which may be treated rapidly since it led to no particular military result at that time, though it lasted long after Herzog's force had been finally dissipated. Several small columns, 
those of Williams, Barnger, Grenfell, and Lowe, all under the direction of Haag, were organized to drive back these commandos, but so nimble were the invaders, so vast the distances and so broken the country, that it was seldom that the forces came into contact. The operations were conducted over a portion of the colony which is strongly Dutch in sympathy, and the enemy, though they do not appear to have obtained any large number of recruits, were able to gather stores, horses, and information wherever they went. When last mentioned Kritzinger's men had crossed the railway north of Rosmed on December 30, and held up a train containing some colonial troops. From then onwards a part of them remained in the Medelberg and Grafrenet districts, while part moved towards the south. On January 11 there was a sharp skirmish near Murraysburg, in which Bung's column was engaged, at the cost of 20 casualties, all of Brabant's or the South African light horse. On the 16th a very rapid movement towards the south began. On that date balls appeared at Aberdeen, and on the 18th at Willowmore, having covered 70 miles in two days. Their long, thin line was shredded out over 150 miles, and from Marysburg, in the north, to Uniondale, which is only 30 miles from the coast, there was rumor of their presence. In this wild district and in that of Outshorn the Boer vanguard flitted in and out of the hills, Haig's column striving hard to bring them to an action. So well informed were the invaders that they were always able to avoid the British concentrations, while if a British outpost or patrol was left exposed it was fortunate if it escaped disaster. On February 6 a small body of 25 of the 7th King's Dragoon Guards and of the West Australians, under Captain Oliver, were overwhelmed at Kliplat, after a very fine defence, in which they held their own against 200 Boers for eight hours, and lost nearly 50% of their number. On the 12th the patrol of yeomanry was surprised and taken near Willamore. The coming of De Wet had evidently been the signal for all the Boer raiders to concentrate, for in the second week of February Kritzinger also began to fall back, as Herzog had done in the west, followed closely by the British columns. He did not, however, actually join De Wet, and his evacuation of the country was never complete, as was the case with Herzog's force. On the 19th Kritzinger was at Bethesda, with Gorringe and Lowe at his heels. On the 23rd an important railway bridge at Fish River, north of Craddock, was attacked, but the attempt was foiled by the resistance of a handful of Cape Police and Lancasters. On March 6 the party of Boers occupied the village of Pston, capturing a few rifles and some ammunition. On the same date there was a skirmish between Colonel Parsons's column and a party of the enemy to the north of Aberdeen. The main body of the invading force appears to have been lurking in this neighborhood, as they were able upon April 7 to cut off a strong British patrol, consisting of a hundred lancers and yeomanry, seventy-five of whom remained as temporary prisoners in the hands of the enemy. With this success we may for the time leave Kritzinger and his lieutenant, Seepers who commanded that portion of his force which had penetrated to the south of the colony. The two invasions which have been here described, that of Herzog in the west and of Kritzinger in the Midlands, would appear in themselves to be unimportant military operations, since they were carried out by small bodies of men whose policy was rather to avoid than to overcome resistance. Their importance, however, is due to the fact that they were really the forerunners of a more important incursion upon the part of De Wet. The object of these two bands of raiders was to spy out the land, so that on the arrival of the main body all might be ready for the general rising of their kinsmen in the colony which was the last chance, not of winning, but of prolonging the war. It must be confessed that, however much their reason might approve of the government under which they lived, the sentiment of the Cape Dutch had been cruelly, though unavoidably, hurt in the course of the war. The appearance of so popular a leader as De Wet with a few thousand veterans in the very heart of their country might have stretched their patience to the breaking point. Inflamed, as they were, by that racial hatred which had always smouldered, and had now been fanned into a blaze by the speeches of their leaders and by the fictions of their newspapers, they were ripe for mischief 
while they had before their eyes an object lesson of the impotence of our military system in those small bands who had kept the country in a ferment for so long. All was propitious, therefore, for the attempt which Stein and De Wet were about to make to carry the war into the enemy's country. We last saw De Wet when, after a long chase, he had been headed back from the Orange River, and, winning clear from Knox's pursuit, had in the third week of December passed successfully through the British cordon between the Abentu and Lady Brand. Thence he made his way to Senecal, and proceeded, in spite of the shaking which he had had, to recruit and recuperate in the amazing way which a Boer army has. There is no force so easy to drive and so difficult to destroy. The British columns still kept in touch with De Wet, but found it impossible to bring him to an action in the difficult district to which he had withdrawn. His force had split up into numerous smaller bodies, capable of reuniting at a signal from their leader. These scattered bodies, mobile as ever, vanished if seriously attacked, while keenly on the alert to pounce upon any British force which might be overpowered before assistance could arrive. Such an opportunity came to the commando led by Philip Boter, and the result was another petty reverse to the British arms. Upon January 3, Colonel White's small column was pushing north, in cooperation with those of Knox, Pilcher, and the others. Upon that date, it had reached a point just north of Lindley, a district which has never been a fortunate one for the invaders. A patrol of Kitchen Rest's newly raised bodyguard, under Colonel Lane, 120 strong, was sent forward to reconnoitre upon the road from Lindley to Reeds. The scouting appears to have been negligently done, there being only two men out upon each flank. The little force walked into one of those horseshoe positions which the Boers love, and learned by a sudden volley from a kraal upon their right that the enemy was present in strength. On attempting to withdraw it was instantly evident that the Boers were on all sides and in the rear with a force which numbered at least five to one. The camp of the main column was only four miles away, however, and the bodyguard, having sent messages of their precarious position, did all they could to make a defence until help could reach them. Colonel Lane had fallen, shot through the heart, but found a gallant successor in young N, the adjutant. Part of the force had thrown themselves, under Nen and Milne, into a donga, which gave some shelter from the sleet of bullets. The others, under Captain Butters, held on to a ruined kraal. The Boers pushed the attack very rapidly, however, and were soon able with their superior numbers to send a raking fire down the donga, which made it a perfect death trap. Still hoping that the laggard reinforcements would come up, the survivors held desperately on, but both in the kraal and in the donga their numbers were from minute to minute diminishing. There was no formal surrender and no white flag, for, when 50% of the British were down, the Boers closed in swiftly and rushed the position. Philip Bota, the brother of the commandant, who led the Boers, behaved with courtesy and humanity to the survivors, but many of the wounds were inflicted with those horrible explosive and expansive missiles, the use of which among civilized combatants should now and always be a capital offense. To disable one's adversary is a painful necessity of warfare, but nothing can excuse the willful mutilation and torture which is inflicted by these brutal devices. How many of you are there? asked Bota. A hundred, said an officer. It is not true. There are one hundred and twenty. I counted you as you came along. The answer of the Boer leader shows how carefully the small force had been nursed until it was in an impossible position. The margin was a narrow one, however, for within fifteen minutes of the disaster White's guns were at work. There may be some question as to whether the rescuing force could have come sooner, but there can be none as to the resistance of the bodyguard. They held out to the last cartridge. Colonel Lane and three officers with sixteen men were killed four officers and twenty-two men were wounded. The high proportion of fatal casualties can only be explained by the deadly character of the Boer bullets. Hardly a single horse of the bodyguard was left unwounded, and the profit to the victors, since they were unable to carry away their prisoners, lay entirely in the captured rifles. 
It is worthy of record that the British wounded were dispatched to Heilbronn without guard through the Boer forces. That they arrived there unmolested is due to the forbearance of the enemy and to the tact and energy of Surgeon Captain Porter, who commanded the convoy. Encouraged by this small success, and stimulated by the news that Herzog and Kritzinger had succeeded in penetrating the colony without disaster, De Wet now prepared to follow them. British scouts to the north of Grunstad reported horsemen riding south and east, sometimes alone, sometimes in small parties. They were recruits going to swell the forces of the wet. On January 23 500 men crossed the line, journeying in the same direction. Before the end of the month, having gathered together about 2,500 men with fresh horses at the Dornberg, 20 miles north of Winburg, the Boer leader was ready for one of his lightning treks once more. On January 28 he broke south through the British net which appears to have had more meshes than cord. Passing the blow Enfantine Lady Brandline at his rail port he swept southwards, with British columns still wearily trailing behind him, like honest bulldogs panting after a greyhound. Dot before following him upon this new venture it is necessary to say a few words about that peace movement in the Boer states to which some allusion has already been made. On December 20 Lord Kitchener had issued a proclamation which was intended to have the effect of affording protection to those burghers who desired to cease fighting, but who were unable to do so without incurring the enmity of their irreconcilable brethren. It is hereby notified, said the document, to all burghers that if after this date they voluntarily surrender they will be allowed to live with their families and government ledgers until such time as the guerrilla warfare now being carried on will admit of their returning safely to their homes. All stock and property brought in at the time of the surrender of such burghers will be respected and paid for if requisitioned. This wise and liberal offer was sedulously concealed from their men by the leaders of the fighting commandos but was largely taken advantage of by those Boers to whom it was conveyed. Boer refugee camps were formed at Pretoria, Johannesburg, Kroonstad, Blo Enfantine, Warrington, and other points, to which by degrees the whole civil population came to be transferred. It was the reconcentrado system of Cuba over again, with the essential difference that the guests of the British government were well fed and well treated during their detention. Within a few months the camps had 50,000 inmates. It was natural that some of these people, having experienced the amenity of British rule, and being convinced of the hopelessness of the struggle, should desire to convey their feelings to their friends and relations in the field. Both in the Transvaal and in the Orange River Colony peace committees were formed, which endeavoured to persuade their countrymen to bow to the inevitable. A remarkable letter was published from Bayard de Wet, a man who had fought bravely for the Boer cause, to his brother, the famous general. Which is better for the republics, he asked, to continue the struggle and run the risk of total ruin as a nation, or to submit? Could we for a moment think of taking back the country if it were offered to us, with thousands of people to be supported by a government which is not a farthing? Dot. Put passionate feeling aside for a moment and use common sense, and you will then agree with me that the best thing for the people and the country is to give in, to be loyal to the new government, and to get responsible government. Should the war continue a few months longer the nation will become so poor that they will be the working class in the country, and disappear as a nation in the future. The British are convinced that they have conquered the land and its people, and consider the matter ended and they only try to treat magnanimously those who are continuing the struggle in order to prevent unnecessary bloodshed. Such were the sentiments of those of the burghers who were in favour of peace. Their eyes had been opened and their bitterness was transferred from the British government to those individual Britons who, partly from idealism and partly from party passion, had encouraged them to their undoing. But their attempt to convey their feelings to their countrymen in the field ended in tragedy. Two of their number, more gentle and wessels, who had journeyed to De Wet's camp, were condemned to death by order of that leader. In the case of more gentle the execution actually took place, and seems to have been attended by brutal circumstances, the man having been thrashed with a jambok before being put to death. 
the circumstances are still surrounded by such obscurity that it is impossible to say whether the message of the peace envoys was to the general himself or to the men under his command. In the former case the man was murdered. In the latter the Boer leader was within his rights, though the rights may have been harshly construed and brutally enforced. On January 29, in the act of breaking south, De Wet's force, or a portion of it, had a sharp brush with a small British column, cruise, at Tabaksburg, which lies about 40 miles northeast of Bloemfontein. This small force, 700 strong, found itself suddenly in the presence of a very superior body of the enemy, and had some difficulty in extricating itself. A pom pom was lost in this affair. Crew fell back upon Knox, and the combined columns made for Bloemfontein, whence they could use the rails for their transport. De Wet meanwhile moved south as far as Smithfield, and then, detaching several small bodies to divert the attention of the British, he struck due west, and crossed the track between Springfontein and Jages Fontaine Road, capturing the usual supply train as he passed. On February 9 he had reached Philippe Lys, well ahead of the British pursuit, and spent a day or two in making his final arrangements before carrying the war over the border. His force consisted at this time of nearly 8,000 men, with two 15-pounders, one pom-pom, and one maxim. The garrisons of all the towns in the southwest of the Orange River colony had been removed in accordance with the policy of concentration, so De Wet found himself for the moment in a friendly country. The British, realizing how serious a situation might arise should De Wet succeed in penetrating the colony and in joining Herzog and Kritzinger, made every effort both to head him off and to bar his return. General Lyttelton at Naorport directed the operations, and the possession of the railway line enabled him to concentrate his columns rapidly at the point of danger. On February 11 De Wet forded the Orange River at Zandrift, and found himself once more upon British territory. Lyttelton's plan of campaign appears to have been to allow De Wet to come some distance south, and then to hold him in front by Delisle's force, while a number of small mobile columns under Plumer, Crab, Henica, Bethune, Hag, and Thornycroft should shepherd him behind. On crossing, De Wet at once moved westwards, where, upon February 12, Plumer's column, consisting of the Queensland Mounted Infantry, the Imperial Bushmen, and part of the King's Dragoon Guards, came into touch with his rearguard. All day upon the 13th and 14th, amid terrific rain, Plumer's hardy troopers followed close upon the enemy, gleaming a few ammunition wagons, a maxim, and some prisoners. The invaders crossed the railway line near Houtnik, to the north of Dua, in the early hours of the 15th, moving upon a front of six or eight miles. Two armoured trains from the north and the south closed in upon him as he passed, Plumer still thundered in his rear and a small column under Crab came pressing from the south. This sturdy colonel of grenadiers had already been wounded four times in the war, so that he might be excused if he felt some personal as well as patriotic reasons for pushing a relentless pursuit. On crossing the railroad the wet turned furiously upon his pursuers, and, taking an excellent position upon a line of copies rising out of the huge expanse of the Karoo, he fought a stubborn rearguard action in order to give time for his convoy to get ahead. He was hustled off the hills, however, the Australian bushman with great dash carrying the central cop, and the guns driving the invaders to the westward. Leaving all his wagons and his reserve ammunition behind him, the guerrilla chief struck northwest, moving with great swiftness, but never succeeding in shaking off Plumer's pursuit. The weather continued, however to be atrocious, rain and hail falling with such violence that the horses could hardly be induced to face it. For a week the two sodden, sleepless, mud-splashed little armies swept onwards over the Karoo. Derwet passed northwards through Stradenburg, past Hopetown, and so to the Orange River, which was found to be too swollen with the rains to permit of his crossing. Here upon the 23rd, after a march of 45 miles on end, Plumer ran into him once more, and captured with very little fighting a fifteen-pounder, a pom-pom, and close on to a hundred prisoners. Slipping away to the east, 
De Wet upon February 24 crossed the railroad again between Crankle and Orange River Station, with Thornycroft's column hard upon his heels. The Boer leader was now more anxious to escape from the colony than ever he had been to enter it, and he rushed distractedly from point to point, endeavouring to find a ford over the great turbid river which cut him off from his own country. Here he was joined by Herzog's commando with a number of invaluable spare horses. It is said also that he had been able to get remounts in the Hope Town district, which had not been cleared in a mission for which, it is to be hoped, someone has been held responsible. The Boer ponies, used to the succulent grasses of the veldt, could make nothing of the rank Karoo, and had so fallen away that an enormous advantage should have rested with the pursuers had ill luck and bad management not combined to enable the invaders to renew their mobility at the very moment when Plumer's horses were dropping dead under their riders. The Boer force was now so scattered that, in spite of the advent of Herzog, De Wet had fewer men with him than when he entered the colony. Several hundreds had been taken prisoners, many had deserted, and a few had been killed. It was hoped now that the whole force might be captured, and Thornycroft's, Crabs, Henikers, and other columns were closing swiftly in upon him, while the swollen river still barred his retreat. There was a sudden drop in the flood, however, one ford became passable, and over it, Upon the last day of February, De Wet and his bedraggled, dispirited commando escaped to their own country. There was still a sting in his tail, however, for upon that very day a portion of his force succeeded in capturing sixty and killing or wounding twenty of Colin Brander's new regiment, Kitchener's fighting scouts. On the other hand, De Wet was finally relieved upon the same day of all care upon the score of his guns as the last of them was most gallantly captured by Captain Dallimore and fifteen Victorians, who at the same time brought in thirty-three Boer prisoners. The net result of De Wet's invasion was that he gained nothing, and that he lost about four thousand horses, all his guns, all his convoy, and some three hundred of his men. Once safely in his own country again, the guerrilla chief pursued his way northwards with his usual celerity and success. The moment that it was certain that De Wet had escaped, the indefatigable plumer, wiry, tenacious man, had been sent off by train to Springfontein, while Beth Hewn's column followed direct. This latter force crossed the Orange River Bridge and marched upon Luckhoff and Foresmith. At the latter town they overtook Plumer, who was again hard upon the heels of De Wet. Together they ran him across the Riot River and north to Petrasburg until they gave it up as hopeless upon finding that, with only fifty followers, he had crossed the Modra River at Abram's Kral. There they abandoned the chase and fell back upon Blow Emfantine to refit and prepare for a fresh effort to run down their elusive enemy. While Plumer and Bethune were following upon the track of De Wet until he left them behind at the Modder, Lyttelton was using the numerous columns which were ready to his hand in effecting a drive up the southeastern section of the Orange River colony. It was disheartening to remember that all this large stretch of country had from April to November been as peaceful and almost as prosperous as Kent or Yorkshire. Now the intrusion of the guerrilla bands, and the pressure put by them upon the farmers, had raised the whole country once again, and the work of pacification had to be set about once more, with harsher measures than before. A continuous barrier of barbed wire fencing had been erected from Blow Emfantine to the Bar Sutter border a distance of eighty miles, and this was now strongly held by British posts. From the south Bruce Hamilton, Hickman, Thornycroft, and Haig swept upwards, stripping the country as they went in the same way that French had done in the eastern Transvaal, while Pilcher's column waited to the north of the barbed wire barrier. It was known that Furry, with a considerable commando, was lurking in this district but he and his men slipped at night between the British columns and escaped. Pilcher, Beth Hewn, and Barn were able, however, to send in two hundred prisoners and very great numbers of cattle. On April 10th Monroe, with Beth Hewn's mounted infantry, captured eighty fighting boars near Duet's Dorp, and sixty more were taken by a night attack at Boschberg. There is no striking victory to record in these operations 
but they were an important part of that process of attrition which was wearing the bores out and helping to bring the war to an end. Terrible it is to see that barren countryside, and to think of the depths of misery to which the once flourishing and happy orange free state had fallen, through joining in a quarrel with a nation which bore it nothing but sincere friendship and goodwill. With nothing to gain and everything to lose, the part played by the Orange Free State in this South African drama is one of the most inconceivable things in history. Never has a nation so deliberately and so causelessly committed suicide. Chapter 33. The Northern Operations from January to April, 1901. Three consecutive chapters have now given some account of the campaign of De Wet, of the operations in the Transvaal up to the end of the year 1900 and of the invasion of Cape Colony up to April 1901. The present chapter will deal with the events in the Transvaal from the beginning of the new century. The military operations in that country, though extending over a very large area, may be roughly divided into two categories, the attacks by the Boers upon British posts, and the aggressive sweeping movements of British columns. Under the first heading come the attacks on Belfast, on Zuerfontein, on Kalfontein, on Zerust, on Modafontein, and on Lichtenberg, besides many minor affairs. The latter comprises the operations of Barbington and of Cunningham to the west and southwest of Pretoria, those of Matthew and still further to the southwest, and the large movement of French in the southeast. In no direction did the British forces in the field meet with much active resistance. So long as they moved the gnats did not settle, it was only when quiet that they buzzed about and occasionally stung. The early days of January 1901 were not fortunate for the British arms, as the check in which Kitchener's bodyguard was so roughly handled, near Lindley, was closely followed by a brisk action at Naor Portors and Fontein, near the Maglisberg in which de la Rey left his mark upon the imperial light horse. The Boer commandos, having been driven into the mountains by French and Clements in the latter part of December, were still on the lookout to strike a blow at any British force which might expose itself. Several mounted columns had been formed to scour the country, one under Keckwish, one under Gordon, and one under Barbington. The two latter, meeting in a mist upon the morning of January 5th actually turned their rifles upon each other, but fortunately without any casualties resulting. A more deadly rencontre was, however, awaiting them. A force of Boers were observed, as the mist cleared, making for a ridge which would command the road along which the convoy and guns were moving. Two squadrons, B and C, of the light horse were instantly detached to seize the point. They do not appear to have realized that they were in the immediate presence of the enemy and they imagined that the ground over which they were passing had been already reconnoitred by a troop of the 14th Hussars. It is true that four scouts were thrown forward, but as both squadrons were cantering there was no time for these to get ahead. Presently C squadron, which was behind, was ordered to close up upon the left of B squadron, and the 150 horsemen in one long line swept over a low grassy ridge. Some hundreds of de la Rey's men were lying in the long grass upon the further side, and their first volley, fired at a fifty-yard range, emptied a score of saddles. It would have been wiser, if less gallant, to retire at once in the presence of a numerous and invisible enemy, but the survivors were ordered to dismount and return the fire. This was done, but the hail of bullets was terrific and the casualties were numerous. Captain Norman, of C Squadron then retired his men, who withdrew in good order. B squadron having lost Yochni, its brave leader, heard no order, so they held their ground until few of them had escaped the driving sleet of lead. Many of the men were struck three and four times. There was no surrender, and the extermination of B company added another laurel, even at a moment of defeat, to the regiment whose reputation was so grimly upheld. The Boer victors walked in among the litter of stricken men and horses. Practically all of them were dressed in khaki and had the water bottles and haversacks of our soldiers. One of them snatched a bayonet from a dead man, and was about to dispatch one of our wounded when he was stopped in the nick of time by a man in a black suit, who, I afterwards heard, was Delaray himself. 
The feature of the action was the incomparable heroism of our dear old Colonel Wool Sampson. So wrote a survivor of B Company, himself shot through the body. It was four hours before a fresh British advance reoccupied the ridge, and by the time the Boers had disappeared. Some seventy killed and wounded, many of them terribly mutilated, were found on the scene of the disaster. It is certainly a singular coincidence that at distant points of the seat of war two of the crack irregular corps should have suffered so severely within three days of each other. In each case, however, their prestige was enhanced rather than lowered by the result. These incidents tend, however, to shake the belief that scouting is better performed in the colonial than in the regular forces. Of the Boer attacks upon British posts to which allusion has been made, that upon Belfast, in the early morning of January 7, appears to have been very gallantly and even desperately pushed. On the same date a number of smaller attacks, which may have been meant simply as diversions, were made upon Wanderfontein, Nuitchidict, Wildfontein, Pan, Dalman Nuta, and Makado Dorp. These seven separate attacks, occurring simultaneously over 60 miles, show that the Boer forces were still organized and under one effective control. The general object of the operations was undoubtedly to cut Lord Roberts's communications upon that side and to destroy a considerable section of the railway. The town of Belfast was strongly held by Smith Doyen, with 1750 men, of which 1,300 were infantry belonging to the Royal Irish, the Shropshires, and the Gordons. The perimeter of defence, however, was 15 miles, and each little fort too far from its neighbour for mutual support, though connected with headquarters by telephone. It is probable that the leaders and burghers engaged in this very gallant attack were in part the same as those concerned in the successful attempt at Helvetia upon December 29, for the assault was delivered in the same way, at the same hour, and apparently with the same primary object. This was to gain possession of the big 5-inch gun, which is as helpless by night as it is formidable by day. At Helvetia they attained their object and even succeeded not merely in destroying, but in removing their gigantic trophy. At Belfast they would have performed the same feat had it not been for the foresight of General Smith Doyen, who had the heavy gun trundled back into the town every night. The attack broke first upon Monument Hill a post held by Captain Fosbury with 83 Royal Irish. Chance or treason guided the Boers to the weak point of the wire entanglement and they surged into the fort, where the garrison fought desperately to hold its own. There was thick mist and driving rain, and the rush of vague and shadowy figures amid the gloom was the first warning of the onslaught. The Irishmen were overborne by a swarm of assailants, but they nobly upheld their traditional reputation. Fosbury met his death like a gallant gentleman, but not more heroically than Barry, the humble private, who, surrounded by Boers, thought neither of himself nor of them, but smashed at the Maxim gun with a pickaxe until he fell riddled with bullets. Half the garrison were on the ground before the post was carried. A second post upon the other side of the town was defended by Lieutenant Marshall with twenty men, mostly Shropshires. For an hour they held out until Marshall and nine out of his twelve Shropshires had been hit. Then this post also was carried. The Gordon Highlanders held two posts to the southeast and to the southwest of the town, and these also were vigorously attacked. Here, however, the advance spent itself without result. In vain the Ermelo and Carolina commandos stormed up to the Gordon pickets. They were blown back by the steady fire of the infantry. One small post manned by twelve Highlanders was taken, but the rest defied all attack. Seeing therefore that his attempt at a coup de main was a failure, Viljoen withdrew his men before daybreak. The Boer casualties have not been ascertained, but twenty-four of their dead were actually picked up within the British lines. The British lost sixty killed and wounded, while about as many were taken prisoners. Altogether the action was a brisk and a gallant one of which neither side has cause to be ashamed. The simultaneous attacks upon six other stations were none of them pressed home, and were demonstrations rather than assaults. The attempts upon Calfontine and on Zuerfontine were both made in the early morning of January 12. 
These two places are small stations upon the line between Johannesburg and Pretoria. It is clear that the Boers were very certain of their own superior mobility before they ventured to intrude into the very heart of the British position, and the result showed that they were right in supposing that even if their attempt were repulsed, they would still be able to make good their escape. Better horsed, better riders, with better intelligence and a better knowledge of the country, their ventures were always attended by a limited liability. The attacks seem to have been delivered by a strong commando said to have been under the command of Biz, upon its way to join the Boer concentration in the eastern Transvaal. They had not the satisfaction, however, of carrying the garrison of a British post with them. For at each point they were met by a stout resistance and beaten off. Calfontaine was garrisoned by 120 men of Cheshire under Williams Freeman. Zuer Fontaine by as many Norfolks and a small body of Lincolns under Corks and Atkinson. For six hours the pressure was considerable. The assailants of Calfontaine keeping up a brisk shell and rifle fire, while those of Zuer Fontaine were without artillery. At the end of that time two armoured trains came up with reinforcements and the enemy continued his trek to the eastward. Knox's 2nd Cavalry Brigade followed them up but without any very marked result. Zerust and Lichtenberg had each been garrisoned and provisioned by Lord Methuen before he carried his column away to the southwest, where much rough and useful work awaited him. The two towns were at once invested by the enemy, who made an attack upon each of them. That upon Zerust, on January 7, was a small matter and easily repulsed. A more formidable one was made on Lichtenberg, on March 3. The attack was delivered by De La Rey, Smuts, and Selliers, with 1,500 men, who galloped up to the pickets in the early morning. The defenders were 600 in number, consisting of Pegget's horse and three companies of the 1st Battalion of the Northumberland Fusiliers, a veteran regiment with a long record of foreign service, not to be confused with that 2nd Battalion which was so severely handled upon several occasions. It was well that it was so, for less sturdy material might have been overborne by the vigour of the attack. As it was, the garrison were driven to their last trench, but held out under a very heavy fire all day, and next morning the Boers abandoned the attack. Their losses appear to have been over fifty in number, and included Commandant Selliers, who was badly wounded and afterwards taken prisoner at warm baths. The brave garrison lost fourteen killed including two officers of the Northumberlands, and twenty wounded. In each of these instances the attacks by the Boers upon British posts had ended in a repulse to themselves. They were more fortunate, however, in their attempt upon Modifantine on the Gatsrand at the end of January. The post was held by two hundred of the South Wales borderers, reinforced by the 59th Imperial Yeomanry, who had come in as escort to a convoy from Krugersdorp. The attack which lasted all day, was carried out by a commando of 2,000 Boers under Smuts, who rushed the position upon the following morning. As usual, the Boers, who were unable to retain their prisoners, had little to show for their success. The British casualties, however, were between 30 and 40, mostly wounded. On January 22 General Cunningham left Oliphant's Neck with a small force consisting of the Border and Worcester regiments. The 6th Mounted Infantry, Kitchener's Horse, 7th Imperial Yeomanry, 8th RFA, and P Battery RHA it had instructions to move south upon the enemy known to be gathering there. By midday this force was warmly engaged, and found itself surrounded by considerable bodies of Delares burghers. That night they camped at Midelfantine, and were strongly attacked in the early morning. So menacing was the Boer attitude and so formidable the position, that the force was in some danger. Fortunately they were in heliographic communication with Oliphantsnick, and learned upon the 23rd that Barbington had been ordered to their relief. All day Cunningham's men were under a long-range fire, but on the 24th Barbington appeared, and the British force was successfully extricated, having 75 casualties. 
This action of Mid-Elphantine is interesting as having been begun in Queen Victoria's reign, and ended in that of Edward Seven Cunning Ames Force moved on to Krugersdorp, and there, having heard of the fall of the Modifantine post as already described, a part of his command moved out to the Gatsrand in pursuit of smuts. It was found, however, that the Boers had taken up a strong defensive position, and the British were not numerous enough to push the attack. On February 3rd Cunningham endeavoured to outflank the enemy with his small cavalry force while pushing his infantry up in front, but in neither attempt did he succeed, the cavalry failing to find the flank, while the infantry were met with a fire which made further advance impossible. One company of the border regiment found itself in such a position that the greater part of it was killed, wounded, or taken. This check constituted the action of Modifantine. On the 4th, however, Cunningham, assisted by some of the South African constabulary, made his way round the flank, and dislodged the enemy, who retreated to the south. A few days later some of Smuts's men made an attempt upon the railway near Bank, but were driven off with 26 casualties. It was after this that Smuts moved west and joined Delaray's commando to make the attack already described upon Lichtenberg. These six attempts represent the chief aggressive movements which the Boers made against British posts in the Transvaal during these months. Attacks upon trains were still common, and every variety of sniping appears to have been rife, from the legitimate ambuscade to something little removed from murder. It has been described in a previous chapter how Lord Kitchener made an offer to the burghers which amounted to an amnesty and how a number of those Boers who had come under the influence of the British formed themselves into peace committees, and endeavoured to convey to the fighting commandos some information as to the hopelessness of the struggle, and the lenient mood of the British. Unfortunately these well-meant offers appear to have been mistaken for signs of weakness by the Boer leaders, and encouraged them to harden their hearts. Of the delegates who conveyed the terms to their fellow countrymen who at least were shot, Several were condemned to death, and few returned without ill usage. In no case did they bear back a favourable answer. The only result of the proclamation was to burden the British resources by an enormous crowd of women and children who were kept and fed in refugee camps, while their fathers and husbands continued in most cases to fight. This allusion to the peace movement among the burghers may serve as an introduction to the attempt made by Lord Kitchener at the end of February 1901, to bring the war to a close by negotiation. Throughout its course the fortitude of Great Britain and of the Empire had never for an instant weakened, but her conscience had always been sensitive at the sight of the ruin which had befallen so large a portion of South Africa, and any settlement would have been eagerly hailed which would ensure that the work done had not been wasted, and would not need to be done again. A peace on any other terms would simply shift upon the shoulders of our descendants those burdens which we were not manly enough to bear ourselves. There had arisen, as has been said, a considerable peace movement among the burghers of the refugee camps and also among the prisoners of war. It was hoped that some reflection of this might be found among the leaders of the people. To find out if this were so Lord Kitchener, at the end of February, sent a verbal message to Louis Bota, and on the 27th of that month the Boer general rode with an escort of hussars into Middelburg. Sunburned, with a pleasant, fattish face of a German type, and wearing an imperial, says one who rode beside him. Judging from the sounds of mirth heard by those without, the two leaders seem to have soon got upon amiable terms, and there was hope that a definite settlement might spring from their interview. From the beginning Lord Kitchener explained that the continued independence of the two republics was an impossibility. But on every other point the British government was prepared to go great lengths in order to satisfy and conciliate the burghers. On March 7 Lord Kitchener wrote to Bota from Pretoria, recapitulating the points which he had advanced. The terms offered were certainly as far as, and indeed rather further than, the general sentiment of the empire would have gone. If the Boers laid down their arms there was to be a complete amnesty, which was apparently to extend to rebels also so long as they did not return to Cape Colony or Natal. Self-government was promised after a necessary interval, during which the two states should be administered as crown colonies. 
law courts should be independent of the executive from the beginning, and both languages be official. A million pounds of compensation would be paid to the burghers a most remarkable example of a war indemnity being paid by the victors. Loans were promised to the farmers to restart them in business, and a pledge was made that farms should not be taxed. The Kaffirs were not to have the franchise, but were to have the protection of law. Such were the generous terms offered by the British government. Public opinion at home, strongly supported by that of the colonies, and especially of the army, felt that the extreme step had been taken in the direction of conciliation, and that to do more would seem not to offer peace, but to implore it. Unfortunately, however, the one thing which the British could not offer was the one thing which the Boers would insist upon having, and the leniency of the proposals in all other directions may have suggested weakness to their minds. On March 15 an answer was returned by General Boatser to the effect that nothing short of total independence would satisfy them, and the negotiations were accordingly broken off. There was a disposition, however, upon the Boer side to renew them, and upon May 10 General Boatser applied to Lord Kitchener for permission to cable to President Kruger, and to take his advice as to the making of peace. The stern old man at The Hague was still, however, in an unbending mood. His reply was to the effect that there were great hopes of a successful issue of the war, and that he had taken steps to make proper provision for the Boer prisoners and for the refugee women. These steps, and very efficient ones too, were to leave them entirely to the generosity of that government which he was so fond of reviling. On the same day upon which Boat who applied for leave to use the British cable, our letter was written by Reitz, State Secretary of the Transvaal, to Stein, in which the desperate condition of the Boers was clearly set forth. This document explained that the burghers were continually surrendering, that the ammunition was nearly exhausted, the food running low and the nation in danger of extinction. The time has come to take the final step, said the Secretary of State. Stein wrote back a reply in which, like his brother President, he showed a dour resolution to continue the struggle, prompted by a fatalist conviction that some outside interference would reverse the result of his appeal to arms. His attitude and that of Kruger determined the Boer leaders to hold out for a few more months, a resolution which may have been injudicious, but was certainly heroic. It's a fight to a finish this time, said the two combatants in the punch cartoon which marked the beginning of the war. It was indeed so, as far as the Boers were concerned. As the victors we can afford to acknowledge that no nation in history has ever made a more desperate and prolonged resistance against a vastly superior antagonist. A Briton may well pray that his own people may be as staunch when their hour of adversity comes round. The British position at this stage of the war was strengthened by a greater centralisation. Garrisons of outlying towns were withdrawn so that fewer convoys became necessary. The population was removed also and placed near the railway lines, where they could be more easily fed. In this way the scene of action was cleared and the Boer and British forces left face to face. Convinced of the failure of the peace policy, and morally strengthened by having tried it, Lord Kitchener set himself to finish the war by a series of vigorous operations which should sweep the country from end to end. For this purpose mounted troops were essential, and an appeal from him for reinforcements was most nobly answered. Five thousand horsemen were dispatched from the colonies, and twenty thousand cavalry, mounted infantry, and yeomanry were sent from home. Ten thousand mounted men had already been raised in Great Britain, South Africa, and Canada for the constabulary force which was being organized by Baden Powell. Altogether the reinforcements of horsemen amounted to more than thirty-five thousand men, all of whom had arrived in South Africa before the end of April. With the remains of his old regiments Lord Kitchener had under him at this final period of the war between 50 and 60,000 cavalry such a force as no British general in his happiest dream had ever thought of commanding, and no British war minister in his darkest nightmare had ever imagined himself called upon to supply. Long before his reinforcements had come to hand, while his yeomanry was still gathering in long queues upon the London pavement to wait their turn at the recruiting office. 
Lord Kitchener had dealt the enemy several shrewd blows which materially weakened their resources in men and material. The chief of these was the great drive down the eastern Transvaal undertaken by seven columns under the command of French. Before considering this, however, a few words must be devoted to the doings of Methuen in the southwest. This hard working general, having garrisoned Zeerost and Lichtenberg, had left his old district and journeyed with a force which consisted largely of bushmen and yeomanry to the disturbed parts of Bequanilland which had been invaded by the Villiers. Here he cleared the country as far as Vryberg, which he had reached in the middle of January, working round to Kuruman and thence to Tungs. From Tungs his force crossed the Transvaal border and made for Klerksdorp, working through an area which had never been traversed and which contained the difficult Masakani hills. He left Tungs upon February 2, fighting skirmishes at Uitvilskop, Padfontein and Lilifontein, in each of which the enemy was brushed aside. Passing through Wulmar and Stad, Methuen turned to the north, where at Hartbestfontein, on February 19, he fought a brisk engagement with a considerable force of Boers under de Villiers and Liebenberg. On the day before the fight he successfully outwitted the Boers, for, learning that they had left their ledger in order to take up a position for battle, he pounced upon the ledger and captured 10,000 head of cattle, 43 wagons, and 40 prisoners. Stimulated by this success, he attacked the Boers next day, and after five hours of hard fighting forced the pass which they were holding against him. As Methuen had but 1,500 men, and was attacking a force which was as large as his own in a formidable position, the success was a very creditable one. The yeomanry all did well, especially the 5th and 10th battalions. So also did the Australians and the loyal North Lancashires. The British casualties amounted to 16 killed and 34 wounded, while the Boers left 18 of their dead upon the position which they had abandoned. Lord Methuen's little force returned to Klerksdorp, having deserved right well of their country. From Klerksdorp Methuen struck back westwards to the south of his former route, and on March 14 he was reported at Warrington. Here also in April came Errol's small column bringing with it the garrison and inhabitants of Hoopstad, a post which it had been determined, in accordance with Lord Kitchener's policy of centralization, to abandon. In the month of January, 1901, there had been a considerable concentration of the Transvaal Boers into that larger triangle which is bounded by the Dialagoa railway line upon the north, the Natal railway line upon the south, and the Swazi and Zulu frontiers upon the east. The bushveld is at this season of the year unhealthy both for man and beast, so that for the sake of their herds, their families, and themselves the burghers were constrained to descend into the open veldt. There seemed the less objection to their doing so since this tract of country, though traversed once both by Buller and by French, had still remained a stronghold of the Boers and a storehouse of supplies. Within its borders are to be found Carolina, Ermelo, Vryide, and other storm centers. Its possession offers peculiar strategical advantages, as a force lying that can always attack either railway, and might even make, as was indeed intended, a descent into Natal. For these mingled reasons of health and of strategy a considerable number of burghers united in this district under the command of the Bothers and of Smuts. Their concentration had not escaped the notice of the British military authorities who welcomed any movement which might bring to a focus that resistance which had been so nebulous and elusive. Lord Kitchener having once seen the enemy fairly gathered into this huge cover, undertook the difficult task of driving it from end to end. For this enterprise General French was given the chief command, and had under his orders no fewer than seven columns, which started from different points of the Delagoa and of the Natal railway lines keeping in touch with each other and all trending south and east. A glance at the map would show, however, that it was a very large field for seven guns, and that it would need all their alertness to prevent the driven game from breaking back. Three columns started from the De Lagoa line, namely, Smith Doyens from Wonderfontein, the most easterly, Campbell's from Middelburg, and Alderson's from Erst Fabriken, close to Pretoria. Four columns came from the Western Railway line, 
General Knox is from Calfontaine, Major Allenby's from Zuerfontaine, both stations between Pretoria and Johannesburg, General Dartnell's from Springs, close to Johannesburg, and finally General Colville, not to be confused with Colville, from Graylingstad in the south. The whole movement resembled a huge dragnet, of which Wanderfontaine and Graylingstad formed the ends, exactly 100 miles apart. On January 27 the net began to be drawn. Some thousands of boars with a considerable number of guns were known to be within the enclosure, and it was hoped that even if their own extreme mobility enabled them to escape it would be impossible for them to save their transport and their cannon. Each of the British columns was about 2,000 strong, making a total of 14,000 men with about 50 guns engaged in the operations. A front of not less than 10 miles was to be maintained by each force. The first decided move was on the part of the extreme left wing, Smith Doyen's column, which moved south on Carolina, and thence on Bothwell near Lake Crissy. The arduous duty of passing supplies down from the line fell mainly upon him, and his force was in consequence larger than the others, consisting of 8,500 men with 13 guns. On the arrival of Smith Doyen at Carolina the other columns started, their center of advance being Ermelo. Over 70 miles of veld the gleam of the helio by day and the flash of the signal lamps at night marked the steady flow of the British tide. Here and there the columns came in touch with the enemy and swept him before them. French had a skirmish at Wilge River at the end of January, and Campbell another south of Middelburg, in which he had 20 casualties. On February 4 Smith Doyen was at Lake Crissy, French had passed through Bethel and the enemy was retiring on Amsterdam. The hundred mile ends of the dragnet were already contracted to a third of that distance, and the game was still known to be within it. On the 5th Ermelo was occupied, and the fresh deep ruts upon the veld told the British horsemen of the huge boar convoy that was ahead of them. For days enormous herds, endless flocks and lines of wagons which stretched from horizon to horizon had been trekking eastward. Cavalry and mounted infantry were all hot upon the scent. Boater, however, was a leader of spirit, not to be hustled with impunity. Having several thousand burghers with him, it was evident that if he threw himself suddenly upon any part of the British line he might hope for a time to make an equal fight, and possibly to overwhelm it. Were Smith Doyen out of the way there would be a clear road of escape for his whole convoy to the north, while a defeat of any of the other columns would not help him much. It was on Smith Doyen, therefore, that he threw himself with great impetuosity. That general's force was, however, formidable, consisting of the Suffolks, West Yorks and Camerons, 5th Lancers, 2nd Imperial Light Horse, and 3rd Mounted Infantry with eight field guns and three heavy pieces. Such a force could hardly be defeated in the open, but no one can foresee the effect of a night surprise well pushed home, and such was the attack delivered by Botu at 3 a.m. upon February 6, when his opponent was encamped at Bothwell Farm. The night was favorable to the attempt, as it was dark and misty. Fortunately, however, the British commander had fortified himself and was ready for an assault. The boar forlorn hope came on with a gallant dash, driving a troop of loose horses in upon the outposts, and charging forward into the camp. The West Yorkshires, however, who bore the brunt of the attack, were veterans of the Tugler, who were no more to be flurried at three in the morning than at three in the afternoon. The attack was blown backwards, and twenty dead boars, with their brave leader Sprit, were left within the British lines. The main body of the Boers contented themselves with a heavy fuse laid out of the darkness, which was answered and crushed by the return fire of the infantry. In the morning no trace, save their dead, was to be seen of the enemy, but twenty killed and fifty wounded in Smith Doyen's column showed how heavy had been the fire which had swept through the sleeping camp. The Carolina attack, which was to have cooperated with that of the Heidelbergers, was never delivered through difficulties of the ground, and considerable recriminations ensued among the Boers in consequence. Beyond a series of skirmishes and rearguard actions this attack of boaters was the one effort made to stay the course of French's columns. 
it did not succeed, however, in arresting them for an hour. From that day began a record of captures of men, herds, guns, and wagons, as the fugitives were rounded up from the north, the west, and the south. The operation was a very thorough one for the towns and districts occupied were denuded of their inhabitants, who were sent into the refugee camps while the country was laid waste to prevent its furnishing the commandos with supplies in the future. Still moving southeast, General French's columns made their way to Biatratif upon the Swazi frontier, pushing a disorganized array which he computed at 5,000 in front of them. A party of the enemy, including the Carolina commando, had broken back in the middle of February and Louis Botha had got away at the same time, but so successful were his main operations that French was able to report his total results at the end of the month as being 292 boars killed or wounded, 500 surrendered, 3 guns and 1 maxim taken, with 600 rifles, 4,000 horses, 4,500 trek oxen, 1,300 wagons and carts, 24,000 cattle, and 165,000 sheep. The whole vast expanse of the eastern veld was dotted with the broken and charred wagons of the enemy. Tremendous rains were falling and the country was one huge quagmire, which crippled although it did not entirely prevent the further operations. All the columns continued to report captures. On March 3rd Dartnell got a maxim and 50 prisoners, while French reported 50 more and Smith Doyen 80. On March 6 French captured two more guns, and on the 14th he reported 46 more boar casualties and 146 surrenders, with 500 more wagons, and another great haul of sheep and oxen. By the end of March French had moved as far south as Vryide, his troops having endured the greatest hardships from the continual heavy rains, and the difficulty of bringing up any supplies. On the 27th he reported 17 more boar casualties and 140 surrenders, while on the last day of the month he took another gun and two pom-poms. The enemy at that date were still retiring eastward, with Alderson and Dartnell pressing upon their rear. On April 4th French announced the capture of the last piece of artillery which the enemy possessed in that region. The rest of the Boer forces doubled back at night between the columns and escaped over the Zululand border, where 200 of them surrendered. The total trophies of French's drive down the eastern Transvaal amounted to 1100 of the enemy killed, wounded, or taken. The largest number in any operation since the surrender of Prince Lou. There is no doubt that the movement would have been even more successful had the weather been less boisterous, but this considerable loss of men together with the capture of all the guns in that region, and of such enormous quantities of wagons, munitions, and stock, inflicted a blow upon the Boers from which they never wholly recovered. On April 20 French was back in Johannesburg once more. While French had run to earth the last Boer gun in the southeastern corner of the Transvaal, de la Rey, upon the western side, had still managed to preserve a considerable artillery with which he flitted about the passes of the Magalisberg or took refuge in the safe districts to the southwest of it. This part of the country had been several times traversed, but had never been subdued by British columns. The Boers, like their own veldt grass, need but a few sparks to be left behind to ensure a conflagration breaking out again. It was into this inflammable country that Barbington moved in March with Klerksdorp for his base. On March 21 he had reached Hartbestfontein, the scene not long before of a successful action by Methuen. Here he was joined by Shekulleton's mounted infantry, and his whole force consisted of these, with the 1st Imperial Light Horse, the 6th Imperial Bushman, the New Zealanders, a squadron of the 14th Hussars, a wing each of the Somerset Light Infantry and of the Welsh Fusiliers, with Carter's guns and four pom-poms. With this mobile and formidable little force Barbington pushed on in search of Smuts and De La Rey, who were known to be in the immediate neighbourhood. As a matter of fact the Boers were not only there, but were nearer and in greater force than had been anticipated. On the 22nd three squadrons of the Imperial Light Horse under Major Briggs rode into 1,500 of them, 
and it was only by virtue of their steadiness and gallantry that they succeeded in withdrawing themselves and their pom-pom without a disaster. With boars in their front and boars on either flank they fought an admirable rearguard action. So hot was the fire that a squadron alone had 22 casualties. They faced it out, however, until their gun had reached a place of safety, when they made an orderly retirement towards Barbington's camp, having inflicted as heavy a loss as they had sustained. With Elan's lagged, Wagon Hill, the relief of Mafeking, Naorport, and Hartbestfontein upon their standards, the Imperial Light Horse, should they take a permanent place in the army list, will start with a record of which many older regiments might be proud. If the Light Horse had a few bad hours on March 22nd at the hands of the Boers, they and their colonial comrades were soon able to return the same with interest. On March 23rd, Barbington moved forward through Kafir Kral, the enemy falling back before him. Next morning, the British again advanced and as the New Zealanders and Bushmen, who formed the vanguard under Colonel Grey, emerged from a pass they saw upon the plain in front of them the Boer force with all its guns moving towards them. Whether this was done of set purpose or whether the Boers imagined that the British had turned and were intending to pursue them cannot now be determined, but whatever the cause it is certain that for almost the first time in the campaign a considerable force of each side found themselves in the open and face to face. It was a glorious moment. Setting spurs to their horses, officers and men with a yell dashed forward at the enemy. One of the Boer guns unlimbered and attempted to open fire, but was overwhelmed by the wave of horsemen. The Boer riders broke and fled, leaving their artillery to escape as best it might. The guns dashed over the veldt in a mad gallop, but wilder still was the rush of the fiery cavalry behind them. For once the brave and ghoul-headed Dutchmen were fairly panic-stricken. Hardly a shot was fired at the pursuers, and the riflemen seemed to have been only too happy to save their own skins. Two field guns, one pom-pom, six maxims, 56 wagons and 140 prisoners were the fruits of that one magnificent charge, while 54 stricken boars were picked up after the action. The pursuit was reluctantly abandoned when the spent horses could go no farther. While the vanguard had thus scattered the main body of the enemy, a detachment of riflemen had ridden round to attack the British rear in convoy. A few volleys from the escort drove them off, however, with some loss. Altogether, what with the loss of nine guns and of at least two hundred men, the rout of Hartbestfontein was a severe blow to the Boer cause. A week or two later Sir H. Rawlinson's column, acting with Barbington, rushed Smuts's ledger at daylight and effected a further capture of two guns and thirty prisoners. Taken in conjunction with French's successes in the east and Plumers in the north, these successive blows might have seemed fatal to the Boer cause but the weary struggle was still destined to go on until it seemed that it must be annihilation rather than incorporation which would at last bring a tragic peace to those unhappy lands. All over the country small British columns had been operating during these months operations which were destined to increase in scope and energy as the cold weather drew in. The weekly tale of prisoners and captures, though small for any one column, gave the aggregate result of a considerable victory. In these scattered and obscure actions there was much good work which can have no reward save the knowledge of duty done. Among many successful raids and skirmishes may be mentioned too by Colonel Park from Lidenburg, which resulted between them in the capture of nearly 100 of the enemy, including Abel Erasmus of sinister reputation. Nor would any summary of these events be complete without a reference to the very gallant defense of Malabatini in Zululand which was successfully held by a handful of police and civilians against an eruption of the Boers. With the advent of winter and of reinforcements the British operations became very energetic in every part of the country, and some account of them will now be added. Chapter 34. The Winter Campaign, April to September, 1901. The African winter extends roughly from April to September, and as the grass during that period would be withered on the veldt, the mobility of the Boer commandos must be very much impaired. 
it was recognized therefore that if the British would avoid another year of war it could only be done by making good use of the months which lay before them. For this reason Lord Kitchener had called for the considerable reinforcements which have been already mentioned, but on the other hand he was forced to lose many thousands of his veteran yeomanry, Australians, and Canadians, whose term of service was at an end. The volunteer companies of the infantry returned also to England, and so did nine militia battalions, whose place was taken however by an equal number of newcomers. The British position was very much strengthened during the winter by the adoption of the blockhouse system. These were small square or hexagonal buildings, made of stone up to nine feet with corrugated iron above it. They were loopholed for musketry fire and held from six to thirty men. These little forts were dotted along the railways at points not more than 2,000 yards apart, and when supplemented by a system of armoured trains they made it no easy matter for the Boers to tamper with or to cross the lines. So effective did these prove that their use was extended to the more dangerous portions of the country, and lines were pushed through the Maglisberg district to form a chain of posts between Kruzierstorp and Russenberg. In the Orange River Colony and on the northern lines of the Cape Colony the same system was extensively applied. I will now attempt to describe the more important operations of the winter, beginning with the incursion of Plumer into the untrodden ground to the north. At this period of the war the British forces had overrun, if they had not subdued, the whole of the Orange River Colony and every part of the Transvaal which is south of the Mafeking Pretoria Committee line. Through this great tract of country there was not a village and hardly a farmhouse which had not seen the invaders. But in the north there remained a vast district, 200 miles long and 300 broad, which had hardly been touched by the war. It is a wild country, scrub-covered, antelope-haunted plains rising into desolate hills, but there are many kloofs and valleys with rich water meadows and lush grazings, which formed natural granaries and depots for the enemy. Here the Boer government continued to exist, and here, screened by their mountains, they were able to organize the continuation of the struggle. It was evident that there could be no end to the war until these last centers of resistance had been broken up. The British forces had advanced as far north as Rosenberg in the west, Pina in the center, and Lidenburg in the east, but here they had halted unwilling to go farther until their conquests had been made good behind them. A general might well pause before plunging his troops into that vast and rugged district, when an active foe and an exposed line of communication lay for many hundreds of miles to the south of them. But Lord Kitchener with characteristic patience waited for the right hour to come, and then with equally characteristic audacity played swiftly and boldly for his stake. De wet impotent for the moment, had been hunted back over the Orange River. French had harried the burghers in the southeast Transvaal, and the main force of the enemy was known to be on that side of the seat of war. The north was exposed, and with one long, straight lunge to the heart, Pietersburg might be transfixed. There could only be one direction for the advance, and that must be along the Pretoria to Pietersburg Railroad. This is the only line of rails which leads to the north and as it was known to be in working order, the Boers were running a bi-weekly service from Pietersburg to warm baths, it was hoped that a swift advance might seize it before any extensive damage could be done. With this object a small but very mobile force rapidly assembled at the end of March at Pinna River, which was the British railhead 40 miles north of Pretoria and 130 from Pietersburg. This column consisted of the Bushveld Carboneers the 4th Imperial Bushman's Corps, and the 6th New Zealand Contingent. With them were the 18th Battery RFA, and three pom-poms. A detachment of the invaluable mounted sappers rode with the force, and two infantry regiments, the 2nd Gordons and the Northamptons, were detached to garrison the more vulnerable places upon the line of advance. Upon March 29 the untiring plumer, called off from the chase of De Wet, was loosed upon this fresh line, and broke swiftly away to the north. The complete success of his undertaking has obscured our estimate of its danger, but it was no light task to advance so great a distance into a bitterly hostile country with a fighting force of 2,000 rifles. 
As an enterprise it was in many ways not unlike Mann's dash on Maffer King, but without any friendly force with which to join hands at the end. However from the beginning all went well. On the 30th the force had reached warm baths, where a great isolated hotel already marks the site of what will be a rich and fashionable spa. On April 1st the Australian scouts rode into Nilestrom, 50 more miles upon their way. There had been sufficient sniping to enliven the journey, but nothing which could be called an action. Gleaning up prisoners and refugees as they went, with the railway engineers working like bees behind them, the force still swept unchecked upon its way. On April 5th Piat Potgiatus Rust was entered, another 50 mile stage, and on the morning of the 8th the British vanguards rode into Piatusburg. Kitchener's judgment and Plumer's energy had met with their reward. The Boer commando had evacuated the town and no serious opposition was made to the British entry. The most effective resistance came from a single schoolmaster, who, in a moment of irrational frenzy or of patriotic exaltation, shot down three of the invaders before he met his own death. Some rolling stock, one small gun, and something under a hundred prisoners were the trophies of the capture but the Boer arsenal and the printing press were destroyed, and the government sped off in a couple of cape carts in search of some new capital. Pietersburg was principally valuable as a base from which a sweeping movement might be made from the north at the same moment as one from the southeast. A glance at the map will show that a force moving from this point in conjunction with another from Lidenburg might form the two crooked claws of a crab to enclose a great space of country in which smaller columns might collect whatever was to be found. Without an instant of unnecessary delay the dispositions were made, and no fewer than eight columns slipped upon the chase. It will be best to continue to follow the movements of Plumer's force, and then to give some account of the little armies which were operating from the south, with the results of their enterprise. It was known that Viljoen and a number of Boers were within the district which lies north of the line in the Middelburg district. An impenetrable bush veldt had offered them a shelter from which they made their constant sallies to wreck a train or to attack a post. This area was now to be systematically cleared up. The first thing was to stop the northern line of retreat. The Oliphant River forms a loop in that direction, and as it is a considerable stream, it would, if securely held, prevent any escape upon that side. With this object Plumer, on April 14th, the sixth day after his occupation of Pietersburg, struck east from that town and trekked over the veldt, through the formidable Tunis Pass, and so to the north bank of the Oliphant, picking up thirty or forty Boer prisoners upon the way. His route lay through a fertile country dotted with native kraals. Having reached the river which marked the line which he was to hold, Plumer, upon April 17, spread his force over many miles so as to block the principal drifts. The flashes of his helio were answered by flash after flash from many points upon the southern horizon. What these other forces were, and whence they came, must now be made clear to the reader. General Bind and Blood, a successful soldier, had confirmed in the Transvaal a reputation which he had won on the northern frontier of India. He and General Elliot were two of the latecomers who had been spared from the great Eastern dependency to take the places of some of those generals who had returned to England for a well-earned rest. He had distinguished himself by his systematic and effective guardianship of the De La Goa railway line, and he was now selected for the supreme control of the columns which were to advance from the south and sweep the Ruse Senecal district. There were seven of them, which were arranged as follows two columns started from Middelburg under Beetson and Benson, which might be called the left wings of the movement. The object of Beetson's column was to hold the drifts of the Crocodile River, while Benson's was to seize the neighboring hills called the Bothersburg. This it was hoped would pin the Boers from the west, while Kitchener from Lidenburg advanced from the east in three separate columns. Pulteney and Douglas would move up from Belfast in the centre, with Dulstoom for their objective. It was the familiar dragnet of French, but facing north instead of south. On April 13 the southern columns were started, but already the British preparations had alarmed the Boers, and Boter, with his main commandos, 
had slipped south across the line into that very district from which he had been so recently driven. Ville Jones' commando still remained to the north, and the British troops, pouring in from every side, converged rapidly upon it. The success of the operations was considerable, though not complete. The Dantersburg, which had been the rallying point of the Boers, was occupied, and Ruse Senecal, their latest capital, was taken, with their state papers and treasure. Ville Joan, with a number of followers, slipped through between the columns, but the greater part of the burghers, dashing furiously about like a shoal of fish when they become conscious of the net, were taken by one or other of the columns. A hundred of the Boxburg commando surrendered en masse, fifty more were taken at Ruse Senecal, forty-one of the formidable Zarps with Schroeder, their leader, were captured in the north by the gallantry and wit of a young Australian officer named Reed, sixty more were hunted down by the indefatigable Viols, leader of the Bushmen. From all parts of the district came the same story of captures and surrenders. Knowing, however, that Botu and Viljoen had slipped through to the south of the railway line, Lord Kitchener determined to rapidly transfer the scene of the operations to that side. At the end of April, after a fortnight's work, during which this large district was cropped, but by no means shaved, the troops turned south again. The results of the operation had been 1100 prisoners, almost the same number as French had taken in the southeast, together with a broken crop, a pom pom, and the remains of the big naval gun taken from us at Helvetia. It was determined that Plumer's advance upon Pietersburg should not be a mere raid but that steps should be taken to secure all that he had gained, and to hold the lines of communication. With this object the second Gordon Highlanders and the second Wiltshires were pushed up along the railroad, followed by Kitchener's fighting scouts. These troops garrisoned Pietersburg and took possession of Tunis port, and other strategic positions. They also furnished escorts for the convoys which supplied Plumer on the Oliphant River, and they carried out some spirited operations themselves in the neighborhood of Pietersburg. Grenfell, who commanded the force, broke up several ledges, and captured a number of prisoners, operations in which he was much assisted by Colnbrander and his men. Finally the last of the great Crayusot guns, the formidable Long Toms, was found mounted near Henidsburg. It was the same piece which had in succession scourged Mafeking and Kimberley. The huge gun, driven to bay, showed its powers by opening an effective fire at 10,000 yards. The British galloped in upon it, the Boer riflemen were driven off, and the gun was blown up by its faithful gunners. So by suicide died the last of that iron brood, the four sinister brothers who had wrought much mischief in South Africa. They and their lesson will live in the history of modern artillery. The sweeping of the Ruse Senecal district being over, Plumer left his post upon the River of the Elephants, a name which, like Renoster, Zico, Camille Fantine, Liu Kop, Tiger Fantine, Eland's River, and so many more, serves as a memorial to the great mammals which once covered the land. On April 28 the force turned south and on May 4 they had reached the railroad at Erst Fabric and close to Pretoria. They had come in touch with a small boar force upon the way, and the indefatigable viols hounded them for 80 miles, and tore away the tail of their convoy with 30 prisoners. The main force had left Pretoria on horseback on March 28, and found themselves back once again upon foot on May 5. They had something to show, however, for the loss of their horses, since they had covered a circular march of 400 miles, had captured some hundreds of the enemy, and had broken up their last organized capital. From first to last it was a most useful and well-managed expedition. It is the more to be regretted that General Blood was recalled from his northern trek before it had attained its full results, because those operations to which he turned did not offer him any great opportunities for success. Withdrawing from the north of the railway with his columns, he at once started upon a sweep of that portion of the country which forms an angle between the Delagoa line and the Swazi frontier the Barberton district. But again the two big fish, Viljoen and Bota, had slipped away, and the usual collection of sprats was left in the net. The sprats count also, however, 
and every week now telegrams were reaching England from Lord Kitchener which showed that from three to five hundred more burghers had fallen into our hands. Although the public might begin to look upon the war as interminable, it had become evident to the thoughtful observer that it was now a mathematical question, and that a date could already be predicted by which the whole Boer population would have passed into the power of the British. Among the numerous small British columns which were at work in different parts of the country, in the latter half of May, there was one under General Dixon which was operating in the neighborhood of the Maglisberg Range. This locality has never been a fortunate one for the British arms. The country is peculiarly mountainous and broken, and it was held by the veteran de Larry and a numerous body of irreconcilable Boers. Here in July we had encountered a Czech at Uit Vlznik, in December Clements had met a more severe one at Nuitjedukt, while shortly afterwards Cunningham had been repulsed at mid Elfantine, and the light horse cut up at or Port. After such experiences one would have thought that no column which was not of overmastering strength would have been sent into this dangerous region, but General Dixon had as a matter of fact by no means a strong force with him. With 1,600 men and a battery he was dispatched upon a quest after some hidden guns which were said to have been buried in those parts. On May 26 Dixon's force, consisting of Derbyshires, King's own Scottish borderers, Imperial Yeomanry, Scottish Horse, and six guns, four of 8th RFA and two of 28th RFA, broke Camp Batna or Port and moved to the west. On the 28th they found themselves at a place called Vlakfontein, immediately south of Oliphantsnik. On that day there were indications that there were a good many balls in the neighborhood. Dixon left to guard over his camp and then sallied out in search of the buried guns. His force was divided into three parts, the left column under Major Chance consisting of two guns of the 28th RFA, 230 of the Yeomanry, and one company of the Derbys. The center comprised two guns, 8th RFA, one Heitzer, two companies of the Scottish Borderers and one of the Derbys, while the right was made up of two guns, 8th RFA, 200 Scottish Horse, and two companies of Borderers. Having ascertained that the guns were not there, the force about midday was returning to the camp, when the storm broke suddenly and fiercely upon the rearguard. There had been some sniping during the whole morning, but no indications of the determined attack which was about to be delivered. The force in retiring upon the camp had become divided, and the rearguard consisted of the small column under Major Chance which had originally formed the left wing. A veld fire was raging on one flank of this rearguard and through the veil of smoke a body of 500 boars charged suddenly home with magnificent gallantry upon the guns. We have few records of a more dashing or of more successful action in the whole course of the war. So rapid was it that hardly any time elapsed between the glimpse of the first dark figures galloping through the haze and the thunder of their hoofs as they dashed in among the gunners. The yeomanry were driven back and many of them shot down. The charge of the mounted boars was supported by a very heavy fire from a covering party, and the gun detachments were killed or wounded almost to a man. The lieutenant in charge and the sergeant were both upon the ground. So far as it is possible to reconstruct the action from the confused accounts of excited eyewitnesses and from the exceedingly obscure official report of General Dixon, there was no longer any resistance round the guns which were at once turned by their captors upon the nearest British detachment. The company of infantry which had helped to escort the guns proved however to be worthy representatives of that historic branch of the British service. They were northerners, men of Derbyshire and Nottingham, the same counties which had furnished the brave militia who had taken their punishment so gamely at Rudeville. Though hustled and broken they reformed and clung doggedly to their task, firing at the groups of boars who surrounded the guns. At the same time word had been sent of their pressing need to the Scotch borderers and the Scottish horse, who came swarming across the valley to the succor of their comrades. Dixon had brought two guns and a howitzer into action, which subdued the fire of the two captured pieces, and the infantry, derbys and borderers, swept over the position, retaking the two guns and shooting down those of the enemy who tried to stand. The greater number vanished into the smoke, 
which veiled their retreat as it had their advance. Forty-one of them were left dead upon the ground. Six officers and fifty men killed with about a hundred and twenty wounded made up the British losses, to which two guns would certainly have been added but for the gallant counter-attack of the infantry. With Dargai and Vlachfontein to their credit the derbies of green laurels upon their war-worn colours. They share them on this occasion with the Scottish borderers, whose volunteer company carried itself as stoutly as the regulars. How is such an action to be summed up? To Kemp, the young Boer leader, and his men belongs the credit of the capture of the guns, to the British that of their recapture and of the final possession of the field. The British loss was probably somewhat higher than that of the Boers, but upon the other hand there could be no question as to which side could afford loss the better. The Britain could be replaced, but there were no reserves behind the fighting line of the Boers. There is one subject which cannot be ignored in discussing this battle, however repugnant it may be. That is the shooting of some of the British wounded who lay round the guns. There is no question at all about the fact, which is attested by many independent witnesses. There is reason to hope that some of the murderers paid for their crimes with their lives before the battle was over. It is pleasant to add that there is at least one witness to the fact that Boer officers interfered with threats to prevent some of these outrages. It is unfair to tarnish the whole Boer nation and cause on account of a few irresponsible villains, who would be disowned by their own decent comrades. Very many too many British soldiers have known by experience what it is to fall into the hands of the enemy, and it must be confessed that on the whole they have been dealt with in no ungenerous spirit while the British treatment of the Boers has been unexampled in all military history for its generosity and humanity. That so fair a tale should be darkened by such ruffianly outrages is indeed deplorable, but the incident is too well authenticated to be left unrecorded in any detailed account of the campaign. General Dixon, finding the Boers very numerous all round him, and being hampered by his wounded, fell back upon the Orport which he reached on June 1 st. In May, Sir Bind and Blood, having returned to the line to refit, made yet another cast through that thrice harried belt of country which contains Ermelo, Bethel, and Carolina, in which Bota, Viljoen, and the fighting Boers had now concentrated. Working over the blackened belt he swung round in the Barberton direction, and afterwards made a westerly drive in conjunction with small columns commanded by Walter Kitchener, Douglas, and Campbell of the Rifles, while Colville, Garnet, and Bullock cooperated from the natal line. Again the results were disappointing when compared with the power of the instrument employed. On July 5 he reached Springs, near Johannesburg, with a considerable amount of stock, but with no great number of prisoners. The elusive boat had slipped away to the south and was reported upon the Zululand border while Viljoen had succeeded in crossing the De La Goa line and winning back to his old lair in the district north of Middelburg, from which he had been evicted in April. The commandos were like those pertinacious flies which buzz upwards when a hand approaches them, but only to settle again in the same place. One could but try to make the place less attractive than before. Before Viljoen's force made its way over the line it had its revenge for the long harrying it had undergone by a well-managed night attack in which it surprised and defeated a portion of Colonel Beetson's column at a place called Wilmins Rust, due south of Middelburg, and between that town and Bethel. Beetson had divided his force, and this section consisted of 850 of the 5th Victorian Mounted Rifles, with 30 gunners and two pom-poms, the whole under the command of Major Morris. Ville Jones' force trekking north towards the line came upon this detachment upon June 12. The British were aware of the presence of the enemy, but do not appear to have posted any extra outposts or taken any special precautions. Long months of commando chasing had imbued them too much with the idea that these were fugitive sheep, and not fierce and wily wolves, whom they were endeavouring to catch. It is said that 700 yards separated the four pickets. With that fine knife a detail which the Boer leaders possess, they had started a veldt fire upon the west of the camp and then attacked from the east, so that they were themselves invisible while their enemies were silhouetted against the light. Creeping up between the pickets, 
the boars were not seen until they opened fire at point-blank range upon the sleeping men. The rifles were stacked another noxious military tradition and many of the troopers were shot down while they rushed for their weapons. Surprised out of their sleep and unable to distinguish their antagonists, the brave Australians did as well as any troops could have done who were placed in so impossible a position. Captain Watson, the officer in charge of the pom-poms, was shot down, and it proved to be impossible to bring the guns into action. Within five minutes the Victorians had lost twenty killed and forty wounded, when the survivors surrendered. It is pleasant to add that they were very well treated by the victors, but the high-spirited colonials felt their reverse most bitterly. It is the worst thing that ever happened to Australia. Says one in the letter in which he describes it. The actual number of Boers who rushed the camp was only 180, but 400 more had formed a cordon round it. To Ville Joan and his Lieutenant Muller great credit must be given for this well-managed affair, which gave them a fresh supply of stores and clothing at a time when they were hard-pressed for both. These same Boer officers had led the attack upon Helvetia where the 4.7 gun was taken. The victors succeeded in getting away with all their trophies, and having temporarily taken one of the blockhouses on the railway near Brugsprout, they crossed the line in safety and returned, as already said, to their old quarters in the north, which had been harried but not denuded by the operations of General Blood. It would take a volume to catalogue, and a library to entirely describe the movements and doings of the very large number of British columns which operated over the Transvaal and the Orange River colony during this cold weather campaign. If the same columns and the same leaders were consistently working in the same districts, some system of narrative might enable the reader to follow their fortunes, but they were, as a matter of fact, rapidly transferred from one side of the field of action to another in accordance with the concentrations of the enemy. The total number of columns amounted to at least 60, which varied in number from 200 to 2000, and seldom hunted alone. Could their movements be marked in red upon a chart? The whole of that huge district would be crisscrossed, from Tongs to Kimati and from Tugs River to Biotisburg, with the track of our weary but indomitable soldiers. Without attempting to enter into details which would be unbecoming to the modesty of a single volume, one may indicate what the other more important groupings were during the course of these months, and which were the columns that took part in them of French's drive in the southeast, and of Blood's incursion into the Ruse Senecal district some account has been given, and of his subsequent sweeping of the south. At the same period Barbington, Dixon, and Rawlinson were cooperating in the Clerkstorp district, though the former officer transferred his services suddenly to Blood's combination, and afterwards to Elliot's column in the north of Orange River Colony. Williams and Featherston Hoare came later to strengthen this Clerkstorp district, in which, after the clearing of the Magalisburg, Delare had united his forces to those of Smuts. This very important work of getting a firm hold upon the Magalisburg was accomplished in July by Barton, Allenby, Keckwish, and Lord Basing, who penetrated into their wild country and established blockhouses and small forts in very much the same way as Cumberland and Wade in 1746 held down the Highlands. The British position was much strengthened by the firm grip obtained of this formidable stronghold of the enemy, which was dangerous not only on account of its extreme strength, but also of its proximity to the centres of population and of wealth. De La Rey, as already stated, had gone down to the Clerkstorp district, whence, for a time at least, he seems to have passed over into the north of the Orange River colony. The British pressure at Clerkstorp had become severe, and thither in May came the indefatigable Methuen, whom we last traced to Warrington. From this point on May 1st he railed his troops to Mafeking, whence he trekked to Lichtenberg, and south as far as his old fighting ground of Hartbestfontein having one skirmish upon the way and capturing a boar gun. Thence he returned to Mafeking, where he had to bid adieu to those veteran yeomanry who had been his comrades on so many a weary march. It was not their fortune to be present at any of the larger battles of the war, 
but few bodies of troops have returned to England with a finer record of hard and useful service. No sooner, however, had Methion laid down one weapon than he snatched up another. Having refitted his men and collected some of the more efficient of the new yeomanry, he was off once more for a three weeks circular tour in the direction of Zerust. It is difficult to believe that the oldest inhabitant could have known more of the western side of the Transvaal, for there was hardly a track which he had not traversed or a cop from which he had not been sniped. Early in August he had made a fresh start from Mafeking, dividing his force into two columns, the command of the second being given to Vondenop. Having joined hands with Featherston Hoare, he moved through the southwest and finally halted at Klerksdorp. The harried Boers moved a hundred miles north to Rosenberg, followed by Methuen, Featherston Hoare, Hamilton, Keckwish, and Allenby, who found the commandos of Delaray and Kemp to be scattering in front of them and hiding in the kloofs and dongas, whence in the early days of September no less than two hundred were extracted. On September 6 and 8 Methuen engaged the main body of Delaray in the valley of the Great Marico River which lies to the northwest of Rosenberg. In these two actions he pushed the Boers in front of him with a loss of 18 killed and 41 prisoners, but the fighting was severe, and 15 of his men were killed and 30 wounded before the position had been carried. The losses were almost entirely among the newly raised yeomanry, who had already shown on several occasions that, having shed their weaker members and had some experience of the field, they were now worthy to take their place beside their veteran comrades. The only other important operation undertaken by the British columns in the Transvaal during this period was in the north, where Biz and his men were still harried by Grenfell, Colnbrander, and Wilson. A considerable proportion of the prisoners which figured in the weekly lists came from this quarter. On May 30 there was a notable action, the truth of which was much debated but finally established, in which Kitchener's scouts under Wilson surprised and defeated a Boer force under Praetorius, killing and wounding several, and taking forty prisoners. On July 1 Grenfell took nearly a hundred of his men with a considerable convoy. North, south, east, and west the tale was ever the same, but so long as Bota, Delaray, Stein, and the wet remained uncaptured, the embers might still at any instant leap into a flame. It only remains to complete this synopsis of the movements of columns within the Transvaal that I should add that after the conclusion of Blood's movement in July, several of his columns continued to clear the country and to harass Viljoen in the Lidenburg and Dahlstrom districts. Park, Kitchener, Spens, Beetson, and Benson were all busy at this work, never succeeding in forcing more than a skirmish but continually whittling away wagons, horses, and men from that nucleus of resistance which the Boer leaders still held together. Though much hampered by the want of forage for their horses, the Boers were ever watchful for an opportunity to strike back, and the long list of minor successes gained by the British was occasionally interrupted by a petty reverse. Such a one befell the small body of South African constabulary stationed near Vereeniging who encountered upon July 13 a strong force of Boers supposed to be the main commando of De Wet. The constabulary behaved with great gallantry but were hopelessly outnumbered, and lost their seven-pounder gun, four killed, six wounded, and twenty-four prisoners. Another small reverse occurred at a far distant point of the seat of war, for the irregular corps known as Stinaka's horse was driven from its position at Bremerstorp in Swaziland upon July 24, and had to fall back 16 miles, with a loss of 10 casualties and 30 prisoners. Thus in the heart of a native state the two great white traces of South Africa were to be seen locked in a desperate conflict. However unavoidable, the site was certainly one to be deplored. Dot to the Boer credit, or discredit, are also to be placed those repeated train wreckings, which cost the British during this campaign the lives and limbs of many brave soldiers who were worthy of some less ignoble fate. It is true that the laws of war sanction such enterprises, but there is something indiscriminate in the results which is repellent to humanity, and which appears to justify the most energetic measures to prevent them. Women, children, and sick must all travel by these trains and are exposed to a common danger, 
while the assailants enjoy a safety which renders their exploit a peculiarly and glorious one. Two Boers, Trichart and Hinden, the one a youth of twenty-two, the other a man of British birth, distinguished, or disgraced, themselves by this unsavory work upon the Delagoa line, but with the extension of the blockhouse system the attempts became less successful. There was one, however, upon the northern line near a boom sprout which cost the lives of Lieutenant Best and eight Gordon Highlanders, while ten were wounded. The party of Gordons continued to resist after the smash, and were killed or wounded to a man. The painful incident is brightened by such an example of military virtue, and by the naive reply of the last survivor, who on being questioned why he continued to fight until he was shot down, answered with fine simplicity, because I am a Gordon Highlander. Another train disaster of an even more tragic character occurred near Waterville, 15 miles north of Pretoria, upon the last day of August. The explosion of a mine wrecked the train, and a hundred boars who lined the banks of the cutting opened fire upon the derailed carriages. Colonel Van Lair, an officer of great promise, was killed and twenty men, chiefly of the West Riding Regiment, were shot. Nurse Page was also among the wounded. It was after this fatal affair that the regulation of carrying Boer hostages upon the trains was at last carried out. It has been already stated that part of Lord Kitchener's policy of concentration lay in his scheme for gathering the civil population into camps along the lines of communication. The reasons for this, both military and humanitarian, were overwhelming. Experience had proved that the men if left at liberty were liable to be persuaded or coerced by the fighting Boers into breaking their parole and rejoining the commandos. As to the women and children, they could not be left upon the farms in a denuded country. That the Boers in the field had no doubts as to the good treatment of these people was shown by the fact that they repeatedly left their families in the way of the columns so that they might be conveyed to the camps. Some consternation was caused in England by a report of Miss Hobhouse, which called public attention to the very high rate of mortality in some of these camps, but examination showed that this was not due to anything insanitary in their situation or arrangement, but to a severe epidemic of measles which had swept away a large number of the children. A fund was started in London to give additional comforts to these people though there is reason to believe that their general condition was superior to that of the Uitlander refugees, who still waited permission to return to their homes. By the end of July there were no fewer than 60,000 inmates of the camps in the Transvaal alone, and half as many in the Orange River colony. So great was the difficulty in providing the supplies for so large a number that it became more and more evident that some at least of the camps must be moved down to the sea coast. Passing to the Orange River colony we find that during this winter period the same British tactics had been met by the same constant evasions on the part of the dwindling commandos. The colony had been divided into four military districts, that of Blow Enfantine, which was given to Charles Knox that of Lyttelton at Springfontein, that of Rundle at Harrismith, and that of Elliot in the north. The latter was infinitely the most important, and Elliot, the warden of the northern marches, had under him during the greater part of the winter a mobile force of about 6,000 men, commanded by such experienced officers as Broadwood, Derlisle, and Beth Hune. Later in the year Spons, Bullock, Plumer, and Rymington were all sent into the Orange River colony to help to stamp out the resistance. Numerous skirmishes and snipings were reported from all parts of the country, but a constant stream of prisoners and of surrenders assured the soldiers that, in spite of the difficulty of the country and the obstinacy of the enemy, the term of their labors was rapidly approaching. In all the petty and yet necessary operations of these columns, two incidents demand more than a mere mention. The first was a hard-fought skirmish in which some of Elliot's horsemen were engaged upon June 6. His column had trekked during the month of May from Kroonstad to Harrismith, and then turning north found itself upon that date near the hamlet of Reeds. Major Sladen with 200 mounted infantry, when detached from the main body, came upon the track of a Boer convoy and ran it down. Over a hundred vehicles with 45 prisoners were the fruits of their enterprise. Well satisfied with his morning's work, 
the British leader dispatched a party of his men to convey the news to Delisle, who was behind, while he established himself with his loot and his prisoners in a convenient kraal. Thence they had an excellent view of a large body of horsemen approaching them with scouts, flankers, and all military precautions. One warm-hearted officer seems actually to have sallied out to meet his comrades, and it was not till his greeting of them took the extreme form of handing over his rifle that the suspicion of danger entered the heads of his companions. But if there was some lack of wit there was none of heart in Sladen and his men. With forty-five boars to hold down, and five hundred under Uri, De Wet, and Alare around them, the little band made rapid preparation for a desperate resistance. The prisoners were laid upon their faces, the men knocked loopholes in the mud walls of the corral, and a blunt soldierly answer was returned to the demand for surrender. But it was a desperate business. The attackers were five to one, and the five were soldiers of De Wet, the hard bitten veterans of a hundred encounters. The captured wagons in a long double row stretched out over the plain, and under this cover the Dutchmen swarmed up to the corral. But the men who faced them were veterans also, and the defence made up for the disparity of numbers. With fine courage the Boers made their way up to the village, and established themselves in the outlying huts, but the mounted infantry clung desperately to their position. Out of the few officers present Findlay was shot through the head, Moira and Cameron through the heart, and Strong through the stomach. It was a wagon hill upon a small scale two dual lines of skirmishers emptying their rifles into each other at point-blank range. Once more, as at Bothaville, the British mounted infantry proved that when it came to a dogged pelting match they could stand punishment longer than their enemy. They suffered terribly. Fifty-one out of the little force were on the ground, and the survivors were not much more numerous than their prisoners. To the first Gordons, the second Bedfords, the South Australians and the New South Welsh men belongs the honour of this magnificent defence. For four hours the fierce battle raged, until at last the parched and powder-stained survivors breathed a prayer of thanks as they saw on the southern horizon the vanguard of Delisle riding furiously to the rescue. For the last hour, since they had despaired of carrying the corral, the Boers had busied themselves in removing their convoy, but now, for the second time in one day, the drivers found British rifles pointed at their heads, and the oxen were turned once more and brought back to those who had fought so hard to hold them. Twenty-eight killed and twenty-six wounded were the losses in this desperate affair. Of the Boers seventeen were left dead in front of the corral, and the forty-five had not escaped from the bulldog grip which held them. There seems for some reason to have been no effective pursuit of the Boers, and the British column held on its way to Kroonstad. The second incident which stands out amid the dreary chronicle of hustlings and snipings is the surprise visit paid by Broadwood with a small British column to the town of Reitz upon July 11, which resulted in the capture of nearly every member of the late government of the Free State, save only the one man whom they particularly wanted. The column consisted of 200 yeomen, 200 of the 7th Dragoon Guards, and two guns. Starting at 11 p.m., the raiders rode hard all night and broke with the dawn upon the sleeping village. Racing into the main street, they secured the startled boars as they rushed from the houses. It is easy to criticize such an operation from a distance, and to overlook the practical difficulties in the way but on the face of it it seems a pity that the holes had not been stopped before the ferret was sent in. A picket at the farther end of the street would have barred Stain's escape. As it was, he flung himself upon his horse and galloped half-clad out of the town. Sergeant Cobb of the Dragoons snapped a rifle at close quarters upon him, but the cold of the night had frozen the oil on the striker and the cartridge hung fire. On such trifles do the large events of history turn. Two Boer generals, two commandants, Stain's brother, his secretary, and several other officials were among the nine and twenty prisoners. The treasury was also captured, but it is feared that the yeomen and dragoons will not be much the richer from their share of the contents. Save these two incidents, the fight at Reitz and the capture of a portion of Stain's government at the same place, the winter's campaign furnished little which was of importance. 
though a great deal of very hard and very useful work was done by the various columns under the direction of the governors of the four military districts. In the South General Bruce Hamilton made two sweeps, one from the railway line to the western frontier, and the second from the south and east in the direction of Petrasburg. The result of the two operations was about 300 prisoners. At the same time Monroe and Hickman re-cleared the already twice cleared districts of Rouville and Smithfield. The country in the east of the colony was verging now upon the state which Grant described in the Shenandoah Valley, a crow, said he, must carry his own rations when he flies across it. In the middle district General Charles Knox, with the columns of Pine Coffin, Thornycroft, Pilcher, and Henry, were engaged in the same sort of work with the same sort of results. The most vigorous operations fell to the lot of General Elliot, who worked over the northern and northeastern district, which still contained a large number of fighting burghers. In May and June, Elliot moved across to Vreed and afterwards down the eastern frontier of the colony, joining hands at last with Rundle at Harrismith. He then worked his way back to Kroonstad through Reitz and Lindley. It was on this journey that Sladen's mounted infantry had a sharp experience which has been already narrated. Weston's column, working independently, cooperated with Elliot in this clearing of the northeast. In August there were very large captures by Broadwood's force, which had attained considerable mobility, 90 miles being covered by it on one occasion in two days. Dot of General Rundle there is little to be said as he was kept busy in exploring the rough country in his own district the same district which had been the scene of the operations against Prince Lou and the Verisburg surrender. Into this district Kritzinger and his men trekked after they were driven from the colony in July, and many small skirmishes and snipings among the mountains showed that the Boer resistance was still alive. July and August were occupied in the Orange River colony by energetic operations of Spons and Rymington's columns in the Midland districts, and by a considerable drive to the northeastern corner, which was shared by three columns under Elliot and two under Plumer with one under Henry and several smaller bodies. A considerable number of prisoners and a large amount of stock were their result of the movement, but it was very evident that there was a waste of energy in the employment of such forces for such an end. The time appeared to be approaching when a strong force of military police stationed permanently in each district might prove a more efficient instrument. One interesting development of this phase of the war was the enrollment of a burger police among the Boers who had surrendered. These men well paid, well mounted, and well armed were an efficient addition to the British forces. The movement spread until before the end of the war there were several thousand burghers under such well-known officers as Selliers, Villain, and Young Cronge, fighting against their own guerrilla countrymen, who, in 1899, could have prophesied such a phenomenon as that. Lord Kitchener's proclamation issued upon August 9 marked one more turn in the screw upon the part of the British authorities. By the burghers were warned that those who had not laid down their arms by September 15 would in the case of the leaders be banished, and in the case of the burghers be compelled to support their families in the refugee camps. As many of the fighting burghers were men of no substance, the latter threat did not affect them much, but the other, though it had little result at the time, may be useful for the exclusion of firebrands during the period of reconstruction. Some increase was noticeable in the number of surrenders after the proclamation, but on the whole it had not the result which was expected, and its expediency is very open to question. This date may be said to mark the conclusion of the winter campaign and the opening of a new phase in the struggle. Chapter 35. The guerrilla operations in Cape Colony. In the account which has been given in a preceding chapter of the invasion of Cape Colony by the Boer forces, it was shown that the Western bands were almost entirely expelled, or at least that they withdrew, at the time when the West was driven across the Orange River. This was at the beginning of March 1901. It was also mentioned that though the Boers evacuated the barren and unprofitable desert of the Karoo, the eastern bands which had come with Kritzinger did not follow the same course, but continued to infest the mountainous districts of the central colony, whence they struck again and again at the railway lines, the small towns, British patrols, or any other quarry which was within their reach and strength. 
From the surrounding country they gathered a fair number of recruits, and they were able through the sympathy and help of the Dutch farmers to keep themselves well mounted and supplied. In small wandering bands they spread themselves over a vast extent of country, and there were few isolated farmhouses from the Orange River to the Oudtshorn Mountains, and from the Cape Town Railroad in the west to the Fish River in the east, which were not visited by their active and enterprising scouts. The object of the whole movement was, no doubt, to stimulate a general revolt in the colony, and it must be acknowledged that if the powder did not all explode it was not for want of the match being thoroughly applied. It might at first sight seem the simplest of military operations to hunt down these scattered and insignificant bands, but as a matter of fact nothing could be more difficult. Operating in a country which was both vast and difficult, with excellent horses, the best of information and supplies ready for them everywhere, it was impossible for the slow-moving British columns with their guns and their wagons to overtake them. Formidable even in flight, the Boers were always ready to turn upon any force which exposed itself too rashly to retaliation, and so amid the mountain passes the British chiefs had to use an amount of caution which was incompatible with extreme speed. Only when a commando was exactly localized so that two or three converging British forces could be brought to bear upon it, was there a reasonable chance of forcing a fight. Still, with all these heavy odds against them, the various little columns continued month after month to play hide and seek with the commandos, and the game was by no means always on the one side. The varied fortunes of this scrambling campaign can only be briefly indicated in these pages. It has already been shown that Kritzinger's original force broke into many bands, which were recruited partly from the Cape rebels and partly from fresh bodies which passed over from the Orange River colony. The more severe the pressure in the north, the greater reason was there for a trek to this land of plenty. The total number of Boers who were wandering over the eastern and midland districts may have been about 2,000, who were divided into bands which varied from 50 to 300. The chief leaders of separate commandos were Kritzinger, Sepers, Malan, Myberg, Fouch, Lotter, Smuts, Van Rien, Leitergun, Maritz, and Conroy, the two latter operating on the western side of the country. To hunt down these numerous and active bodies the British were compelled to put many similar detachments into the field, known as the Columns of Gorringe, Crab, Henica, Scobell, Duran, Kavana, Alexander, and others. These two sets of miniature armies performed an intricate devil's dance over the colony, the main lines of which are indicated by the red lines upon the map. There's Uerberg Mountains to the north of Steinsburg the Sneeberg range to the south of Middelburg, the Oudtshorn Mountains in the south, the Craddock district, the Murraysburg district, and the Grafrainet district these were the chief centers of Boer activity. In April Kritzinger made his way north to the Orange River colony, for the purpose of consulting with De Wet, but he returned with a following of 200 men about the end of May. Continual brushes occurred during this month between the various columns, and much hard marching was done upon either side, but there was nothing which could be claimed as a positive success. Early in May, two passengers sailed for Europe, the journey of each being in its way historical. The first was the weary and overworked proconsul who had the foresight to distinguish the danger and the courage to meet it. Milner's worn face and prematurely grizzled hair told of the crushing weight which had rested upon him during three eventful years. A gentle scholar, he might have seemed more fitted for a life of academic calm than for the stormy part which the discernment of Mr. Chamberlain had assigned to him. The fine flower of an English university, low-voiced and urbane, it was difficult to imagine what impression he would produce upon those rugged types of which South Africa is so peculiarly prolific. But behind the reserve of a gentleman there lay within him a lofty sense of duty, a singular clearness of vision and a moral courage which would brace him to follow with his reason pointed. His visit to England for three months rest was the occasion for a striking manifestation of loyalty and regard from his fellow countrymen. He returned in August as Lord Milner to the scene of his labours, 
with the construction of a united and loyal Commonwealth of South Africa as the task of his life. The second traveller who sailed within a few days of the governor was Mrs. Boater, the wife of the Boer General, who visited Europe for private as well as political reasons. She bought a Kruger an exact account of the state of the country and of the desperate condition of the burghers. Her mission had no immediate or visible effect, and the weary war, exhausting for the British but fatal for the Boers, went steadily on. To continue the survey of the operations in the Cape, the first point scored was by the invaders, for Malan's commando succeeded upon May 13 in overwhelming a strong patrol of the Midland Mounted Rifles, the local colonial corps to the south of Marysburg. Six killed, eleven wounded, and forty-one prisoners were the fruits of his little victory, which furnished him also with a fresh supply of rifles and ammunition. On May 21 Crabbe's column was in touch with Lotter and with Latergun, but no very positive result came from the skirmish. The end of May showed considerable Boer activity in the Cape Colony, that date corresponding with the return of Kritzinger from the north. Haig had for the moment driven Sieber's back from the extreme southerly point which he had reached, and he was now in the Grafrenet district, but on the other side of the colony Conroy had appeared near Kenhart, and upon May 23 he fought a sharp skirmish with a party of border scouts. The main Boer force under Kritzinger was in the Midlands, however, and had concentrated to such an extent in the Kradok district that it was clear that some larger enterprise was on foot. This soon took shape, for on June 2, after a long and rapid march, the Boer leader threw himself upon Jamestown. Overwhelmed the sixty townsmen who formed the guard, and looted the town, from which he drew some welcome supplies and one hundred horses. British columns were full cry upon his heels. However, and the Boers after a few hours left the gutted town and vanished into the hills once more. On June 6 the British had a little luck at last, for on that date Scob Ellen Lukin in the Barclay East District surprised a ledger and took twenty prisoners, one hundred and sixty-six horses, and much of the Jamestown loot. On the same day Wyndham treated Van Rien in a similar rough fashion near Stainsburg and took 22 prisoners. On June 8 the supreme command of the operations in Cape Colony was undertaken by General French, who from this time forward maneuvered his numerous columns upon a connected plan with the main idea of pushing the enemy northwards. It was some time, however, before his disposition bore fruit, for the commandos were still better mounted and lighter than their pursuers. On June 13 the youthful and dashing seepers, who commanded his own little force at an age when he would have been a junior lieutenant of the British Army, raided Murraysburg and captured a patrol. On June 17 Monroe with Lovat's scouts and Bethune's mounted infantry had some slight success near Tarkastad, but three days later the ill-fated Midland mounted rifles were surprised in the early morning by Kritzinger at Waterclough, which is thirty miles west of Kradok, and were badly mauled by him. They lost 10 killed, 11 wounded, and 66 prisoners in this unfortunate affair. Again the myth that colonial alertness is greater than that of regular troops seems to have been exposed. At the end of June, Fouch, one of the most enterprising of the guerrilla chiefs, made a dash from Barclay East into the native reserves of the Transkai in order to obtain horses and supplies. It was a desperate measure as it was vain to suppose that the warlike Kaffirs would permit their property to be looted without resistance, and if once the Assegais were reddened no man could say how far the mischief might go. With great loyalty the British government, even in the darkest days, had held back those martial races Zulus, Swazis, and Barsatos who all had old grudges against the Amaboon. Fouch's raid was stopped, however, before it led to serious trouble. A handful of Griqualand mounted rifles held it in front, while Dalgety and his colonial veterans moving very swiftly drove him back northwards. Though balked, Fouch was still formidable, and on July 14 he made a strong attack in the neighborhood of Jamestown upon a column of Connaught Rangers who were escorting a convoy. Major Moore offered a determined resistance, and eventually, after some hours of fighting, drove the enemy away and captured their ledger. 
7 killed and 17 wounded were the British losses in this spirited engagement. On July 10, General French, surveying from a lofty mountain peak the vast expanse of the field of operations, with his heliograph calling up responsive twinkles over 100 miles of country, gave the order for the convergence of four columns upon the valley in which he knew Sepers to be lurking. We have it from one of his own letters that his commando at the time consisted of 240 men, of whom 40 were free staters and the rest colonial rebels. Crew, Wyndham, Duran, and Scopelli answered to the call, but the young leader was a man of resource, and a long kloof up the precipitous side of the hill gave him a road to safety. Yet the operations showed a new mobility in the British columns, which shed their guns and their baggage in order to travel faster. The main commando escaped, but 25 laggards were taken. The action took place among the hills 30 miles to the west of Grafrainet. On July 21, Crab and Kritzinger had a skirmish in the mountains near Kraduk, in which the Boers were strong enough to hold their own, but on the same date near Murraysburg, Lukin, the gallant colonial gunner, with 90 men rode into 150 of later guns band and captured 10 of them with a hundred horses. On July 27 a small party of 21 Imperial Yeomanry was captured, after a gallant resistance, by a large force of Boers at the Dawn River on the other side of the colony. The Kaffir scouts of the British were shot dead in cold blood by their captors after the action. There seems to be no possible excuse for the repeated murders of colored men by the Boers as they had themselves from the beginning of the war used their kaffirs for every purpose short of actually fighting. The war had lost much of the good humor which marked its outset. A fiercer feeling had been engendered on both sides by the long strain, but the execution of rebels by the British, though much to be deplored, is still recognized as one of the rights of a belligerent. When one remembers the condemnation upon the part of the British of the use of their own uniforms by the Boers, of the wholesale breaking of paroles, of the continual use of expansive bullets, of the abuse of the pass system and of the Red Cross, it is impossible to blame them for showing some severity in the stamping out of armed rebellion within their own colony. If stern measures were eventually adopted it was only after extreme leniency had been tried and failed. The loss of five years franchise as a penalty for firing upon their own flag is surely the most gentle correction which an empire ever laid upon a rebellious people. At the beginning of August the connected systematic work of French's columns began to tell. In a huge semicircle the British were pushing north, driving the guerrillas in front of them. Sepers in his usual wayward fashion had broken away to the south but the others had been unable to penetrate the cordon and were herded over the Stormberg to or Port line. The main body of the Boers was hustled swiftly along from August 7 to August 10, from Grafrainet to Thebus, and thrust over the railway line at that point with some loss of men and a great shedding of horses. It was hoped that the blockhouses on the railroad would have held the enemy but they slipped across by night and got into the Steinsburg district, where Gorringe's colonials took up the running. On August 18 he followed the commandos from Steinsburg to Ventestad, killing twenty of them and taking several prisoners. On the 15th, Kritzinger with the main body of the invaders passed the Orange River near Bethali, and made his way to the Weapona district of the Orange River colony. Seepers, Lotta, Latergun, and a few small wandering bands were the only Boers left in the colony, and to these the British columns now turned their attention, with the result that later gun, towards the end of the month, was also driven over the river. For the time, at least, the situation seemed to have very much improved, but there was a drift of Boers over the northwestern frontier, and the long continued warfare at their own doors was undoubtedly having a dangerous effect upon the Dutch farmers small successes from time to time, such as the taking of sixty of French's scouts by Theron's commando on August 10, served to keep them from despair. Of the guerrilla bands which remained, the most important was that of Sepers, which now numbered three hundred men, well mounted and supplied. He had broken back through the cordon, and made for his old haunts in the southwest. Theron, with a smaller band, 
was also in the Uniondale and Willowmore district, approaching close to the sea in the Mossel Bay direction, but being headed off by Kavana. Seepers turned in the direction of Cape Town, but swerved aside at Montague, and moved northwards towards Tooze River. So far, the British had succeeded in driving and injuring, but never in destroying, the Borp bands. It was a new departure therefore when, upon September 4, the commando of Lotta was entirely destroyed by the column of Scopel. This column consisted of some of the Cape Mounted Rifles and of the indefatigable Ninth Lancers. It marked the enemy down in a valley to the west of Cradock and attacked them in the morning, after having secured all the approaches. The result was a complete success. The Boers threw themselves into a building and held out valiantly but their position was impossible, and after enduring considerable punishment they were forced to hoist the white flag. Eleven had been killed, forty-six wounded, and fifty-six surrendered figures which are in themselves a proof of the tenacity of their defence. Lotta was among the prisoners, two hundred and sixty horses were taken, and a good supply of ammunition, with some dynamite. A few days later, on September 10, a similar blow, less final in its character, was dealt by Colonel Crabbe to the commando of Van der Merv, which was an offshoot of that of Seepers. The action was fought near Lanesburg, which is on the main line, just north of Matchsfontein, and it ended in the scattering of the Boer band, the death of their boy leader, he was only eighteen years of age, and the capture of thirty-seven prisoners. Seventy of the beers escaped by a hidden road. To colonials and yeomanry belongs the honour of the action, which cost the British force seven casualties. Colonel Crabb pushed on after the success, and on September 14 he was in touch with Seepers's commander near Ladysmith, not to be confused with the historical town of Natal, and endured and inflicted some losses. On the 17th a patrol of grenadier guards was captured in the north of the colony, Brebo the young lieutenant in charge of them, meeting with a the soldier's death. On the same day a more serious engagement occurred near Tarkastad, a place which lies to the east of Kradak, a notorious centre of disaffection in the Midland district. Smuts's commando, some hundred strong, was marked down in this part, and several forces converged upon it. One of the outlets, Eland's River Port, was guarded by a single squadron of the 17th Lancers. Upon this the Boers made a sudden and very fierce attack, their approach being facilitated partly by the mist and partly by the use of khaki, a trick which seems never to have grown too stale for successful use. The result was that they were able to ride up to the British camp before any preparations had been made for resistance, and to shoot down a number of the lancers before they could reach their horses. So terrible was the fire that the single squadron lost 34 killed and 36 wounded. But the regiment may console itself for the disaster by the fact that the sorely stricken detachment remained true to the spirited motto of the corps, and that no prisoners appear to have been lost. After this one sharp engagement there ensued several weeks during which the absence of historical events, or the presence of the military censor, caused a singular lull in the account of the operations. With so many small commandos and so many pursuing columns it is extraordinary that there should not have been a constant succession of actions. That there was not must indicate a sluggishness upon the part of the pursuers, and this sluggishness can only be explained by the condition of their horses. Every train of thought brings the critic back always to the great horse question, and encourages the conclusion that there, at all seasons of the war and in all scenes of it, is to be found the most damning indictment against British foresight, common sense, and power of organisation. That the third year of the war should dawn without the British forces having yet got the legs of the Boers, after having penetrated every portion of their country and having the horses of the world on which to draw, is the most amazingly inexplicable point in the whole of this strange campaign. From the telegram infantry preferred addressed to a nation of rough riders down to the failure to secure the excellent horses on the spot, while importing them unfit for use from the ends of the earth, there has been nothing but one long series of blunders in this, the most vital question of all. 
even up to the end, in the colony the obvious lesson had not yet been learned that it is better to give one thousand men two horses each, and to let them reach the enemy, than give two thousand men one horse each, with which they can never attain their object. The chase during two years of the man with two horses by the man with one horse, has been a sight painful to ourselves and ludicrous to others. In connection with this account of operations within the colony, there is one episode which occurred in the extreme northwest which will not fit in with this connected narrative, but which will justify the distraction of the reader's intelligence, for few finer deeds of arms are recorded in the war. This was the heroic defence of a convoy by the 14th Company of Irish Imperial Yeomanry. The convoy was taking food to Griqua town, on the Kimberley side of the seat of war. The town had been long invested by Conroy, and the inhabitants were in such straits that it was highly necessary to relieve them. To this end a convoy, two miles long, was dispatched under Major Humby of the Irish Yeomanry. The escort consisted of 75 Northumberland Fusiliers, 24 local troops, and 100 of the 74th Irish Yeomanry. Fifteen miles from Griqua town, at a place called Rukapj's, the convoy was attacked by the enemy several hundred in number. Two companies of the Irishmen seized the ridge, however, which commanded the wagons, and held it until they were almost exterminated. The position was covered with bush and the two parties came to the closest of quarters, the yeomen refusing to take a backward step, though it was clear that they were vastly outnumbered. Encouraged by the example of Madden and Ford, their gallant young leaders, they deliberately sacrificed their lives in order to give time for the guns to come up and for the convoy to pass. Olive, Boninge, and McLean, who had been children together, were shot side by side on the ridge and afterwards buried in one grave. Of forty-three men in action, fourteen were killed and twenty severely wounded. Their sacrifice was not in vain, however. The Boers were beaten back, and the convoy, as well as Griqua town, was saved. Some thirty or forty Boers were killed or wounded in the skirmish, and Conroy, their leader, declared that it was the stiffest fight of his life. In the autumn and winter of 1901 General French had steadily pursued the system of clearing certain districts, one at a time, and endeavouring by his blockhouses and by the arrangement of his forces to hold in strict quarantine those sections of the country which were still infested by the commandos. In this manner he succeeded by the November of this year in confining the active forces of the enemy to the extreme northeast and to the southwest of the peninsula. It is doubtful if the whole Boer force, three quarters of whom were colonial rebels, amounted to more than 1500 men. When we learn that at this period of the war they were indifferently armed, and that many of them were mounted upon donkeys, it is impossible after making every allowance for the passive assistance of the farmers, and the difficulties of the country, to believe that the pursuit was always pushed with the spirit and vigour which was needful. In the northeast, Myberg, Wessels, and the truculent Fouch were allowed almost a free hand for some months, while the roving bands were rounded up in the Midlands and driven along until they were west of the main railroad. Here, in the Galvinia district, Several commandos united in October 1901 under Maritz, Lou, Smith, and Theron. Their united bands rode down into the rich grain growing country round Beckettburg and Malmesbury, pushing south until it seemed as if their academic supporters at Pal were actually to have a sight of the rebellion which they had fanned to a flame. At one period, their patrols were within 40 miles of Cape Town. The movement was checked, however, by a small force of lancers and district troops, and towards the end of October, Maritz, who was chief in this quarter, turned northwards, and on the 29th captured a small British convoy which crossed his line of march. Early in November he doubled back and attacked Pekitburg, but was beaten off with some loss. From that time a steady pressure from the south and east drove these bands farther and farther into the great barren lands of the west, until, in the following April, they had got as far as Namaquiland, many hundred miles away. Upon October 9, the second anniversary of the ultimatum, 
the hands of the military were strengthened by the proclamation of Cape Town and all the seaport towns as being in a state of martial law. By this means a possible source of supplies and recruits for the enemy was effectually blocked. That it had not been done two years before is a proof of how far local political considerations can be allowed to override the essentials of imperial policy. Meanwhile treason courts were sitting, and sentences, increasing rapidly from the most trivial to the most tragic, were teaching the rebel that his danger did not end upon the field of battle. The execution of Lotta and his lieutenants was a sign that the patience of a long-suffering empire had at last reached an end. The young Boer leader, Sepers, had long been a thorn in the side of the British. He had infested the southern districts for some months, and he had distinguished himself both by the activity of his movements and by the ruthless vigor of some of his actions. Early in October a serious illness and consequent confinement to his bed brought him at last within the range of British mobility. On his recovery he was tried for repeated breaches of the laws of war, including the murder of several natives. He was condemned to death, and was executed in December. Much sympathy was excited by his gallantry and his youth he was only twenty-three. On the other hand, our word was pledged to protect the natives and if he whose hand had been so heavy upon them escaped, all confidence would have been lost in our promises and our justice. That British vengeance was not indiscriminate was shown soon afterwards in the case of a more important commander, Kritzinger, who was the chief leader of the Boers within Cape Colony. Kritzinger was wounded and captured while endeavouring to cross the line near Hanover Road upon December 15. He was put upon his trial and his fate turned upon how far he was responsible for the misdeeds of some of his subordinates. It was clearly shown that he had endeavoured to hold them within the bounds of civilised warfare, and with congratulations and handshakings he was acquitted by the military court. In the last two months of the year 1901, a new system was introduced into the Cape Colony campaign by placing the colonial and district troops immediately under the command of colonial officers and of the colonial government. It had long been felt that some devolution was necessary, and the change was justified by the result. Without any dramatic incident, an inexorable process of attrition, caused by continual pursuit and hardship, wore out the commandos. Large bands had become small ones and small ones had vanished. Only by the union of several bodies could any enterprise higher than the looting of a farmhouse be successfully attempted. Such a union occurred, however, in the early days of February 1902, when Smuts, Malan, and several other Boer leaders showed great activity in the country round Calvinia. Their commandos seemed to have included a proportion of veteran Republicans from the north who were more formidable fighting material than the raw colonial rebels. It happened that several dangerously weak British columns were operating within reach at that time, and it was only owing to the really admirable conduct of the troops that a serious disaster was averted. Two separate actions, each of them severe, were fought on the same date, and in each case the Boers were able to bring very superior numbers into the field. The first of these was the fight in which Colonel Duran's column extricated itself with severe loss from a most perilous plight. The whole force under Duran consisted of 350 men with two guns, and this handful was divided by an expedition which he, with 150 men, undertook in order to search a distant farm. The remaining 200 men, under Captain Saunders, were left upon February 5th with the guns and the convoy at a place called Middle Post, which lies about 50 miles southwest of Calvinia. These men were of the 11th, 23rd, and 24th Imperial Yeomanry, with a troop of Cape Police. The Boer intelligence was excellent, as might be expected in a country which is dotted with farms. The weakened force at Middle Post was instantly attacked by Smuts's commando. Saunders evacuated the camp and abandoned the convoy, which was the only thing he could do, but he concentrated all his efforts upon preserving his guns. The night was illuminated by the blazing wagons, and made hideous by the whoops of the drunken rebels who caroused among the captured stores. With the first light of dawn the small British force was fiercely assailed on all sides, 
but held its own in a manner which would have done credit to any troops. The much criticized yeomen fought like veterans. A considerable position had to be covered, and only a handful of men were available at the most important points. One ridge, from which the guns would be enfiladed, was committed to the charge of Lieutenants Tabor and Chichester with eleven men of the 11th Imperial Yeomanry, their instructions being to hold it to the death. The order was obeyed with the utmost heroism. After a desperate defence the ridge was only taken by the Boers when both officers had been killed and nine out of eleven men were on the ground. In spite of the loss of this position the fight was still sustained until shortly after midday, when Duran with the patrol returned. The position was still most dangerous, the losses had been severe, and the Boers were increasing in strength. An immediate retreat was ordered, and the small column, after ten days of hardship and anxiety, reached the railway line in safety. The wounded were left to the care of smuts, who behaved with chivalry and humanity. At about the same date a convoy proceeding from Beaufort West to Fraserburg was attacked by Malan's commando. The escort, which consisted of 60 colonial mounted rifles and 100 of the West Yorkshire militia, was overwhelmed after a good defence, in which Major Crofton, their commander, was killed. The wagons were destroyed, but the Boers were driven off by the arrival of Crabbe's column, followed by those of Capper and Lund. The total losses of the British in these two actions amounted to 23 killed and 65 wounded. The re establishment of settled law and order was becoming more marked every week in those southwestern districts, which had long been most disturbed. Colonel Crewe in this region, and Colonel Lukin upon the other side of the line, acting entirely with colonial troops, were pushing back the rebels, and holding, by a well devised system of district defence, all that they had gained. By the end of February there were none of the enemy south of the Beaufort West and Clan William line. These results were not obtained without much hard marching and a little hard fighting. Small columns under Crab, Kappa, Wyndham, Nicol, and Lund, were continually on the move, with little to show for it save an ever-widening area of settled country in their rear. In a skirmish on February 20 Judge Hugo, a well-known Boer leader, was killed, and Van Heerden, a notorious rebel, was captured. At the end of this month Fauci's tranquil occupation of the northeast was at last disturbed, and he was driven out of it into the Midlands, where he took refuge with the remains of his commando in the Kamdibu Mountains. Malan's men had already sought shelter in the same natural fortress. Malan was wounded and taken in a skirmish near Somerset East a few days before the general bore surrender. Fouch gave himself up at Cradock on June 2 nd. The last incident of this scattered, scrambling, unsatisfactory campaign in the Cape Peninsula was the raid made by Smuts, the Transvaal leader, into the Port Noloth district of Namaqualand, best known for its copper mines. A small railroad has been constructed from the coast at this point, the terminus being the township of Okiap. The length of the line is about 70 miles. It is difficult to imagine what the Boers expected to gain in this remote corner of the seat of war, unless they had conceived the idea that they might actually obtain possession of Port Noloth itself, and so restore the communications with their sympathizers and allies. At the end of March the Boer horsemen appeared suddenly out of the desert, drove in the British outposts, and summoned Durkey up to surrender. Colonel Shelton, who commanded the small garrison, sent an uncompromising reply, but he was unable to protect the railway in his rear, which was wrecked, together with some of the blockhouses which had been erected to guard it. The loyal population of the surrounding country had flocked into Okiap, and the commandant found himself burdened with the care of six thousand people. The enemy had succeeded in taking the small post of Springbok, and Concordia, the mining centre was surrendered into their hands without resistance, giving them welcome supplies of arms, ammunition, and dynamite. The latter was used by the Boers in the shape of hand bombs, and proved to be a very efficient weapon when employed against blockhouses. Several of the British defences were wrecked by them, with considerable loss to the garrison, but in the course of a month's siege, in spite of several attacks, 
the Boers were never able to carry the frail works which guarded the town. Once more, at the end of the war as at the beginning of it, there was shown the impotence of the Dutch riflemen against a British defence. A relief column, under Colonel Cooper, was quickly organised at Port Noloth, and advanced along the railway line, forcing Smuts to raise the siege in the first week of May. Immediately afterwards came the news of the negotiations for peace, and the Boer General presented himself at Port Noloth, whence he was conveyed by ship to Cape Town, and so north again to take part in the deliberations of his fellow countrymen. Throughout the war he had played a manly and honourable part. It may be hoped that with youth and remarkable experience, both of diplomacy and of war, he may now find a long and brilliant career awaiting him in a wider arena than that for which he strove. Chapter 36. The Spring Campaign, September to December, 1901. The history of the war during the African winter of 1901 has now been sketched, and some account given of the course of events in the Transvaal, the Orange River Colony, and the Cape Colony. The hope of the British that they might stamp out resistance before the grass should restore mobility to the larger bodies of Boers was destined to be disappointed. By the middle of September the veldt had turned from drab to green, and the great drama was fated to last for one more act, however anxious all the British and the majority of the Boers might be to ring down the curtain. Exasperating as this senseless prolongation of a hopeless struggle might be. There was still some consolation in the reflection that those who drank this bitter cup to the very lees would be less likely to thirst for it again. September 15 was the date which brought into force the British proclamation announcing the banishment of those Boer leaders who continued in arms. It must be confessed that this step may appear harsh and unchivalrous to the impartial observer, so long as those leaders were guilty of no practices which are foreign to the laws of civilized warfare. The imposition of personal penalties upon the officers of an opposing army is a step for which it is difficult to quote a precedent, nor is it wise to officially rule your enemy outside the pale of ordinary warfare, since it is equally open to him to take the same step against you. The only justification for such a course would be its complete success, as this would suggest that the intelligence department were aware that the leaders desired some strong excuse for coming in such an excuse as the proclamation would afford. The result proved that nothing of the kind was needed, and the whole proceeding must appear to be injudicious and high-handed. In honourable war you conquer your adversary by superior courage, strength, or wit, but you do not terrorize him by particular penalties aimed at individuals. The burghers of the Transvaal and of the late Orange Free State were legitimate belligerents, and to be treated as such a statement which does not, of course, extend to the African rebels who were their allies. The tendency of the British had been to treat their antagonists as a broken and disorganized banditti. But with the breaking of the spring they were sharply reminded that the burghers were still capable of a formidable and coherent effort. The very date which put them beyond the pale as belligerents was that which they seemed to have chosen in order to prove what active and valiant soldiers they still remained. A quick succession of encounters occurred at various parts of the seat of war, the general tendency of which was not entirely in favour of the British arms though the weekly export of prisoners reassured all who noted it as to the sapping and decay of the Boer strength. These incidents must now be set down in the order of their occurrence, with their relation to each other so far as it is possible to trace it. General Louis Boter, with the double intention of making an offensive move and of distracting the wavering burghers from a close examination of Lord Kitchener's proclamation, assembled his forces in the second week of September in the Ermlo district. Thence he moved them rapidly towards Natal, with the result that the volunteers of that colony had once more to grasp their rifles and hasten to the frontier. The whole situation bore for an instant an absurd resemblance to that of two years before Bota playing the part of Jubert, and Lyttelton, who commanded on the frontier, that of White. It only remained, to make the parallel complete, that someone should represent Penn Simmons, and this perilous role fell to a gallant officer, Major Goff, commanding a detached force which thought itself strong enough to hold its own, 
and only learned by actual experiment that it was not. This officer, with a small force consisting of three companies of mounted infantry with two guns of the 69th RFA, was operating in the neighborhood of Utrecht in the southeastern corner of the Transvaal, on the very path along which boat must descend. On September 17 he had crossed to Jager's Drift on the Blood River, not very far from Dundee, when he found himself in touch with the enemy. His mission was to open a path for an empty convoy returning from Vryad, and in order to do so it was necessary that Blood River Port, where the Boers were now seen, should be cleared. With admirable zeal Goff pushed rapidly forward, supported by a force of 350 Johannesburg mounted rifles under Stuart. Such a proceeding must have seemed natural to any British officer at this stage of the war, when a swift advance was the only chance of closing with the small bodies of Boers, but it is strange that the intelligence department had not warned the patrols upon the frontier that a considerable force was coming down upon them, and that they should be careful to avoid action against impossible odds. If Goff had known that Boater's main commando was coming down upon him, it is inconceivable that he would have pushed his advance until he could neither extricate his men nor his guns. A small body of the enemy, said to have been the personal escort of Louis Boater, led him on, until a large force was able to ride down upon him from the flank and rear. Surrounded at Seeper's Neck by many hundreds of riflemen in a difficult country, there was no alternative but to surrender and so sharp and sudden was the Boer advance that the whole action was over in a very short time. The new tactics of the Boers, already used at Vlakfontein, and afterwards to be successful at Brickenal Act and at Tweebosch, were put in force. A large body of mounted men, galloping swiftly in open order and firing from the saddle, rode into and over the British. Such temerity should in theory have met with severe punishment but as a matter of fact the losses of the enemy seem to have been very small. The soldiers were not able to return an effective fire from their horses, and had no time to dismount. The sights and breech blocks of the two guns are said to have been destroyed, but the former statement seems more credible than the latter. A Colt gun was also captured. Of the small force twenty were killed, forty wounded, and over two hundred taken. Stuart's force was able to extricate itself with some difficulty, and to fall back on the drift. Goff managed to escape that night and to report that it was Bo to himself, with over a thousand men, who had eaten up his detachment. The prisoners and wounded were sent in a few days later to Vryide, a town which appeared to be in some danger of capture had not Walter Kitchener hastened to carry reinforcements to the garrison. Bruce Hamilton was at the same time dispatched to head Boto off, and every step taken to prevent his southern advance. So many columns from all parts converged upon the danger spot that Lyttelton, who commanded upon the natal frontier, had over 20,000 men under his orders. Boto's plans appear to have been to work through Zululand and then strike at natal, an operation which would be the more easy as it would be conducted a considerable distance from the railway line. Pushing on a few days after his successful action with Goff, he crossed the Zulu frontier, and had in front of him an almost unimpeded march as far as the Tugla. Crossing this far from the British base of power, his force could raid the Groot town district and raise recruits among the Dutch farmers, laying waste one of the few spots in South Africa which had been untouched by the blight of war. All this lay before him and in his path nothing save only two small British posts which might be either disregarded or gathered up as he passed. In an evil moment for himself, tempted by the thought of the supplies which they might contain, he stopped to gather them up, and the force of the wave of invasion broke itself as upon two granite rocks. These two so-called forts were posts of very modest strength, a chain of which had been erected at the time of the old Zulu war. Fort Adana the larger, was garrisoned by 300 men of the 5th Mounted Infantry, drawn from the Dublin Fusiliers, Middlesex, Dorsets, South Lancashires, and Lancashire Fusiliers most of them old soldiers of many battles. They had two guns of the 69th RFA, the same battery which had lost a section the week before. Major Chapman, of the Dublins, 
was in command. Upon September 25, the small garrison heard that the main force of the Boers was sweeping towards them, and prepared to give them a soldier's welcome. The fort is situated upon the flank of a hill, on the summit of which, a mile from the main trenches, a strong outpost was stationed. It was upon this that the first force of the attack broke at midnight of September 25. The garrison, 80 strong, was fiercely beset by several hundred Boers, and the post was eventually carried after a sharp and bloody contest. Kane, of the South Lancashires, died with the words no surrender upon his lips, and Potjata, a Boer leader, was pistoled by Kane's fellow officer, Lefroy. Twenty of the small garrison fell, and the remainder were overpowered and taken. With this vantage ground in their possession, the Boers settled down to the task of overwhelming the main position. They attacked upon three sides, and until morning the force was raked from end to end by unseen riflemen. The two British guns were put out of action, and the Maxim was made unserviceable by a bullet. At dawn there was a pause in the attack, but it recommenced and continued without intermission until sunset. The span betwixt the rising of the sun and its last red glow in the west is a long one for the man who spends it at his ease, but how never ending must have seemed the hours to this handful of men, outnumbered, surrounded, pelted by bullets, parched with thirst, torn with anxiety, holding desperately on with dwindling numbers to their frail defences. To them it may have seemed a hard thing to endure so much for a tiny fort in a savage land. The larger view of its vital importance could have scarcely come to console the regimental officer, far less the private. But duty carried them through, and they wrought better than they knew, for the brave Dutchman, exasperated by so disproportionate a resistance, stormed up to the very trenches and suffered as they had not suffered for many a long month. There have been battles with 10,000 British troops hotly engaged in which the ball losses have not been so great as in this obscure conflict against an isolated post. When at last, baffled and disheartened, they drew off with the waning light, it is said that no fewer than a hundred of their dead and two hundred of their wounded attested the severity of the fight. So strange are the conditions of South African warfare that this loss which would have hardly made a skirmish memorable in the slogging days of the peninsula, was one of the most severe blows which the burghers had sustained in the course of a two years warfare against a large and aggressive army. There is a conflict of evidence as to the exact figures, but at least there were sufficient to beat the Boer army back and to change their plan of campaign. Whilst this prolonged contest had raged round forty dollar, a similar attack upon a smaller scale was being made upon Fort Prospect, some fifteen miles to the eastward. This small post was held by a handful of Durham artillery militia and of Dorsets. The attack was delivered by Grobler with several hundred burghers, but it made no advance although it was pushed with great vigour, and repeated many times in the course of the day. Captain Rowley, who was in command, handled his men with such judgment that one killed and eight wounded represented his casualties during a long day's fighting. Here again the ball losses were in proportion to the resolution of their attack, and are said to have amounted to sixty killed and wounded. Considering the impossibility of replacing the men, and the fruitless waste of valuable ammunition, September 26 was an evil day for the Boer cause. The British casualties amounted to 73. The water of the garrison of Fort Itala had been cut off early in the attack, and their ammunition had run low by evening. Chapman withdrew his men and his guns there fort and Candler, where the survivors of his gallant garrison received the special thanks of Lord Kitchener. The country around was still swarming with boars, and on the last day of September a convoy from Melmoth fell into their hands and provided them with some badly needed supplies. But the check which he had received was sufficient to prevent any important advance upon the part of Boater, while the swollen state of the rivers put an additional obstacle in his way. Already the British commanders, delighted to have at last discovered a definite objective, were hurrying to the scene of action. Bruce Hamilton had reached Fort Italo upon September 28 and Walter Kitchener had been dispatched to Vryde. Two British forces, aided by smaller columns, were endeavouring to surround the Boer leader. On October 6 Boater had fallen back to the northeast of Vryde, 
with other British forces had followed him. Like De Wet's invasion of the Cape, Boater's advance upon Natal had ended in placing himself and his army in a critical position. On October 9 he had succeeded in crossing the Privan River, a branch of the Pongolo, and was pushing north in the direction of Biotry Teeth, much helped by misty weather and incessant train. Some of his force escaped between the British columns, and some remained in the kloofs and forests of that difficult country. Walter Kitchener, who had followed up the Boer retreat, had a brisk engagement with the rearguard upon October 6. The Boers shook themselves clear with some loss, both to themselves and to their pursuers. On the 10th, those of the burghers who held together had reached Lunenburg, and shortly afterwards they had got completely away from the British columns. The weather was atrocious, and the lumbering wagons, axle deep in mud, made it impossible for troops who were attached to them to keep in touch with the light riders who sped before them. For some weeks there was no word of the main Boer force, but at the end of that time they reappeared in a manner which showed that both in numbers and in spirit there was still a formidable body. Of all the sixty odd British columns which were traversing the Boer states, there was not one which had a better record than that commanded by Colonel Benson. During seven months of continuous service, this small force, consisting at that time of the Argyll and Sutherland Highlanders, the second Scottish horse, the 18th and 19th Mounted Infantry, and two guns, had acted with great energy, and had reduced its work to a complete and highly effective system. Leaving the infantry as a camp guard, Benson operated with mounted troops alone, and no Borlager within fifty miles was safe from his nocturnal visits. So skillful had he and his men become at these night attacks in a strange, and often difficult country that out of twenty-eight attempts twenty-one resulted in complete success. In each case the rule was simply to gallop headlong into the Bolliger, and to go on chasing as far as the horses could go. The furious and reckless pace may be judged by the fact that the casualties of the force were far greater from falls than from bullets. In seven months forty-seven boars were killed and six hundred captured, to say nothing of enormous quantities of munitions and stock. The success of these operations was due, not only to the energy of Benson and his men, but to the untiring exertions of Colonel Walls Sampson, who acted as intelligence officer. If, during his long persecution by President Kruger, Walls Sampson in the bitterness of his heart had vowed a feud against the Boer cause, it must be acknowledged that he has most amply fulfilled it for it would be difficult to point to any single man who has from first to last done them greater harm. In October Colonel Benson's force was reorganized, and it then consisted of the second Buffs, the second Scottish horse, the third and twenty-fifth mounted infantry, and four guns of the eighty-fourth battery. With this force, numbering nineteen hundred men, he left Middelburg upon the Delagoa line on October twentieth and proceeded south crossing the course along which the Boers, who were retiring from their abortive raid into Natal, might be expected to come. For several days the column performed its familiar work, and gathered up forty or fifty prisoners. On the 26th came news that the Boer commandos under Grobler were concentrating against it, and that an attack in force might be expected. For two days there was continuous sniping and the column as it moved through the country saw Boer horsemen keeping pace with it on the far flanks and in the rear. The weather had been very bad, and it was in a deluge of cold driving rain that the British set forth upon October 30, moving towards Brake and Lagd, which is a point about forty miles due south of mid Elberg. It was Benson's intention to return to his base. About midday the column, still escorted by large bodies of aggressive Boers, came to a difficult sprout swollen by the rain. Here the wagons stuck, and it took some hours to get them all across. The ball fire was continually becoming more severe, and had broken out at the head of the column as well as the rear. The situation was rendered more difficult by the violence of the rain, which raised a thick steam from the ground and made it impossible to see for any distance. Major Anley, in command of the rear guard, peering back, saw through a rift of the clouds a large body of horsemen in extended order sweeping after them. There's miles of them, begob! cried an excited Irish trooper. Next instant the curtain had closed once more, 
but all who had caught a glimpse of that vision knew that a stern struggle was at hand. At this moment two guns of the 84th Battery under Major Guinness were in action against Boer riflemen. As a rear screen on the farther side of the guns was a body of the Scottish horse and of the Yorkshire mounted infantry. Near the guns themselves were thirty men of the buffs. The rest of the buffs and of the mounted infantry were out upon the flanks or else were with the advance guard, which was now engaged, under the direction of Colonel Walls Sampson, in parking the convoy and informing the camp. These troops played a small part in the day's fighting, the whole force of which broke with irresistible violence upon the few hundred men who were in front of or around the rear guns. Colonel Benson seems to have just ridden back to the danger point when the Boers delivered their furious attack. Louis Boter with his commando is said to have ridden 60 miles in order to join the forces of Grobler and Opperman, and overwhelm the British column. It may have been the presence of their commander or a desire to have vengeance for the harrying which they had undergone upon the natal border, but whatever the reason, the Boer attack was made with a spirit and dash which earned the enthusiastic applause of every soldier who survived to describe it. With the low roar of a great torrent, several hundred horsemen burst through the curtain of mist, riding at a furious pace for the British guns. The rear screen of mounted infantry fell back before this terrific rush, and the two bodies of horsemen came pell-mell down upon the handful of buffs and the guns. The infantry were ridden into and surrounded by the Boers, who found nothing to stop them from galloping on to the low ridge upon which the guns were stationed. This ridge was held by 80 of the Scottish horse and 40 of the Yorkshire MI, with a few riflemen from the 25th Mounted Infantry. The latter were the escort of the guns, but the former were the rear screen who had fallen back rapidly because it was the game to do so, but who were in no way shaken and who instantly dismounted and formed when they reached a defensive position. These men had hardly time to take up their ground when the Boers were on them. With that extraordinary quickness to adapt their tactics to circumstances which is the chief military virtue of the Boers, the horsemen did not gallop over the crest, but lined the edge of it, and poured a withering fire on to the guns and the men beside them. The heroic nature of the defence can be best shown by the plain figures of the casualties. No rhetoric is needed to adorn that simple record. There were 32 gunners round the guns, and 29 fell where they stood. Major Guinness was mortally wounded while endeavouring with his own hands to fire a round of case. There were 62 casualties out of 80 among the Scottish horse, and the Yorkshires were practically annihilated. Altogether 123 men fell, out of about 160 on the ridge. Hard pounding, gentlemen, as Wellington remarked at Waterloo, and British troops seemed as ready as ever to endure it. The gunners were, as usual, magnificent. Of the two little bullet pelted groups of men around the guns, there was not one who did not stand to his duty without flinching. Corporal Atkin was shot down with all his comrades, but still endeavoured with his failing strength to twist the breech block out of the gun. Another bullet passed through his upraised hands as he did it. Sergeant Hayes, badly wounded, and the last survivor of the crew, seized the lanyard, crawled up the trail, and fired a last round before he fainted. Sergeant Matthews, with three bullets through him, kept steadily to his duty. Five drivers tried to bring up a limber and remove the gun, but all of them, with all the horses, were hit. There have been incidents in this war which have not increased our military reputation, but you might search the classical records of valour and fail to find anything finer than the consistent conduct of the British artillery. Colonel Benson was hit in the knee and again in the stomach, but wounded as he was he dispatched a message back to Walls Sampson, asking him to burst shrapnel over the ridge so as to prevent the Boers from carrying off the guns. The burghers had ridden in among the litter of dead and wounded men which marked the British position, and some of the baser of them, much against the will of their commanders, handled the injured soldiers with great brutality. The shell fire drove them back, however, and the two guns were left standing alone, with no one near them save their prostrate gunners and escort. There has been some misunderstanding as to the part played by the buffs in this action and words have been used which seem to imply that they had in some way failed their mounted companions. 
It is due to the honor of one of the finest regiments in the British Army to clear this up. As a matter of fact, the greater part of the regiment under Major Daglish was engaged in defending the camp. Near the guns there were four separate small bodies of buffs, none of which appears to have been detailed as an escort. One of these parties, consisting of thirty men under Lieutenant Grotwood, was ridden over by the horsemen, and the same fate befell a party of twenty who were far out upon the flank. Another small body under Lieutenant Lynch was overtaken by the same charge, and was practically destroyed, losing nineteen killed and wounded out of thirty. In the rear of the guns was a larger body of buffs, one hundred and thirty in number, under Major Eels. When the guns were taken this handful attempted a counter-attack, but Eels soon saw that it was a hopeless effort, and he lost thirty of his men before he could extricate himself. Had these men been with the others on the gun ridge they might have restored the fight, but they had not reached it when the position was taken, and to persevere in the attempt to retake it would have led to certain disaster. The only just criticism to which the regiment is open is that, having just come off blockhouse duty, they were much out of condition, which caused the men to straggle and the movements to be unduly slow. It was fortunate that the command of the column devolved upon so experienced and cool headed a soldier as Walls Sampson. To attempt a counter attack for the purpose of recapturing the guns would, in case of disaster, have risked the camp and the convoy. The latter was the prize which the Boers had particularly in view, and to expose it would be to play their game. Very wisely, therefore, Wool's Sampson held the attacking Boers off with his guns and his riflemen, while every spare pair of hands was set to work entrenching the position and making it impregnable against attack. Outposts were stationed upon all those surrounding points which might command the camp, and a summons to surrender from the Boer leader was treated with contempt. All day a long range fire, occasionally very severe, rained upon the camp. Colonel Benson was brought in by the ambulance, and used his dying breath in exhorting his subordinate to hold out. No more night marches are said to have been the last words spoken by this gallant soldier as he passed away in the early morning after the action. On October 31st the force remained on the defensive, but early on November 1st the gleaming of two heliographs, one to the northeast and one to the southwest, told that two British columns, those of Turl Island of Barta, were hastening to the rescue. But the Boers had passed as the storm does and nothing but their swathe of destruction was left to show where they had been. They had taken away the guns during the night, and were already beyond the reach of pursuit. Such was the action at Break and Lagged, which cost the British sixty men killed and one hundred and seventy wounded, together with two guns. Colonel Benson, Colonel Guinness, Captain Air Lloyd of the Guards, Major Murray and Captain Lindsay of the Scottish Horse, with seven other officers were among the dead while sixteen officers were wounded. The net result of the action was that the British rear guard had been annihilated, but that the main body and the convoy, which was the chief object of the attack, was saved. The Boer loss was considerable, being about 150. In spite of the Boer success nothing could suit the British better than hard fighting of the sort, since whatever the immediate result of it might be. It must necessarily cause a wastage among the enemy which could never be replaced. The gallantry of the Boer charge was only equaled by that of the resistance offered round the guns, and it is an action to which both sides can look back without shame or regret. It was feared that the captured guns would soon be used to break the blockhouse line, but nothing of the kind was attempted, and within a few weeks they were both recovered by British columns. In order to make a consecutive and intelligible narrative, I will continue with an account of the operations in this southeastern portion of the Transvaal from the action of break and lag down to the end of the year 1901. These were placed in the early part of November, under the supreme command of General Bruce Hamilton, and that energetic commander set in motion a number of small columns, which effected numerous captures. He was much helped in his work by the new lines of blockhouses, one of which extended from Standerton to Ermelo, while another connected Brugsbrut with Greylinkstad. The huge country was thus cut into manageable districts, 
and the fruits were soon seen by the large returns of prisoners which came from this part of the seat of war. Upon December 3rd Bruce Hamilton, who had the valuable assistance of Walls Sampson to direct his intelligence, struck swiftly out from Ermelo and fell upon a Borgia in the early morning, capturing 96 prisoners. On the 10th he overwhelmed the Bethel commando by a similar march, killing 7 and capturing 131. Williams and Wink commanded separate columns in this operation, and their energy may be judged from the fact that they covered 51 miles during the 24 hours. On the 12th Hamilton's columns were on the warpath once more, and another commando was wiped out. 16 killed and 70 prisoners were the fruits of this expedition. For the second time in a week the columns had done their 50 miles a day and it was no surprise to hear from their commander that they were in need of a rest. Nearly 400 prisoners had been taken from the most warlike portion of the Transvaal in 10 days by one energetic commander, with a list of 25 casualties to ourselves. The thanks of the Secretary of War were specially sent to him for his brilliant work. From then until the end of the year 1901, numbers of smaller captures continued to be reported from the same region, where Plumer, Spence, Mackenzie, Rawlinson, and others were working. On the other hand there was one small setback which occurred to a body of 200 mounted infantry under Major Bridgeford, who had been detached from Spence's column to search some farmhouses at a place called Holland, to the south of Ermelo. The expedition set forth upon the night of December 19, and next morning surrounded and examined the farms. The British force became divided in doing this work, and were suddenly attacked by several hundred of Brits's commando, who came to close quarters through their khaki dress, which enabled them to pass as Plumer's vanguard. The brunt of the fight fell upon an outlying body of fifty men, nearly all of whom were killed, wounded or taken. A second body of fifty men were overpowered in the same way, after a creditable defence. Fifteen of the British were killed and thirty wounded, while Bridgeford the commander was also taken. Spence came up shortly afterwards with the column, and the Boers were driven off. There seems every reason to think that upon this occasion the plans of the British had leaked out, and that a deliberate ambush had been laid for them round the farms. But in such operations these are chances against which it is not always possible to guard. Considering the number of the Boers, and the cleverness of their dispositions, the British were fortunate in being able to extricate their force without greater loss, a feat which was largely due to the leading of Lieutenant Sterling. Leaving the eastern Transvaal, the narrative must now return to several incidents of importance which had occurred at various points of the seat of war during the latter months of 1901. On September 19, two days after Gough's disaster, a misfortune occurred near Blow Enfantine by which two guns and 140 men fell temporarily into the hands of the enemy. These guns, belonging to U Battery, were moving south under an escort of mounted infantry, from that very Senna's post which had been so fatal to the same battery 18 months before. When 15 miles south of the waterworks, at a place called Vlakfontein, another Vlakfontein from that of General Dixon's engagement, the small force was surrounded and captured by Ackerman's commando. The gunner officer, Lieutenant Barry, died beside his guns in the way that gunner officers have. Guns and men were taken, however, the latter to be released, and the former to be recovered a week or two later by the British columns. It is certainly a credit to the Boers that the spring campaign should have opened by four British guns falling into their hands and it is impossible to withhold our admiration for those gallant farmers who, after two years of exhausting warfare, were still able to turn upon a formidable and victorious enemy, and to renovate their supplies at his expense. Two days later, hard on the heels of Goff's mishap, of the Vlakfontein incident, and of the annihilation of the squadron of lancers in the Cape, there was a serious affair at Elands Kluv near Zasteron, in the extreme south of the Orange River colony. In this a detachment of the Highland Scouts raised by the public spirit of Lord Lovat was surprised at night and very severely handled by Kritzinger's commando. The loss of Colonel Murray, 
their commander, of the adjutant of the same name, and of 42 out of 80 of the scouts, shows how fell was the attack, which broke as sudden and as strong as a South African thunderstorm upon the unconscious camp. The Boers appear to have eluded the outposts and crept right among the sleeping troops, as they did in the case of the Victorians at Wilmont's Rust. Twelve gunners were also hit, and the only field gun taken. The retiring Boers were swiftly followed up by Thornycroft's column, however, and the gun was retaken, together with twenty of Kritzinger's men. It must be confessed that there seems some irony in the fact that, Within five days of the British ruling by which the Boers were no longer a military force, these non-belligerents had inflicted a loss of nearly 600 men killed, wounded, or taken. Two small commandos, that of Koch in the Orange River Colony, and that of Carolina, had been captured by Williams and Benson. Combined they only numbered a hundred and nine men, but here, as always, they were men who could never be replaced. Those who had followed the war with care, and had speculated upon the future, were prepared on hearing of Bota's movement upon Natal to learn that Delare had also made some energetic attack in the western quarter of the Transvaal. Those who had formed this expectation were not disappointed, for upon the last day of September the Boer chief struck fiercely at Kekwish's column in a vigorous night attack which led to as stern an encounter as any in the campaign. This was the action at Moed Will, near Magartonek, in the Maglisberg. When last mentioned Alare was in the Marico district, near Zerust, where he fought two actions with Methuen in the early part of September. Thence he made his way to Rosenberg and into the Maglisberg country, where he joined Kemp. The Boer force was followed up by two British columns under Kekwish and Featherston Hoar. The former commander had camped upon the night of Sunday, September 30th, at the farm of Moed Will, in a strong position within a triangle formed by the Silas River on the west, Adonga on the east, and the Zeros Trussenberg Road as a base. The apex of the triangle pointed north, with a ridge on the farther side of the river. The men with Kekwish were for the most part the same as those who had fought in the Vlachfontein engagement. The Derbys, the first Scottish horse, the Yeomanry, and the 28th RFA every precaution appears to have been taken by the leader, and his pickets were thrown out so far that ample warning was assured of an attack. The Boer onslaught came so suddenly and fiercely, however, in the early morning, that the posts upon the river bank were driven in or destroyed and the riflemen from the ridge on the farther side were able to sweep the camp with their fire. In numbers the two forces were not unequal but the Boers had already obtained the tactical advantage, and were playing a game in which they are the schoolmasters of the world. Never has the British spirit flamed up more fiercely, and from the commander to the latest yeoman recruit there was not a man who flinched from a difficult and almost a desperate task. The Boers must at all hazard be driven from the position which enabled them to command the camp. No retreat was possible without such an abandonment of stores as would amount to a disaster. In the confusion and the uncertain light of early dawn there was no chance of a concerted movement, though Kekwish made such dispositions as were possible with admirable coolness and promptness. Squadrons and companies closed in upon the river bank with the one thought of coming to close quarters and driving the enemy from their commanding position. Already more than half their horses and a very large number of officers and men had gone down before the pelting bullets. Scottish horse. Yeomanry, and Derbys pushed on, the young soldiers of the two former corps keeping pace with the veteran regiment. All the men behaved simply splendidly, said a spectator, taking what little cover there was and advancing yard by yard. An order was given to try and saddle up a squadron, with the idea of getting round their flank. I had the saddle almost on one of my ponies when he was hit in two places. Two men trying to saddle alongside of me were both shot dead, and Lieutenant Wortley was shot through the knee. I ran back to where I had been firing from and found the colonel slightly hit, the adjutant wounded and dying, and men dead and wounded all round. But the counter-attack soon began to make way. At first the advance was slow, but soon it quickened into a magnificent rush. 
the wounded Kekwish whooping on his men, and the guns coming into action as the enemy began to fall back before the fierce charge of the British riflemen. At six o'clock De La Rey's burghers had seen that their attempt was hopeless, and were in full retreat a retreat which could not be harassed by the victors, whose cavalry had been converted by that hail of bullets into footmen. The repulse had been absolute and complete, for not a man or a cartridge had been taken from the British, but the price paid in killed and wounded was a heavy one. No fewer than 161 had been hit, including the gallant leader, whose hurt did not prevent him from resuming his duties within a few days. The heaviest losses fell upon the Scottish horse, and upon the Derbys, but the yeomanry also proved on this, as on some other occasions, how ungenerous were the criticisms to which they had been exposed. There are few actions in the war which appear to have been more creditable to the troops engaged. Though repulsed at Moed Will, De La Rey, the grim, long bearded fighting man, was by no means discouraged. From the earliest days of the campaign, when he first faced Methuen upon the road to Kimberley, he had shown that he was a most dangerous antagonist, tenacious, ingenious, and indomitable. With him were a body of irreconcilable burghers, who were the veterans of many engagements, and in Kemp he had an excellent fighting subordinate. His command extended over a wide stretch of populous country, and at any time he could bring considerable reinforcements to his aid who would separate again to their farms and hiding places when their venture was accomplished. For some weeks after the fight at Moed Will the Boer forces remained quiet in that district. Two British columns had left Zerost on October 17, under Methuen and Vondernop, in order to sweep the surrounding country, the one working in the direction of Elands River and the other in that of Rosenberg. They returned to Zerost twelve days later, after a successful foray which had been attended with much sniping and skirmishing, but only one action which is worthy of record. This was fought on October 24 at a spot near Clefantine, upon the great Marico River, which runs to the northeast of Zerust. Von Dinop's column was straggling through very broken and bush-covered country when it was furiously charged in the flank and rear by two separate bodies of burghers. Kemp, who commanded the flank attack, cut into the line of wagons and destroyed eight of them, killing many of the Kaffir drivers, before he could be driven off. Delare and Steenkamp, who rushed the rear guard, had a more desperate contest. The Boer horsemen got among the two guns of the 4th RFA, and held temporary possession of them, but the small escort were veterans of the Fighting 5th, who lived up to the traditions of their famous North Country Regiment. Of the gun crews of the section, amounting to about 26 men, the young officer, Hill, and 16 men were hit. Of the escort of Northumberland Fusiliers hardly a man was left standing, and 41 of the supporting yeomanry were killed and wounded. It was for some little time a fierce and concentrated struggle at the shortest of ranges. The British horsemen came galloping to the rescue, however, and the attack was finally driven back into that broken country from which it had come. Forty dead boars upon the ground, with their brave chieftain, Uister Husen, amongst them, showed how manfully the attack had been driven home. The British losses were twenty-eight killed and fifty-six wounded. Somewhat mauled, and with eight missing wagons, the small column made its way back to Zerust. From this incident until the end of the year nothing of importance occurred in this part of the seat of war save for a sharp and well-managed action at Best Ekral upon October 29, in which 79 Boers were surrounded and captured by Kekwish's horsemen. The process of attrition went very steadily forwards, and each of the British columns returned its constant tale of prisoners. The blockhouse system had now been extended to such an extent that the Maglisberg was securely held, and a line had been pushed through from Klerksdorp and Frederikstad to Ventisdorp. One of Colonel Hickey's yeomanry patrols was roughly handled near Braxbrot upon November 13, but with this exception the points scored were all upon one side. Methuen and Kekwish came across early in November from Zerust to Clerksdorp, and operated from the railway line. The end of the year saw them both in the Woolmar and Stad district, 
where they were gathering up prisoners and clearing the country. Of the events in the other parts of the Transvaal, during the last three months of the year 1901, there is not much to be said. In all parts, the lines of blockhouses and of constabulary posts were neutralizing the Boer mobility and bringing them more and more within reach of the British. The only fighting forces left in the Transvaal were those under Bota in the southeast and those under De Larre in the west. The others attempted nothing save to escape from their pursuers, and when overtaken they usually gave in without serious opposition. Among the larger halls may be mentioned that of Dawkins in the Nilestrom district, 76 prisoners, Kekwish, 78. Colnbranda in the north, 57, Dawkins and Colnbranda, 104, Colnbranda, 62, but the great majority of the captures were in smaller bodies, gleaned from the caves, the kloofs, and the farmhouses. Only two small actions during these months appear to call for any separate notice. The first was an attack made by Bai's commando, upon November 20th. On the railway pioneers, when at work near Villestorp, in the extreme northeast of the Orange River colony. This corps, consisting mainly of miners from Johannesburg, had done invaluable service during the war. On this occasion, a working party of them was suddenly attacked, and most of them taken prisoners. Major Fisher, who commanded the pioneers, was killed, and three other officers with several men were wounded. Colonel Rymington's column appeared upon the scene, however, and drove off the Boers, who left their leader, Byes, a wounded prisoner in our hands. The second action was a sharp attack delivered by Muller's Boers upon Colonel Park's column on the night of December 19, at Eland Sprout. The fight was sharp while it lasted, but it ended in the repulse of the assailants. The British casualties were six killed and twenty-four wounded. The Boers, who left eight dead behind them, suffered probably to about the same extent. Already the most striking and pleasing feature in the Transvaal was the tranquility of its central provinces, and the way in which the population was settling down to its old avocations. Pretoria had resumed its normal quiet life, while its larger and more energetic neighbor was rapidly recovering from its two years of paralysis. Every week more stamps were dropped in the mines and from month to month a steady increase in the output showed that the great staple industry of the place would soon be as vigorous as ever. Most pleasing of all was the restoration of safety upon the railway lines, which, save for some precautions at night, had resumed their normal traffic. When the observer took his eyes from the dark clouds which shadowed every horizon, he could not but rejoice at the ever-widening central stretch of peaceful blue which told that the storm was nearing its end. Having now dealt with the campaign in the Transvaal down to the end of 1901, it only remains to bring the chronicle of the events in the Orange River colony down to the same date. Reference has already been made to two small British reverses which occurred in September, the loss of two guns to the south of the waterworks near Bloemfontein and the surprise of the camp of Lord Lovat's scouts. There were some indications at this time that a movement had been planned through the passes of the Drakensberg by a small free state force which should aid Louis Bota's invasion of Natal. The main movement was checked, however, and the demonstration in aid of it came to nothing. The blockhouse system had been developed to a very complete extent in the Orange River colony and the small bands of Boers found it increasingly difficult to escape from the British columns who were forever at their heels. The southern portion of the country had been cut off from the northern by a line which extended through Bloemfontein on the east to the Barsato frontier, and on the west to Jacobsdal. To the south of this line the Boer resistance had practically ceased, although several columns moved continually through it, and gleaned up the broken fragments of the commandos. The northwest had also settled down to a large extent, and during the last three months of 1901 no action of importance occurred in that region. Even in the turbulent northeast, which had always been the center of resistance, there was little opposition to the British columns, which continued every week to send in their tale of prisoners. Of the column commanders, Williams, Damant, Dumoulin, Lowry Cole, and Wilson were the most successful. 
In their operations they were much aided by the South African Constabulary. One young officer of this force, Major Pack Beresford, especially distinguished himself by his gallantry and ability. His premature death from Enderic was a grave loss to the British Army. Save for one skirmish of Colonel Wilson's early in October, and another of Bonn's on November 14, there can hardly be said to have been any actual fighting until the events late in December which I am about to describe. In the meanwhile the peaceful organization of the country was being pushed forward as rapidly as in the Transvaal, although here the problems presented were of a different order, and the population an exclusively Dutch one. The schools already showed a higher attendance than in the days before the war, while a continual stream of burghers presented themselves to take the oath of allegiance, and even to join the ranks against their own irreconcilable countrymen, whom they looked upon with justice as the real authors of their troubles. Towards the end of November there were signs that the word had gone forth for a fresh concentration of the fighting boars in their old haunts in the Heilbronn district and early in December it was known that the indefatigable de Wet was again in the field. He had remained quiet so long that there had been persistent rumours of his injury and even of his death, but he was soon to show that he was as alive as ever. President Stein was ill of a most serious complaint, caused possibly by the mental and physical sufferings which he had undergone, but with an indomitable resolution which makes one forget and forgive the fatuous policy which brought him and his state to such a pass, he still appeared in his cape cart at the ledger of the faithful remnant of his commandos. To those who remembered how widespread was our conviction of the half-heartedness of the free staters at the outbreak of the war, it was indeed a revelation to see them after two years still making a stand against the forces which had crushed them. It had been long evident that the present British tactics of scouring the country and capturing the isolated burghers must in time bring the war to a conclusion. From the Boer point of view the only hope, or at least the only glory, lay in reassembling once more in larger bodies and trying conclusions with some of the British columns. It was with this purpose that De Wet early in December assembled Wessels, mainly Boater, and others of his lieutenants, together with a force of about 2,000 men, in the Heilbronn district. Small as this force was, it was admirably mobile, and every man in it was a veteran, toughened and seasoned by two years of constant fighting. De Wet's first operations were directed against an isolated column of Colonel Wilson's which was surrounded within twenty miles of Heilbronn. Rymington, in response to a heliographic call for assistance, hurried with admirable promptitude to the scene of action, and joined hands with Wilson. De Wet's men were as numerous, however, as the two columns combined, and they harassed the return march into Heilbronn. A determined attack was made on the convoy and on the rear guard, but it was beaten off. That night Rymington's camp was fired into by a large body of boars, but he had cleverly moved his men away from the fires, so that no harm was done. The losses in these operations were small, but with troops which had not been trained in this method of fighting the situation would have been a serious one. For a fortnight or more after this the burghers contented themselves by skirmishing with British columns and avoiding a drive which Elliot's forces made against them. On December 18 they took the offensive, however, and within a week fought three actions, two of which ended in their favour. News had come to British headquarters that Kaffers Cop, to the northwest of Bethlehem, was a centre of Boer activity. Three columns were therefore turned in that direction, Elliot's, Barker's, and Dartnell's. Some desultory skirmishing ensued, which was only remarkable for the death of Haysbroek, a well-known Boer leader. As the columns separated again, unable to find an objective, Derwet suddenly showed one of them that their failure was not due to his absence. Dartnell had retraced his steps nearly as far as Eland's River Bridge, when the Boer leader sprang out of his lair in the Langburg and threw himself upon him. The burghers attempted to ride in, as they had successfully done at Break and Lagd, but they were opposed by the steady old troopers of the two regiments of Imperial Horse and by a general who was familiar with every Boros. The horsemen never got nearer than 150 yards to the British line, and were beaten back by the steady fire which met them. Finding that he made no headway, 
and learning that Campbell's column was coming up from Bethlehem, De Wet withdrew his men after four hours fighting. Fifteen were hit upon the British side, and the ball loss seems to have been certainly as great or greater. De Wet's general aim in his operations seems to have been to check the British blockhouse building. With his main force in the Langberg he could threaten the line which was now being erected between Bethlehem and Harrismith, a line against which his main commando was destined, only two months later, to beat itself in vain. Sixty miles to the north a second line was being run across country from Frankfurt to Standerton, and had reached a place called Tafekop. A covering party of East Lancashires and Yeomanry watched over the workers, but De Wet had left a portion of his force in that neighborhood, and they harassed the blockhouse builders to such an extent that General Hamilton, who was in command, found it necessary to send into Frankfurt for support. The British columns that had just returned exhausted from a drive, but three bodies under Damant, Rymington, and Wilson were at once dispatched to clear away the enemy. The weather was so atrocious that the Velt resembled an inland sea with the Copges as islands rising out of it. By this stage of the war the troops were hardened to all weathers, and they pushed swiftly on to the scene of action. As they approached the spot where the Boers had been reported, the line had been extended over many miles, with the result that it had become very attenuated and dangerously weak in the center. At this point Colonel Damant and his small staff were alone with the two guns and the Maxim, save for a handful of Imperial Yeomanry, 91st, who acted as escort to the guns. Across the face of this small force there rode a body of men in khaki uniforms, keeping British formation, and actually firing bogus volleys from time to time in the direction of some distant boars. Damant and his staff seemed to have taken it for granted that these were Rymington's men, and the clever ruse succeeded to perfection. Nearer and nearer came the strangers, and suddenly throwing off all disguise, they made a dash for the guns. Four rounds of case failed to stop them, and in a few minutes they were over the cop on which the guns stood and had ridden among the gunners, supported in their attack by a flank fire from a number of dismounted riflemen. The instant that the danger was realized Damant, his staff, and the forty yeomen who formed the escort dashed for the crest in the hope of anticipating the boars. So rapid was the charge of the others that they had overwhelmed the gunners before the supports could reach the hill, and the latter found themselves under the deadly fire of the boar rifles from above. Damant was hit in four places, all of his staff were wounded, and hardly a man of the small body of yeomanry was left standing. Nothing could exceed their gallantry. Gosen their captain fell at their head. On the ridge the men about the guns were nearly all killed or wounded. Of the gun detachment only two men remained. Both of them hit, and Jeffcoat their dying captain bequeathed them fifty pounds each in a will drawn upon the spot. In half an hour the centre of the British line had been absolutely annihilated. Modern warfare is on the whole much less bloody than of old. But when one party has gained the tactical mastery it is a choice between speedy surrender and total destruction. The widespread British wings had begun to understand that there was something amiss, and to ride in towards the centre. An officer on the far right peering through his glasses saw those telltale puffs at the very muzzles of the British guns, which showed that they were firing case at close quarters. He turned his squadron inwards and soon gathered up Scott's squadron of Damant's horse, and both rode for the cop. Rymington's men were appearing on the other side, and the Boers rode off. They were unable to remove the guns which they had taken, because all the horses had perished. I actually thought, says one officer who saw them ride away, that I had made a mistake and been fighting our own men. They were dressed in our uniforms and some of them wore the tiger skin, the badge of Damant's horse, round their hats. The same officer gives an account of the scene on the gun cop. The result when we got to the guns was this, gunners all killed except two, both wounded, pom-pom officers and men all killed, Maxim all killed, 91st, the gun escort, one officer and one man not hit, all the rest killed or wounded, staff, every officer hit. That is what it means to those who are caught in the vortex of the cyclone. The total loss was about 75. In this action the Boers, 
who were under the command of Wessels, delivered their attack with a cleverness and dash which deserved success. Their stratagem, however, depending as it did upon the use of British uniforms and methods, was illegitimate by all the laws of war, and one can but marvel at the long-suffering patience of officers and men who endured such things without any attempt at retaliation. There is too much reason to believe also, that considerable brutality was shown by those Boers who carried the cop, and the very high proportion of killed to wounded among the British who lay the corroborates the statement of the survivors that several were shot at close quarters after all resistance had ceased. This rough encounter of Tafe Cop was followed only four days later by a very much more serious one at Tweefontein which proved that even after two years of experience we had not yet sufficiently understood the courage and the cunning of our antagonist. The blockhouse line was being gradually extended from Harrismith to Bethlehem, so as to hold down this turbulent portion of the country. The Harrismith section had been pushed as far as Tweefontine, which is nine miles west of Eland's River Bridge, and here a small force was stationed to cover the workers. This column consisted of four squadrons of the 4th Imperial Yeomanry, one gun of the 79th Battery, and one pom-pom, the whole under the temporary command of Major Williams of the South Staffords, Colonel Fermin being absent. Knowing that De Wet and his men were in the neighborhood, the camp of the yeoman had been pitched in a position which seemed to secure it against attack. A solitary cop presented a long slope to the north, while the southern end was precipitous. The outposts were pushed well out upon the plain, and a line of sentries was placed along the crest. The only precaution which seems to have been neglected was to have other outposts at the base of the southern declivity. It appears to have been taken for granted, however, that no attack was to be apprehended from that side, and that in any case it would be impossible to evade the vigilance of the sentries upon the top dot of all the daring and skillful attacks delivered by the Boers during the war there is certainly none more remarkable than this one. At two o'clock in the morning of a moonlight night De Wet's forlorn hope assembled at the base of the hill and clambered up to the summit. The fact that it was Christmas Eve may conceivably have had something to do with the want of vigilance upon the part of the sentries. In a season of goodwill and conviviality the rigor of military discipline may insensibly relax. Little did the sleeping yeoman in the tents, or the drowsy outposts upon the crest, think of the terrible Christmas visitors who were creeping on to them, or of the grim morning gift which Santa Claus was bearing. The boars, stealing up in their stockinged feet, poured under the crest until they were numerous enough to make a rush. It is almost inconceivable how they could have got so far without their presence being suspected by the sentries but so it was. At last, feeling strong enough to advance, they sprang over the crest and fired into the pickets, and passed them into the sleeping camp. The top of the hill being once gained, there was nothing to prevent their comrades from swarming up, and in a very few minutes nearly a thousand boars were in a position to command the camp. The British were not only completely outnumbered, but were hurried from their sleep into the fight without any clear idea as to the danger or how to meet it, while the hissing sleet of bullets struck many of them down as they rushed out of their tents. Considering how terrible the ordeal was to which they were exposed, these untried yeomen seemed to have behaved very well. Some brave gentlemen ran away at the first shot, but I am thankful to say they were not many, says one of their number. The most veteran troops would have been tried very high had they been placed in such a position. The noise and the clamor, says one spectator, were awful. The yells of the Dutch, the screams and shrieks of dying men and horses, the cries of natives, howls of dogs, the firing, the galloping of horses, the whistling of bullets, and the whir volleys make in the air, made up such a compound of awful and diabolical sounds as I never heard before nor hope to hear again. In the confusion some of the men killed each other and some killed themselves. Two boars who put on helmets were killed by their own people. The men were given no time to rally or to collect their thoughts, for the gallant boars barged right into them, shooting them down, and occasionally being shot down, at range of a few yards. Harridge and Watney, 
who had charge of the Maxim, died nobly with all the men of their gun section round them. Reed, the sergeant major, rushed at the enemy with his club rifle, but was riddled with bullets. Major Williams, the commander, was shot through the stomach as he rallied his men. The gunners had time to fire two rounds before they were overpowered and shot down to a man. For half an hour the resistance was maintained, but at the end of that time the Boers had the whole camp in their possession, and were already hastening to get their prisoners away before the morning should bring a rescue. The casualties are in themselves enough to show how creditable was the resistance of the yeomanry. Out of a force of under 400 men they had six officers and 51 men killed, eight officers and 80 men wounded. There have been very few surrenders during the war in which there has been such evidence as this of a determined stand. Nor was it a bloodless victory upon the part of the Boers, for there was evidence that their losses, though less than those of the British, were still severe. The prisoners, over 200 in number, were hurried away by the Boers, who seemed under the immediate eye of De Wet to have behaved with exemplary humanity to the wounded. The captives were taken by forced marches to the Bar Sutta border, where they were turned adrift, half clad and without food. By devious ways and after many adventures, they all made their way back again to the British lines. It was well for De Wet that he had shown such promptness in getting away, for within three hours of the end of the action the two regiments of Imperial Horse appeared upon the scene, having travelled seventeen miles in the time. Already, however, the rearguard of the Boers was disappearing into the fastness of the Langberg, where all pursuit was vain. Such was the short but vigorous campaign of De Wet in the last part of December of the year 1901. It had been a brilliant one, but none the less his bolt was shot, and Tweefontein was the last encounter in which British troops should feel his heavy hand. His operations, bold as they had been, had not delayed by a day the building of that iron cage which was gradually enclosing him. Already it was nearly completed and in a few more weeks he was destined to find himself and his commando struggling against bars. Chapter 37. The campaign of January to April, 1902. At the opening of the year 1902 it was evident to every observer that the Boer resistance, spirited as it was, must be nearing its close. By a long succession of captures their forces were much reduced in numbers. They were isolated from the world and had no means save precarious smuggling of renewing their supplies of ammunition. It was known also that their mobility, which had been their great strength, was decreasing, and that in spite of their admirable horse mastership their supply of remounts was becoming exhausted. An increasing number of the burghers were volunteering for service against their own people, and it was found that all fears as to this delicate experiment were misplaced and that in the whole army there were no keener and more loyal soldiers. The chief factor, however, in bringing the Boers to their knees was the elaborate and wonderful blockhouse system, which had been strung across the whole of the enemy's country. The original blockhouses had been far apart, and were a hindrance and an annoyance rather than an absolute barrier to the burghers. The new models, however, were only 600 yards apart and were connected by such impenetrable strands of wire that a Boer pithily described it by saying that if one's hat blew over the line anywhere between Ermelo and Standard and one had to walk round Ermelo to fetch it. Use was made of such barriers by the Spaniards in Cuba, but an application of them on such a scale over such an enormous tract of country is one of the curiosities of warfare and will remain one of several novelties which will make the South African campaign forever interesting to students of military history. The spines of this great system were always the railway lines, which were guarded on either side, and down which, as down a road, went flocks, herds, pedestrians, and everything which wished to travel in safety. From these long central cords the lines branched out to right and left, cutting up the great country into manageable districts. A category of them would but weary the reader, but suffice it that by the beginning of the year the southeast of the Transvaal and the northeast of the Orange River colony, the haunts of Botu and Awet, had been so intersected that it was obvious that the situation must soon be impossible for both of them. Only on the west of the Transvaal was there a clear run for Delare and Kemp. 
Hence it was expected, as actually occurred, that in this quarter the most stirring events of the close of the campaign would happen. General Bruce Hamilton in the eastern Transvaal had continued the energetic tactics which had given such good results in the past. With the new year his number of prisoners fell, but he had taken so many, and had hustled the remainder to such an extent, that the fight seemed to have gone out of the bores in this district. On January 1st be presented the first fruits of the year in the shape of 22 of Grobler's burghers. On the 3rd he captured 49, while Wing, cooperating with him, took 20 more. Among these was General Erasmus, who had helped, or failed to help, General Lucas Meyer at Talana Hill. On the 10th Colonel Wing's column, which was part of Hamilton's force, struck out again and took 42 prisoners including the two Wilmarins. Only two days later Hamilton returned to the same spot, and was rewarded with 32 more captures. On the 18th he took 27, on the 24th 12, and on the 26th no fewer than 90. So severe were these blows, and so difficult was it for the Boers to know how to get away from an antagonist who was ready to ride 30 miles in a night in order to fall upon their ledger that the enemy became much scattered and too demoralized for offensive operations. Finding that they had grown too shy in this much shot over district, Hamilton moved farther south, and early in March took a cast round the Vriai district, where he made some captures, notably General Cherry Emmett, a descendant of the famous Irish rebel, and brother-in-law of Louis Bota. For all these repeated successes it was to the intelligence department so admirably controlled by Colonel Walls Sampson, that thanks are mainly due. Whilst Bruce Hamilton was operating so successfully in the Ermelo district, several British columns under Plumer, Spens, and Colville were stationed some 50 miles south to prevent the fugitives from getting away into the mountainous country which lies to the north of Wackerstrom. On January 3 a small force of Plumer's New Zealanders had a brisk skirmish with a party of Boers, whose cattle they captured, though at some loss to themselves. These boars were strongly reinforced, however, and when on the following day Major Valentin pursued them with fifty men he found himself at Onverwacht in the presence of several hundred of the enemy, led by Opperman and Christian Bota. Valentin was killed and almost all of his small force were hit before British reinforcements, under Colonel Pulteney, drove the boars off. 19 killed and 23 wounded were our losses in this most sanguinary little skirmish. Nine dead Boers, with Opperman himself, were left upon the field of battle. His loss was a serious one to the enemy, as he was one of their most experienced generals. From that time until the end, these columns, together with Mackenzie's column to the north of Ermelo, continued to break up all combinations and to send in their share of prisoners to swell Lord Kitchener's weekly list. A final drive, organized on April 11 against the Standerton Line, resulted in 134 prisoners. In spite of the very large army in South Africa, so many men were absorbed by the huge lines of communications and the blockhouse system that the number available for active operations was never more than 40 or 50,000 men. With another 50,000 there is no doubt that at least six months would have been taken from the duration of the war. On account of this short-handedness Lord Kitchener had to leave certain districts alone, while he directed his attention to those which were more essential. Thus to the north of the Delagoa railway line there was only one town, Lidenburg, which was occupied by the British. They had, however, an energetic commander in Park of the Devons. This leader, striking out from his stronghold among the mountains, and aided by Ermston from Belfast, kept the commando of Benville Joan and the peripatetic government of Schorkberger continually upon the move. As already narrated, Park fought a sharp night action upon December 19, after which, in combination with Ermston, he occupied Dulstrom, only missing the government by a few hours. In January Park and Ermston were again upon the warpath, though the incessant winds, fogs, and rains of that most inclement portion of the Transvaal seriously hampered their operations. Several skirmishes with the commandos of Muller and Trichart gave no very decisive result, 
but a piece of luck befell the British on January 25th in the capture of General Viljoen by an ambuscade cleverly arranged by Major Raw in the neighborhood of Lidenburg. Though a great firebrand before the war, Viljoen had fought bravely and honorably throughout the contest, and he had won the respect and esteem of his enemy. Colonel Park had had no great success in his last two expeditions, but on February 20th he made an admirable march and fell upon a ball edger which lay in placid security in the heart of the hills. 164 prisoners, including many Boer officers, were the fruits of this success, in which the National Scouts, or Tame Boers, as they were familiarly called, played a prominent part. This commando was that of Middelburg, which was acting as escort to the government, who again escaped dissolution. Early in March Park was again out on trek, upon one occasion covering 70 miles in a single day. Nothing further of importance came from this portion of the seat of war until March 23, when the news reached England that Schorkberger, Reitz, Lucas Meyer, and others of the Transvaal government had come into Middelburg, and that they were anxious to proceed to Pretoria to treat. On the eastern horizon had appeared the first golden gleam of the dawning peace. Having indicated the course of events in the eastern Transvaal, north and south of the railway line, I will now treat one or two incidents which occurred in the more central and northern portions of the country. I will then give some account of De Wet's doings in the Orange River colony, and finally describe that brilliant effort of Delares in the West which shed a last glory upon the Boer arms. In the latter days of December, Colnbrunner and Dawkins operating together had put in a great deal of useful work in the northern district, and from Nilstrom to Pietersburg the Bergers were continually harried by the activity of these leaders. Late in the month Dawkins was sent down into the Orange River colony in order to reinforce the troops who were opposed to De Wet. Colne Brander alone, with his hardy colonial forces, swept through the Magalisburg, and had the double satisfaction of capturing a number of the enemy and of heading off and sending back a war party of Lynch scaffers who, incensed by a cattle raid of Kemp's, were moving down an addiction which would have brought them dangerously near to the Dutch women and children. This instance and several similar ones in the campaign show how vile are the lies which have been told of the use save under certain well-defined conditions, of armed natives by the British during the war. It would have been a perfectly easy thing at any time for the government to have raised all the fighting native races of South Africa, but it is not probable that we, who held back our admirable and highly disciplined Sikhs and Gorkhas, would break our self-imposed restrictions in order to enroll the inferior but more savage races of Africa. Yet no charge has been more often repeated and has caused more piteous protests among the soft-hearted and soft-headed editors of continental journals. The absence of Kohlenbrander in the Russenberg country gave Biz a chance of which he was not slow to avail himself. On January 24, in the early morning, he delivered an attack upon Pietersburg itself, but he was easily driven off by the small garrison. It is probable, however, that the attack was a mere feint in order to enable a number of the inmates of the refugee camp to escape. About a hundred and fifty made off, and rejoined the commandos. There were three thousand Boers in all in this camp, which was shortly afterwards moved down to Natal in order to avoid the recurrence of such an incident. Colnbrander, having returned to Pietersburg once more, determined to return with his visit, and upon April 8 he moved out with a small force to surprise the Bolliger. The Innis King Fusiliers seized the ground which commanded the enemy's position. The latter retreated, but were followed up, and altogether about 150 were killed, wounded, and taken. On May 3 a fresh operation against Biz was undertaken, and resulted in about the same loss to the Boers. On the other hand, the Boers had a small success against Kitchener's scouts, killing 18 and taking 30 prisoners. There is one incident, however, in connection with the war in this region which one would desire to pass over in silence if such a course were permissible. Some 80 miles to the east of Pietersburg is a wild part of the country called the Spelonkin. In this region, an irregular corps, named the Bushveld Carboneers, had been operating. 
It was raised in South Africa, but contained both colonials and British in its ranks. Its wild duties, its mixed composition, and its isolated situation must have all militated against discipline and restraint, and it appears to have degenerated into a band not unlike those southern bushwhackers in the American war to whom the Federals showed little mercy. They had given short shrift to the Boer prisoners who had fallen into their hands, the excuse offered for their barbarous conduct being that an officer who had served in the Corps had himself been murdered by the Boers. Such a reason, even if it were true, could of course offer no justification for indiscriminate revenge. The crimes were committed in July and August 1901, but it was not until January 1902 that five of the officers were put upon their trial and were found to be guilty as principals or accessories of twelve murders. The corps was disbanded, and three of the accused officers, Hancock, Wilton, and Morant, were sentenced to death while another, Picton, was cashiered. Hancock and Morant were actually executed. This stern measure shows more clearly than volumes of argument could do how high was the standard of discipline in the British army, and how heavy was the punishment, and how vain all excuses, where it had been infringed. In the face of this actual outrage and its prompt punishment how absurd becomes that crusade against imaginary outrage is preached by an ignorant press abroad and by renegade Englishmen at home. To the south of Johannesburg, halfway between the town and the frontier, there is a range of hills called the Zuikabosch Rand, which extends across from one railway system to the other. A number of Boers were known to have sought refuge in this country, so upon February 12 a small British force left Clip River Post in order to clear them out. There were 320 men in all, composing the 28th Mounted Infantry, drawn from the Lancashire Fusiliers, Woiks, and Derbys, most of whom had just arrived from Malta, which one would certainly imagine to be the last place where mounted infantry could be effectively trained. Major Dowell was in command. An advance was made into the hilly country, but it was found that the enemy was in much greater force than had been imagined. The familiar Boer tactics were used with the customary success. The British line was held by a sharp fire in front, while strong flanking parties galloped round each of the wings. It was with great difficulty that any of the British extricated themselves from their perilous position, and the safety of a portion of the force was only secured by the devotion of a handful of officers and men, who gave their lives in order to gain time for their comrades to get away. Twelve killed and fifty wounded were our losses in this unfortunate skirmish and about 100 prisoners supplied the victors with a useful addition to their rifles and ammunition. A stronger British force came up next day, and the enemy were driven out of the hills. A week later, upon February 18, there occurred another skirmish at Clipan, near Springs, between a squadron of the Scots Greys and a party of Boers who had broken into this central reserve which Lord Kitchener had long kept clear of the enemy. In this action the cavalry were treated as roughly as the mounted infantry had been the week before, losing three officers killed, eight men killed or wounded, and forty-six taken. They had formed a flanking party to General Gilbert Hamilton's column, but were attacked and overwhelmed so rapidly that the blow had fallen before their comrades could come to their assistance. One of the consequences of the successful drives about to be described in the Orange River colony was that a number of the Free Staters came north of the Val in order to get away from the extreme pressure upon the south. At the end of March, a considerable number had reinforced the local commandos in that district to the east of Springs, no very great distance from Johannesburg which had always been a storm center. A cavalry force was stationed at this spot which consisted at that time of the 2nd Queen's Bays, the 7th Hussars, and some national scouts, all under Colonel Lawley of the Hussars. After a series of minor engagements east of Springs, Lawley had possessed himself of Boschman's Cup, 18 miles from that town, close to the district which was the chief scene of Boer activity. From this base he dispatched upon the morning of April 1st three squadrons of the bays under Colonel Fanchet, for the purpose of surprising a small force of the enemy which was reported at one of the farms. 
Fanshaw's strength was about 300 men. The British cavalry found themselves, however, in the position of the hunter who, when he is out for a snipe, puts up a tiger. All went well with the expedition as far as Holsprout, the farm which they had started to search. Commandant Pretorius, to whom it belonged, was taken by the energy of Major Vaughan, who pursued and overtook his cape cart. It was found, however, that Albert's commando was camped at the farm, and that the bays were in the presence of a very superior force of the enemy. The night was dark, and when firing began it was almost muzzle to muzzle, with the greatest possible difficulty in telling friend from foe. The three squadrons fell back upon some rising ground, keeping admirable order under most difficult circumstances. In spite of the darkness the attack was pressed fiercely home, and with their favorite tactics the burghers rapidly outflanked the position taken up by the cavalry. The British moved by alternate squadrons onto a higher rocky cop on the east, which could be vaguely distinguished looming in the darkness against the skyline. B Squadron the last to retire, was actually charged and ridden through by the brave assailants, firing from their saddles as they broke through the ranks. The British had hardly time to reach the cop and to dismount and line its edge when the boars, yelling loudly, charged with their horses up the steep flanks. Twice they were beaten back, but the third time they seized one corner of the hill and opened a hot fire upon the rear of the line of men who were defending the other side. Dawn was now breaking, and the situation most serious, for the Boers were in very superior numbers and were pushing their pursuit with the utmost vigor and determination. A small party of officers and men whose horses had been shot covered the retreat of their comrades, and continued to fire until all of them, two officers and twenty-three men, were killed or wounded, the whole of their desperate defense being conducted within from thirty to fifty yards of the enemy. The remainder of the regiment was now retired to successive ridges, each of which was rapidly outflanked by the Boers, whose whole method of conducting their attack was extraordinarily skillful. Nothing but the excellent discipline of the overmatched troopers prevented the retreat from becoming a rout. Fortunately, before the pressure became intolerable the 7th Hussars with some artillery came to the rescue, and turned the tide. The Hussars galloped in with such dash that some of them actually got among the Boers with their swords, but the enemy rapidly fell back and disappeared. In this very sharp and sanguinary cavalry skirmish, the Bays lost 80 killed and wounded out of a total force of 270. To stand such losses under such circumstances, and to preserve absolute discipline and order, is a fine test of soldierly virtue. The adjutant, the squadron leaders, and six out of ten officers were killed or wounded. The Boers lost equally heavily. Two prins lose, one of them a commandant, and three field cornets were among the slain, with seventy other casualties. The force under General Alberts was a considerable one, not fewer than six hundred rifles, so that the action at Holsprout is one which adds another name of honor to the battle roll of the bays. It is pleasing to add that in this and the other actions which were fought at the end of the war our wounded met with kindness and consideration from the enemy. We may now descend to the Orange River colony and trace the course of those operations which were destined to break the power of De Wet's commando. On these we may concentrate our attention, for the marchings and gleanings and snipings of the numerous small columns in the other portions of the colony, although they involved much arduous and useful work do not claim a particular account. After the heavy blow which he dealt firm in yeomanry, De Wet retired, as has been told, into the Langberg, whence he afterwards retreated towards Reitz. There he was energetically pushed by Elliot's columns, which had attained such mobility that 150 miles were performed in three days within a single week. Our rough schoolmasters had taught us our lesson, and the soldiering which accomplished the marches of Bruce Hamilton, Elliot, Rymington, and the other leaders of the end of the war was very far removed from that which is associated with ox wagons and harmoniums. Moving rapidly, and covering himself by a succession of rearguard skirmishes, De Wet danced like a will o' the wisp in front of and round the British columns. De Lisle, Fanchet, Barnger, Rymington, Dawkins, 
and Rawlinson were all snatching at him and finding him just beyond their fingertips. The mastermind at Pretoria had, however, thought out a scheme which was worthy of to wet himself in its ingenuity. A glance at the map will show that the little branch from Heilbrun to Wolverek forms an acute angle with the main line. Both these railways were strongly blockhoused and barbed wired, so that any force which was driven into the angle, and held in it by a force behind it, would be in a perilous position. To attempt to round the wet's mobile burgers into this obvious pen would have been to show one's hand too clearly. In vain is the net laid in sight of the bird. The drive was therefore made away from this point, with the confident expectation that the guerrilla chief would break back through the columns, and that they might then pivot round upon him and hustle him so rapidly into the desired position that he would not realize his danger until it was too late. Bung's column was left behind the driving line to be ready for the expected backward break. All came off exactly as expected. De Wet doubled back through the columns, and one of his commandos stumbled upon Bung's men, who were waiting on the Vlai River to the west of Reitz. The Boers seemed to have taken it for granted that, having passed the British driving line, they were out of danger, and for once it was they who were surprised. The South African Light Horse, the New Zealanders, and the Queensland Bushmen all rode in upon them. A fifteen-pounder, the one taken at Tweefontein, and two pom-poms were captured, with thirty prisoners and a considerable quantity of stores. This successful skirmish was a small matter, however, compared to the importance of being in close touch with the wet and having a definite objective for the drive. The columns behind expanded suddenly into a spray of mounted men forming a continuous line for over 60 miles. On February 5th the line was advancing, and on the 6th it was known that De Wet was actually within the angle, the mouth of which was spanned by the British line. Hope ran high in Pretoria. The space into which the Burger chief had been driven was bounded by 66 miles of blockhouse and wire on one side and 30 on the other, while the third side of the triangle was crossed by 55 miles of British horsemen, flanked by a blockhouse line between Kroonstad and Lindley. The tension along the lines of defence was extreme. Infantry guarded every yard of them, and armoured trains patrolled them, while at night searchlights at regular intervals shed their vivid rays over the black expanse of the veldt and illuminated the mounted figures who flitted from time to time across their narrow belts of light. On the sixth De Wet realized his position, and with characteristic audacity and promptness he took means to clear the formidable toils which had been woven round him. The greater part of his command scattered, with orders to make their way as best they might out of the danger. Working in their own country, where every crease and fold of the ground was familiar to them, it is not surprising that most of them managed to make their way through gaps in the attenuated line of horsemen behind them. A few were killed, and a considerable number taken, 270 being the respectable total of the prisoners. Three or four slipped through, however, for every one who stuck in the meshes. De Wet himself was reported to have made his escape by driving cattle against the wire fences which enclosed him. It seems, however, to have been nothing more romantic than a wire cutter which cleared his path, though cattle no doubt made their way through the gap which he left. With a loss of only three of his immediate followers De Wet won his way out of the most dangerous position which even his adventurous career had ever known. Lord Kitchener had descended to Wolverek to be present at the climax of the operations, but it was not fated that he was to receive the submission of the most energetic of his opponents, and he returned to Pretoria to weave a fresh mesh around him. This was not hard to do, as the Boer general had simply escaped from one pen into another, though a larger one. After a short rest to restore the columns, the whole pack were full cry upon his heels once more. An acute angle is formed by the Wilge River on one side and the line of blockhouses between Harrismith and Van Rien upon the other. This was strongly manned by troops and five columns, those of Rawlinson, Nixon, Bang, Rymington, and Ear herded the broken commandos into the trap. From February 20 the troops swept in an enormous skirmish line across the country, ascending hills, exploring kloofs 
searching river banks, and always keeping the enemy in front of them? At last, when the pressure was severely felt, there came the usual breakback, which took the form of a most determined night attack upon the British line. This was delivered shortly after midnight on February 23rd. It struck the British cordon at the point of juncture between Bung's column and that of Rymington. So huge were the distances which had to be covered, and so attenuated was the force which covered them, that the historical thin red line was a massive formation compared to its khaki equivalent. The chain was frail and the links were not all carefully joined, but each particular link was good metal, and the bore impact came upon one of the best. This was the seventh New Zealand contingent who proved themselves to be worthy comrades to their six gallant predecessors. Their patrols were broken by the rush of wild, yelling, firing horsemen, but the troopers made a most gallant resistance. Having pierced the line the Boers, who were led in their fiery rush by Maney Boater, turned to their flank, and, charging down the line of weak patrols, overwhelmed one after another and threatened to roll up the whole line. They had cleared a gap of half a mile and it seemed as if the whole Boer force would certainly escape through so long a gap in the defences. The desperate defence of the New Zealanders gave time, however, for the further patrols, which consisted of Cox's New South Wales Mounted Infantry, to fall back almost at right angles so as to present a fresh face to the attack. The pivot of the resistance was a Maxim gun, most gallantly handled by Captain Bigby and his men. The fight at this point was almost muzzle to muzzle, fifty or sixty New Zealanders and Australians with the British gunners holding off a force of several hundred of the best fighting men of the Boer forces. In this desperate duel many dropped on both sides. Bigby died beside his gun, which fired eighty rounds before it jammed. It was run back by its crew in order to save it from capture. But reinforcements were coming up, and the Boer attack was beaten back. A number of them had escaped, however, through the opening which they had cleared, and it was conjectured that the wonderful De Wet was among them. How fierce was the storm which had broken on the New Zealanders may be shown by their roll of twenty killed and forty wounded, while thirty dead Boers were picked up in front of their picket line. Of eight New Zealand officers seven are reported to have been hit, an even higher proportion than that which the same gallant race endured at the Battle of Renosticop more than a year before. It was feared at first that the greater part of the Boers might have escaped upon this night of the 23rd, when many Boaters storming party burst through the ranks of the New Zealanders. It was soon discovered that this was not so and the columns as they closed in had evidence from the numerous horsemen who scampered aimlessly over the hills in front of them that the main body of the enemy was still in the toils. The advance was in tempestuous weather and over rugged country, but the men were filled with eagerness, and no precaution was neglected to keep the line intact. This time their efforts were crowned with considerable success. A second attempt was made by the corralled burghers to break out on the night of February 26 but it was easily repulsed by Nixon. The task of the troopers as the cordon drew south was more and more difficult, and there were places traversed upon the natal border where an alpenstock would have been a more useful adjunct than a horse. At six o'clock on the morning of the 27th came the end. Two boars appeared in front of the advancing line of the Imperial Light Horse and held up a flag. They proved to be Druter and De Jaja ready to make terms for their commando. The only terms offered were absolute surrender within the hour. The Boers had been swept into a very confined space, which was closely hemmed in by troops, so that any resistance must have ended in a tragedy. Fortunately there was no reason for desperate counsels in their case, since they did not fight as Lotta had done, with the shadow of judgment hanging over him. The burghers piled arms, and all was over. The total number captured in this important drive was 780 men, including several leaders, one of whom was De Wet's own son. It was found that De Wet himself had been among those who had got away through the picket lines on the night of the 23rd. Most of the commando were transvalers, and it was typical of the wide sweep of the net that many of them were the men who had been engaged against the 28th Mounted Infantry in the district south of Johannesburg upon the 12th of the same month. 
the loss of 2,000 horses and 50,000 cartridges meant as much as that of the men to the Boer army. It was evident that a few more such blows would clear the Orange River colony altogether. The wearied troopers were allowed little rest, for in a couple of days after their rendezvous at Harrismith they were sweeping back again to pick up all that they had missed. This drive, which was over the same ground, but sweeping backwards towards the Heilbrunter Wolver Eckline, ended in the total capture of 147 of the enemy, who were picked out of holes retrieved from amid the reeds of the river, culled down out of trees, or otherwise collected. So thorough were the operations that it is recorded that the angle which formed the apex of the drive was one drove of game upon the last day, all the many types of antelope, which form one of the characteristics and charms of the country, having been herded into it. More important even than the results of the drive was the discovery of one of Dilwet's arsenals in a cave in the Vreed district. Halfway down a precipitous crantz, with its mouth covered by creepers, no writer of romance could have imagined a more fitting headquarters for a guerrilla chief. The find was made by Ross's Canadian scouts, who celebrated Dominion Day by this most useful achievement. Forty wagon loads of ammunition and supplies were taken out of the cave. De Wet was known to have left the northeast district, and to have got across the railway traveling towards the Val as if it were his intention to join De Lare in the Transvaal. The Boer resistance had suddenly become exceedingly energetic in that part, and several important actions had been fought, to which we will presently turn. Before doing so it would be as well to bring the chronicle of events in the Orange River colony down to the conclusion of peace. There were still a great number of wandering Boers in the northern districts and in the frontier mountains, who were assiduously, but not always successfully, hunted down by the British troops. Much arduous and useful work was done by several small columns, the colonial horse and the artillery mounted rifles especially distinguishing themselves. The latter corps, formed from the gunners whose field pieces were no longer needed, proved themselves to be a most useful body of men, and the British gunner, when he took to carrying his gun, vindicated the reputation which he had won when his gun had carried him. From the 1st to the 4th of May a successful drive was conducted by many columns in the often harried but never deserted Lindley to Kroonstad district. The result was propitious, as no fewer than 321 prisoners were brought in. Of these, 150 undermints were captured in one body as they attempted to break through the encircling cordon. Amid many small drives and many skirmishes, one stands out for its severity. It is remarkable as being the last action of any importance in the campaign. This was the fight at Muhlmann's Sprout, near Fixburg, upon April 20, 1902. A force of about 100 yeomanry and 40 mounted infantry, South Staffords was dispatched by night to attack an isolated farm in which a small body of boars was supposed to be sleeping. Colonel Percival was in command. The farm was reached after a difficult march, but the enemy were found to have been forewarned, and to be in much greater strength than was anticipated. A furious fire was opened on the advancing troops, who were clearly visible in the light of a full moon. Sir Thomas Fowler was killed and several men of the yeomanry were hit. The British charged up to the very walls, but were unable to effect an entrance, as the place was barricaded and loopholed. Captain Blackwood, of the Staffords, was killed in the attack. Finding that the place was impregnable, and that the enemy outnumbered him, Colonel Percival gave the order to retire a movement which was only successfully carried out because the greater part of the Boer horses had been shot. By morning the small British force had extricated itself, from its perilous position with a total loss of six killed, nineteen wounded, and six missing. The whole affair was undoubtedly a cleverly planned boar ambush, and the small force was most fortunate in escaping destruction. One other isolated incident may be mentioned here, though it occurred far away in the Vryai district of the Transvaal. This was the unfortunate encounter between Zulus and Boers by which the latter lost over fifty of their numbers under deplorable circumstances. This portion of the Transvaal has only recently been annexed, and is inhabited by warlike Zulus, 
who are very different from the debased Kafirs of the rest of the country. These men had a blood feud against the Boers, which was embittered by the fact that they had lost heavily through Boer depredations. Knowing that a party of 59 men were sleeping in a farmhouse, the Zulus crept onto it and slaughtered every man of the inmates. Such an incident is much to be regretted, and yet, looking back upon the long course of the war, and remembering the turbulent tribes who surrounded the combatant Swazis, Basatos, and Zulus we may well congratulate ourselves that we have been able to restrain those black warriors, and to escape the brutalities and the bitter memories of a barbarian invasion. Chapter 38. To LA Ray's campaign of 1902. It will be remembered that at the close of 1901, Lord Methuen and Colonel Keckwish had both come across to the eastern side of their district and made their base at the railway line in the Clerksdorps section. Their position was strengthened by the fact that a blockhouse cordon now ran from Clerksdorp to Ventersdorp and from Ventersdorp to Pochstrom, so that this triangle could be effectively controlled. There remained, however, a huge tract of difficult country which was practically in the occupation of the enemy. Several thousand stalwarts were known to be riding with de Larry and his energetic Lieutenant Kemp. The strenuous operations of the British in the eastern Transvaal and in the Orange River colony had caused this district to be comparatively neglected and so everything was in favor of an aggressive movement of the Boers. There was a long lull after the unsuccessful attack upon Kekwish's camp at Moedwil, but close observers of the war distrusted this ominous calm and expected a storm to follow. The new year found the British connecting Ventersdorp with Tafekop by a blockhouse line. The latter place had been a center of Boer activity. Colonel Hickey's column covered this operation. Meanwhile Methuen had struck across through Ulmar and Stad as far as Vryburg. In these operations, which resulted in constant small captures, he was assisted by a column under Major Paris working from Kimberley. From Vryburg Lord Methuen made his way in the middle of January to Lichtenberg, meeting with a small rebuff in the neighborhood of that town, for a detachment of yeomanry was overwhelmed by General Selliers, who killed eight, wounded fifteen, and captured forty. From Lichtenberg Lord Methuen continued his enormous trek, and arrived on February 1 at Klerksdorp once more. Little rest was given to his hard work troops, and they were sent off again within the week under the command of Vondernop, with the result that on February 8, near Wolmar and Stad, they captured Potjiata's Lydia with forty Boer prisoners. Vondernop remained at Wolmar and Stad until late in February. On the 23rd he dispatched an empty convoy back to Clerksdorp, the fate of which will be afterwards narrated. Kekwish and Hickey had combined their forces at the beginning of February. On February 4th an attempt was made by them to surprise General de Larry. The mounted troops who were dispatched under Major Leader failed in this enterprise, but they found an overwhelmed leger of Sir Alberts, capturing 132 prisoners. By stampeding the horses the Boer retreat was cut off, and the attack was so furiously driven home, especially by the admirable Scottish horse, that few of the enemy got away. Alberts himself with all his officers were among the prisoners. From this time until the end of February this column was not seriously engaged. It has been stated above that on February 23rd von der Nop sent in an empty convoy from Wolmar and Stad to Klerksdorp a distance of about 50 miles. Nothing had been heard for some time of Delare, but he had called together his men and was waiting to bring off some coup. The convoy gave him the very opportunity for which he sought. The escort of the convoy consisted of the 5th Imperial Yeomanry, 60 of Pegget's horse, three companies of the ubiquitous Northumberland Fusiliers, two guns of the 4th RFA, and a pom-pom, amounting in all to 630 men. Colonel Anderson was in command. On the morning of Tuesday, February 25, the convoy was within 10 miles of its destination, and the sentries on the copies round the town could see the gleam of the long line of white tilted wagons. Their hazardous voyage was nearly over, and yet they were destined to most complete and fatal wreck within sight of port. So confident were they that the detachment of Pegget's horse was permitted to ride on the night before into the town. It was as well, 
for such a handful would have shared and could not have averted the disaster. The night had been dark and wet, and the boars under cover of it had crept between the sleeping convoy and the town. Some bushes which afford excellent cover lie within a few hundred yards of the road, and here the main ambush was laid. In the first grey of the morning the long line of the convoy, 130 wagons in all, came trailing past guns and yeomanry in front, fusiliers upon the flanks and rear. Suddenly the black bank of scrub was outlined in flame, and a furious rifle fire was opened upon the head of the column. The troops behaved admirably under most difficult circumstances. A counter-attack by the fusiliers and some of the yeomanry, under cover of shrapnel from the guns, drove the enemy out of the scrub and silenced his fire at this point. It was evident, however, that he was present in force, for firing soon broke out along the whole left flank, and the rearguard found itself as warmly attacked as the van. Again, however, the assailants were driven off. It was now broad daylight, and the wagons, which had got into great confusion in the first turmoil of battle, had been remarshalled and arranged. It was Colonel Anderson's hope that he might be able to send them on into safety while he with the escort covered their retreat. His plan was certainly the best one, and if it did not succeed it was due to nothing which he could avert, but to the nature of the ground and the gallantry of the enemy. The physical obstacle consisted in a very deep and difficult sprout, the jagged sprout, which forms an ugly passage in times of peace, but which when crowded and choked with stampeding mules and splintering wagons, under their terrified conductors, soon became impassable. Here the head of the column was clubbed and the whole line came to a stand. Meanwhile the enemy, adopting their new tactics, came galloping in on the left flank and on the rear. The first attack was repelled by the steady fire of the fusiliers, but on the second occasion the horsemen got up to the wagons, and galloping down them were able to overwhelm in detail the little knots of soldiers who were scattered along the flank. The British, who were outnumbered by at least three to one, made a stout resistance, and it was not until seven o'clock that the last shot was fired. The result was a complete success to the burghers, but one which leaves no shadow of discredit on any officer or man among those who were engaged. Eleven officers and 176 men fell out of about 550 actually engaged. The two guns were taken. The convoy was no use to the Boers, so the teams were shot and the wagons burned before they withdrew. The prisoners too, they were unable to retain and their sole permanent trophies consisted of the two guns, the rifles, and the ammunition. Their own losses amounted to about fifty killed and wounded. A small force sallied out from Clerksdorp in the hope of helping Anderson, but on reaching the Jag Drift it was found that the fighting was over and that the field was in possession of the Boers. Delare was seen in person among the burghers, and it is pleasant to add that he made himself conspicuous by his humanity to the wounded. His force drew off in the course of the morning, and was soon out of reach of immediate pursuit, though this was attempted by Kekwish, von Denop, and Grenfell. It was important to regain the guns if possible, as they were always a menace to the blockhouse system, and for this purpose Grenfell with 1600 horsemen was dispatched to a point south of Lichtenberg, which was conjectured to be upon the Boer line of retreat. At the same time Lord Methuen was ordered up from Vryburg in order to cooperate in this movement, and to join his forces to those of Grenfell. It was obvious that with an energetic and resolute adversary like de la Rey there was great danger of these two forces being taken in detail, but it was hoped that each was strong enough to hold its own until the other could come to its aid. The result was to show that the danger was real and the hope fallacious. It was on March 2nd that Matthew and left Vryburg. The column was not his old one, consisting of veterans of the trek, but was the Kimberley column under Major Paris, a body of men who had seen much less service and were in every way less reliable. It included a curious mixture of units, the most solid of which were four guns, two of the 4th, and two of the 38th RFA. 200 Northumberland Fusiliers, and 100 Loyal North Lancashires. The mounted men included 5th Imperial Yeomanry, 184, Cape Police, 233, Cullinan's Horse, 
64, 86th Imperial Yeomanry, 110, Diamond Fields Horse, 92, Denison S. Scouts, 58, Ashburner's Horse, 126, and British South African Police, 24. Such a collection of samples would be more in place, one would imagine, in a London procession than in an operation which called for discipline and cohesion. In warfare the half is often greater than the whole, and the presence of a proportion of half-hearted and inexperienced men may be a positive danger to their more capable companions. Upon March 6 Methuen, marching east towards Lichtenberg, came in touch nearly as Prout with Van Zyl's commando and learned in the small skirmish which ensued that some of his yeomanry were unreliable and ill-instructed. Having driven the enemy off by his artillery fire, Methuen moved to Tweebosch, where he lived until next morning. At 3 a.m. of the 7th the ox convoy was sent on, under escort of half of his little force. The other half followed at 4.20, so as to give the slow-moving oxen a chance of keeping ahead. It was evident, however, immediately after the column had got started that the enemy were all round in great numbers, and that an attack in force was to be expected. Lord Methuen gave orders therefore that the ox wagons should be halted and that the mule transport should close upon them so as to form one solid block, instead of a straggling line. At the same time he reinforced his rearguard with mounted men and with two guns, for it was in that quarter that the enemy appeared to be most numerous and aggressive. An attack was also developing upon the right flank, which was held off by the infantry and by the second section of the guns. It has been said that Methuen's horsemen were for the most part inexperienced irregulars. Such men become in time excellent soldiers, as all this campaign bears witness, but it is too much to expose them to a severe ordeal in the open field when they are still raw and untrained. As it happened, this particular ordeal was exceedingly severe but nothing can excuse the absolute failure of the troops concerned to rise to the occasion. Had Methuen's rearguard consisted of Imperial Light Horse, or Scottish Horse, it is safe to say that the Battle of Tweebosch would have had a very different ending. What happened was that a large body of Boers formed up in five lines and charged straight home at the rear screen and rearguard, firing from their saddles as they had done at break and lagged. The sight of those wide-flung lines of determined men galloping over the plain seems to have been too much for the nerves of the unseasoned troopers. A panic spread through their ranks, and in an instant they had turned their horses' heads and were thundering to their rear, leaving the two guns uncovered and streaming in wild confusion past the left flank of the jeering infantry who were lying round the wagons. The limit of their flight seems to have been the wind of their horses and most of them never drew rein until they had placed many miles between themselves and the comrades whom they had deserted. It was pitiable, says an eyewitness, to see the grand old general begging them to stop, but they would not, a large body of them arrived in Kraepan without firing a shot, it was a South African battle of the spurs. By this defection of the greater portion of the force the handful of brave men who remained were left in a hopeless position. The two guns of the 38th battery were overwhelmed and ridden over by the Boer horsemen, every man being killed or wounded, including Lieutenant Nisham, who acted up to the highest traditions of his corps. The battle, however, was not yet over. The infantry were few in number, but they were experienced troops, and they maintained the struggle for some hours in the face of overwhelming numbers. Two hundred of the Northumberland fusiliers lay round the wagons and held the Boers off from their prey. With them were the two remaining guns, which were a mark for a thousand Boer riflemen. It was while encouraging by his presence and example the much tried gunners of this section that the gallant Methuen was wounded by a bullet which broke the bone of his thigh. Lieutenant Venning and all the detachment fell with their general round the guns. An attempt had been made to rally some of the flying troopers at a neighboring kraal and a small body of Cape Police and Yeomanry under the command of Major Paris held out there for some hours. A hundred of the Lancashire infantry aided them in their stout defence. But the guns taken by the Boers from von der Nop's convoy had free play now that the British guns were out of action, and they were brought to bear with crushing effect upon both the Kral and the wagons. 
further resistance meant a useless slaughter, and orders were given for a surrender. Convoy, ammunition, guns, horses nothing was saved except the honor of the infantry and the gunners. The losses, 68 killed and 121 wounded, fell chiefly upon these two branches of the service. There were 205 unwounded prisoners. This, the last Boer victory in the war, reflected equal credit upon their valor and humanity, qualities which had not always gone hand in hand in our experience of them. Courtesy and attention were extended to the British wounded, and Lord Methuen was sent under charge of his chief medical officer, Colonel Townsend, the doctor as severely wounded as the patient, into Klerksdorp. In Delare we have always found an opponent who was as chivalrous as he was formidable. The remainder of the force reached the Kimberley to Mafeking railway line in the direction of Krayaipan, the spot where the first bloodshed of the war had occurred some 29 months before. On Lord Methuen himself no blame can rest for this unsuccessful action. If the workman's tool snaps in his hand he cannot be held responsible for the failure of his task. The troops who misbehaved were none of his training. If you hear anyone slang him, says one of his men, you are to tell them that he is the finest general and the truest gentleman that ever fought in this war. Such was the tone of his own troopers, and such also that of the spokesmen of the nation when they commented upon the disaster in the Houses of Parliament. It was a fine example of British justice and sense of fair play, even in that bitter moment that to hear his eulogy one would have thought that the occasion had been one when thanks were being returned for a victory. It is a generous public with fine instincts, and Paul Methuen, wounded and broken, still remained in their eyes the heroic soldier and the chivalrous man of honor. The De Wet country had been pretty well cleared by the series of drives which have already been described and Louis Botha's force in the eastern Transvaal had been much diminished by the tactics of Bruce Hamilton and Wolves Sampson. Lord Kitchener was able, therefore, to concentrate his troops and his attention upon that widespread western area in which General de Larre had dealt two such shrewd blows within a few weeks of each other. Troops were rapidly concentrated at Clerksdorp. Keckwish, Walter Kitchener, Rawlinson, and Rochford with a number of small columns, were ready in the third week of March to endeavour to avenge Lord Methuen. The problem with which Lord Kitchener was confronted was a very difficult one, and he has never shown more originality and audacity than in the fashion in which he handled it. Delaray's force was scattered over a long tract of country, capable of rapidly concentrating for a blow, but otherwise as intangible and elusive as a phantom army. Were Lord Kitchener simply to launch 10,000 horsemen at him, the result would be a weary ride over illimitable plains without sight of a boar, unless it were a distant scout upon the extreme horizon. Delare and his men would have slipped away to his northern hiding places beyond the Marico River. There was no solid obstacle here, as in the Orange River colony, against which the flying enemy could be rounded up. One line of blockhouses there was, it is true the one called the Schoonsprout Cordon, which flanked the Delare country. It flanked it, however, upon the same side as that on which the troops were assembled. If the troops were only on the other side, and Delare was between them and the blockhouse line, then, indeed, something might be done. But to place the troops there, and then bring them instantly back again, was to put such a strain upon men and horses as had never yet been done upon a large scale in the course of the war. Yet Lord Kitchener knew the mettle of the men whom he commanded, and he was aware that there were no exertions of which the human frame is capable which he might not confidently demand. The precise location of the Borlagers does not appear to have been known, but it was certain that a considerable number of them were scattered about thirty miles or so to the west of Clerksdorp and the Schoonsprout line. The plan was to march a British force right through them, then spread out into a wide line and come straight back, driving the burghers onto the cordon of blockhouses, which had been strengthened by the arrival of three regiments of Highlanders. But to get to the other side of the Boers it was necessary to march the columns through by night. It was a hazardous operation, but the secret was well kept, 
and the movement was so well carried out that the enemy had no time to check it. On the night of Sunday, March 23rd, the British horsemen passed stealthily in column through the Delary country, and then, spreading out into a line, which from the left wing at Lichtenberg to the right wing at Commander Drift measured a good 80 miles, they proceeded to sweep back upon their traces. In order to reach their positions the columns had, of course, started at different points of the British blockhouse line, and some had a good deal farther to go than others, while the southern extension of the line was formed by Rochefort's troops, who had moved up from the Val. Above him from south to north came Walter Kitchener, Rawlinson, and Keckwish in the order named Dot on the morning of Monday, March 24, a line of 80 miles of horsemen, without guns or transport, was sweeping back towards the blockhouses, while the country between was filled with scattered parties of Boers who were seeking for gaps by which to escape. It was soon learned from the first prisoners that Delaray was not within the cordon. His ledger had been some distance farther west. But the sight of fugitive horsemen rising and dipping over the rolling veldt assured the British that they had something within their net. The catch was, however, by no means as complete as might have been desired. Three hundred men in khaki slipped through between the two columns in the early morning. Another large party escaped to the southwards. Some of the Boers adopted extraordinary devices in order to escape from the ever narrowing cordon. Three, in charge of some cattle, buried themselves, and left a small hole to breathe through with a tube. Some men began to probe with bayonets in the new turned earth and got immediate and vociferous subterranean yells. Another man tried the same game and a horse stepped on him. He writhed and reared the horse, and practically the horse found the prisoner for us. But the operations achieved one result, which must have lifted a load of anxiety from Lord Kitchener's mind. Three fifteen pounders, two pom poms, and a large amount of ammunition were taken. To Keckwish and the Scottish horse fell the honour of the capture, Colonel Wolves Sampson and Captain Rice heading the charge and pursuit. By this means the constant menace to the blockhouses was lessened, if not entirely removed. 175 Boers were disposed of, nearly all as prisoners, and a considerable quantity of transport was captured. In this operation the troops had averaged from 70 to 80 miles in 26 hours without change of horses. To such a point had the slow-moving ponderous British army attained after two years training of that stern drill master, necessity. The operations had attained some success, but nothing commensurate with the daring of the plan or the exertions of the soldiers. Without an instant's delay, however, Lord Kitchener struck a second blow at his enemy. Before the end of March Keckwish, Rawlinson, and Walter Kitchener were all upon the trek once more. Their operations were pushed farther to the west than in the last drive, since it was known that on that occasion Delaray and his main commando had been outside the cordon. It was to one of Walter Kitchener's lieutenants that the honour fell to come in direct contact with the main force of the Burgers. This general had moved out to a point about forty miles west of Klerksdorp. Forming his ledger there, he dispatched Cookson on March 30 with 1700 men to work further westward in the direction of the Hartz River. Under Cookson's immediate command were the 2nd Canadian Mounted Infantry, Dammit's Horse, and four guns of the 7th RFA. His lieutenant, Keir, commanded the 28th Mounted Infantry, the Artillery Mounted Rifles, and 2nd Kitchener's Fighting Scouts. The force was well mounted and carried the minimum of baggage. It was not long before this mobile force found itself within touch of the enemy. The broad wheel made by the passing of a convoy set them off at full cry, and they were soon encouraged by the distant cloud of dust which shrouded the Boer wagons. The advance guard of the column galloped at the top of their speed for eight miles, and closed in upon the convoy, but found themselves faced by an escort of five hundred Boers who fought a clever rearguard action, and covered their charge with great skill. At the same time Cookson closed in upon his mounted infantry, while on the other side de Larray's main force fell back in order to reinforce the escort. British and Boers were both riding furiously to help their own comrades. 
The two forces were fairly face to face. Perceiving that he was in front of the whole Boer army, and knowing that he might expect reinforcements, Cookson decided to act upon the defensive. A position was rapidly taken up along the Braxprut, and preparations made to resist the impending attack. The line of defense was roughly the line of the Sprut, but for some reason, probably to establish a cross fire, one advanced position was occupied upon either flank. On the left flank was a farmhouse, which was held by 200 men of the artillery rifles. On the extreme right was another outpost of 24 Canadians and 45 mounted infantry. They occupied no defensible position, and their situation was evidently a most dangerous one, only to be justified by some strong military reason which is not explained by any account of the action. The Boer guns had opened fire and considerable bodies of the enemy appeared upon the flanks and in front. Their first efforts were devoted towards getting possession of the farmhouse, which would give them a point d'appui from which they could turn the whole line. Some 500 of them charged on horseback, but were met by a very steady fire from the artillery rifles, while the guns raked them with shrapnel. They reached a point within 500 yards of the building, but the fire was too hot and they wheeled round in rapid retreat. Dismounting in a mealy patch they skirmished up towards the farmhouse once more, but they were again checked by the fire of the defenders and by a pom-pom which Colonel Ear had brought up. No progress whatever was made by the attack in this quarter. In the meantime the fate which might have been foretold had befallen the isolated detachment of Canadians and 28th mounted infantry upon the extreme right. Bruce Carruthers the Canadian officer in command, behaved with the utmost gallantry, and was splendidly seconded by his men. Overwhelmed by vastly superior numbers, amid a perfect hail of bullets they fought like heroes to the end. There have been few finer instances of heroism in the course of the campaign, says the reticent Kitchener in his official dispatch. Of the Canadians 18 were hit out of 21 and the mounted infantry hard by lost 30 out of 45 before they surrendered. This advantage gained upon the right flank was of no assistance to the Boers in breaking the British line. The fact that it was so makes it the more difficult to understand why this outpost was so exposed. The Burgers had practically surrounded Cookson's force, and Alare and Kemp urged on the attack, but their artillery fire was dominated by the British guns and no weak point could be found in the defence. At one o'clock the attack had been begun, and at 5.30 it was finally abandoned, and Alare was in full retreat. That he was in no sense rooted is shown by the fact that Cookson did not attempt to follow him up or to capture his guns, but at least he had failed in his purpose, and had lost more heavily than in any engagement which he had yet fought. The moral effect of his previous victories had also been weakened, and his burghers had learned, if they had illusions upon the subject, that the men who fled at Tweebosch were not typical troopers of the British army. Altogether, it was a well-fought and useful action, though it cost the British force some 200 casualties, of which 35 were fatal. Cookson's force stood to arms all night until the arrival of Walter Kitchener's men in the morning. Generally in Hamilton, who had acted for some time as chief of the staff to Lord Kitchener, had arrived on April 8 at Clerksdorp to take supreme command of the whole operations against Delare. Early in April the three main British columns had made a rapid cast around without success. To the very end the better intelligence and the higher mobility seemed to have remained upon the side of the Boers, who could always force a fight when they wished and escape when they wished. Occasionally, however, they forced one at the wrong time, as in the instance which I am about to describe. Hamilton had planned a drive to cover the southern portion of Delaray's country, and for this purpose, with Hartbest Fontaine for his centre, he was manoeuvring his columns so as to swing them into line and then sweep back towards Clerksdorp. Keckwish, Rawlinson, and Walter Kitchener were all manoeuvring for this purpose. The Boers, however, gained to the last although they were aware that their leaders had gone into treat, and that peace was probably due within a few days, determined to have one last gallant fall with a British column. The forces of Kekwish were the farthest to the westward, and also, 
as the burghers thought, the most isolated, and it was upon them, accordingly, that the attack was made. In the morning of April 11th, at a place called Ruwell, the enemy, who had moved up from Wulmar and Stad, 1900 strong, under Kemp and Vermas, fell with the utmost impetuosity upon the British column. There was no preliminary skirmishing, and a single gallant charge by 1,500 Boers both opened and ended the engagement. I was just saying to the staff officer that there were no Boers within 20 miles, says one who was present, when we heard a roar of musketry and saw a lot of men galloping down on us. The British were surprised but not shaken by this unexpected apparition. I never saw a more splendid attack. They kept a distinct line, says the eyewitness. Another spectator says, they came on in one long line four deep and knee to knee. It was an old-fashioned cavalry charge, and the fact that it got as far as it did shows that we have overrated the stopping power of modern rifles. They came for a good 500 yards under direct fire and were only turned within a hundred of the British line. The yeomanry, the Scottish horse, and the constabulary poured a steady fire upon the advancing wave of horsemen, and the guns opened with case at two hundred yards. The boars were stopped, staggered, and turned. Their fire, or rather the covering fire of those who had not joined in the charge, had caused some fifty casualties, but their own losses were very much more severe. The fierce Potjata fell just in front of the British guns. Thank goodness he is dead! cried one of his wounded burghers, for he jamboked me into the firing line this morning. Fifty dead and a great number of wounded were left upon the field of battle. Rawlinson's column came up on Kekwish's left, and the ball flight became a rout, for they were chased for twenty miles, and their two guns were captured. It was a brisk and decisive little engagement, and it closed the Western campaign, leaving the last trick, as well as the game, to the credit of the British. From this time until the end there was a gleaning of prisoners but little fighting in Delare's country, the most noteworthy event being a surprise visit to Schweizerinek by Rochford, by which some sixty prisoners were taken, and afterwards the drive of Ian Hamilton's forces against the Mafeking railway line by which no fewer than 364 prisoners were secured. In this difficult and well-managed operation the gaps between the British columns were concealed by the lighting of long veldt fires and the discharge of rifles by scattered scouts. The newly arrived Australian Commonwealth regiments gave a brilliant start to the military history of their united country by the energy of their marching and the thoroughness of their entrenching. Upon May 29, only two days before the final declaration of peace, a raid was made by a few Boers upon the native cattle reserves near Frederickstad. A handful of horsemen pursued them, and were ambushed by a considerable body of the enemy in some hilly country ten miles from the British lines. Most of the pursuers got away in safety, but young Sutherland, second lieutenant of the Seaforths, and only a few months from Eton, found himself separated from his horse and in a hopeless position. Scorning to surrender, the lad actually fought his way upon foot for over a mile before he was shot down by the horsemen who circled round him. Well might the Boer commander declare that in the whole course of the war he had seen no finer example of British courage. It is indeed sad that at this last instant a young life should be thrown away, but Sutherland died in a noble fashion for a noble cause, and many inglorious years would be a poor substitute for the example and tradition which such a death will leave behind. Chapter 39. The end. It only remains in one short chapter to narrate the progress of the peace negotiations, the ultimate settlement, and the final consequences of this long drawn war. However disheartening the successive incidents may have been in which the Boers were able to inflict heavy losses upon us and to renew their supplies of arms and ammunition, it was none the less certain that their numbers were waning and that the inevitable end was steadily approaching. With mathematical precision the scientific soldier in Pretoria, with his web of barbed wire radiating out over the whole country, was week by week wearing them steadily down. 
and yet after the recent victory of Delaray and various braggadocio pronouncements from the refugees at The Hague, it was somewhat of a surprise to the British public when it was announced upon March 22 that the acting government of the Transvaal, consisting of Messrs. Chalkberger, Lucas Meyer, Reitz, Jacobi, Grog, and Van Velden had come into Middelburg and requested to be forwarded by train to Pretoria for the purpose of discussing terms of peace with Lord Kitchener. A thrill of help ran through the Empire at the news, but so doubtful did the issue seem that none of the preparations were relaxed which would ensure a vigorous campaign in the immediate future. In the South African as in the Peninsula and in the Crimean Wars, it may truly be said that Great Britain was never so ready to fight as at the dawning of peace. At least two years of failure and experience are needed to turn a civilian and commercial nation into a military power. In spite of the optimistic pronouncements of Mr. Fisher and the absurd forecasts of Dr. Lades, the power of the Boers was really broken, and they had come in with the genuine intention of surrender. In a race with such individuality, it was not enough that the government should form its conclusion. It was necessary for them to persuade their burghers that the game was really up, and that they had no choice but to throw down their well-worn rifles and their ill-filled bandoliers. For this purpose a long series of negotiations had to be entered into which put a strain upon the complacency of the authorities in South Africa and upon the patience of the attentive public at home. Their ultimate success shows that this complacency and this patience were eminently the right attitude to adopt. On March 23, the Transvaal representatives were dispatched to Kroonstad for the purpose of opening up the matter with Stein and De Wet. Messengers were sent to communicate with these two leaders, but had they been British columns instead of fellow countrymen, they could not have found greater difficulty in running them to earth. At last, however, at the end of the month, the message was conveyed and resulted in the appearance of De Wet, De La Rey, and Stein at the British outposts at Klerksdorp. The other delegates had come north again from Kroonstad, and all were united in the same small town, which, by a whimsical fate, had suddenly become the centre both for the making of peace and for the prosecution of the war, with the eyes of the whole world fixed upon its insignificant litter of houses. On April 11th, after repeated conferences, both parties moved on to Pretoria, and the most sceptical observers began to confess that there was something in the negotiations after all. After conferring with Lord Kitchener the Boer leaders upon April 18 left Pretoria again and rode out to the commandos to explain the situation to them. The result of this mission was that two delegates were chosen from each body in the field who assembled at Vereeniging upon May 15 for the purpose of settling the question by vote. Never was a high matter of state decided in so democratic a fashion. Up to that period the Boer leaders had made a succession of tentative suggestions, each of which had been put aside by the British government. Their first had been that they should merely concede those points which had been at issue at the beginning of the war. This was set aside. The second was that they should be allowed to consult their friends in Europe. This also was refused. The next was that an armistice should be granted, but again Lord Kitchener was obdurate. A definite period was suggested within which the burghers should make their final choice between surrender and a war which must finally exterminate them as a people. It was tacitly understood, if not definitely promised that the conditions which the British government would be prepared to grant would not differ much in essentials from those which had been refused by the Boers a twelve month before, after the Middelburg interview. On May 15 the Boer conference opened at Vereeniging. Sixty-four delegates from the commandos met with the military and political chiefs of the late republics, the whole amounting to 150 persons. A more singular gathering has not met in our time. There was Bota, the young lawyer, who had found himself by a strange turn of fate commanding a victorious army in a great war. De Wet was there, with his grim mouth and sun-browned face, De La Rey, also, with the grizzled beard and the strong aquiline features. There, too, were the politicians. The grey-bearded, genial Reitz, a little graver than when he looked upon the whole matter as an immense joke, and the unfortunate Stein, stumbling and groping a broken and ruined man. The burly Lucas Meyer, smart young smuts fresh from the siege of Okip, 
as from the north, Kemp the dashing cavalry leader, Mala the hero of many fights all these with many others of their sun blackened, gaunt, hard featured comrades were grouped within the great tent of Virene Ejing. The discussions were heated and prolonged, but the logic of facts was inexorable, and the cold still voice of common sense had more power than all the ravings of enthusiasts. The vote showed that the great majority of the delegates were in favour of surrender upon the terms offered by the British government. On May 31st this resolution was notified to Lord Kitchener, and at half past ten of the same night the delegates arrived at Pretoria and set their names to the Treaty of Peace. After two years seven and a half months of hostilities the Dutch republics had acquiesced in their own destruction, and the whole of South Africa, from Cape Town to the Zambesi had been added to the British Empire. The great struggle had cost us 20,000 lives and 100,000 stricken men, with 200 millions of money, but, apart from a peaceful South Africa, it had won for us a national resuscitation of spirit and a closer union with our great colonies which could in no other way have been attained. We had hoped that we were a solid empire when we engaged in the struggle, but we knew that we were when we emerged from it. In that change lies an ample recompense for all the blood and treasure spent. The following were in brief the terms of surrender colon 1. That the burghers lay down their arms and acknowledge themselves subjects of Edward VII. 2. That all prisoners taking the oath of allegiance be returned. 3. That their liberty and property be inviolate. 4. That an amnesty be granted save in special cases. 5 that the Dutch language be allowed in schools and law courts. 6. That rifles be allowed if registered. 7. That self-government be granted as soon as possible. 8. That no franchise be granted for natives until after self-government. 9. That no special land tax be levied. 10. That the people be helped to reoccupy the farms. 11 that three million pounds be given to help the farmers. 12. That the rebels be disfranchised and their leaders tried, on condition that no death penalty be inflicted. These terms were practically the same as those which had been refused by Bota in March 1901. Thirteen months of useless warfare had left the situation as it was. It had been a war of surprises, but the surprises have unhappily been hitherto invariably unpleasant ones. Now at last the balance swung the other way, for in all the long paradoxical history of South African strife there is nothing more wonderful than the way in which these two sturdy and unemotional races clasped hands the instant that the fight was done. The fact is in itself a final answer to the ill-natured critics of the continent. Men do not so easily grasp a hand which is reddened with the blood of women and children. From all parts, as the commandos came in there was welcome news of the fraternization between them and the soldiers, while the Boer leaders, as loyal to their new ties as they had been to their old ones, exerted themselves to promote good feeling among their people. A few weeks seemed to do more to lessen racial bitterness than some of us had hoped for in as many years. One can but pray that it will last. The surrenders amounted in all to 20,000 men and showed that in all parts of the seat of war the enemy had more men in the field than we had imagined, a fact which may take the sting out of several of our later mishaps. About 12,000 surrendered in the Transvaal, 6,000 in the Orange River Colony, and about 2,000 in the Cape Colony, showing that the movement in the rebel districts had always been more vexatious than formidable. A computation of the prisoners of war, the surrenders, the mercenaries, and the casualties, shows that the total forces to which we were opposed were certainly not fewer than 75,000 well armed mounted men, while they may have considerably exceeded that number. No wonder that the Boer leaders showed great confidence at the outset of the war. That the heavy losses caused us by the war were borne without a murmur is surely evidence enough how deep was the conviction of the nation that the war was not only just but essential that the possession of South Africa and the unity of the empire were at stake. Could it be shown, or were it even remotely possible, that ministers had incurred so immense a responsibility and entailed such tremendous sacrifices upon their people without adequate cause, is it not certain that, the task once done, 
an explosion of rage from the deceived and the bereaved would have driven them forever from public life. Among high and low, in England, in Scotland, in Ireland, in the great colonies, how many high hopes had been crushed, how often the soldier son had gone forth and never returned, or come back maimed and stricken in the pride of his youth. Everywhere was the voice of pity and sorrow, but nowhere that of reproach. The deepest instincts of the nation told it that it must fight and win, or forever abdicate its position in the world. Through dark days which brought out the virtues of our race as nothing has done in our generation, we struggled grimly on until the light had fully broken once again. And of all gifts that God has given to Britain there is none to compare with those days of sorrow, for it was in them that the nation was assured of its unity, and learned for all time that blood is stronger to bind than salt water is to part. The only difference in the point of view of the Briton from Britain and the Briton from the ends of the earth, was that the latter with the energy of youth was more wholesale in the imperial cause. Who has seen that army and can forget it its spirit, its picturesqueness above all, what it stands for in the future history of the world? Cowboys from the vast plains of the northwest, gentlemen who ride hard with the corn or the belvoir, gillies from the Sutherland deer forests, bushmen from the back blocks of Australia, exquisites of the Raleigh Club or the Bachelors, hard men from Ontario, dandy sportsmen from India and Ceylon, the horsemen of New Zealand, the wiry South African irregulars, these are the reserves whose existence was chronicled in no blue book and whose appearance came as a shock to the pedant soldiers of the continent who had sneered so long at our little army, since long years of peace have caused them to forget its exploits. On the plains of South Africa, in common danger and in common privation, the blood brotherhood of the empire was sealed dot so much for the empire. But what of South Africa? There in the end we must reap as we sow. If we are worthy of the trust, it will be left to us. If we are unworthy of it, it will be taken away. Kruger's downfall should teach us that it is not trifles but justice which is the title deed of a nation. The British flag under our best administrators will mean clean government, honest laws, liberty and equality to all men. So long as it continues to do so, we shall hold South Africa. When, out of fear or out or greed, we fall from that ideal. We may know that we are stricken with that disease which has killed every great empire before us.